Welcome to day one of Potapalooza 2024. I am Justin Mason, and this is going to be a very, very fun day, very, very fun event. We have two full days of live streams from some of the best fantasy baseball minds in our industry. We're going to be raising money for Fantasy Cares. Uh, let me throw that ticker up there so where every everybody can see what we're talking about. And where we're donating to, go to donorbox.org backslash TGFBI. Every dollar you donate goes to Fantasy Cares and gets you entered in to win amazing prizes, including TGFBI entries for next season. You ever want to get in TGFBI? This is one of the ways that you can do it. If you're not a content creator, uh, we're going to be talking about a whole bunch of fantasy baseball things to get you ready for your drafts, which start for a lot of people, next month, if you're not crazy like me and been drafting since like October, uh, and TGFBI kicks off on Monday. So this is the perfect time to discuss things. Please, please donate. Every dollar you donate gets you entered to win prizes. We're going to be giving away all the prizes at the end this year. Last year, I was donating prizes throughout the, uh, throughout the contest. We're just going to throw everything into one big pool. So that way, nobody misses out on any of the prizes. And I will announce the prizes probably over the next week. So keep those donations coming in and we will raise a lot of money for Fantasy Cares, which is an amazing, amazing organization run by Scott Fish, uh, which donates to a lot of causes, but especially Toys for Tots. They give out tens of thousands of dollars worth of toys, Toys for Tots every year. And we are so proud to be working with them this year for Potapalooza and TGFBI. Let's jump into our first panel. We are going to be talking about undervalued and overvalued players based on ADP. So let me bring in our first panel. First, we have Mike Gianella. How you doing, my friend? Hey, Justin. Great to be here. Uh, remind everybody where you can reach us on social media, uh, if you're on social media, uh, and then well, remind everybody where uh, where you work and what you do. Well, at this point, I'm on Blue Sky, so you can find me there at Mike Gianella. Uh, and as far as what I do, I'm with Baseball Prospectus. Uh, I write two articles a week there. One of them is an ADP article, which is probably why you invited me here. Uh, and then additionally, John Hagland and I do Flags Fly Forever, which is a weekly podcast. Uh, so we're, we're doing that right now. One of my favorite podcasts. I've been listening for, feels like a decade at least now. Uh, you guys do great work over there at Baseball Perspectives. Joining us as well is Jamie Steed. How you doing, my friend? I'm good, Justin. Yourself? I'm doing well. Remind everybody where yeah. you can be reached and uh, what you do. Uh, I am on X at the handle just underneath my chin at baseball underscore Jimbo. And I work right over at uh, rotoballer.com where I cover the in-season cut list weekly article looking at players worth cutting ones on the fence you might be thinking of that are worth holding as well as all the usual pre-season articles uh draft prep work with the team over there and last but not least my friend daniel rotter uh who is a former member of friends of fantasy benefits but on to bigger and better things daniel remind everybody where you can reach and what you do Hey, everybody. Yes, you can find me on Twitter at DRot underscore six. It says it right under my face. Uh, I'm writing right now for sportsethos.com. We got a big draft guide coming out this week. And the big thing that I am going to be covering is overvalued and undervalued players in your draft. So definitely check that out. Over the course of the season, I'll be talking about various roster maintenance type of things, such as guys to look into adding, two-star pitchers, all that sort of thing as of right now. All right, let's just jump right into the topic. We are talking about what Daniel and Mike cover, which is overvalued and undervalued players. And especially when we have early ADPs like we've started to get over the last few years, there's always guys that feel like they're going a bit too high or they're going a bit too low. So let's start with how do you go about determining kind of who is undervalued and who is overvalued there, Mike? Well, what I usually do, ADP is the last thing I look at. So I put together my rankings. I, I go through a lot of other stuff. And then when I'm done with all that, I, I look at ADP. And, and that's the gut check for me. So it, if I see somebody, for example, I was really high on Nolan Gorman coming into this season. Uh, and I wound up moving him down because I didn't need to have him ranked as high as I had him ranked. Uh, and, and that's where ADP is a good resource. Uh, additionally, for a, for a position, if you find a lot of players that you're really high on at a position, 
that's good information. You you can move some down. You can also look at it like, well, I, I know there's five or six first basemen that I like. Uh, I can move a few down and, and just play around with that and, and know that one of them is going to be there for me later. What about you, Daniel? How do you kind of go around or go about figuring out like who are the guys that are overvalued and undervalued? Well, I would say so far, kind of just considering a variety of factors, uh, including but not limited to just like looking at last season's production, you know, checking out various resources like their advanced stats on fan graphs, XFIP, WRC plus, that sort of thing, uh, stack cast metrics on Savant. And I mean, I watch the games. I got to trust my gumption, too. You know, it's all about what you believe in. Jamie, what about you? Yeah, similar processes. I try and look at uh, the turning factors, like I said, with the rankings that you're putting in, why someone is high or lower than what I've got them for, whether it's like a, a, a bias, like their age, possible health concerns, anything like that. But I do like to look at similar comparisons. So if you look at projections, if you look at similar players who are 50, 80, 100 uh, places different in the ADP, unless there's a glaring issue like potential plan time losses or massive injury risk try and ascertain why there's such a difference and then utilize that is, is someone vastly overpriced or is someone massively undervalued between the two of them or is there somewhere in between and then try and find some value players like that yeah so what i do is i i i do full projections myself it's something i started doing last season um, it is a labor intensive process that i do not recommend for anyone that actually has a social life or family uh, because it just takes so damn long. Um, and then I run it through some sort of draft software. Every site has some sort of draft software that they use. Uh, find which one you like the best. I use Tanner Bell's Smart Fantasy Baseball software, which I found is the most customizable for me uh, and what I look for. And then it spits out dollar values, and I can compare those dollar values to the ADP and go, okay, well, this player X is going at this point in the draft, but my uh, my dollar values tell me he should be going, you know, a hundred or thirty spots higher, thirty spots lower, and I start kind of figuring out, okay, who are the guys that I can get way below what I think uh, they're worth, uh, and who are the guys I'm going to avoid because they're going way higher than uh, I think they're worth. So it's I think we all kind of kind of come to a conclusion. We got to figure out our own values first and then compare them. Don't I think a lot of people start with going and looking at ADP and going, well, I like that guy, I don't like that guy. I like that guy and don't like that guy. I think you want to have a little bit better process to kind of identify before you look at the ADP so that way you're not influenced by the ADP cuz you have to remember ADP is a great tool to use but it's made up of every single person that's playing in a league. And that means you're getting just as many last place teams in the ADP as you are getting first place teams, right? So that skews how worthy uh, of a tool that is if you're just going straight by that. All right. Uh, which hitter do you think is the most overvalued at the ADP right now there, Jamie? Uh, it's a, bit of a harsh take because I, I love the player and I love what he does but Adley Rushman in the first sort of four rounds is just you know borderline fifth round it's just too much for me because again if you're comparing players his projections are similar to someone like William Contreras who's going 25-30 picks later uh, is 20 homer 80 RBI 80 runs if he's not a catcher, he's going 50, 80 picks later. And obviously, I'll get it. Catcher is such a, a scarce position, and you've got to look at it differently, especially in two catcher leagues. But at his current ADP, I, I can't see me taking any Adley Rushman. I'd rather wait until another two or three rounds if I wanted to take one of the earlier catchers and then just pair him later on with someone. And if anybody disagrees with anybody's take, feel free to jump in and argue with them. Uh, I don't disagree with you, personally. I think that I love Rushman. I love what Rushman can do. 600 plate appearances from a catcher's uh, always got value. But I think the catching pool is thickened up enough where I don't know that I want to spend that high of a pick on a catcher. I think I'd rather get JTL Ramuto like two rounds later or get a William Contreras later. So I, I tend to agree with you. 
Mike, who's your most overvalued hitter at the current ADP? Uh, Esther Ruiz. Uh, I, I great speed, obviously. And you know, if you're in a mono or really deep league, it's it's a different calculus because you know having an outfielder who's going to steal 50 bases, even as a part timer, is great. Uh, but in any other format, he's just really difficult to roster. Uh, he presents a lot of the challenges that I've heard talked about with like Luisa Rise, who who's going later. Uh, and I, I worry he's going to lose his job. He, like, he won't even be a full timer. Um, I've heard him compared to Billy Hamilton. And the thing is, like, yeah, I, I get that. But Billy Hamilton was stealing, you know, 50, 60 bases for a couple of years there when nobody was running. There's, there's just so many steals to be had and so many ways to put your roster together that you don't need Estre Ruiz to, to make it work. I'm not saying I wouldn't draft him. Like, I, I would probably take him outside the top 200, like in, in that area, like right after that. But that's not where he's going. It means I won't get him anywhere. I'm, I'm fine with that. I, I just feel like he's he's kind of a poison pill for for your roster if you you take him where he's going. Yeah, I I, I tend to agree with you. I don't know if he's going to lose his job, but he's such a negative in so many categories that uh, you know one of the great things about Billy Hamilton is he could individually win you that category, right? But if you lost him, all of a sudden, not only were you already at a negative in the other categories you now had no way of compiling this 50 or 60 stolen bases you had penciled in from Billy Hamilton. I think the same can be said for Ashford Ruiz, where if something happens to him, how are you finding 50, 60, 70 stolen bases on the wire? I don't care if you're in a 10-team league. That's really hard to do from one roster spot. Uh, and so I tend to like to build a little bit more balanced. Uh, so I will not be taking Ashford Ruiz at his ADP either. Daniel, what about you? Well, I can't lie. Jamie kind of stole the guy I was going to talk about, too. Uh, those of you who interact with any of my content on Twitter know that I'm a massive Orioles fan. So this might come as a bit of a surprise. I was going to talk about Adley also. Uh, just the fact that, you know, he's going to play five, six days a week at catcher and DH kind of is what makes him exciting. But I thought a lot of the premier price people are paying don't exactly translate to Roto. Like he handles the pitching staff well. Um, he comes with big prospect pedigree, but I don't know necessarily what separates him from those other guys like Jamie was talking about. So I'll pivot. I'll talk about someone else. Uh, I wanted to get a little bit controversial talking about overvalued guys, maybe pick someone going pretty high. So I wanted to talk about Royce Lewis just because the pick value is pretty high right now. Um, I know that he was absolutely outstanding in his limited uh, showing that we saw last year and in the playoffs, he was unbelievable. But the injury risk has been there. The sample size is not quite there. His ADP right now on NFC is 49. So you're valuing him now at a early fourth round pick. He's going as third base six. And I just think I haven't even seen him play half a season yet. So for me to put that much trust in him, I, I understand the talents there. And I think he's absolutely a top 100 player. But 49 just feels very risky to me. I'm not going to lie. It does, but I, I understand why everybody is making the jump into it. And I have too. So, like, I can't, like, sit here and be like, like, oh, don't draft Royce Lewis. I've drafted Royce Lewis because on a per plate appearance basis, it seems like that is a really tantalizing option. But I think you're kind of right. And I know that, like, when my big money drafts comes around next month, uh, I will not, probably not be getting Royce Lewis at cost. Can I ask my that, Justin? Um, yeah. I don't necessarily dislike Lewis, but my issue is more there's a few third basemen I like better at their ADP, and this is part of what this discussion's about. Like people are fading Manny Machado right now because they're concerned about his injury. I like Alex Bregman for the stability. I, there's just a few players I'd, I'd kind of rather have. Like it, like last year when third base was a little bit weaker, I could kind of see this. Right now I look at it like, well, he really needs to hit on a lot of his upside or run more, which maybe he'll do to, to get there. So, yeah, Daniel, I'm, I'm kind of with you where I don't even have any against his ADP. I just don't want him there because of the third baseman who are also available. Yeah, I think that's a really, really good point. And, you know, I, I was uh, talking on uh, Bubba's, uh, he was doing an auction last night and did a live stream for it, raising money for Potapalooza at the same time. So I appreciate him. Shout out. He couldn't be here this weekend, so he wanted to do something. But we were kind of talking about the depth at every position this year. And my assertion is that 
there isn't a shallow position like there's been in years past. Like I don't look at every position or any position and go, oh man, I really need to take a guy in the first three or four rounds at this position because it drops off so much uh, later. But there are sharp declines in tiers, right? Like are there sharp distinctions between tiers? Uh, and so just be smart about like, hey, why take Royce Lewis if I really like this guy later? Uh, you know, just make sure you bump up that later guy around or two. So that way you make sure you get him because you don't want to fall victim to those sharp declines in the ADP. All right. Uh, who's the most overvalued pitcher in the ADP right now, Daniel? All right. Again, I wanted to pick a guy who's a little bit controversial going high. Um, so the guy that I'm choosing to talk about today is from Valdez. His current NFC ADP is 63, ESPN's 34, and Yahoo is 60. Uh, we all know last year was kind of a tale of two halves for Fromber. After the All-Star break, he was not good. He had a 4-6 ERA, including a no-hitter. Not that we can, you know, discount the no-hitter or anything, but 4-6 in 87 innings uh, in the second half was pretty rough. Uh, he's not a gaudy strikeout guy, and he doesn't have a triple-digit fastball that you can bank on. I think a lot of his value kind of comes with his reliability. Uh, he was giving up a lot of hard contact, and he was kind of towards the bottom of the league in a lot of those metrics, like I think average exit velocity, um, that sort of thing. He cut his walk rate a little bit. Uh, I just feel like it's a little risky to pick him as a possible staff ace if you waited on pitching. Uh, when you really can't bank on strikeouts, and I feel like where he's going now, you are kind of like Jamie said, looking at more of his 80th percentile outcome, picking him at that spot. Because if things go a little more south, then what what are you ultimately looking for him to even improve on that value from there? I I think that's kind of a bold take there, Daniel. I I, I tend to disagree with it just because of the floor. But I think one of the things you said kind of really um, hammers in a point that I don't think has been made quite yet uh, that we should definitely uh, remember. ADP is relative to every site you're on, right? Daniel just said different ADPs from different sites. So make sure you know what the ADP is for the site you're playing on. If you're going and playing on ESPN, don't care as much about the NFBC ADP, right? We And we as an industry, talk about the NFBC ADP because it's so robust so early um, and because people are playing on NFBC or putting money in. But that doesn't necessarily translate great to ESPN. It, does, it definitely doesn't translate great to Yahoo, uh, who has different uh, position eligibility requirements and different uh, roster construction requirements. And most NFBC leagues are 15-team leagues. Most Yahoo leagues and ESPN leagues are 10 team leagues. So just be careful about the ADP. Jamie, what are your thoughts on the most overvalued pitcher right now? This isn't based on talent. It's just it is what I think will happen this season. And that's uh, Yuri Perez going around pick 80. Uh, you know, his underlying numbers suggest his ERA should have been nearer to four than it actually was last year. He's Got great strikeout numbers, but again, how, how many innings is he going to pitch? Is he going to be able to get more than 150 strikeouts? And sometimes we lose sight of the fact that, you know, it's an accumulation of stats. So, you know, he might get a load of strikeouts in 120 innings. He's still only getting 150 at the end of the season. I don't see the Marlins helping him get double-digit wins. And, you know, he's 20 years old. He's still learning. He's going to be capped. And I'm just not comfortable taking him at his low-end SP2, which is roughly where he's going. If anything, I'd rather wait until 10 rounds later and get someone like Braxton Garrett, his teammate. I just don't see any value with Yuri Perez unless he pitches magically 180 innings this year, which is just not going to happen. So Perez, as much as I love the talent, he's just not someone I'm going to be rostering where he's going at the moment. You guys are killing me. You guys are hurting my heart now. I was loving your guys' picks for hitters, hating them for pitchers. I love Yuri Perez. I can see the downside, though, and I don't know if the ADP completely reflects the downside. He fell apart in the second half, and as much as you can kind of be like, well, he's young, and you know, he'd never thrown that many innings. He got sent down, came back up. Like All those things can still apply in 2024, so I understand the downside. I do think he probably is a little bit overvalued. 
uh, based on the ADP uh, as well. I still love him, though, because, man, if everything does come together and we see 170 innings, maybe a top 15 pitcher in baseball, uh, you know, from just talent alone. Mike, where are you at? Who is the most overvalued pitcher in, in fantasy? So mine's a little bit lower on ADP, and for me, it's Chris Sale. Um, now, I'm just going off of NFBC, and, and I pulled off a of draft champions. I have, I think he's at about 132. I know that varies depending on the dates. I, I'm seeing it's, it's usual spring training stuff. I'm seeing, oh, he, he looks great. You know, he feels great. But then it's like he hasn't been good in five years. Or he hasn't been good and healthy altogether in five years. And, and I get it. it. It's not within the top 100. I just feel there's so many pitchers in this value bet you can get who have like more reliability or more of a health history. I, I It's kind of similar to Ruiz where I wouldn't mind taking sale later. I just don't like him here for somebody who just could really – like you're probably looking for an SB three or four at this point in the draft. You could get nothing. Like you just could get completely, you know, absolutely nothing from Chris sale. I've heard some people say, Oh, he's going to Atlanta. They could work, you know, miracles with him. They're, they're a great franchise and they certainly are. But the other side of that is they could do what the Dodgers are going to do with a lot of their pitchers and, and really just kind of save them for the postseason. you know, use them sporadically. And unless you're in a league with like very liberal IL rules, I don't know how much that helps you. Like if you're in an overall component like NFBC, I don't know if sales, a guy you want to just have hanging there on your reserve list, like on and off all year. So he's a guy I'm fading. I'm, I'm sure I won't have him on any of my teams this year. I think that's a really good point. Be smart depending on your league format, right? And every league format's a little bit different. If you're playing on NFBC, there are no IL spots playing on Yahoo. You might have three or five or in ESPN, you might have three or five. I don't like to invite injury risk on my team. And, you know, as much as I love Chris Sale, and I do think that he is usually pretty good when he pitches, he just hasn't been able to stay on the mound a ton. And so I might take the gamble here and there just because I have loved him in the past, but he's probably not someone I want to invite on my team unless I have, like, Tout Wars and Labor both use unlimited IL. I don't know how many leagues do that, but uh, regular leagues do that. But in those kind of leagues, sure, I'll take the gamble because yeah. I can stash him and go pick someone else up. But in most formats, eh, that is kind of a risk. Yeah, I, you know, la labor, which I just did, d does that too. And, you know, I, I took Shane Boz there. And that was the reason I took him because I'm like, honestly, it's unlimited IL and, you know, I can stash him. And if he gives me 80 to 100 great innings where I got him, that's that's fine. Are you worried on Shane Boz uh, at all that they don't put him on the IL and they just send him to extended spring training? Yeah, a little bit, um, you know, and it, but again, given that's where the liberal rules still do help because it's a limited IL, I don't mind using a reserve slot. It is when it's limited and combined with that where I'd be a little more reluctant. Uh, yeah, because that that scares me a little bit. I know how many I mean, I used to play in an old school ale only. It was four by four and then turned to five by five. Uh, but we had a rule. You couldn't draft any minor league players. Right. In yeah. every year, some guy got sent to extended spring training and they called him a minor leaguer and you're like no he's really a major leaguer and they're like rules are rules and you lose the guy and so i i have uh ptsd from those days i, I kind of i hear you i'm still that. i'm still in a league like that so i i hear you uh i i am shocked absolutely shocked that nobody named the guy that is just the top of my list so even though i'm hosting and i'm not really giving my own picks necessarily i'm throwing out tyler glass now Tyler Glass, now, I understand that he's going to the Dodgers and the Dodgers can do no wrong, but Tyler Glass now has never thrown over 120 innings at the major league level in a single season. He has never been a top 30 pitcher in, in fantasy baseball in a single season, and he is currently going off the board as the 11th starting pitcher on NFBC, and I, as we start moving into spring training and we start seeing him pitch – He's going to move up higher. Um, I, I just can't rationalize spending a top 50 pick on a guy that I don't think can throw 130 innings to major level, even though those innings are elite on a per inning basis. Uh, I think it's a huge mistake. I say it every year and it seems like every year I'm right. Yeah, but you know, the thing there is it's elite, but I, I look at him and I agree with you. I look at him like, it, it's like, what if I could get Jacob deGrom without that level of track record ever, like of innings and quality and take him almost as high as deGrom was going last year? It, it, that's what I, yeah, I, I agree with you. It just seems like a disaster 
in the making. Like he's never pitched a level, at least with DeGrom. You're like, well, I get it. Like if everything comes together and he gives me 130, 140 innings, he could be like the number one starter. I just don't see that with Glassnow. Yeah, I think I mean, we sometimes forget. So just gonna say he does he hasn't pitched that innings himself, and Dodgers starters don't get the huge workloads. They do try and keep them, you know, ready for the postseason. So if he's already hit 120, 140 innings, you know, come late August, how much are they going to use him in September as well? So even if he does stay relatively healthy, I think the Dodgers are going to look to nurse him through the end of the season to get to the playoffs anyway. Especially because they have other guys they've got to nurse as well, right? Like, you know, they've got Yamamoto, who's never pitched uh, in the major leagues. They're probably going to want to, you know, they're going to keep this six-day or six-man rotation in order to limit innings. Bobby Miller's really young. Uh, I mean, other guys have injury issues. Kershaw, if and when, or if and well, he will come back at some point. But like, they've got all these guys they've got to kind of maintain, and everybody's going to. James Paxton has never been able to stay healthy. Like, I, I get wishing and hoping on a star that a guy is going to throw 180 innings, but we don't even know what 180 innings of glass now looks like. Can he keep the level of effectiveness that late into a season when he's never been able to do it? And I think I, I made this point the other day talking to Paul. I think people forget that Tyler Glass now pitched for years in Pittsburgh. This isn't a guy who's like, oh, he's only been around for three or four years. This is like his ninth season in Major League Baseball, never crossed over to like 120 plus innings. Like what makes us think it's going to happen this year? I just, if it does and I'm wrong, you know what? I'll eat it. But I haven't been wrong the last eight years. So I'm, I'm going to kind of go by the history of it. All right, let's... uh. We're going to go to go into uh, picking our most undervalued and overvalued at each position. Uh, we'll start with catcher, even though uh, I think Daniel and Jamie have already given the catcher. So why don't we start with Mike on catcher? Mike, who is your most undervalued and overvalued at the catcher position? So undervalued, just because I think there's potential for more playing time, despite the current depth charts, is Ryan Jeffers. Uh, he was really great last year. Now, some of that was Babbitt fueled, and, and Robert Orr at, at Baseball Perspectives had a great you know piece talking about Pakoda and the hitters that didn't like. And Jeffers was one of those hitters. I do agree that he's not going to do what he did last year, but I, I can still see like a 750, 800 OPS, and I think he'll play more. The team is making all the right noises uh, about you know, splitting the, the time there, but I think Jeffers is eventually going to you know take that time away. And if he does, you know, 20 home runs, you know, some good like production in that lineup, average won't kill you. That's kind of what I see from Jeffers. And you know, based on where he's going right now, which I think is around like 250 ADP. I think he's a tidy little bargain, but if you don't want to spend up on catchers because they're going a little higher this year. So since everyone said Rushman, I'm, I'm going to give my hot take here on, on a hitter I'm wary of. It's not that I don't like him, but that's JT Real Muto. He had his worst season offensively going all the way back to his rookie year. Yes, he runs. Yes, it's important to catcher. But because of the stolen base context, because there were about a thousand or, or whatever it was, more stolen bases league wide, I don't think those 10 to 15 steals are as important as they were. And some of those factors into Real Muto's age, like he's not necessarily going to fall off the cliff, but we've seen this with a lot of catchers. Like we've seen them kind of, you know, just suddenly take a decline. So I have nothing against him as a player. I think he's a good player. He handles the staff well. He he's somebody that the Phillies are, are you know good to have. But for fantasy, I just really don't want to pay up for for some th things I see there where it's like, well, he could be a below average hitting catcher, you know, in twenty twenty four, and it just wouldn't surprise me. I mean, I couldn't disagree with you more on Real Muto. I love Real Muto. Twenty sixteen in your worst season. Yes, the skills are starting to decline. He is getting older. He's thirty two. Going to be thirty three this year. But, like, getting that all-around, like, five-category production from your catcher position, I just think is so valuable. I understand if you don't want to pay for it because there are other guys going later, uh, you know, especially, like I said, the thickening up of the position. But, man, I love Rumoto. I, I still can't quit him. All right, Daniel, you already said Rushman is the guy you uh, dislike the most uh, at their ADP. Uh, who's the guy you like the most at the ADP? I think the guy that most stands out to me right now is probably uh, Mitch Garver, who's moved on to greener pastures in Seattle. Mitch Garver, sleepy, had an awesome season last year. Uh, he had an OPS, I think, north of 850. He hit 
around 20 home runs. Um, and with Cal Raleigh in the mix at Seattle, he figures to get a good amount of DH at bats also. So he should have a solid amount of playing time where he'll be off his legs because I know he's a little bit older. He hits the ball hard, and he's a pretty disciplined hitter. He's, he's a good, solid veteran presence in that Seattle lineup. And he's not necessarily a short thing. It's not like Mitch Garver has always been a stud catcher, but he looks like a guy who's going to provide you with solid power stats at that value. And I think that as maybe a high second catcher, if you really, really waited and catcher just didn't work out for you, he's a guy that has some potential to put up respectable fantasy stats at the catcher position. I love catchers who aren't going to catch, who are going to play a different position full time because you can just rack up plate appearances. And Garver's only issue has really been he just can't stay healthy. Maybe the DH can do that, but I, I, I completely agree. With you. I love Garver at his price right now. Jamie, who is your guy that you like the most at the catcher position? The guy I like the most is Wilson Contreras. Um, going at what the eighth catcher, and I said, put only two catcher. Leagues in the NFBC, but around 140, one catcher leagues, he's going about 160, 180. You know, he had his actually had his best offensive year since 2019 last year. Only Sean Murphy put up a better WRC plus than Contreras last year. And that was obviously on a struggling Cardinals team. He had some obviously issues handling the staff at the start of the year. Cardinals were a bit of a dysfunctional mess last year, and yet he still put up solid numbers at the position. The Cardinals have invested a lot in him, so they're going to play him. They're not going to do anything about that. He, he is going to be a regular catcher. The plate appearances are going to be there. And like I said, he, he put up solid numbers, and yet he seems to have be bumped down ADP this year compared to previous years. So at his current price, I'm perfectly happy skipping on the first five or six catches going and then just jumping on Contreras where he is. I love steady Eddie guys, and I feel like – Wilson Contreras is that steady Eddie guy who's like perpetually underrated every single season. Like everybody kind of just, ah, he's boring. I'm going to push him down, but I'll take boring production and catcher because it doesn't hurt you. Like I don't want my catcher to hurt you. And every year people draft catchers that are like, Ooh, look at the upside. Look at, if I was going to be picking one, uh, an overvalued catcher, be Francisco Alvarez. Like, like he could legitimately destroy your batting average. Yes, you're probably going to get power, but he also could be in the minor leagues at some point if he can't make contact. Like, give me the steady Eddie guy in Wilson Contreras. I'm surprised nobody mentioned my boy Jonah Hine. Jonah Hine going as a 15th catcher off the board right now. Uh, he was the number one catcher in fantasy before getting hurt. Yes, he struggled after coming back, but he had a, a messed up wrist that he needed surgery on and played through it. He's going to be healthy coming into the season. He's going to be the full-time guy back there. I love Jonah Hine this year uh, going off as a 15th catcher off the board right now. Uh, let's move on over to first base. Jamie, who's the first baseman you think is the most overvalued and the most undervalued? Uh, I'll start with the most undervalued, and it's a bit of a homer pick, but I'm going with Anthony Rizzo because you know he was absolutely brilliant last season until he went to San Diego and nearly had his head knocked off. You know, he was on course for 30 homers. He was hitting 300, which, you know, he's not going to do again, but he was on course to repeat his 2020 season pretty much. Then had to play weeks and weeks with a concussion, could barely hit the ball and couldn't even see it. Bowl accounts, it was a complete mess up from the Yankees medical staff. Um, and he's now finding himself going barely inside the top 300. You know, he's going to hit behind Judge and Soto and ahead of Glaber Torres. There's not many better first baseman situations than that. So by all accounts, he's over the concussion issues. He could have come back at the end of last season, but the Yankees played it careful and didn't really need to bring him in. So I don't see why Rizzo's going so deep. First base is pretty stacked, but again, unless I'm getting one of the top guys, an Olsen, a Freeman, I'm probably just going to sit, wait, and look at someone like Rizzo in the, the, the late 200s to put, put in at first base. Love that call. I love Rizzo this year. I completely agree with you. What about your most overvalued at first? He's not someone I hate, but uh, Tristan Casas uh, around pick 100. Uh, you know, he's, I'm not saying he's going to be bad, but how much is he going to be rolled out there against left handed pitching? He can hit it, but his batting average was a bit of a drag. And if we again look at comparisons and look at players who've got similar projections and who I think are going to hit 
about, about similar. He's going to have similar numbers to Reese Hoskins, who's going 100 picks later. So I think you're paying for the upside quite a lot, and he's got to hit his ceiling to provide value where he is. He could easily go and hit 40, 45 home runs, but I just don't see it, especially right now. I still think he's developing a year or two's time. He will probably be around that 100 pick, and I'll be fine with it. But for this season, I just it's just a little bit too gaudy for me. I completely agree with you. I think you nailed these. These would, would have been probably the two guys I would have gone with as well. I don't know what Tristan Casas is. The first half, he was awful, but the underlying numbers said he was going to be so much better. I, I was touting him as like a second half like guy that you wanted to buy low on. He did it in the second half. He was fantastic, but the underlying numbers say he shouldn't have been. He should have been bad. So like, I don't know who Tristan Casas is. I don't know if Tristan Casas knows who Tristan Cassis is. When he looks in the mirror, he's probably very confused because I'm confused looking at him. So uh, I'm, I'm with you on that. Uh, Daniel, who is your most overvalued and undervalued at first base? Sure. And Tristan Cassis knows. He let the Red Sox know he wants that extension. He's like, I don't know who I am, but I know I want you to pay me. <laughs> um, so as far as overvalued at first, I thought it was kind of hard because I don't think there's anybody going in like that top 10 to 12 range that I necessarily hate or am avidly against. The guy I kind of landed on that I don't really see myself ending up with was Spencer Steer. He obviously had a, a very solid rookie season, a uh, good OPS, a little bit of power speed combo. Uh, he doesn't really hit the ball super hard as far as like comparing to the rest of the league goes. So he might be a bit of a uh, great American ballpark merchant, which is not necessarily a bad thing for him. He can't change the fact that he plays at his home park. Um, but it's a crowded infield. He's going to be bouncing around, which is good for his fantasy value. But I just don't know if I'm super confident in the fact that he's a top 100-ish guy. Um, and then as far as my undervalued guy, I like Vinny Pasquantino. I think going around pick 170, you're getting a huge bargain on what you were paying for last year for Vinny Pasquantino. Uh, he obviously had the shoulder injury in June. And he had a little bit worse batted ball luck, which I think is why his batting average and his home runs fell off a little bit. But I'm willing to take the big discount and hope that he bounces back. And I think his 2024 will hopefully be somewhere between his 2022 and 2023 season, maybe even hopefully closer to his 2022. I'm a big fan of Vinny P. So uh, I'm right there with you on Vinny P. I don't know if I buy your, your Spencer Steer argument. I, I know he's not going to get the, the 665 plate appearances he had in 2023. Uh, the team is just too loaded, but and triple eligible. Uh, he's going to, he can play in a lot of different spots. Like I think he's going to volume his way to, into being useful. Maybe there's a little step back, but man, I love that triple eligibility. I don't necessarily hate him. He was just kind of the guy I landed on. I don't really hate any of the first baseman going early in drafts. I think that's fair. Uh, Mike, who's your most overvalued and undervalued first baseman? Well, I'll say like Daniel, I had a really hard time picking somebody like overvalued because I, I love the position. Like almost everybody here, like I either think they're fine at their price or they're bargains. Um, so if you had to twist my arm, the guy I don't like, and this is just an ADP call. I like the player is, is Yandy Diaz. The, the power just is kind of all over the place. I'm not convinced he's going to hit 22 home runs. And if he only hits 15 home runs, we're sort of back to the Luisa rise argument. Like I've heard a lot of like, you know, don't take a rise. He's, he hurts you everywhere else except for average. Diaz is close to that. He's not quite the same and he's, he's more expensive than a rise. So I'm fine taking him. It's just, if you do take him, you, and he doesn't hit over 20 home runs again, you're really, you know, maybe putting yourself into a box in power. Now, again, this is not a real life argument. In real life, he's he's a great hitter. You know, the Rays know what they're doing. This is this is a fantasy argument. I'm not knocking him as a player. Um, if I had to pick a name here of someone I like, it, it's sort of a boring, like he's getting faded too far, even though I don't like the context and situation. Uh, it's Andrew Vaughn. Yes, I know he he's disappointing. He's not going to live up to his prospect pedigree. Uh, he's on a, a terrible like team in terms of developing. But at this point, I think you're looking at like a boring like 20 to 25 home runs from him. Um, average won't really kill you. I think he's kind of fine where he's going ADP, which is around 240. Um, Vaughn's a guy I'll probably be, you know, just scooping up in that range if I need a corner. I don't oversell him, but it, just based on price, I, I like Vaughn where he's going. 
Yeah, I don't mind Vaughn at all. Um, he's one of those guys that uh, I've always had kind of an affinity for because he he like he went to high school um, and played high school ball like within walking distance of my house. My wife works with his dad, uh, and he's a genuinely really really good dude that I kind of root for. I do worry he's had a little bit of back trouble, and he just never seemed to kind of deliver on the promise of his prospect pedigree. But I think sometimes we over rate that in fantasy like you know like yes a guy didn't turn into a superstar but he's still a really useful player uh that's gonna play every day in a good park so i'm kind of i'm kind of with you on vaughn right there and i'm also with you on yandy i think yandy is uh a little bit overrated at his current adp as well mike why don't you kick off second base and tell me who your second basemen are that are undervalued and overvalued well, I mentioned him at the top of the show, and you know, I, I know. Speaking of back issues, I know he has them, but I, I love Nolan Gorman. Uh, I, I really see there's so much power potential here. Uh, it's not difficult to see him hitting 30 home runs, and and really the the optimistic is 40. I'm not going to go, you know, like too too far afield with that, but you know, if he gets the playing time, the power's there. Yes, he's a bit of an average drain. I also think the Cardinals are going to be better this year, which should prop up his his runs on RBI. The other concern I've heard about him is, you know, against lefties and he might platoon. I look at the bench, though, in that lineup, and I don't really see it. I think if he's healthy, he's going to play. Yes, he'll get rested once in a while. Uh, but I, I really like Gorman where, where he's going, you know, just, just because he's going right around pick 200. It's not like you really need to stretch for him, you know, to, to add him. Um, the player I, I don't like, and this this again is just more of an ADP thing, is is Nico Horner. He's so much is wrapped up in one category. This is not a Ruiz argument. He he's got other things going for him, but the pick is far far enough inside the top 100 that there's other players I'd rather take. Um, and unlike a CJ Abrams who who has the really high steel ceiling. I think this is pretty much what you're getting from Horner in terms of the steals. So yeah, I, I if you want to do it, it's fine. I know some it's just a matter of how you like to build your team. I just don't like to build my team that way where I'm wrapping up so much of an early pick into what's mostly, you know, and I know he hits for average, but mostly a one category player. Oh man, again, breaking my heart with Nico Horner hate. I love Nico Horner. I understand your argument. I love guys who put the bat on the ball and i mean he was third best in zone contact in uh in 2023 uh he hits at the top of what should still be a pretty good lineup um i assume they're gonna get cody bellinger back at some point but who knows what happens with those unsigned guys because it's crazy that we're on february 24th and guys are still unsigned um i, I get why why you dislike him but i think he is more than a one category player but he's not a five category player. There's not much power, power in, in the bat. RBI is maybe an issue as well. So uh, I get it. I, I still think it's a fine ADP personally. Uh, Daniel, what about you? Undervalued, overvalued at second base? I resonated with a lot of what Mike said about Nico Horner as an overvalued player, just because for me personally, I don't like to limit my power potential that much that early in the draft. Um, I think stolen bases have never been easier to find than they are now seemingly because of the bigger bases. So I think there's some guys that I have my eye on going later in drafts that I would like to scoop up for steals and get a guy with more power potential in those early 60 picks, like my fourth round pick in NFC. That's a huge spot, pivotal for determining your team's counting stats and stuff. So obviously the average in the stolen bases floor is good, but Pretty much everything that Mike said, I agreed with on Horner. I don't see myself touching him very much. As far as uh, undervalued, a guy that I'm really, really excited about personally is Edward Julian. Uh, dude hits the ball hard, real hard. And I'm very excited to see what he does in his second season of uh, playing. His only drawback was the strikeouts, and he was whiffing a lot. But he walked at a super elite rate. So I, kinda, I saw this a little bit with Gunnar Henderson last year when he came up in April, that he was watching a lot of pitches out of the zone, but was kind of struggling to connect with those ones in the zone consistently. But since he was hitting the ball so hard, it eventually kind of just came around for him and the strikeouts dropped and he boomed. And I don't, I think that that's kind of a similar situation that Julian's in because his savant page is gorgeous other than the fact that he whiffs and strikes out a good amount. And that's something I'm willing to buy because if he can hit the ball hard and he gets walks, I think that guy is going to be a productive player. So I definitely am looking to roster him around pick 200. Um, I, I don't want to actually clap hard and, and uh, hurt people's ears, but man, I love that call. I love me some Edward Julian this year. 
Uh, Jamie, give me your undervalued, overvalued at second base. Uh, undervalued first pick was Nolan Gorman, and second pick was Julian, so that's me out. Um, I will say, obviously, echoing what Mike said, especially on Gorman about the injury risk, but he played 120 games last year and hit 27 homers. So even if that's all you get this year, I'm fine finding a second baseman, middle infielder, off of waivers to plug in for 40 games, add a few more home runs in. You're getting 30 combined homers potentially out of those two players. So at his ADP, he's a, he's a great risk. To, he's not even really a risk. It's just a great position for him. And overrated, it, there wasn't many that really stand out, but I'm a little apprehensive where he's going is uh, Haas Young King. Um, again, I, I like him. I like him to play assist. When I do my projections, and a lot of the projection systems seem to have the same sort of thing where he's around the same Bryson Stott, Andres Jimenez, Tommy Edmund types. And they're, you know, they're going 20 to 50 picks later than him. So, again, if we're just looking at a straight-up comparison, yeah, he might get a few more stolen bases than those guys, but he's going to be a bit more of a batting average drain than those. So it's a bit of a, you know, what you need at that point in the draft. But I'm happier. He's got the eligibility at different positions, yeah. But if you're taking that away from him, his ADP is just a little bit too high for me. Why don't you go ahead and run it back for shortstop there, Jamie? Shortstop um, for... Undervalued, my favourite guy, and I was all in him last year, so it broke my heart, but I'm going with O'Neill Cruz. Uh, he, I feel like he was Ellie Dela Cruz before Ellie Dela Cruz was Ellie Dela Cruz. You know, he was the ultimate power, speedster, dynamic. He's going to play every day because, you know, what else are the Pirates going to do? And obviously, you know, major ankle injury is a bit of a concern and a red flag, but as, 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 assuming he's showing good health in spring and he's not having any setbacks with it and he's you know, he's able to play without any restrictions. I can easily see him being a star going next year, going in the second round if he does produce what we was hoping he would last year. So O'Neill Cruz is my undervalued play at short. And overvalued, there's not a huge amount. I dislike there's so many in the top 100 this year. I think there's like 12, 13 shortstop eligible players going in, in there. And again, I love the player, but I'm bit apprehensive about taking Gunnar Henderson where he's going. Um, you're basically getting another version of Bo Bichette who's going later at third base. You, you know, you're getting Alex Bregman, similar numbers with more steals. So there's so many comparable players that have, again, similar projections for me for what I've got for Henderson going later that I've just, I feel like, again, you're playing for the, the, the upside that we could see, but I'm not happy going late second, early third round at Henderson at the moment. Yeah, I think the only uh, only qualm I have with either of those two uh, is I think if O'Neill Cruz hits like a few spring bombs, his price is going to go through the roof. Like I think people are going to start really pushing him up. Uh, right now, I think the ADP is fine where it's at, but it's gonna it's gonna skyrocket here if uh, he has a big spring, especially showing that health. Uh, Daniel, shortstop, undervalued or valued? Uh, my overvalued shortstop is more of a middle infield guy. I've been a little apprehensive about Matt McLean. Um, I know him and Horner are both middle infield eligible at both spots. Kind of just a hit over power guy. Um, so we're going to need a good batting average and a lot of steals probably out of him, I think. I, I don't think he would hit 25 home runs this year probably. Playing in Great American Ballpark, he might. Uh, he's just a guy that I haven't really seen myself picking up a lot this year at his price. Um, I know that he got that injury. I was kind of feeling that way even before that. So this injury, if it limits him even more, um, that could even further that. But maybe make him drop a little bit as well. So we'll see. Uh, he's just a guy I haven't been finding myself drafting much. As far as undervalued shortstops, I thought there were a good amount. The guy that I kind of landed on to talk about was Correa, just because I thought he was injured a lot last year. And it couldn't have been easy playing through plantar fasciitis the whole year. He came back in the playoffs and played pretty well. So I'd like to think around pick 250, that's a reasonable spot to just take a flyer on a guy who's overall been very productive as far as like WRC plus and putting up a solid OPS and stuff. So I haven't been a big Correa buyer in the past when his price has been high, but I think I could convince myself to get back in at a price that low. All right. I completely disagree with both guys, but we're running low on time and I want to get to uh, as many positions as we can. So Mike, I'm going to throw it to you. Undervalued, overvalued at shortstop. 
Um, so shortstop undervalued, I had Correa. So I'm going to go with my second choice. who's a similar player going a little bit higher, and that's Willie Adamas. Um, Adamas has the health history going for him. He kind of went from being like lucky Babbitt to unlucky. I think the skills are a 240 hitter, but the power is legitimate. Um, you know, it's a walk year. You know, I know Eno Saris and, and Derek Van Riper on Rates and Barrels have talked about Eno in particular, how players run more in their walk year. So, you know, Adamas kicking in 10 to 12 steals and boosting his value really wouldn't surprise me. I just think he's a nice pick and there's trade rumors with him, but if he gets traded, he might go to the Dodgers and wind up being their starting shortstop. He's not going to a second division team where the runs and the RBI are going to drop. Those would only go up. So I like Adamas kind of just going, you know, just inside the top 200. Um, as far as avoid, look, I, I know this is a cliche, but Ellie de la Cruz, I, I just don't want any thing to do with him in the second round extremely talented player he's going to be great someday i just don't want to you know pay a second round price to find out this year that he's not going to be even if he steals 70 bases which he could there's so much other potential ugliness that that could happen with him i i it's too early in the draft if i could take him in the third i i'd certainly do it i just don't want to use a second round pick in a 15 team league where there's so many needs that i have there and I, I just the, the bust potential for me at that slot is is too high. I'm shocked it took 50 minutes for someone to say Ellie the Eclipse's name as overvalued because I'm right there with you. Um, all right, Mike, why don't you run it back for third base? Um, third base, uh, my pick here, and like I said, there's a few names I like, but I like Alex Bregman. Um, I know he's a boring pick, but he's going to play. He's except for one injury in 2021, he's super healthy. He stays on the field. Great lineup, so you're looking at a lot of runs and RBI. Runs in particular is just such an underrated category. Yes, he's not going to run, but with his ADP, it, it really um, doesn't matter. Um, as far as the third baseman to avoid, uh, my pick here was Spencer Steer. Um, but since he was mentioned before, I'm, I'm going to kind of like look for, for somebody else to talk about here. And I do apologize. I'm, I'm kind of looking for... Um, somebody on the fly, but I think the player I'm going to mention, even though his ADP is a little bit low, and I know some people love him, is Michael Garcia. Yes, I, I get it. He's going to steal a lot of bases. However, you know something I've heard said about him constantly is he hits the ball hard. He does, but the scouting profile on him is he doesn't really have a lot of lift. And I, I just feel like you're looking more to doubles hitter. He, the average could be really good because he hits the ball hard. But I've heard some people saying a power boost is coming. I, I just don't see it. So there's just some players I'd rather have there. There's also some mostly speed profiles I'd kind of rather get. And you know, outside of Bobby Witt and, and Pasquantino, as mentioned earlier, and you know, maybe a couple other players, I don't like the Royals contextually. So I, I steers the guy I'd really avoid here. But I was kind of pressed to to come up with a second choice, so I, I came up with Garcia. Oh, hurt my heart on that one. Uh, Jamie, who's your undervalued, overvalued guy at third base? Uh, overvalued, I had Royce Lewis, who we've covered, so I'll leave it at that again. I'm just not comfortable where he's going. Undervalued, I'm going with Max Munch Muncy. Um, you know, he hit 36 home runs last year with 200 combined runs and RBIs, and he's going 40 picks later than he did last year. So I don't really know what he's got to do to get the love. He's still on a great team. He's still going to hit, you know, in the heart of the order. Maybe a tiny homers a bit too often in front of him, so he's not getting as many RBI opportunities. But he, 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 the batting average is going to, you know, still drain a bit. But you, you, you're getting 30 plus home runs, you're getting 200 combined runs and RBIs, and he's going in a 160, 170 range. It's just too much value, I think, at that at that price tag. All right, Daniel, finish that on third base. I'll try and be quick because I know we're running out of time. I already discussed my apprehension for Lewis. I think he's the guy that's overvalued to me. Uh, undervalued, I was kind of looking at Michael Garcia just because personally I wasn't going to go for a, Her a Horner guy earlier for steals. So I think he's kind of a, an intriguing guy later in drafts to pick up some steals, and he's probably going to get some runs. So he's a guy that I'm looking at to maybe make up some ground in steals later. All right. Let's move on into the outfield. We got about six minutes left. So, uh, Daniel, kick us off with your outfielder, undervalued, overvalued. Overvalued guy is probably Springer for me, going around pick 115. He showed some signs of aging, even though he actually ended up having a pretty solid year. Um, I'm just a little worried about staying healthy, 
Um, and if the power is going to stay the same, I know he stole more bases last year, which was good, but I'm, I'm a little worried at that price. Don't see myself ending up with him much undervalued. I'm going to go with Jack Sawinski for a lot of similar reasons why I like Edward Julian. He hits the ball hard. Um, he strikes out a lot, but I think he walks a lot and hits the ball hard. And those are the kind of archetypes that I think could evolve into good fantasy players. So I'm willing to take the buy on him at around pick 230. I like that pick. Swinsky. Since he's guy I've never really liked, but I've kind of come around to. Uh, just, and he still goes cheap. Uh, Mike, what's your undervalued, overvalued at the or in the outfield? Well, we already talked about S3 Ruiz, and since we're running short on time, you know, he he's the overvalued. Um, undervalued, a lot of players here, but I'm going to go with Cedric Mullins. I mean, this is a guy who was being drafted like close to the top 50 last year, played through a groin injury most of the season, clearly wasn't right. I mean, never made excuses, but he just never looked quite right on the field. I I, I don't want to take him anywhere near where he, where he was going in 20, you know, 23. However, you know, a path to like a 2030 season, a great con context with the Orioles for runs on RBI. Uh, Mullins is a guy I can see scooping up a round or two earlier where he's going, which is like right around 150 right now. Speaking my language, loving Cedric Mullins. Uh, Jamie, what about you? Undervalued, overvalued in the outfield. I'll see the glint in your eye when he mentioned Cedric. Yeah. Estre um, Ruiz was my pick as overvalued because at that price, again, I don't want all my stolen eggs in one basket. So you're not going to replace what he gives to you off the waivers. Uh, you, you can get other guys around that pick. You can replicate a little bit better. So he was my overvalued. Uh, undervalued, I'm going to put two in here because they're the same sort of player with Dalton Varsho and MJ Melendez. I think there was way overpicked last year because they had catch eligibility. They've now lost that. They're still the same sort of players that they were going to be. You know, Bar Show, we're looking at 25 homers, 15 stolen bases on a good team. He's going to play every day because he's a good defender. And I think at his current price now, this is exactly what he should have been previous last year. Same for MJ Melendez. He's going just inside the top 300. He's still got the power. He's still going to put a pop. Yeah, obviously the Royals aren't going to help him too much. It's not a great ballpark to hit in, but it feels like we've just completely overvalued the pair last year and have just gone in completely the opposite direction this year and just chucked him into the dumpster fire. And I just don't, I just don't think that, that you know they, they should be discounted. I, I'm right there with you, especially on Varsha. Varsha has been my most drafted player this year. I think I've gotten him on every single team. I've drafted. I've already drafted eight teams this year. So love the Varsho call. Let's uh, let's move over to the pitching side. Uh, you guys talked about your starters already, um, but if you have another starter that you think is undervalued, overvalued, uh, go ahead and give them to me. And if you have a relief pitcher that's undervalued and overvalued, feel free to give them to me as well. J uh, Jamie, go ahead and uh, kick us off for this one. It's going to hurt. I'll wrap it up quite quick. It's a bit controversial, but overvalued. I'm saying George Kirby at pick 40. Again, I absolutely love the pitcher, but if I'm taking an SP1, I kind of want the strikeouts, which you're lacking a little bit with him. Okay, just a quick look at the numbers. He's there and thereabouts with Logan Webb. You can get 20 picks later. Logan Webb's got the better track record, obviously, long track record. He's got the, the volume, a greater volume. And I just, you know, I want strikeouts from that first pick. So unless he's putting up a free 3.2 ERA, you know, one one ten whip, I'm struggling to see Kirby as a like mid to late SP1. He's more an SP2 for me. So he's probably someone I'm going to avoid there. And undervalued, there's so many guys. Uh, I'd say I'm skipping the SPs. I'm going to go with Evan Phillips uh, relief. You know, I think he's in a great situation. Maybe the Dodgers will score too many runs, so he's not going to get the save opportunities. And I'm a little bit wary about that. But he's got elite stuff. He's had two fantastic years, and he seems to be sort of like lacking something to make him into that top three, top five uh, relief pitcher role. But that's exactly what I think he will be this year. All right. Mike, give me uh, undervalued or valued in the pitching departments. Um, we already talked about Chris Sale. I know we're just at time, so I'm just going to give you undervalued. Um, I, I gasped at the dra and labor when your podcast partner, Paul Sporer, took Christopher Sanchez. I love him. I was going to do, do a double tap there on the turn. Uh, really good stuff. I mean, good team context. Yes, I know the park is tough, but the way Sanchez pisses, pitches, um, 
He he suppresses hard contact. He keeps the ball on the ground. Um, the defense behind him maybe is my only concern, like a little bit. But yeah, I, I really like Sanchez as somebody going in that ADP range who could just deliver like a lot of value. I don't think you're going to be looking at him next year as like a top 100 guy, but I, I think he could just be somebody who's like more of a steady like SP3, SP4 in most formats. Go ahead and finish this out, Daniel. All right. Uh, I am apprehensive on Fromber for similar reasons why Jamie's apprehensive on Kirby. I think the guy I'm excited to draft his value is Brian Wu. I'm really excited to see what he does in year two. I want some shares of him for sure. Uh, around 190, I'm buying. All right. That's going to wrap up the first hour. I'm going to let you guys promote yourself a little bit before I boot you out of here unceremoniously. Daniel, remind everybody who you reached on social media and then plug everything you do. You can find me on Twitter at DRot underscore six. It's right below me right here on the ticker. Um, I'm writing for Sports Ethos. We have a draft guide coming out this week. I'll be talking about overvalued and undervalued players, some of which I mentioned. And I'll continue putting out pieces over the season about roster construction, who's hot, who's cold, that sort of thing. All right, Mike, tell us where you've reached and what you do. Mike Gianella at Blue Sky. That's just the name without the space there. And I'm at Baseball Prospectus. Um, I do ADP rankings. I do tier rankings. Um, and the other thing I'll plug just from the site in general, which is great, not just for fantasy. Um, if you haven't bought the Baseball Prospectus annual, please do so. Just so many awesome like co contributors in there, both for the comments and for the team essays. And then, Jamie, remind everybody where you can be reached and what you do. And also, you uh, are responsible for a prize we're giving away. So why don't you talk about that for a second? Yep. Uh, I can be reached at baseball underscore Jimbo and X underneath my chin. And I write uh, Roto Baller. Uh, and the prize we're giving away, the guy, the team in charge of the Roto Baller site, have kindly offered up a year's uh, premium pass, which includes all nine sports, uh, fantasy, DFS, betting, anything you could dream of. Um, so that's going to be one of the raffle prizes given up uh, tomorrow afternoon. All right. Uh, keep donating. Thank you, guys. I'm going to boot you all out so I can bring in the next crew. Uh, appreciate everybody coming on and talking fantasy baseball with me all weekend long. We've got a bunch of amazing panels, including bold predictions coming up next. But before we do, I want to remind everybody where – you can donate. Go to donorbox.org backslash TGFBI. It's down there on the ticker if you're watching live on YouTube. Every dollar you donate will get donated to Fantasy Gears, and every dollar you donate will get you entered in to win amazing raffle prizes like the one that Jamie just talked about. Uh, and we've also got jerseys. We've got bobbleheads. We've got more subscriptions to amazing sites. Books. Books like the Fantasy Black Book. From Joe Pisa Pia. How you doing, my friend? What's up, buddy? You look amazing. Can I just say, like, Thanks. you're looking svelte. You're looking very good. I I've see, lost like, 50 me... pounds. I know. I'm just saying, like, I'm staring yeah. at this screen. And although, like, we both have gotten a little grayer in the beard down here, I feel like a little less here. You, you yeah. look fantastic. Everybody, a, a round of applause for Justin Mason putting in the work. Put in the work, baby. Now it's not all just you smoking cigarettes and not eating anymore, right? Like that that's that's not the workout regime, is it? Uh that's part of the workout it's regime. Part of it. But okay. but I am also exercising. I've been a right. little lazier now that draft season has uh, come around. It's been much more difficult to get away from my computer and my microphone. So uh, but yeah, you know, just trying to take better care of myself and turn it 40 this year. Uh, I want to be around for at least another 40 years. So yeah. I like that. I like that. I'll, I want to be around for another 60 years. I want to go well past a hundred. Like I, I'm, I'm in for the long haul. I want the century mark. I want to do the whole thing, but this is great. Every year, Justin organizes this and everybody, you have no idea how much work it is to deal with everybody's nonsense and their schedule. So the fact that you take so much time to do this, shout out to you, shout out to everybody who's donating time today, but also everybody go make donations to fantasy cares dot org to go ahead and help out because that's what we're all here for today not just a little bit of baseball or a lot of bit of baseball i guess justin and shout out to my wife who allows me to do this um, well i was gonna say i think she's probably happy to get rid of you for two days that that's yes. more i feel like yeah it's like two days of freedom right tell her i said uh, tell daniel i said you're welcome uh, yeah that, exactly that, that's an order she, yeah. she's she's in the uh comment section right now so i'm sure <laughs> uh as she sends some love joe remind everybody where you can reach on social media and then plug everything that you do because you do uh, great work my friend god plug everything i do i don't think we have enough time in the hour uh 
First of all, uh, again, we're giving away a fantasy baseball black book 2024 edition. I'll also throw in the free cheat sheets too, just because, you know, I can. So go ahead and do that. Uh, if you subscribe to what's going on here, if you are donating, you are eligible to win that. Obviously, you can check us out at Fantasy Bros MLB YouTube channel, the Welsh and myself having fun every single day talking baseball. When the season starts, we start every day, Monday through Friday, live with the peanuts and the cracker jacks. We talk fantasy, we talk betting, we talk baseball. Baseball is fun at the end of the day. Let's not forget that. It's supposed to be a good time. And of course, you can see me on Sports Grid TV. I roll over fantasy pros, betting pros, and uh, Joe P's at PS17 on the X as well. So that's that's enough places. That's for damn sure. All right. We're also going to be joined by my boy, Ray Coon. How you doing, my friend? You're on mute. Uh, it would probably help to, take, to go off of mute. I'm doing good. Yeah. Happy to be <laughs> here again. Yeah, you. Remind everybody where you can reach on social media and talk about what you do. All right, I'm at Ray underscore Kuhn underscore 28, and you can find the majority of my work as part of the Fan Tracks Draft Guide, and I also contributed the divisional previews for the Dr. Roto's Draft Guide and AL West Player Capsules for Fantasy Alarm, and I do some work over there as well. Awesome. And you and I are going to start podcasting nope. together again at Friends of Fantasy Benefits. Looking forward to doing that, my friend. It's always great to see you. Uh, speaking of people I podcast with on a regular basis, we have Jason Collette. How you doing, my friend? What's up, guys? How are you? Doing well. Remind everybody where you reached and uh, what you do. I'm going to steal Jamie's line below my chin. That, that's where the uh, stuff, that's where you could find me uh, below my chin. And then I have the uh, weekly collect calls column at Rotowire and uh, Sundays uh, with you. Uh, but tomorrow we're recording this again. Uh, so uh, tomorrow's time slot will be that. Yeah, there you go. Always great to see you guys. We may have another person joining here in a little bit, but he's not here yet. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to turn things over to Joe. I'm going to let him lead things, and I'm going to go to the restroom. I might go get my uh, uh, eldest child Starbucks, and uh, I will be back uh, at the end of the hour. So you guys enjoy your hour talking bold predictions. Yes, bold predictions here on Potapalooza, and uh, it feels like Jason might be on a bit of a delay, which is going to be super fun for me. So uh, we'll see if we can clean that up. Uh, I'm not sure where he's broadcasting from somewhere in uh, South America, perhaps. You never know with Jason Collette. He is out and about in a lot of different places. Ray Coon from Fantrax, obviously, as well. I was looking at the original Lollapalooza lineup and looking at some of the bands. Uh, you know, uh, Ray, you're giving off the vibe of like a Henry Rollins band. I feel like, you know, a very serious looking face. He seems like he's ready to throw down any moment. Jason Collette, I can't decide between Violent Femmes and the Butthole Surfers for you trying to decide i'll let you know as the show goes on which one i'm going to decide with but let's get to of course the bold predictions here ray let's start with you because i think you're still broadcasting in the united states so let's start with your first of many bold predictions for the 2024 fantasy baseball season what do you have for the people all right eloy jimenez i'm saying he's going to be a top 125 player maybe borderline top 100 this year all right top 100 potentially so let's talk about eloy jimenez because this is a player that just a few years ago, we were all very excited about. The White Sox were excited about him. They extended him along with all the youth. They said, hey, look, we're going to commit to all the youth. And by the boards, this was probably, Ray, the right thing to do. Structurally, a lot of teams have had success. Unfortunately, that success did not befall the Chicago White Sox, I feel like, in any of these investments that they made, <laughs> save maybe the Luis Robert one. But let's talk about Jimenez in this journey because it's been one where he hasn't been able to stay healthy. We've seen moments and spurts, but it really has been the injuries above all else. And now he is going at such a discount. So let's talk about why you think this is possible when it comes to Jimenez. All right, I guess part of the reason why I think we're seeing the discount is he's UTL only beginning of the year. So I think that scares a lot of people off. But by the same token, perhaps if he's just going to DH, maybe he will be able to stay healthier and we'll get to see him come back to some of the power we saw a few years ago. And I mean, if we're going to go crazy, maybe 30 hundred. And if we're getting that in around pick 200, does it really matter that he's only going to be UT eligible? Jason, when you look at the tail of the tape of Aloya Menez, this is a player that 27 years old, turning 28. So this is really his prime. We're looking at that rookie season of 2019 where he played 122 games, which, by the way, is the most he ever played in his career. 
31 homers, 79 RBI, hitting 267 over that span. Then the following year, just 55 games. The year after that, 55 games. Now, I know in 2020, it wasn't fault. <laughs> there was always so many games to play. But still, 2022, 84 games. Last year, 120, where he did hit 18 homers. What Ray is laying out here for Jimenez is a pretty large, substantial bounce back because you really need to get the innings out of him. He needs to be playing. It needs to get these at-bats, these games played way up. Do you think there's still hope for Jimenez? And when you're looking at the ADP going around, pick 183 overall, the 55th outfielder overall, do you think that that makes sense to take that risk because of the upside that uh, still remains, Jason? Well, I would say, first off, uh, I'm hoping that I sound better now. If not, I'm going to turn off my video to see if that helps. Uh, I would agree with Ray that we have uh, the issue about the UT only penalty there. But, you know, Aloy has come to camp twice now in better shape. Uh, with that, so he's trying. I would say this as a whole, the White Sox, they're a bad team, but their parts are better than their sum. I, I see there's a lot of different players on Chicago that are going below what I think their their final market value could be with Aloy right there at the top of the list. Yeah, parts are better than their sum. That's been uh, used to uh, describe me many, many times. And Jason, we don't want you to go to, <laughs> to, uh, to audio only because that beard looks fantastic today and Clearly, you're going to be one of the most handsome fellas on this show for the next eight hours. So let's go to one of your picks here, uh, Jason. Let's start with you because you've got a hot take, a bold prediction that begins with the New York Yankees. Yeah, I, I believe that Juan Soto is going to out Homer Aaron Judge. Uh, and the, the simple part of this is that Soto will be hitting in front of Judge. And what pitcher in the right mind is going to want to pitch around Juan Soto to get to Aaron Judge? Uh, you look at this, you look at how Juan Soto has just murdered fastballs over his career. Uh, it's hard to attack somebody in the strike zone without fastballs. So I believe Soto's in for a tremendous year with the with the protection he's gonna have behind him with the on base help in front of him and obviously the stadium. He's going to have to change his swing a bit because he has been an all field swinger and it's going to be really enticing just to hit pop ups to right field with that. Uh, but I believe that Soto's in for a massive power year and he is going to out home for Aaron Judge this year, even if both guys stay healthy. Jason, uh, let, let's start there because I think that's the big question when it comes to this. Aaron Judge. Came out the other day in spring, was talking about that toe injury, right? That's saying, hey, this is something I'm going to have to have maintenance on for the rest of my career. Now, I don't know about you, but that doesn't make me feel warm and fuzzy uh, necessarily. It, it seems like something that is going to be legitimately something that's going to bother him. And that's not on top of whatever other injuries that could befall Aaron Judge at any given time, because we've seen that happen in his career. Also, he's a bigger framed player than we're normally used to. When you're trying to, you know, Welsh and I on our Fantasy Pro show were just having this discussion earlier this week. When you're trying to disseminate between these guys, the very top tier here of outfield or even first round talent, I keep taking Soto over Judge for that fact. If I just think, hey, all things being equal, give me the guy playing for a contract. Give me the guy that I think has been so durable over his young career, as opposed to the guy who's dealing with a chronic toe issue. Not to say the Judge isn't a great player, but do you agree with that sense mm -hmm. too, that people should be valuing those two differently, even though in ADP, they're practically the same? Yeah, that's right. I do agree with uh, even Welsh with this, because when you get to that point, you're looking at any other differentiators to that. And that's certainly anytime I hear about an issue, a lower half issue with a power hitter, it scares me because you can't hit with power if you don't have 100 percent base to you. Uh, but anything you look at contract year, it could go either way with things. But I always look at those types of intangibles as tiebreakers where I'm like, OK, what am I going to take? I would say every time I've been given the chance, I have taken Soto over Judge this winter and I'll continue to do so. Ray, I want to talk to you about Juan Soto here, because if you're taking him out of San Diego, you look at the stats of San Diego, right? His work there, 113 games in that ballpark. So it's not a small sample size or a large sample. He had 231. The OBP was very high, 374, but that's Juan Soto's game. And then 409 slugging, 783 OPS. If you look at his numbers, Nationals ballpark, 296, a 968 OPS, um, do you think that the secret sauce here for Soto was just to get out of, of San Diego and dropping him into Yankee Stadium, which is practically a wiffle ball field? I think it might be. I mean, I'm too in the camp of taking Soto ahead of Judge, but my concern is maybe April it gets in his head a little bit about adjusting his swing for right field, and maybe we get to a little bit of a slow start. The other thing that kind of caught me was, if you look at baseball's font, his expected home runs for Yankee Stadium last year were 27. 
So again, it speaks to the point of, yeah, he has to adjust his swing a little bit. Maybe that takes a little bit of time. But at the same t- time, I think this is still attainable because Judge is going to likely end up on the injured list at some point. All right, let's take a look at the outfielders, too. We've got some time here. So uh, Ronald Acuna is going first, Julio, then Corbin Carroll, Mookie Betts, Kyle Tucker, then Tatis, Judge, Soto, Alvarez, Luis Robert. Those are the top 10 guys. Ray, when you're looking at that, does that sound correct to you in terms of not just the order, but is somebody missing from that? Because it feels like that's the right 10, and then you can flip-flop Soto, Judge, depending on this conversation or some other folks there. Does that make sense to you, though, in terms of how you evaluate them? Yeah, it does. I, I, I think the top 10 is pretty set, is pretty set and stable this year. Jason, when you're looking at the top 10 fantasy outfielders this season, do you see somebody cracking that top 10 that's not on that list right now? Guys like Michael Harris or Rosarena uh, Garcia are all very close. Mike Trout is the 14th outfielder. Usually this is where he lives at the top of this list, but it's been some time. And then there's some dark horse candidates too. Guys like Jazz Chisholm, you know, if he plays an entire season, gives us the power and the speed. Uh, who knows what Jackson Churio is capable of. So Jason, when you're looking at this top 10 outfielder, is it as simple as this, or do you think maybe there's some room for some conversation? Well, you mentioned one of the guys I was going to say with Michael Harris. I think he's right there on the fringe. I even in uh, in a current draft and hold that I'm in, I opened, I had the third pick. I opened with Julio Rodriguez and I took Michael Harris on the backside, just in front of Luis Robert. And to me, the differentiator there was the batting average upside. Uh, I really like Harris. And I know that, Robert will bring some more power, but I wanted to have a little more average there. So I went there. I would see even dark horse because, you know, Ryan Bloomfield always puts this out. Hey, who was a guy outside the top 180 that could crack first round at the end of the year? And every year somebody does it. One guy does it this year Mm -hmm. at the outfield. But I actually picked an outfielder in Tyler O'Neill. Somebody I think Mm -hmm. has the potential, has done it in recent years, obviously comes with a lot of flaws. But Tyler O'Neill is somebody that I'm looking at like late round that could jump up in the top 10 if everything went right for him. O'Neill with the uh, Boston Red Sox now, too. So it wouldn't be the first time an outfielder left St. Louis and all of a sudden was better, would it? We've seen that between Garcia and a Rosarena. You know, all these you know, somebody in St. Louis needs to be held accountable, I feel like, Jason. I feel like every couple of years we go through this, like, oh, it's going to be this guy, it's going to be this guy. And then it never is. And they go somewhere else and then they end up being good. So. Maybe O'Neal, <laughs> exactly. best guy on that list <laughs> as the trend <laughs> continues. Let's go back to you, Ray, for another 2024 prediction. What do you have for everybody? I have Francisco Alvarez is going to finish the year as a top five catcher. All right. I like this one. Alvarez already showed some power last year. Uh, that's not the problem. Obviously, with young catchers, it's always a matter of learning the pitching staff, getting acclimated to all the other things you have to. And typically, you see the offense lag behind. We've seen that. You know, I'll go back to the Matt Weeders days, some other young catchers that we were high on in terms of, you know, power ability and offensive ability. But last year he did hit 208 in the minor leagues, a much more complete hitter. I think we'd all agree, but still a relatively young player, obviously, as well. Uh, not a lot of bright spots for the Mets, but this 22 year old could certainly be one of them. Let's talk about why. Um, I mean, if you look at that, obviously it's an adjustment to the big leagues. He had to get used to the pitching staff. And I think in the second half, they just ran him out there day after day because they didn't have a choice. He had 174 in the second half. So I think that number, even by default, if that comes up, we're going to see a little batting average growth. But he still maintained that power, and he was and he was a run producer. He hit 25 home runs last year, and you can argue that we didn't that he struggled for most of the year offensively because he was concentrating on the pitching staff, concentrating on acclimating to the big leagues, big league pitching. So, I mean, 25 home runs when it really wasn't a good offensive season, if you if you break it down, I think 35 home runs maybe. I mean, I don't I mean, I know we're doing bold predictions. This is a time to get a little crazy, but yeah, let's get crazy. But, let's but, get but, why, but why not? Right. Well, I mean, you know, it's not like you got to avoid too many guys in the Mets lineup. So you might as well pitch to somebody here. <laughs> uh, as you, if you couldn't tell, I am a loser Mets fan myself. So I'm already well aware the season is over before it's begun. Alvarez versus minor league career, Jason, 273 batting average, a 384 OBP, a 529 slugging, and a 913 OPS over 257 games. Now, that's some pretty solid productivity over a pretty good sample size, 250 plus games. What stands out the most to me, Jason, in those numbers is the 384 OBP, because in the major league so far, he's been 100 points below that mark. So, 
How do you equate for that gap here? Is this a matter of just too much free swinging, not enough pitch recognition skills here? What, what's been that deficit in terms of the conversion of that OBP? The batting average, I think we can all understand that's going to fluctuate, but the OBP dropping 100 points from minor to major, that to me is the big hurdle when it comes to Alvarez. And, and to me, that's when you look at it's the quality of pitching. As somebody who watches a lot of minor league baseball here in North Carolina, very few minor league pitchers can spin non-fastballs for strikes. It, it, they have to be chase pitches. So if you're a disciplined hitter, like Alvarez is and can do that in the minor leagues, he can just lay off that stuff and wait for fastballs. Well, you get to the major league level, and all of a sudden, guys can throw sliders and curveballs for strikes and for non-strikes that look like strikes. And that's really what it came down to, to me, because he had done so well as a minor league hitter and made the climb so quickly, he didn't get the chance. And it's like all of a sudden, you're like, all right, all right, welcome to the big league kids. Here comes the nasty stuff. And it's just, it's a learning curve. We've seen it. Go back and look at any other young hitter who was aggressively promoted to the major leagues. They all struggled in year one. Uh, and the catcher, just the tax of that. But you know, I could, go back and look at Manny Ramirez's first year. Go back, back and look at A-Rod's numbers their first year. Uh, as great as they were, they did not do well in their rookie years, year, rookie years either. And then year two, boom. Yeah, I think Alvarez is a very exciting player. Uh, I see Rupert's comment that said, I did not get the memo about the backwards cap today. Uh, like I'm Here, always I'll letting the ball head like out. <laughs> but no, 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 no. I'm always getting, you know, letting the ball head out there. Uh, I'm, I'm very proud of it. I embrace it. It's I, My bald head is now 18 years old, gentlemen, so it's allowed to vote. I don't know if you guys realize this. So that's how long <laughs> the head has been shaped celebrating that anniversary this summer. Uh, let's uh, continue on talking about catchers here, Jason. He is going right now as right around the 10th catcher overall on fantasypros.com at 11 Gabriel Moreno right after him. To me, this is more about what your roster construction looks like. If you need some batting average help in the Roto mm -hmm. format, well, I think Moreno is probably your guy, obviously, but if you're looking for power, it would be Alvarez. Do you see it the same way? Because you just laid out a path where maybe there's a big jump here for Alvarez. Do you think Alvarez is still clearly the guy regardless? I, I I would still take I mean, Alvarez. Uh, man, I'd like Ray's call about getting up there. Go ahead, Ray. No, go, go ahead. ahead. Go ahead. No, no, you go, Ray. Oh, no, I was just thinking, <laughs> yeah, I like that. <laughs> I mean, I, I do like I, I do like Alvarez's call up there. I mean, Moreno again. It does come down to roster construction. The difference, uh, you know, he, Moreno may end up playing because the defense was so good. He was such a big part of Arizona's success last year with his ability to control the running game and how he handled the pitchers at such a young age. It was, it was surprising when Toronto traded Moreno uh, as they did, but, and he was immediate returns. But to me, I still want Alvarez's upside because it's rather tremendous. Ray, uh, obviously you would feel the same way, correct? Yeah, hundred percent. I think Alvarez is going to probably steal some DH bats as well. But yeah. I mean, given the, given the Mets roster construction, I think they have Navarez, maybe Nito makes a team too. And are you really going to have DJ Stewart and Tyrone Taylor? Mm -hmm. D D D I mean, ultimately, I think it's going to be Alvarez getting some rest, DHing as well. Marino, I like his plate approach, but I don't, but I rather take even a 240 average from Alvarez with all that power. Well, I was going to say, you're looking at potentially twice, if not three times the amount of power. And yeah. I, that that's a lot to me uh, at this stage in the game. Uh, Brian, uh, congratulations on your bald head turning 21. You're going to buy it a cocktail. I see you out there. And Rupert, again, back suggesting that I should draw seams on my head for opening day. Now, our YouTube channel at Fantasy Bros MLB did cross 15,000 subs. So uh, we will be wearing wigs, Welsh and myself. And if we get to 17,000 before opening day, we're going to grow the mustaches. One time we did mustaches for the show. We took a vacation from ourselves. We're going to be doing that along with the wigs if we get to 17. So just putting that out there. If you want stupid things, we're the place for you. Uh, speaking of uh, stupid things, uh, let's get back to Jason Collette for another one of his predictions for 2024. <laughs> Yeah, way to set up these predictions. I mean, so I, uh, I have two pitcher predictions, but we're going to break them up. And let's start with Zach Gallon, who I don't, I don't believe as a bold prediction is going to be a top twenty starting pitcher. Uh, and my reason why is because of the massive workload increase that he had last year. He led the league in innings pitched. He led the league in pitches thrown, uh, and this is including everything going into the postseason. So we have not seen uh, how he's going to handle that. But I would say going back and i wrote an article about this uh, over the winter every the recent years the guy that has led that leaderboard who's thrown the most and done all that the next year hasn't been so well so in 2022 
That was Aaron Nola. We saw him take a step back last year in 2021. That was Walker Bueller. We all know what happened there. Uh, and so Justin Verlander has been the one guy who's been able to survive this type of thing. But Justin Verlander was also in his 30s when he was doing that. Zach Gallon's not there. And so Zach Gallon had a tremendous – it was almost uh, – trying to remember the exact but 48 49 more innings but then you throw in the the postseason innings tax pitchers will tell mm -hmm. you that those innings of postseason is like a 1.25 or 1.5 stress on that so he had a big increase i want no part of zach gallon where he's going right now that's in the drafts i've seen he's been going mid to late second rounds and i'm out he is one of the top guys. I just did a video on the same topic of guys I'm avoiding. It was uh, don't hate the player, hate the ADP. And I'm with you 100%. I look at Gowan. I look at some other mm -hmm. guys that I could get rounds two and three later even that I think could be in that same mix of being ace potentially. Uh, the number was 210 innings that he threw, then 243 and two-thirds total. That's 60 more than his previous high. Ray, are you in the same boat as Jason and myself where we're looking at Zach Gowan and we say, hey, this is a player that oh, we love the talent. We understand how great he is, how dominant he is, but this is a very risky pick and you're not getting any sort of discount on Gowan. He is still going very high on the board. He is still the ninth pitcher off the board right now. So what do you make of Gowan's value? I mean, I think maybe I have him at the end of my top 20 but I haven't drafted him yet and I probably won't have any shares of gallon by the time we're done because that ADP because we're get because we're not getting any kind of discount and when I see somebody like gallon sitting there on the board I my default has been to kind of take another hitter at that point and then address starting pitching around later and other than the innings the two things that concern me about gallon is his barrel rate went up two percent last year exit velocity went up like three miles an hour last year so, the, so again, we saw more innings out of him. I don't know if the, the increased workload led to hitters making better contact against him as the year went on. From a results perspective, yeah, it was still there, but it's another piece that gives me a little bit of concern. Right. If I dropped him from SP9, which is where Gowan is now, let's say to SP20, that board looks like this. Max Freed, Zach Gowan, Blake Snell. Who would you want of those three guys? I'm taking Freed out of those three. Taking free now, he has some injury concerns as well attached to him. Jason, how about you? That trio of guys, if we drop Gallon all the way there, which again, it's probably not going to happen, that's just not going to be the case in terms of it. But mm -hmm. let's say maybe there is a little hiccup in spring training, we've seen that happen before. Guys have dead arm, all of a sudden, there's a little panic in the market. Let's say we get down to Blake Snell, Max Freed, and Zach Gallon. Who would you prefer of those three? Uh, I'm with Ray. I would take Freed as well, as much as I like Blake Snell. It's a boomer. He's such a boomer bust profile. You know, when he pitches 140 or more innings, he wins hardware. But he's done that twice in his career. In both years, it's been awesome. But when he doesn't do it, it's it, the, the floor is there. And so that's why, as much as it was, I was all in on Snell last year at the market price. I don't want him this year where he's going right now. So Freed would be my guy as well. All right. We've got four remaining uh Pro bold predictions, if you want to call them the hot takes, whatever you want to call them here. But I'm going to flip it around here. Ray went first for the first half hour. But Jason, yours is kind of attached to this last one. So Zach Gowan, I think it's bold, but I think it's one that some of us smart, handsome people uh, already kind of see coming. Uh, we've talked about it a lot. However, this next one you have, Jason, I don't mm -hmm. think anyone's quite talking about. And you are going to take a, a shot here. So I don't want to blow it for the people, but you've got a feeling about the SP1. Let's talk about it. Yeah, I'm going to get beat up for this one if it doesn't work out. But I also, Spencer Strider, I think, finishes outside the top 20. And hear me out on this. Uh, you know, you look at you look at Calfzilla and uh, Quadzilla, whatever you want to call them. The legs, everybody wants to say, oh, he's healthy. He's all this, right? This was Brandon Woodruff last year, too. Brandon Woodruff was going at the turn. And everybody was looking at Brandon Woodruff as this big, healthy guy should be just fine until he wasn't. Uh, but to me, when I look at Strider, he had a 48% increase in his workload year over year, 48%. And then pitches 41%. That's a massive jump for a guy that has had surgery in college. Uh, I know he reworked his mechanics and everything, but that is a massive, massive jump jump in workload for a young pitcher we have not seen how the body's going to react to that uh so to me like i said in the price i have absolutely out in the first round if he fell to the second round which he is not i've seen him go as high as four so it doesn't even matter let's not even talk about that i am not comfortable at all taking strider in the first round and i'm frankly 
surprised to continue to see him move up as the winner, and he's now in the top five going in drafts. Uh, I believe that's a recipe for disaster. I'm still a guy who, Jason, I, I refuse to take pitching early in drafts. I just don't see the value in it anymore. Uh, I don't see where those those big horses that used to be out at the front of the gate, I just don't see it. I mean, Garrett Cole's still that guy, and that's fair. He's probably the safest on that board. What's fun to me is I'm looking and listening to you, and I'm looking at the regular season strikeout leaders of 2024 for wagering. Spencer Strider's at the top at plus 195. The next guy is plus 1,000. It's 10 to 1 in Kevin Gossman. So if anything that you're talking about comes to fruition, what a great way to make an investment there. He is a thousand to one uh, excuse me plus one thousand a thousand to one plus one thousand garrett cole is plus twelve hundred and then my dark horse guy too that i think again if you can just get the innings up um a guy like freddie peralta he is at 25 to one so a really interesting strikeout board if you do want to fade spencer strider ray this is a very provocative idea but jason has laid out some good math around it to support this uh the controversial take, let's just call it that. So do you think that Spencer Strider is a guy that is worth his ADP currently? 100% not. I mean, I think first, have we seen Spencer Strider with the new uniform pants, with those likes? I think I'm we've not... seen too much of him. I think <laughs> I was going to say, I was going to say the answer to that question is, yes, we've seen him. We've seen a lot of everybody, I feel yes. like. Yes, Un unfortunately for Casey Schmidt, but... It's, uh, did George Costanza make those pants? That's my question to everybody, too. It's like, you know, when they put Costanza in charge of the uniforms with the Yankees back in the day, you know, I, I feel like this is the same kind of thing. I I, th I think so. But, but but Strider, again, is somebody that I'm not rostering at all this year based on that price. And I wasn't doing it when he was going at the back of the first round. Now, if he's going top five, there's no way. And I think this year especially, I don't know that I've started a draft without going hit or hitter at all and i think i a good portion of my drafts i've gone hit or hit or hit or or hit or hit or hit or closer and i've kind of waited till four five six to go for my starters and the thing with striders i mean the strikeouts are ridiculous that even when even if he did go on the il for a month or two you're still going to get a ton of strikeouts out of him but if you're going to price in that injury risk and you're saying hey He's going to go on the IL for a month or two. The replacement value of your ace starting pitcher that you drafted in the first round and then probably eased up on strikeouts at least a little bit because you had that comfort in Strider, it's not going to be good for roster construction either. I'll take it a step further, Ray. I think in head-to-head -head formats is even more of a concern because it's one thing in the season long when you're missing a player, and as you said, well, he's still going to end up with 200 strikeouts even if he throws 170 innings or 160 innings, right? Whatever that might be. But at the same time, does it cost you a playoff spot in head-to-head -head formats? You know, does it cost you enough losses during the year to lose that player that you took in the you know early second round? I think that's a that's a big question. I think everybody has to ask themselves when they're coming to that. By the way, everybody donate at donorbox.org slash TGFBI. Again, that's donorbox.org slash TGFBI. I'm sure there's links all over X if you're following Justin Mason. I'm sure you are. So go directly. Make a donation here. Do nice things. Again, when you do, you could win fabulous prizes like this fantasy baseball black book behind my head from Amazon. There's also a lot of other amazing prizes, subscriptions to different sites. Um, I don't know. Maybe uh, Justin Mason will come to your house, and, you know, vacuum. I don't know. There's a lot of things out there that I would bid on. If there's an open, I just want him to come. I want him to wear a maid's outfit. I want him to clean my house. That might be at least 500 to 1,000 for me. I got to say like that and. And you know he'll do it because he has zero shame. There you go. There. See, look, look how little time it I'm took. I'm waiting for Danielle to chime in the chat. I'm waiting for oh, Danielle well, to chime in the chat. He doesn't do that at our house. Why would he come to your house? <laughs> well, he wears – the problem is he wears the outfit. He just doesn't clean. That's the problem. All right, let's continue on with some of these bold predictions here. Let's go back to you, Ray, with your number three for 2024. What do you have? All right, I'm saying that based on ADP, Jazz Chisholm – is a better pick than C.J. Abrams and will outperform him by the end of the year. Okay. I'm here for, you know, last year, C.J. Abrams was our darling on our show. We kept saying, he's free. Just take him. And he's probably going to suck for a couple months. Just take him and just wait. Just be patient because he's free. And if you were patient, the second half was really good. And in Roto Leagues, he was, I don't want to say a league winner, but maybe he was a league winner for some people. Like He might have <laughs> been. But it's a provocative idea because we just had a conversation about Jazz Chisholm or Trout. And looking at the age of the players and the power speed combination of Chisholm, 
I almost am more intrigued to take Jazz Chisholm too. So this is a lot of helium here. CJ Abrams does feel like a player that has gone nuclear in terms of ADP. So let's talk about Abrams and Chisholm first, because I want to get your take on the why here. Okay, the why is obviously Abrams stole 47 bases. If he didn't steal 47 bases, we wouldn't be having this conversation because then, then at that point he's J.P. Crawford. So he sold the 47 bases. Obviously, especially if you're looking at NFBC leagues, everyone pushes up stolen bases. It's incredibly valuable. There's more stolen bases out there based on last year than there has been, but at the same point, you still need more to compete. So I understand the 47 stolen bases. Chisholm, if everything goes right, not sure there's a path for him to get more than 30. So you're losing 30. So you're losing, say, 15 stolen bases. Batting average, Chisholm's going to be a little better than Abrams. But then the power, I think, is where Chisholm has the edge. He could be a 30 30 guy. Abrams hit 18 last year. That's probably his max. He hit 245 overall on the season. But again, he only had one month over 247. He hit 166 against lefties. I'm not sure Washington has the talent to say, hey, you're going to be a platoon player. But that is something to be concerned about going forward. And I think with Abrams, we probably saw the best that he had to offer last year, unless some of those plate skills and the power develops ahead of where it did. And the other problem is kind of like Strider in the first round. You take Strider in the first round, you're committing a lot of your capital to those strikeouts. If he goes down, your roster construction, especially head-to-head leagues, it looks very different. If you're taking Abrams in the third round, you have to meet the power up elsewhere. You have to meet the batting average up elsewhere. He goes down, struggles. You're down stolen bases. It's going to be harder to make that up. Looking at his ADP also, he's going right now typically in the consensus ADP at 58 overall. I see names like Paul Goldschmidt, a guy who is a perennial 30, 100, 100 guy. Yeah, he's coming off a down year, but so what? I see Matt McClain. I see Nolan Jones. I see Royce Lewis. I see some of the most exciting players there in that little cluster, all going after Abrams, and I just can't justify it, Ray. No. I mean, Nolan Jones, again, I'm not a huge fan of him, but I think they're similar. Plays in Colorado. Exactly. And a Colorado, my friend. It, it exactly. never lets you down. Not ever. One of those but again, things. between the two, I'm taking Jones over Abrams, even if I might not be a true fan of Jones. I mean, in reality, I'm probably not taking either there, but somebody like a McLean or a tried and true Goldschmidt, I think I think there's better conversation there. Jason, let's have a conversation about what Ray mentioned about the stolen bases, because in my opinion, when you have more people stealing more bases, it makes it a lot easier to find it as you go and kind of build it up. You could go for the specialist guys, or you could, you know, build a team that's got a nice benchmark there of some players that'll get you 10 to 20 in that range because your stolen bases are up in general. I don't feel like that premium for stolen bases is worth it for a guy like Abrams. Do you see it differently? Well, with steals, you remember last year, it, if you were slow, it really didn't help you. Uh, it, so, it, yeah, the market rising tides was supposed to lift all boats, but it didn't. I mean, if you were slow, you still weren't running. Brendan Rodgers still did not steal a base last year. He has not never mm-hmm. stolen one in his career. He's not slow. He just doesn't run. Carlos Correa doesn't run anymore. He still didn't steal a base. Uh, you know, so it's it's one of those different things with that. I think th- th- the issue and why Abrams is going and, and but where uh, Chisholm isn't right now is you know Chisholm's had one full, not even a full season. I mean, he he has never played more than 124 games in a season. And you can't argue with the talents, but something is always broken down with him. Whereas Abrams just put a big volume year up. Up and is on pace to do a big volume year again. I understand the risk that if you if you took you've got to build around that skill set. But overall, with steals, yeah, they're out there, and there could be even more this year with the untapped potential of stealing third base. The league was swiping third base at about eighty two to eighty three percent, and the league as a whole wasn't taking too many chances. But when they look at those numbers, they're probably like, ooh, let's do more of that. Uh, and so, give me somebody that's going to be at the top of the lineup that's not going to have somebody on base in front of them to have those opportunities to do that. So there may be even more in the tank for um, Abrams uh, in that regard. Jason, back-to-back right now, 79 is Brian Reynolds uh, in current consensus ADP. Jazz Chisholm is 80. Who would you rather have on your team? Brian Reynolds. Why? 
I like safety. <laughs> yes. I like well, Brian Reynolds and his durability for the most part over, over Chasman, over Chaz Chisholm. It's, it's the durability thing that scares me. Or <laughs> you almost gave him a new name that would have sounded like an adult film star. Uh, if you call him Chaz and then switch the J, <laughs> that would have been a very different uh, thing here. It's early in the morning, Colette. It's early in the I was morning. Doing Beastie Boys it's lyrics. Sorry. <laughs> uh, I guess so. I guess we know which Lollapalooza band you are. Uh, Ray, I'll put the same question to you. Jazz Chisholm or uh, Brian Reynolds, who would you rather have those two outfielders going back to back in ADP currently? I'm going to go with Jazz there. I mean, it shouldn't be a surprise based on my prediction, but I think at that point in the draft, I'm willing to go for the upside of Chisholm knowing that even last year he played in 97 games and he still finished with 19 home runs and 22 stolen bases. So even factoring that in, yeah, I'm giving up a few home runs, few RBIs to Reynolds, but Chisholm goes out, I'm still going to get replacement value of somebody else in that roster spot. All right, let's talk about uh, the next one of yours. Jason, you were mentioning earlier about the White Sox being better than the sum of their parts. Um, I want to dive into this a little bit more because if you're looking at this White Sox roster, it is a team that I, I think all of us looked at it last year and saw the Ceases and Giolitos and even Lance Lynn. And we all thought, yeah, you know what? Uh, you know, the White Sox are going to be a useful fantasy team. And then uh, it felt like collectively the season of uh, Tim Anderson might have been the best way to describe what happened to the White Sox last year, I think, mm -hmm. all around. So looking at it this year, why should people be helpful and, and hopeful? Because it feels as though, you know, there is a dip in the value. Luis Roberts still a top player that's out there, but you're looking around Andrew Vaughn coming off a, a season where people had expectations didn't come to fruition. Aloya Menez, another one there too. Um, you know, Jake Berger was the surprise guy last year, but he is gone. And you look at the rest of this rotation too. I mean, guys like Michael Kopech once upon a time, that was, that was big time stuff. People looked for the upside of Kopeck, and that's a guy I feel like nobody's discussing at all. So what do you think about the White Sox roster currently and some of the value it might give you in fantasy? Yeah, I would quote my good friend Craig, who's a big White Sox fan. White Sox fan. The hate has gone too far uh, with this team. They're bad. I mean, it's going to be a bad team. Uh, but you look at, we've talked, we've already talked about Eloy, and Eloy's ADP in February is 238. Uh, and then Dylan Cease is just outside the top 100, and Luis Roberts there in the second round, and that's it. There's only five guys that are being drafted in the tw in a 23 times 12 12 team format. There's five guys that are making it uh, before the reserve rounds. And to me, when you see a team that has that many players below uh, active roster value, there's opportunity. And I think last year, uh, as fantasy managers, we were reminded of that when Brett Rooker had a great year and Brent Rooker was an afterthought for Oakland, but because it was a bad team, he had the opportunity to produce something happen. And you look up and down this roster. I was looking at uh, Andrew Benintendi is projected to hit leadoff, projected to get 600 plate appearances and his ADP is 380 right now. So he's like free help, free leadoff guy in the reserves. And if Andrew Benintendi can put it together, then there's some nice value there. You mentioned Kopech as well. The stuff has always been there, but his ability to stay on the mound to use that stuff has been problematic. Um, you have to give it another chance. If you want to get into the Yoan Moncada contract year, he needs a new paycheck after this year. And the last four years have been terrible. Maybe something happens there. Uh, but the prices are right. I just look at this as an opportunity to get in on the White Sox because there's not, there's not a next level. Like Colson Montgomery may be the only prospect that comes up for them this year. I live in Charlotte where their triple A team is. It's terrible. They don't have another guy coming up. So they're either going to be trading guys away or using these guys every day in the lineup. And I just find that there's going to be production here because they're, so, they're being undervalued um, because it's a bad team. Uh, pitching staff wise, like, you know, give me uh, John Brebery a closer type of thing, but there's a lot of mess in the, on this team and I get wanting to avoid it, but there's still opportunity here. What about Dylan Cease? He's going to be entering his age 28 season. Uh, three straight years of throwing at least 165 innings. That's positive. The strikeout rate has declined, though. The K for 9 went from 12 to 11 to 10. Again, still elite, but did go down a little bit. The ERA was at 4.5 last year. Now, everybody thought there was going to be a regression from the ERA year over year, and it was with a vengeance. But the XERA was 407. The FIP was 372. The X FIP was 408. So it wasn't quite as bad as it laid out there, too. If you're looking at Dylan Cease currently in terms of where he's being drafted, which is pretty late when all said and done here, do you see him as a potential value on that board, too? Just to give you a reference point, too, 
Uh, Dylan Cease is going right now as the 28th starting pitcher on the board in consensus ADP. He's going ahead of Joe Musgrove, which I grossly disagree with. He's also going ahead of guys like Yuri Perez, Cole mm-hmm. Reagans, Tanner Bybee, a lot of the young studs that people are really uh, excited about. Would you take Cease over any of those guys? Jason? I like Cease quite a bit at his current market price. And let's, and, and I mean, he's likely going to be traded. So it's only going to increase his value. If he were to get traded today, his value is going to jump up two to three rounds. Uh, people will be more forgiving of some of his flaws if they if he was on another roster. I think last year, some of the issues, uh, you know, Yasmani Grandal behind the plate, not a great catcher. Uh, and that was hurting him as well. And I, I always put Cease in that bucket of like, don't watch your closers. Don't watch Dylan Cease pitch. It's frustrating. He throws a lot of pitches. Uh, and it, it just grinds through at bats. He, can't, he struggles to put guys away despite the strikeouts, but a lot of foul balls and type of thing. It's kind of uh, like Blake Snell used to be uh, in that regard. So I don't want to watch Dylan Cease pitch, but I have no problem putting him on my roster at the current market price because I only see it going higher once he's traded because he's not sticking on this team this year. All right, that's fair. But Ray, right now, we don't know that for sure. You know, we don't have, I mean, it it might be thinking it's trending that way. Dylan Cease, 20th SP off the board. There's no way I'm taking him ahead of Musgrove. But what about you? Would you take Cease over Reagans, over Perez, over Bybee, uh, even over veterans like Justin Verlander? I mean, I I would take him probably over those four. I mean, if Verlander didn't start off the spring with the shoulder thing, maybe that answer changes. But I would take him over like a Bibby or a Perez or a Reagans. And again, I think the main thing here is the walks, not saying he's all of a sudden going to magically flip switch and improve his control. But if the walks per nine went from four to three, I think we're telling a totally different story here. And again, if he gets traded, add a few more wins. I know it's hard to kind of predict wins, but I think pretty much every team is going to have more wins than the White Sox this year. So maybe by default, he gets there. And I think the Mets might tell him to hold their beer, right? (laughs) And I think the problem really is (laughs) Montgomery hasn't signed. Snell hasn't signed. I think once those dominoes at some point fall, maybe we'll see the cease trade talks reignite. Scott Boris does know that the season's beginning soon, right? Like uh, Snell and Montgomery and Bellinger, like we are, the season is starting, right? They did get that memo across the desk. I hope Um, it is amazing to me how late these guys are waiting to sign. Uh, We'll see where they all end up. Uh, maybe we'll do some predictions on them too at the end here if we have some time. But let's go back to you, Ray, because you think all cruises are not created equal. This no. is one that might blow a lot of people's minds. Let's hear it. 100%. I mean, I haven't been in on Ellie De La Cruz at all this winter, and I think I've written a few different places and at a few different times that he's going to be a bust. I mean, part of it is his second round ADP, but I'm going to say O'Neill Cruz will have a better season than Ellie De La Cruz. Okay, why? Because I think that's one that we all want to hear. Ellie, the power, the speed, O'Neill certainly has that as well. But Cruz got, you know, I should say Ellie got some time, did take his lumps last year as well. Um, but at the same time, you, you flash some of that brilliance there. And, and O'Neill really, I mean, didn't play by nine games. Like, you can't really get excited about that. So why is O'Neill a better investment? Because that's what it seems like you're saying, basically. If you're going to take a Cruz, O'Neill is the better one, not Ellie. Well, I think part of it is the price that NF- NFBC ADP, you're getting O'Neill 40 picks later, give or take. So that, so I think that's probably the one thing. But then to go into Ally, he hit 191 second half last year. Again, it was his first taste of the big leagues, young player adjustments. He came on strong, 190, but still 191 in the second half. It's not, it's not exactly exciting or make you feel comfortable. From the power perspective, yeah, he hit 13 home runs, but he did it with a 3.6 degree average launch, launch angle. So that gives me a little concern. His 8.5% barrel, barrel rate, yeah, it's good, but it's not off the charts good that it's going, going to stop me in my tracks. And again, 410 slugging percentage, 386x slugging. So based on that, I'm not feeling 100% confident in him. But again, he stole 35 stolen bases. But I'm going to go back to kind of the C.J. Abrams comment I made is, okay, fine, we're drafting him to a point because of the stolen bases. But then if we're going to go to O'Neill Cruz, yeah, last year he really didn't play. So I went back to 2022. Again, he hit 233. So either way, I'm not looking for batting average out of either of these players. He only had 10 stolen bases in 87 games. 
So you're going to be down on the stolen basis. But he hit 17 home runs in those 87 games, drove in 54 runs, and he did it with a 15.5% Bauer rate. So to me, I think there's more upside potential in his bat. Then take it one step further. Pittsburgh has nobody. So O'Neill Cruz, as long as he stays healthy, is going to get his 600 plate appearances. Ali De La Cruz, yeah, he came up for half a year, and he did great. But you could say the same thing about Encarnacion Strand. Say the same thing about McLean. Say the same thing about Spencer Steer. They signed Candelario. They have India still there. You have Will Benson in the outfield. They have a lot of pieces. I'm not saying De La Cruz isn't better than those guys. But if there's an extended slump, perhaps they say, hey, wait a second, you need a little more time. Not saying he's going to go to the minor leagues, but hey, maybe we can kind of take a step back. He loses some playing time. All right, let's go to you, Jason, about the cruises. You've got Elliot going at the 34th player off the board and then O'Neill going as 87th player off the board. Now, if you take this and put it in the context of, let's say, salary cap drafts, which cruise is the better value? To me, it's uh, raised right on. It's it's O'Neill, and I've I've taken O'Neill twice. I've had him in the in two different fifteen team drafts. So in Wharf this past weekend, I got O'Neill in the uh, fifth round, fifth, and then the other one, uh, one DCM, and now I just took him in the sixth. So I've taken O'Neill Cruz down there twice, and to me, it kind of feels like. You know, if we were, I forget where, I would love to remember where O'Neill Cruz was going this time last year, coming off his 2022 and 2023. Mm-hmm. I want to say he, even as good as he had looked and shown some of the growth that uh, Adam was referring to in the chat, you know, I think O'Neill Cruz was still going fourth, fifth round last year. And here's Ellie De La Cruz. I can who tell you a if lot you'd like to know the answer, the spectrum, Jason going Clement. into the third. Yeah, uh, I can tell you the answer. Uh, the answer, because I'm on uh, Fantasy Pros, because we got all that data there. Your fingertips is uh, 76 overall. That's where he was in the ADP this time last year. O'Neill Cruz. Okay, so it's right, right, honestly, right about where he's going now uh, to things. So it's, you know, I want to see how things spring. Adam asked a great question about the stolen bases and the ankle. We'll have to see uh, how that all plays out uh, with that. But youth, you know, youth that has resiliency. I'm fifty. I'm fifty one. If I get hurt, I'm not running anymore. Uh, that's why I don't scooter <laughs> anymore. Uh, so, <laughs> yeah, you learn that. There the are way. there are different things with that, but. I am all about uh, I am all about O'Neill Cruz at his market value. The Ellie Dela Cruz hype to me reminds me of the mistake Paul Spore and I made uh, in Vlad Guerrero Jr.'s uh, in his second year. We took him in the fourth round. We're like, man, we're all in. This is going to be great. He showed all this, and it was a terrible pick in hindsight. And that when I see Ellie Dela Cruz going in the third round, to me, it feels like I don't, don't want to make that same mistake that Paul and I made years ago. All right. Uh, very fair uh, statements here about both of the cruise guys. Uh, similar profiles too. power speed uh, batting average might be lagging behind a little bit, but very exciting players. I, I'm all with uh, Rupert too about let's just hope all the cruises play well. And that's good for baseball. Uh, I think we're very excited. Yep. Uh, Ray, who would you rather have Matt McLean or Ellie De La Cruz? Just out of curiosity, Ray. McLean for me. Jason, is that the same answer for you in redraft? Interesting. Indeed, it McLean is. is a player that kind of came, I don't want to say out of nowhere, mm-hmm. but certainly surprised a lot of people last year. Let's go back to the free agents. Let's have some bold prediction about where they're going to end up here. Ray, I've been saying all along, I feel like the Cody Ballinger should just go back with the Cubs. Like, what are we doing here? Just, yeah. just go back there. It's a good fit for you. It's a good fit for them. Everybody wins. The Cubs have a shot to win that division this year, in my opinion. I love Imanaga. I, I'm very excited about Justin Steele. I feel like Bellinger there is that last piece that where they can really compete again. Where do you think Bellinger ends up ultimately? I mean, the Cubs make too much sense. It, it, I mean, it's by no means boring to agree, but the Cubs make too much sense for him not to go back there. Jason, Cody Bellinger, predict where he goes. I, yeah, I can't argue that. I, I want to. I'm, I'm offering everybody a pillow contract to come to Tampa Bay for one year uh, and then try again next year. But yeah, it makes way too much sense for Bellinger not to go back to Chicago. All right, Blake Snell, Jason Collette. You've seen some Blake Snell in your life. Uh, a player that wins a Cy Young and then the next year throws a four and a half ERA up sometimes. The walks were insane last year. I think the market's looking at Blake Snell and saying, you know, we really don't know who he is and we don't want to overpay for him. And therefore, we're waiting to find out because Scott Boris says, oh, yeah, well, let's wait till one of your big pitchers goes down and then you're desperate for Blake Snell. So I get it. It makes a ton of sense. 
at the end of the day, who do you think is going to be desperate enough to overpay? Because that seems to be what they're waiting for. Yeah, and I, you know, San Francisco. Blake Snell's a West Coast guy. He's from Seattle, West Coast. I would still want to put him with the Giants. If he goes to Yankee Stadium, I really don't want. Uh, it lowers his value to me, and it's not because of the environment. It's just more the environment of New York than anything else. He's a West Coast guy. Wants to stay down the west coast i'd hate to see him go over there but if he doesn't sign here in the next week then i'm really concerned about how many starts he misses to, to get into the season because these guys are in routines and yeah sure you can do some work on the side at facilities and whatnot but you need to see every time if a guy's missing an outing or two maybe he misses a start or two and that drops him down a little bit but i want to put him in san francisco and not because i hate the yankees i, I just want blake <laughs> snell to be in the best place possible because i love watching blake snell pitch <laughs> like, it would be it it will be an interesting Yankee addition, though, because you look at the personalities, and I'll put that in quotes, that they've added this offseason. Marcus Stroman, maybe Blake Snell, uh, Alex Verdugo. These are not your prototypical Yankee personalities. And uh, like I'm from New York, uh, so I, I've you know grown up with the Steinbrenner family. And, and it's just been, let's just say those guys don't necessarily fit some of the, uh, the, the clubhouse guys they like. It's going to be fascinating if all of those personalities are on one spot. I can tell you right now, not to mention Soto and the contract and all that noise. It's going to be fascinating. Ray, how about you when it comes to Blake Snell? Are you where Jason is too, which is the Giants make a lot of sense potentially for him stay on the West Coast? They do. I mean, I see him probably – if I had to predict, I think he goes to the Yankees on a one-year Giant deal. But if you're Blake Snell – pitching in that stadium, pitching in the AL East, pitching in New York, might not be the best thing for your long-term value. So I'd say the Giants, I mean, I don't know. The, it seems the Padres aren't going to spend any money. Mm-hmm. Again, if they woke up and decided one day that they Well, they're in debt, so I think that's yeah. pretty much why. You know? so, so that kind of takes them out of the equation for all these guys. Because I mean, they can certainly use Bellinger. They can certainly use Snell if you look at their roster resource page. So... Gi- Giants would be the, the right move for, for Snell, especially considering their rotation as well. All right. What about the last one? Jordan Montgomery, another guy that still has yet to sign. Certainly a player that can help people in the middle of rotations, can help fantasy teams too. As Jason said, Ray, we're getting to that point where if you're not in camp soon here, by the time we turn the page to March, it's probably going to delay the start of your season. Is that a big deal? No, it gives you a little bit of a discount, maybe a round or two on a player, but it is something. And We've seen guys, when they get out of routine, sometimes it hurts them. What do you think about Montgomery, his potential landing spot? I mean, we haven't heard anything about Bradish's arm since the initial news, so potentially on how that goes, I'd say Baltimore. I mean, I know we've heard a lot of news about Montgomery's ties to Boston, but I think they would have made that move already if it was going to happen. So I'd say Baltimore for him. Baltimore's interesting spot. What about Blake Snell in Baltimore, Colette? You like that one? I mean... Are we, are we gonna do you think one of those two pitchers, either Montgomery or uh potentially Blake Snell, could end up there if the Bradish news, which we anticipate being bad, is worse? Yeah, Ray make Ray took my answer. It's exactly what I was gonna say. When you look at this window of opportunity that Baltimore has right now in this young window, it's not about making the investment for this year. I too expect Bradish news not to go well. And so then you've got Rodriguez and you got Burns, and then you got Pray for Rain, uh, for the most part. And if you can bring in either one of these lefties and put them in that ballpark with that Mount Camden out in left field that suppresses home runs giggity that would be good for either one of these guys and i would like to see baltimore make that investment because again this is the window and it would be a shame for them to waste it by trying to fix this on the cheap and hoping because if bradish goes down now you pretty much write them off next year too so it's a two-year thing so don't look for a one-year band-aid go ahead and make an investment and speaking of windows of opportunity there's Justin Mason, right on time, as always. Don't forget, everybody, to donate at donorbox.org slash TGFBI to be entered in the raffle for the Fantasy Black Book 2024 and a whole lot more prizes to be given out. Ray Kuhn from Fantrax, Jason Colette from uh, Tampa, uh, right from the Rays organization, and uh, Justin Mason, we'll kick it back to you for more Potapalooza, baby. Well, you guys were as bold as bold can be. I appreciate you guys coming on for the hour and – and uh, I was as just, bald as bald could be. Yeah, I'm, is, I'm right I there with I you, brother. Yes. Yeah, like, you know, it's just, unfortunately, our brains can't sustain all the power it needs for knowledge and hair at the same time. 
Uh, so we got to do what we got to do and just, you know, grow it on our face so that way we've got some sort of warmth. Uh, You're just migrating was, south like everything does when you get old. <laughs> it was an absolute pleasure uh, to listen to you guys. I appreciate you taking over for an hour so that way I could uh, get my bougie kids Starbucks. Uh, <laughs> apparently that's something that I have to do now. Uh, I had to do that last week because I have a teenage daughter who's 14 just recently turned and another one's turning 12. So, yeah, it's, I feel you, bro. I feel you. Yeah, Lots of yeah. frappuccinos. I have a yeah, five-year-old that thinks she's 14, too. so he's there getting stuff today, too. There you go. There <laughs> you go. Yeah, so I uh, appreciate you guys. Uh, make sure you're following all these guys on mm -hmm. social media because they do a fantastic job and so you can read all their content or listen to all their content since – Everybody here does podcasting and writing. I'm going to boot you guys out unceremoniously like I always do so I can get ready to bring in the next crew. See you guys later. We are raising money for Fantasy Cares today. Uh, it is a fantastic organization that uh, 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 donates to a lot of charitable organizations, including Toys for Tots where they donate tens of thousands of dollars worth of toys every single year. Scott Fish is the main man over there. Uh, and they, they might be donating a pretty cool prize uh, at some point during Potapalooza. So keep those donations coming in. Every dollar you donate gets you entered in to win raffle prizes. Currently, uh, we have raised almost $1,000 today. You add that on to what the TGFBI and TGFBI satellite participants have raised, and we have raised over $7,000 between TGFBI and Potapalooza, uh, and that is amazing. Every $1,000 we raise, I'm going to give away a spot in next year's TGFBI. So we've already uh, done a 1000 or almost done $1,000 today for Potapalooza, six thousand dollars for uh tgfbi or from tgfbi participants so that's seven spots in next year's tgfbi that i'll be giving away plus we've got uh jerseys we uh including i have an extra sean bouchard jersey i don't know if people like sean bouchard but he won me a bunch of money last year in the nfbc so i accidentally ordered two one for me one for someone here we've got bobbleheads we've got baseball cards we've got subscriptions to a number of different places and sites and tools including this guy derek cardi's be giving away something really cool derek welcome to the show let everybody know where you can reach what you do and what you're giving away yeah thanks uh you can find me on twitter at derek cardi uh, probably best known for the Bad X projection system. You can find it at Fangraphs for free for season long. Uh, if you do DFS, you can find it at Roto Grinders during the season, sports betting at EV Analytics. I'm giving away a free subscription uh, to the Bad X at EV Analytics for sports betting. Uh, so uh, one lucky person is going to get one of those. All right. And joining him today for this panel is John Legaza. Of the athletic, my friend. How you doing, Justin? What's going on, man? I'm dying thinking about the idea of bold projections. Doing ten bold projections for next year, or maybe the fact that no one's ever said they had an extra Sam Bouchard jersey. Yeah, right, right. Yeah. Sean Bouchard, like just random people winning you money. You gotta love it. That's yeah. what uh, that's what betting and DFS and fantasy is all about. The random you know, guy that comes through for you in the end or disappoints you in the end. Uh, you guys are going to be talking about some amazing stuff in terms of betting. I'm really excited because I'm starting to get into the betting like everybody else is. So I'm going to be listening from behind the scenes, trying to take notes and learn as much as I can. You guys have a really, really fun hour, and I will see you guys in a little, a little later. All right, Derek, let's do it to it, man. Fastest hour of Potapalooza coming at you. Grab your sword, grab your shield. It's 300, baby, where we give the books nothing, but we take from them everything. Derek, I kid, but not really, man, because, right, you and I talk about this stuff all the time, on air, off air, behind and in front of the curtain. Man, it's more than just math. It's attitude, right? It's, man, it's wherewithal, intestinal fortitude, Grill Monsoon used to say, you know, going to get it in these betting streets. I'm glad Justin mentioned that, you know, he has kind of a peaking interest going on. And I think you and I, Derek, maybe more so than you, really do a very good job of, of filling in that, that gap, right? Kind of bridging that gap between 
fantasy players, which is a certain type of game, but then betting, which has become, listen, it's prevalent and it's legalized and listen, it's legitimate business. So let's go get it. You already did your introduction. Do you have any other shameless self-promotions you'd like to go through? No, that's about it. You know, the bad X is, uh, is, is, is kind of my thing. And yeah, it's so, pretty yeah. good. From what I hear, yeah, it's, pretty, pretty it's pretty good. <laughs> it's, pretty, it's pretty, it's pretty good stuff. Again, if you want any shameless self promotion of Derek's work, you could just follow me at Twitter at John yeah. Magaza. Derek, you are an integral part of my work, and not just because I love your hair, think you're super handsome, but because, gosh, not only do you add so much, you make it available. It's out there for free. You're also an open book. Like I know I have come at you. Again, not this be argumentative or combative. But that's exactly it. You're malleable. You want to see what other people think. And you're kind of willing to adjust. And I really respect that. I can think of a few conversations we've had that ended with you saying, that's a good point. Where a lot of times the progenitor of systems, models, and stuff can become a little arrogant. We're going to actually touch on arrogance a little bit later on where it pushes up against confidence. And where I think you need to kind of toe that line, pushing up against Right, very sharp kind of Vegas market. So without any further ado, let's dive right into the thing, man. Let's start at the beginning, betting 101, where I put fun, but still business, because I think that's important. Again, I mentioned attitude. I'm known for being kind of brash and out there, a lot of fun and wild, but I think that's part of what helps me sustain in a betting market that sometimes will just wallop you, and you need to keep a good attitude. So... How about for you? Let's start at the beginning. Like I said, what's your best advice to someone before they even lay their first bet? What does Derek Cardi have to say to them? It's such a broad question because there's so there's so many important things that casual player or casual bettors don't understand. But I think the, the very first thing you have to do if you're going to start betting is you have to decide what your goal is. And that may sound obvious, but it's not for some people. Like, is your goal really just to have fun? You're a Yankees fan and you're watching the game and you want to bet on the Yankees to win and Aaron Judge to hit home run and like, that's fine. That is the way a lot of people bet and there's nothing wrong with that. That's very different though than if your goal is making money. If your goal is profiting and winning bets, that's an entirely different thing and you need to approach it entirely differently. So just having that right off the bat, what do I want to get out of this? I think it's super important. Um, you kind of alluded to it earlier where especially if you are looking to be profitable uh the swings are are huge you kind of need to have i forget what you call it like the mental kind of the mental fortitude basically you need the acuity. yeah you need that fortitude you do you do because you're gonna go on streaks where all you do is lose and you feel terrible and then you're gonna go on streaks where it feels like sports betting is the easiest thing in the world but like you need to stay kind of even keeled throughout that whole thing both of the last couple years by the end of April, a full month, both years, I was I was down. I was losing losing bets for an entire month, um, and it just it happens. Um, but you have to realize it's random. If your process is good, you're going to be fine, and that's always been the case for me. Um, but like it happens to the best betters, so that's that's something you have to be aware of going in that that's going to happen, and don't freak out. <laughs> now think think about this. This is so you're 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 going to hit us with your answer. I'm going to see if I can digest some of it for the people out there. And I, what I want to highlight in that answer, which again, I wasn't prepped for, is Mr. Math, Mr. Analytics, Mr. Number Spreadsheet guy didn't mention a single mathematical equation, not a single formula, right, or predictive metric in that. So first things first, people, even for the most analytically driven better, people with hard and experience, they understand that there's more to it. There's a subjective element to it that is going to lead into self-control and discipline. And again, where I think then being regimented is really important. We're going to touch on risk management later, but I thought that was the most important thing. Check out mine, Derek. This is something that, again, I have a background in trading, so I've kind of taken some serious lumps that might as well have been gambling losses. It's the same idea. My best advice for someone first starting is winning is very easy. Losing is very hard, right? And it's how you act during those losing streaks that will define your output over long term. The best advice I've gotten and that I'd like to give people is, we call it a trading combine, call it a betting combine. You don't need to bet live money on your first day. So if someone were to come to me and say, John, I want to work for you as a trader under me, as a better under me, I'd say, okay, the first thing you need to do in our combine is prove to me 
45 days of profitable betting. You could bet on paper, people, especially for beginners. This is very important. 45 days is a drop in the bucket compared to the long sample of our lives, right? You don't need physical tools. You could gamble well into your 60s and 70s. Not a big deal. So it's very important to set the foundation first. Prove to yourself that you can be profitable over 45 days. Guess what, Derek? Most people aren't. Not once, not twice, not three times, four times. And then I start getting the responses of, dude, I would be down four buy-ins right now, but I'm not. I'm even. And now instead of letting those buy-ins compound and snowball into bad decisions, they end up learning during the process. So, people, that's the best advice I have is to put yourself through a combine. Everyone thinks they're, what if I make a million dollars in the first 30 days? <laughs> Guess what? That, that's like not going to happen, right? That's not going yeah. to happen. The smile on your face says it all. we got two rows of teeth, man. That's very simple, people. Even if you're going to play for fun, you need to manage that risk. You never want to play with money. You don't want to lose. I like to gear more towards people that are looking to do this and stay in the arena. So that was really good. All right. How about I, this? I want to um, yeah, jump no, on one of the points you made there. Yeah. yeah. So um, sorry. I lost my train of thought. Um, the combine, oh, maybe? What's that? The combine, maybe? I was trying to steer you back. No. Um, so basically, uh, the point I was going to make was – oh, right, right, right. So – a lot of, I mean, a lot of people, most people think they're going to bet and they're going to win. Um, like they think, you know, I watch sports my whole life. I know this game. This is easy. I'm going to be able to be profitable. Like no problem. Uh, chances are, if that's the approach you're coming with, you're not going to be profitable. You're, you're going to, you're going to lose a lot of money. Um, so doing like kind of the on paper betting to start is good. And then also kind of understanding that it's not about your your sports knowledge. Like it's really not, um, especially just the kind of basic stuff that like most sports fans know, like, all right, I'm going to watch the Yankees game today. And, uh, you know, Garrett Cole's really good. So I'm going to, you know, I, I just feel like he's going to have a great game. So I'm going to bet on Garrett Cole over eight and a half strikeouts today because that's where the line is. And I just think he's going to have a good game. So I'm just going to bet the over. You're going to lose. Like if that's the way you're betting, you're going to lose. You should never be locked into – this guy's going to have a great game. I just, I'm just going to bet the over no matter what, or the opposite. I'm going to bet the under because I think he's going to be terrible. There should be a point for every single player, every single day, where you would be comfortable betting the over or betting the under. Let's say Garrett Cole, you think he's going to have a great game, but for whatever reason, the sports book hangs a line of 20 and a half strikeouts. Are you going to bet the over? on? No, you're not. Like That's stupid. However good a game you think he's going to have, he's not going to be that good. Or if you think he's going to be terrible, you'd still bet the over on one and a half strikeouts. Like there has to be a point for every player where you think it could go either way. And you have to be objective about that. Uh, because at the end of the day, it's all about probability. What is the probability chance that Garrett Cole goes over four and a half strikeouts, five and a half strikeouts, six and a half strikeouts, seven and a half strikeouts. And depending on where the line is set and how often you think he's going to go over the line or under the line, that's how you bet. You don't bet based on gut feel. I think he's going to have a great game. And if you are doing that, at the very least, try to define what that is. What is a great game in your mind? I think he's going to have six strikeouts. I think he's going to have seven. I think he's going to have eight. Um, and that's so crucial for casual bettors that they just yeah. don't understand. Yeah. Now, if we could actually we could quantify that for people in this wonderful you know internet age we live in of ubiquitous information. I've been using Yahoo has a great tool. So I could put the link on Twitter later on because, again, we don't want to just tell people this. I want, we want to show them how to actually go get it. It's really very simple. There are odds calculators that are brilliant. They're very simple to use. Again, Yahoo has one. I think it's the Yahoo odds calculator. And you could enter the you know odd minus 110, minus 130, minus 150. It will give you the probability to help you quantify. Right? You don't actually have to do this math. That's why we have calculators. I love when people brag about being able to do stuff in their head that you could just do on the side. Like, yeah, so it doesn't matter. Yeah, properly, there's right? lots of them out there. Yeah, I use the one at EV Analytics. You just put in the odds and it tells you exactly 53.5% is the break even. So shame on me. First, <laughs> first, first rake step is my host today. Sorry, Justin was not promoting my guest who has his own okay. odd calculator. So yes, I would use Terrace because Yahoo's, you know, it's not, it's just not as good. But the, the point is you could physically and objectively quantify these things yeah. and you will become familiar with it and start to understand why we'll probably mention line shopping and how important it is. Obviously, price matters. People think of it this way. Again, internet age. 
information is ubiquitous. If you were to go into a store and you wanted a soda for some reason, and it's two dollars on shelf A and a dollar ninety on shelf B, some people say, "Well, ten cents is stupid. I don't care about ten cents." You have to think about things in terms of percentages. That five percent is can be the difference between using red ink and black ink at the end of a season. They're off to a six star. All right, so I know I did start you off a little vague. Now, how about a little bit more specifically? If you could go back now, not to when you were like a little kid and give yourself the winner to every World Series. <laughs> the, Der the adult Derek Hardy, who is, I don't want to say new to betting, but right, you've kind of really pushed into it the last couple of years. Just in that set, is there any advice you would go back and give yourself right off the bat? Like before you got in, like, is there a, a big mistake maybe that you've addressed personally? Um, I think honestly, it would probably be like the whole emotional component of it. Like I went into sports betting, having been super successful in DFS, having the bat right. built, like knowing it was really good. Um, and until you actually bet for a while, you kind of like, you can theorize it, but you don't understand what those swings are really like, um, and what, what it feels like to go through them. So really it would just be kind of trying to prepare myself for that as opposed to just thinking like, I'm going to do well, and it's kind of just going to be, you know, well all along. And that's not the case. Like it's up and down and up and down. <laughs> yeah. Having to, again, you know, I like to, you okay, having trading background, there are a lot of crossovers and similarities when we kind of draw up this Venn diagram and let's you, you know, pick the most popular stock, right? Amazon stock is a great example. So if you were to take a five-year view of an Amazon stock, it's a literal straight line up. So you could say, oh, well, everybody made money at every single point going forward. All you had to do was hold. However, as you get that optometrist thing, I'll click, 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 and start to zoom in, <laughs> you realize that within that straight line, that, you know, moving like vertical perpetuity, like it's insane really, is actually full of tons of ebbs and flows. And even within there, there might be a six month, you know, ebb right there where you might have eaten like a 30% loss. You might've taken a bath. You got killed while, you know, your neighbor, the janitor who bought early and just held made money. So perspective and time frames really matter. And again, this is something that you can correct during the combine, thinking of things in a longer term, where you might say, wow, I didn't make money over 45 days. I actually lost 8% or something like that. That's really bad. I want to put that into the lesson that I want. This is another one. My first one is really just be confident and follow your work. Meaning when I first started modeling, sometimes I'd be like, man, I have the Pirates winning and no one else does. So the Pirates can't win. But it's I, I get in a lot of trouble with this, with like the old school kind of gambling crowd out there that's become prominent on Twitter now that like, a lot of times, Derek, once the whistle blows or the game starts, a lot of these games are closer to 50-50, in my honest opinion, than we think they are. You know what I mean? Oh, it's yeah, just, definitely. Right. It's easy to allow the spreadsheet to kind of take over. But my real lesson is this, and it's more than just kind of a catchy phrase, and it's no bet is better than a bad bet. And this one I really – I've left with people. It resonates, and it matters. People, check it out. Why do I say no bet is better than a bad bet? And why no action is better than a bad bet. Again, we want to objectively quantify these things, put the feather in the cap so you can use it going forward. If you start with $100 and you were to lose 10%, Derek, easy math, you'd be down to $90, right? Pretty simple. Now, if you were to make a bet and win back 10%, you'd only be at 99 Now, some people, again, that person that said, well, 10% on a soda is stupid. That dollar is a huge difference. It's 1% loss. And if you were to repeat that same up 10%, down 10%, Guess who's going broke? Like, guess who's going straight up broke in the market? So, again, to put those numbers in real life, for every 10% you lose, you need to win 11% back. So it's really very, very, very important to – I used to call it three scratches of the chin. Like, when I go, oh, man. Oh, man. Oh, man. I'm out. Too much <laughs> uncertainty and I'm out. Now, granted, you make an excellent point about the odds. You could scratch your chin three times on a plus 500. That's a different story. But I, you know what I mean? I was talking about more single bets, straight bets, yeah. kind of stacking and grinding your way to the top. So that's a really good one. Just really briefly, we're going to do props because I think that's the best overlay for fantasy. But I did want you to just address really quickly general markets. Like, again, you were like, dude, you're one of the preeminent experts in the prop field. Like, that's objective. Betting market, and I'm not saying you're not. But it's really, really tough, right? That's really tough. The menu is not what it is in props. The focus is much heavier. So do you get involved with money line, run line, over, under? Do you think the edge is really enough in props that that's where we should focus? I would say for most people that are getting into sports betting, you're probably not going to want to focus on, on those. On a per bet basis, uh, prop betting is going to be more profitable. 
once you start to get more advanced, you run into issues where books are limiting your account. You need to figure out ways to keep your account, you know, under the radar. Like you want to get just more volume down because they won't let you bet, you know, several thousand dollars on a prop. Then you need to start, you know, looking at main markets like money line, run line, that kind of thing. Um, rule of thumb with sports betting, the more popular a market, the sharper it's going to be and the harder it is to beat. And so money lines over unders, they're going to be harder to beat than props. Doesn't mean you can't do it, um, but they're they're harder. And the one thing I would say with that is that in my experience, the more prof uh, the more profitable bets are like your gross. I mean, this is true for for props or for anything, but the gross bets are the more are the generally the more positive EV bets because uh, the the books know you know if it's the the Dodgers against the Pirates today, like the books know people think the Dodgers are going to win. They want to bet on the Dodgers. No one wants to bet on the Pirates to beat the Dodgers. And a lot of times they give you the odds that actually make it positive expected value to bet on the Pirates. Um, so that's always. The, yeah. So that's the kind of thing. Don't be afraid to do. Obviously, look at a projection, run the numbers. But a lot of times you're going to see that. And it might be like, oh, that's gross. Uh, a lot of times. That's that's a good sign. <laughs> now you know because you're so focused on offense and scoring. I again, I've gotten in a lot. I've gotten quite a you know I've caught some flack on this one, where people think runs are like highly predictable. I push back and say they aren't, and that's why they're always listed at minus one ten. That books make their money on volume, really not like they'll always move. Right, you notice that they'll always move a total. You never move the price. The OU price, the over on the price is pretty much flat. Again, some some of them step on the scale, minus 112, but you know what I'm saying. It's minus 110. So I generally, not to tell people to avoid it, but unless I get a super strong signal, it's really for a reason. You know, we get people out there that just flat bet 07 and a half. And I'm like, I, I don't know if that's pretty much wise. Do you have any take on those? That's what I was getting with like flat bets, you know. Uh, Garrett Cole is facing, I don't know, whatever, uh, Yamamoto or something. And the total comes out at 06, you know, and some people just kind of go over and I'm like, oh, I'm not always there in that. Do you have any blind stuff? Do you always run it through the model, I guess? Pretty much. Yeah. yeah I yeah, see yeah, what sure. the model says. I see what the probability is compared to the odds. And then, um, at least as a starting point, you know, I may decide, you know, I like this bet a little bit more than the model does. I like this bet a little bit less, but that's always where I'm starting. Yeah, those are always really tough. And again, you know, that that's 90% of the bad beat complaints in baseball are are totals, right? You're you're over eight and a half. And it, I've done it myself. I hate doing it. I've done it myself. We're going to address losing at the end if we have time. But uh, 14 hits and eight walks, and I didn't get anything, and you're pulling your hair out. And you, you just got to understand that's a good cap. You put yourself in a strong probabilistic scenario to win, and it just didn't happen, right? And that's why you yeah. balance these things. It's also why I've been finding with baseball – would, there's something I noticed that you do also. I need to expand my volume a little bit. Sometimes, again, this is – I was wondering if you were going to mention this as a model player. So my model actually quantifies these things, but we also have to be very careful that when we're getting to decimal points, like, you know, I have a, this is a 56% probability and this is a 54. Yeah. You have to choose one, right? And now it becomes very binary, where if you keep picking the one that's the loser, you were on plus EV hits, but you didn't give yourself enough time to have it smoothed out. So that was cool. Just to give people an idea that the general market is out there, but it is very difficult. Don't be too confident with these OUs because they'll get you in trouble. I want to mention one thing, and then I want your take on it. One general market that I have had a lot of success in, that which is funny, you mentioned limiting. Derek, I've actually kind of had books respond to my work, being one of the first people to really push F5 betting into the four. The idea being with me was very simple. The prices are very comparable. But you don't have to worry about bullpens, which are wonky, roll, usage, health. It's all very wonky. And if you have a favorite that's like tied after five innings, you're probably upset about that. You don't want to win it at the end. You want it to be ahead because generally the handicapping is based on starting pitching performance. So I like F5s. One, because if you bet the money line on a favorite and it's tied, you get your money, you're out. I also like to bet the plus half run. Let's use your example, Dodgers Pirates. You will get. The Pirates' first five run line, what that means, people, is you get a half a run through a five, meaning you can cash your bet on a tie. Those are the games that I really like to focus on, where I think I have a comparable pitching matchup where I could just tie it through five. It's only 15 outs, bro. So I, do you do any F5 betting, Derek? 
And if so, do you think, do you like the idea of eliminating the bullpen variable? So I don't, but I do think there's probably a good amount of value in it. It's more just like I haven't had the time to really yeah, dive yeah. into it. First five is a derivative market where the odds are going to be set pretty much just based on what the full game line is. But it's not going to account for a lot of those variables. Like, okay, maybe the game line looks this way, but it's because this team has a super elite bullpen, and that's not going to factor into the first five lines. So like that, those kind of things you can definitely find edges with, I'm sure. Yeah. Um, and kind of like the rule of thumb I said before, the more popular a market, uh, the sharper it's going to be. So your popular markets are going to be your money line and your over-unders. And first five is kind of under that. So those are going to definitely have more edge than uh, than like your real, you know, right. your real big stuff. Yeah. A couple of years ago it was the Marlins. Last year it was the A's. So you get these perpetually bad teams that might be competitive for five, but have terrible bullpens and sub, you know, average offenses that end up getting smoked. And the next day people see, well, it was eight, two. If Dodgers beat the A's eight, two. So you've gotten smashed Dodgers minus three fifty again. Meanwhile, we were hitting the F5 every, every night, you know, so, um, Sandy Alcantara, the Marlins, idea being if you could find even a strong five and dive player, you can get great odds on tie games, people. That's the one general market I do like. All right, let's get into the overlap between fantasy and betting. I've done enough talking. Talk to our fantasy players out there why they might want to look at, at prop betting and maybe any advantages to adding it to a portfolio. The biggest advantage is because it's fun. So just, just right off the bat, it's fun. Like, it's basically the fantasy version of betting. Like fantasy players are accustomed to rooting for things on the player level. You know, you have this guy on your team, you're rooting for this guy. Um, if you're betting a, you know, a, an over under or a money line, you're rooting on team outcomes basically. But for props, you can root on those individual player outcomes the same as you can for fantasy. And that's fun. And it makes it very easy to kind of understand what you're doing right away. You don't have to understand what the you know, Dodgers minus 270 means you, you should know what those mean, but like, and that they have a place in prop betting, but like, it is just easier to conceptualize like, okay, Garrett Cole over six and a half strikeouts. You want to make sure you're getting the right odds with it. Um, but it, it's a pretty easy entrance way from fantasy um, into betting. And, uh, and because they're not as popular as game lines, you know, people who've been betting forever, uh, you know, the, the sharp betters that are 60, 70 years old that we talked about, like they they didn't have props when they were younger. They no didn't clue. come from fantasy. Like they're used to betting those big big game lines. That's where most of the action comes in on. And so the books don't take the time uh, to make their prop lines as sharp. And so they're easier to beat. Uh, so yeah, they're, prop they're lines almost feel reactionary, right? They like they they almost put it out knowing the first line is going to move. Like they, it, it very much feels that way because they're more illiquid, like you mentioned, that almost any action starts to shift it. I'm oh, yeah. sure you've noticed this. I've noticed this. It is, I mean, again, I've, I've watched your work there. So I know it happens on my show also in real time. Odds are literally changing as we're giving, as we're giving plays and people are hitting stuff at nine in the morning, it's moving. Yeah. You know, so I know for a fact I had at least one or two line makers in my chat room every day because that's a really good place to find out where, again, where maybe a sharp is and going to bring some action and maybe they could get in front of it or maybe smooth out their own lines before it happens. One thing I wanted to add on top of that, this is funny because so I'm a very conservative season long fantasy player. And so prop betting allows me to live that adventure, right? To be that, to be that guy I'm, I'm afraid to be in the draft room because again, we're married to these guys for six whole months. So the idea of Royce Lewis is a lot sexier than actually having to rely on him for 155 games, which realistically is probably like a fifth percentile outcome. But, but you can get full exposure, right? To get your Ellie Dela Cruz, man. Get your Royce Lewis, get all your heavy kind of lefty righty splits. And those guys, I found, again, you're very good with uh, environmental adjustments, let's call them. I find, Derek, I think that's where you've really created a, like a real serious edge. Split plus park plus weather pitching style, amalgamating those things and finding value in these backup players, which again, the book is like, I don't know, who's this Mike Ford guy? What do you think about Mike Ford? <laughs> and all of a sudden, you know, we're like, yeah, we can't, we can't wait for Mike Ford to hit the lineup. Or actually, he was the I should have thought of Ryan O'Hearn was really my guy because he was legit good when he played. And he's kind of irrelevant, right? He's not, I mean, I don't want to knock these guys. These are the best athletes in the world, but it's, right. you know, it's not a household name. So he's not a guy you're drafting in the second round of your, of your, exactly, you know, your, your exactly, right? <laughs> there is an element of 
narrative and prominence that drives the opening lines. That is like absolutely a thing where, I mean, we see it. I don't want to forget. We're going to get to it later on. But like, uh, for me, home run prop prices are disgusting. They don't at all reflect actual probabilities, but they know people are going to chase, you know, Kyle Schwarber every single day or Pete Alonso. Like, for me, I know if it's not plus 350 or better, I'm not betting on the home run. Anyway, okay, let's get back into it. Back on track here. Let's see. Um, okay, let's let's well, zoom the, out. the other the other part just to quick. Well, go, yeah, if, go. If, yeah, if you're one of these people that likes to draft your Royce Lewis and your Ellie De La Cruz and your season long, when they're in the minors in May and your team is dead, <laughs> you can just pop it and you can still have fun following the season. <laughs> Derek, you we you know what? We pretty good, man. We made 20, 80 minutes before you troll people and upset them. <laughs> <laughs> but it's it. You know, again, you uh, this is part of the positive attitude that you have to have that you have that I feel like I share of there are failures, there are foibles. Don't invite them because I feel like that's what people are doing, especially paying a premium for, you know, prospects and stuff, which Derek, you and I, t- I actually got a great company with Salfino. Salfino's like, I can't bother you. You're part of the Cardi lineage. <laughs> Of prospects, dude, and he like thought he was insulting me. I was like, oh, I was polishing my badge, you know. I was really <laughs> proud of that, dude. It's all probabilistic scenario, and again, fantasy is a long time, you know, a long term investment relative to props. Where again, I just think you can get that same exposure with a more immediate cash out for a player whose profile lends itself to exactly that. All right, let's zoom out a little bit. This is your thing right here. We get a ton of this. You touched on it, but I really want you to expand. The floor is yours. Why do people need to use models and projections? There are people just kill me with this. Do you even watch the games? I, I just can't. So the, the best that you can, explain to any newbies why why they want to be not right, not absolutely subscribing to everything. I mean, I'm not paying for your work. I mean, but Derek said so, and he's the infallible authority. Why do they want to lean on this stuff? Help them out, man. Uh, You want to lean on projections and models because you're probably going to lose money if you don't. Um, It's like I say that and like it sounds like I'm like, you know, trying to goad people. But it is actually true. The number of people that aren't using projections and models and are actually profitable betters are the number is so small. Like it's very, very difficult to do because the books aren't stupid. Like they know this guy's good. They know this guy's pitching in Coors Field today. They like they know this stuff. So um, all the stuff that you're like, oh, my sports knowledge. I know so much about this, this, and this. And like, you're you probably don't. Like, you probably aren't actually considering things that the book isn't already considering in their line. And if the book's already considering it in their line, you don't have an edge. You're just going to lose to the rake. Yep. Um, so projections, they help you stay objective for one thing. They help you find edges on things that the book may not be considering uh, because it's able to, you know, run models and, and consider, you know, just different things that the book, like we said, the books aren't spending a ton of time putting their prop lines together because they're more focused on, um, you know, their game lines. And there's just so many players and so many props to put together anyway, that it's not conceivable for them to really like spend a bunch of time on all of them. So there's always going to be edges to find. And projections are the easy way to do it. It also saves you time. Yeah. Instead of having to, you know, go through and look at every game and every player and be like, well, I think this guy to hit a home run at plus 400 looks pretty good based on my gut. Like the system will look at every single one of them in the blink of an eye and tell you, okay, this guy, this guy, this guy, and this guy, they theoretically have the best odds today. And then from there, you don't have to place those bets, but it's a great place to start to be like, okay, this is where the model sees value. Uh, what do I want to do with this? I wrote down bias elimination, which is pretty much what you said. I'm going to kick it right back to you because there's one term that you didn't mention that I was I was expecting, and it's something you taught me firsthand, and it's the danger of double counting. Oh, so yeah. I had, again, um, you know, I'm very clear about my losses as part of the game. You know, I think they strengthen me, iron sharpens iron, all that good stuff. I love statistics and stat cast, and it's almost similar to how you mentioned old school betters didn't bet props. So the prop market comes out, and it's almost like a refresh. That almost happened with StatCast, right? So we get this new understanding of the ball in flight and how it may change, you know, the way that we see the game, analyze it, and then bet on it. And not everyone is doing that. What happens when you introduce new information? There is a risk of misuse, overuse, or 
double counting. I was that guy, Derek, that kept citing all these different power stats that all meant the same thing. And that's mm -hmm. something people need to be careful of, right? Listen, hard hit rate is important. And especially if you're combining it with lift, and then especially if you're combining it with pull, right? So it's not irrelevant. But for somebody like me, when I first started citing hard hit rate and barrel and blast and ex-Wobicon, and it's like, they're almost quite literally, almost all saying the same thing. You're just strong contact quality. Right. Which you don't, again you don't is have four different data points in your favor. That's you kind of have thing. one that's, you know. Do you have anything to expand for double counting or maybe a good another example of it? I know I don't mean to put you on the spot if that was the best example, but no, I think done that's a, good a lot of work talking about it, yeah. Yeah, and the more you bet, the and the more you're kind of understanding what goes into the projections you're using, uh, the more you can identify what's being accounted for in the market and what isn't. Like you're going to notice patterns over time. Like this guy, um, someone actually mentioned in chat earlier, this is one of the great ones. Like uh, uh, guys that get pinch hit for a lot, you can, a lot of times you can find they're under, um, they're under on their hits uh, at really good value because the books don't know they're going to get pinch hit for a lot. And so you do that enough and you start to realize, oh, uh, this guy gets pinch hit for, I'm seeing value on him and I see it for him again tomorrow. And then another similar guy the next day. And like, you can start to pick up, okay, where the biases in the books are and how you can attack them. That's a, re that's a really good, that's a really good one. That kind of leads into the next one. I, I know we mentioned mistakes earlier, but I wanted to get, right, we're trying to, Justin asked us to appeal to new players. They have a certain amount of, trust in us you have a very very like unique experience of entry level players Derek your work is so good it's cutting edge innovative so you you know naturally new players kind of gravitate to you then all your discords and chats and all this other stuff where do you think the average player screws up the most is there one that maybe we didn't mention we probably might we might have covered it if it's risk or arrogance double counting statistics maybe just a matter of all maybe it's just humility but yeah, I think we've kind of covered this already. Like I, I would say basically like the I know sports so I can beat the books kind of humility, mentality. right? Yeah. Humility. And I think, again, people, you know, it's not to keep pushing the sky up. He's our guest here. Derek, he's freaking brilliant, man. Notice he's not arrogant about it. He's confident without being arrogant, understanding that with good work, it validates implied probability. You push your chips in the middle and then you kind of disconnect from those things, right? You don't want to be sour. You don't want to be beating yourself up. Also, one thing you meant, if you noticed that he did not mention was flip-flopping, right? Uh, he went through a losing streak and all of a sudden started questioning his work. No, oh, yeah. the work was done. The promise was made. Then the execution happens. And I'd say you kind of deal with it, but you kind of deal with it, right? You Yeah. As long as you're confident that your process is good and a, a short-term run of bad results should not Shake your confidence in that. Derek, that's another one that kind of comes with the combine is success through process will validate, you know, the confidence in actually investing. And if you start with live money, and again, some people, which is the biggest mistake, is start with like a lot of money, right? Well, you know, I've been I've been watching. I feel like I've been doing pretty good. You know, I've been, tra I've been tracking the last couple of days. I think I'm doing pretty good. Oh, man, I knew that was going to happen. I knew that was going to happen. <laughs> people go and put a week's pay or a mortgage payment in there. And get themselves in trouble, and then all of a sudden you're kind of you're chasing, right? Which is what so if you're one of these people that's watching a game and being like, I knew that was gonna happen, you have the wrong mentality because Dude, that was the mistake we were looking for. Look, we got through it. That was the yeah. that's the exactly that is the most succinct succinct way to put that is the like hindsight observant, like subjective better. Oh man, I knew I knew that, you know. And then the best is I'll get the DM that's like, Oh, you know, what, what happened to the brewers? And I'm like, Well. Show me the ticket for the A's, right? Show me the ticket. Why did Ben? Well, that, what are we talking? What are we talking about here, right? You've said that also. If somebody's going to come at your throat, bet the other side, right? Bet the other side, right? How confident you were confident enough to talk, you know, shite on Twitter, but not confident enough to put your money where your mouth is. So those are well, these are all things that build into the, you know, your and your those persona. type of people don't understand the whole probability aspect yeah. of it. Like, okay. You you recommended the Brewers today. It's probably because you think they have a 70% chance of winning and the Lion thinks they have a 65% chance of winning. And so you have edge, but there's 30% of the time they're still going to lose. Um, you'd make the bet every time because it's positive expected value, but yeah. like you're not expecting to win every single bet. That That's, I think, another key thing for um, for people just getting into it. Like don't expect to win every bet. You're going to lose a lot of them. Um, yeah, just really quick. Yeah, expectations 
for so again, I have uh, I have some background in trading at a very high level, and then you get into bet, sports betting, and that is the biggest disparity in in attitudes or the expectations. Meaning, so a, a sports better expects to like double their money every single night, all the way. Right? They want to bet a hundred, want to win a hundred, or they sometimes even more. They want to hit plus thousand parlays every single day. Whereas if you speak to an actual like professional trader and you told them, yo man, I did like five and a half percent this year. Like, wow, that's pretty way to go, Johnny. Pretty way to go, man. That's, that's really great. Yeah. And if, if you tell if novice sports betters, you know, I, I did five and a half percent. Like, so they go, wait, so if I start $100, I'm going to have five bucks. And you're like, well, that's when, if you ever heard it takes money to make money. It's not because Warren Buffett bet a zillion dollars on one play and cashed out the next day. Yeah. You know, you're building incrementally, and this is going to get to the next one, where my, one of the things that I like to help people with, and I when it gets into the risk uh, risk stuff, is units. So briefly, people, units are one of the most misleading things in the betting space. It's meant well. The idea is the unit is kind of what you bet. However, because it has a nebulous description that is not tied to a percentage gain or outcome, this is where touts and the fakes and the fugazis mislead people. Okay, so I have found the best way to cancel out all this stuff. If everyone, let's say, call them out, but question people to find out exactly where they are, is ask for ROI. In particular, Derek, I like to make my units a percentage of stack. So therefore, they work in perfect accordance and it works for everybody, meaning I only have 100 units. Once if I lose 100 units, I have a, you know, a do rag tied to a stick and I'm like selling rotten oranges on the side of the highway. Like it's over. You know, we have people, I bet. The 50,000 unit mega max whale. <laughs> if you bet 50 units, what do you have? But how many units are there? You know what I mean? So yeah. I find a good way to do it is, is if you start with what you have, then you could tell yourself, well, I only bet two and a half percent per day. And now that's your daily unit size. And then I work backwards. So if you have, let's say you bet a unit a day and you have 10 plays, you could bet a tenth of a unit. Where people get in trouble is they're only supposed to bet a unit a day. But they get 10 plays, so they bet 10 times that. Mm -hmm. Do you have anything to throw in on units? I know this wasn't in the sheet, but you do a lot of good work cutting through the fog of war, Derek. And units are at the center of this, so just, just take it away. Yeah, I mean, I keep a, a public sheet where you can see every bet I've ever um, ever recommended publicly and, and how it's done, um, and I've done really well. Um, but uh, it is important. Like, I don't do any of, like, the the sketchy, you know, 50 unit max whale bet kind of thing, like, which is just so bad. Um, it's just a way to try to get engagement and, and draw people in and make it seem like, you know, something like, I know this is going to happen uh, when we don't like, we know probability that that's the best we can actually do. Um, so basically every bet that I put out, I'm not saying this one's 10 units, this one's 20 units. Like they're all, it's all centered on one unit for everything. And, uh, and, and so for me, like maybe that will mean I'm betting five or 10% of my bankroll in a day, but I'm fine doing that because um, I think that's all right. Um, just listen, if it's part of your plan, it's okay. And mm -hmm. that's why I wanted to highlight it because though you and I do it differently, those are the two correct ways to do it. So yeah. you could tie it directly to units to stack to just clear it. Or if not, and you're going Derek's route, that's why he provides you with ROI because ROI really is is the base, right? That's the base right there. There's no, there's no fooling that, right? When you get people there up 200 units, but if you were to do all the math, you might find out that same person's only up three or 4% because they're betting 50 things a day and they just the way the math works out. So I was glad to just, hopefully we had a little bit of clarity because I get a lot of that. Like, what do I make of these units and stuff like that? And that's really it. It's, it's widgets. It's nothing. And it's, it can be very misleading if you don't have a trusted source. All right, right at the problem. What a unit should mean is yeah, go, go, go. what you're going to place on any individual bet. So right. for most people, it should be probably about 1% or less. Um, so that that's really what a unit should mean. But it can be kind of, uh, like you said, people can, can kind Vague of- Vague and shady, right? You're not trying to kill anybody for it, but it really is the truth. We're here really talking down to the most granular levels. That does not satisfy my scrutiny, right? It doesn't. That's a, that's a fair statement, right? If I was accounting and somebody just handed me units without ROI, I would still have questions. Whereas though your our accounting is different, there are no questions to be had. And I think that's the most important thing is you know exactly where the record is at and where the tout stands. 
Back to props, Derek. Do you have a favorite type? I get this all the time because people, Joe, what about outs and there's hits and walks and strikes? I literally can't keep up with it. I have found I tap into my follower base to help highlight stuff that then maybe I'll take. You mentioned specialization, me coming from general markets into prop betting. I started with like home runs, you go to total bases. Do you have a favorite? Like, is there something that you've identified maybe that's more steady, sticky, profitable or whatever? It changes over time because you constantly have to be adjusting to the adjustments that the books are making. So um, two, I think it was two years ago, maybe three years ago, uh, books were terrible at making stolen base props. Stolen base props, like a guy should should have been, you know, like plus 400 for a stolen base. And they were offering like, like, so like four to one and they were offering like 10 to one or 15 to one, like just crazy, crazy value. Um, they weren't accounting for matchups. Like they had no idea that you no know, cinder guard was so easy to steal on. Like they, they just had no idea about this stuff. Um, and, uh, and so that was super profitable for a while. I had one guy tell me he actually made a video of it. You can find it on YouTube. Um, he won a, I forget what he said there, like, like $300,000 in like three months of betting stolen base props using the bad X. Um, and then by the end of that, a lot of the books stopped, stopped offering them because I, I guess, cause they were getting crushed so much. Like they just straight up, were not offering stolen bases anymore for the rest of the year. Um, so again, I mean, if they make that adjustment, well, you can't bet on stolen base props anymore. Um, there's still some value on them. Most books offer them, but it's not what it was a few years ago. So it's constantly kind of trying to find those edges, like the pinch hit stuff I found value in. Um, but a lot of times it's only for like a couple days, like, you know, a guy, um, has a good pinch hit rate projection. Um, and then he gets pinch hit for one day and gets pinch hit for the next day. And then all of a sudden there's no value on his line anymore because the book realizes it. Like right. To that point, if you, and you probably might remember, I would tag you whenever it would happen that we'd get these under uh, the line over under earned runs would be set at a half for a lot of guys. Right. And it's very easy to say, the Pirates who can't score Jacob DeGrom or Shane McClanahan or whatever it may be, those type of guys, they almost always hit. They, oh, the over almost always hits. That's one of those things that, like, where, again, where I think hat, using a model, at the very least, the model is going to tell you going over a half a run is almost always a, a plus EV bet. Because it's not like they make the minus 300 or anything. These are regular props. Um, my favorite, Derek. Was. This is funny too, and I'm going to give a little explainer just briefly. It was going under strikeouts. Part of that had to do with the pinch hitting stuff. Love the Giants, love the Rays. I mean, just insane stuff. The Giants are pinch hitting Michael Conforto in the fifth inning. It's crazy stuff, crazy, <laughs> crazy stuff. And the line just would, would never be adjusted. But to that, what I've noticed, where we actually found a little bit of edge on the book, hat tip to my man, well, you also, but Eno Saris would talk about this. Stabilization rates and disciplinary statistics happen faster than others. And I found the book, it literally, it looks like they were just copy and pasting like his K rate from the year before. But if you're watching the waves, you could see guys tighten up their strikeout rates. And man, we crushed on a few guys last year, just insane. Like, man, Jared Duran off the top of my head. Guys that would strike. Oh, Brandon Lowe on the on the Rays, who was kind of known as a strikeout guy, cleaned up his act. That was my mod was ringing all the time. He was literally a plus 250 every day for a week, a week at a time. Yeah, he might strike out once that week, but we were just absolutely killing it. So people, there is value in these out in kind of, I don't know what you would call them, ancillary prop markets. And wisdom of the crowd, tap into Derek, tap into his followers, tap into myself, tap into followers. You see it on the Twitter thread sometimes that I learn for people out there. Do you have any stayaways, Derek? Uh, stay away from anything that's projected as a bad bet. Love um, that. I mean, that's really all it is. Like, I have no problem betting any market, um, you know, if it's showing value. Um, that's funny. You, you, yeah, you, you kind of got mine. I mentioned home run props. The fact that like a so really good home run hitter hits like 40 in 600 plate appearances, but you get these things listed at plus 190 sometimes is just yeah. completely broken. And I know sometimes they hit and then you have to deal with like the Twitter emojis of a minus EV bet caching. And I don't think anything makes me more nauseous because that's a really good way to get in trouble is betting. I think home run props are, it's not like, you, you nailed it. It's not that home run props are bad inherently. They're not priced at plus EV numbers almost ever. I have found like that's the most 
well, I guess efficient market for the books because they're just killing people on these things. Yeah. And then people try to especially for them. star players. Um, and, right. and it yeah, very good. over time, like two years ago, the bat thought there was like no value on home runs, like the whole year last year. Um, it thought there was more, but we had more, you know, we had like the new ball with the spike in the home run rate, but it was never on, you know, Aaron judge plus plus one fifty. Like it's on, you know, right, uh, right. Austin Nola plus yes. 2000, you know, like it's those type of guys that you can find value. It's not on the guys that are fun that you want to root for. Yeah. It's on the guys that really have a low chance. Like, the guy has a 6% chance of hitting a home run, um, but the line implies he has a 3% chance. Like those are the type of ones that you can find value on. And just to clarify, I said before, I'm okay putting down like, like, like a, a bet is like one unit. Those type of guys, you're not betting a full unit. Very good. Like you're, you're betting less on that. That's a great point. Long yeah. shot type of thing. Now there was one I threw at you this morning because I've been trying to clean up my parameters a little bit. Again, as I was doing it in real time, I noticed that I was probably making – some mistakes that I wasn't properly accounting for. So we're talking about offensive props. I wanted to look at total bases versus hit run ribby. The reason I mentioned it is right off the bat, I would notice I got in trouble with total bases. Sometimes there are a few different things. One walks would get me in trouble. Walks do not count as a total base people. You have to actually get a hit. I also noticed sometimes I would have players at home that are favorites that lose a plate appearance at the end. So I got caught in the middle of like, well, I am implying them for five runs. So I, I could and should get an extra PA, but it's, it's almost a given that they're not going to get it, especially in a heavy favorite. The games were probably targeting. So then I had people say, well, why don't you just move to hit run ribby? The guy who walks could still come around and score. Not that you're going to get a ribby on a walk, but you could score. And I've just been kind of torn with that extra stuff, do you have anything to toss people? Again, these are total bases and hit run rubies are among the more popular prop bets and people are playing those. Can you help to settle that a little bit? My answer is a boring one. It's okay. It, whichever, whichever is showing the best value, you know, you can project each of these things. And so you should, you should look at a projection. Um, like, yeah, total base. Like I can see the, you know, the, the argument, like total bases, you can win with one swing. Hits, runs, RBIs, you know, you have more outs for. You can have a sacrifice fly. You can walk and come around, score run, like whatever. Um, but at the end of the day, you just project the probability of each. You see which one offers more value. And, um, you know, and that's uh, that, that's kind of it. Um, yeah, you know, a good projection will, will account for the chance that he's going to get that fifth plate appearance, that fourth right. plate appearance. Um, you know, it's going to account for the quality of his teammate and the chance of the RBI or the run and everything. So, like, that's – that's why a projection is so good because especially if you're trying, it's not even just like you're projecting or you're trying to figure out if a guy's, you know, one guy is going to get a home run or a few strikeouts. Like you're trying to project, okay, what's his chance of getting a home run or getting a, you know, a, a hit at, or an RBI or a run. And then how do we combine? Like the human brain can't do that. Like yeah, let a computer help you. <laughs> yeah. Again, that's, you know, we, we laugh tongue in cheek a little bit, but it, it is true. We hit a certain point where, you know, the abacus is full. There's too many dials moving around. And you should rely on tech, you know, on tech for assistance. I, I have found they, I think they do a good job of balancing those two. Like maybe in the prop market, those two markets get the most focus. It doesn't mean a ton of focus, but they get the most. Because I found that they try and suck you in with a better price than the total bases, which is obviously not as probable to happen. And I get them so close. And then you get into the whole like, but every time I bet a total base, he doesn't get it and he scores and then vice versa. And like, that's the worst way to do it. I was wondering if you were even going to assert that we should be consistent. And the answer is probably not. Don't be a consistent. The only execution you should be consistent in is the probability and not the market. Again, something I found I'm very open and honest about. I said, oh, no, I'm very, uh, you know, kind of tunnel vision. I don't look at walks. John, when you're about to hit over and the walk over and the strikeout over, it wasn't until the playoffs when the games really reduced that I got a chance to look at that and said, wow, man, I may have been missing out this whole time. So being open, right, being malleable, head in a swivel, all that is probably really good advice. Let's see if I could speed through the rest of it. Um, how about the, I don't know what you want to call them, trendy betting styles. Let's combine these two. So we got SGP craze going on with the nerfy yurfy. That's mm -hmm. yes and no. First inning, I talked some smack about that online. I called it the fast food of baseball betting. I caught some heat, and I'll probably never be on that channel. To me, this stuff is kind of dumb. I go flip a coin somewhere. I just don't really understand it. 
and as far as parlays go, if you're the fun better and you work it into a long-term plan, yes, you can parlay. I don't advise it. Betting is hard. Yeah, so generally speaking, the more popular a market is, the more a book knows that casual bettors, you know, square bettors are going to be betting it and they're not really going to care about the odds that much, the worse odds they can offer. Um, I can't say for sure. I haven't actually run numbers on your fee, nerfy stuff. Um, I would imagine there's going to be less edge on that than there is on other type of derivative markets, other prop it. markets. I'm because, getting mad. I'm getting physically upset right now just talking about it. I hate it. I'm yeah, sorry. because people like people just love them. You see people talking about it. Um, and uh, when that's the it's case, on the whole of page of the game and website, people. If it's on, <laughs> the people trying to take your money, put that on the headline. <laughs> That's like all that. Oh my God, help me! Oh my God. Hey, some idiot at Barstool was betting this fifteen hundred parlay, <laughs> and you see this nine point five thousand people have played this, and you're like, oh, yeah, Par- yeah, parlays yeah. are interesting because the books make like the vast majority of their profit on parlays, and they're popular because you're not just betting a dollar to win two dollars; like you're betting a dollar to win fifty dollars sometimes, and people they want the odds. That. They they want that lottery feel. Um, and because people are bad at betting to begin with, if you're bad at betting, your parlay is just going to lose you more money quicker. But on the reverse side of that, if you're really good at betting, if you're certain you have an edge, you can do parlays and and make money. Um, and it, it's nice. I mean, this is real kind of high high level concept stuff. But like, if you're trying not to get limited. Like the books kind of profile your account. So like they look at what types of things you're doing. Are you doing things that sharps do? Or are you doing things that squares do? If you're doing parlays, that's kind of, you know. A, you're a fine. Swirl, you're welcome. The, door, the lights are on. The lights left on for you. All right, hold on. I'm going to get into the, one of the last pieces on it because we're going to run out of time. Me and you could probably put on a three-hour clinic every day. So for people, we're about to have a new season start. We only have old statistics for starting pitchers, let's say, Derek, when you throw away last year's, right? A guy, is it have to do with VLO diagnostics or I have gotten in trouble with this. Um, if you were using Lance Lynn's, you know, 2022 stats into the summer of 23, I, again, you get that do-rag and the stick out. You're probably be pretty broke. You had to adjust. Is there a proper time to adjust into the current stats? Uh, I mean, maybe we're on opposite sides here. I, I will never throw away the previous year entirely. Um, obviously, the further along you go. But then you the got more... killed on Manoa, dude. You got killed. You kept running your chin out there for Alec Manoa? No, you didn't. No, but the system would adjust to it. Like, it didn't, uh, you know. It, uh... Okay, so whatever waiting you have. Okay, so yeah, you're still, you're keep waiting on it. I get in trouble of, and this may, I may not be right, I get in trouble. Some, I know Justin talks about often that pitchers have the ability to change your trajectory the hitter, people change right. the mechanic, move on the rubber and stuff. So sometimes I find I'm like, Whoop. not saying totally discarded, but if you feel like you have this new pitcher, sometimes I, you know, do that. I wanted to ask you if you thought hitters, if being hot was a thing, I'm gonna run out of time. This no, so I mean, I'm yeah, really accounting for that as much as possible. You know, if the guy's stuff stuff gets better, you want to account for that. You don't want to treat him as the same guy as last year. Okay. So um, you will kind of adjust the dials. It'll, it'll automatically adjust. I mean, okay. just in season based on the data. What about the giant velo bump? You know what I mean? Reagan's comes out plus four miles an hour. Schoolgirl school comes out four miles an hour. Kind of a different picture. You know what I mean? Well, I mean, that's in the bat. If the guy's velo goes up, the bat knows about it. And it, it okay, okay. All right. Project. Yeah. Unfortunately, I would love to hear you guys do another couple hours How good was of that, this. Come on, yeah, bro. that was fantastic. I want to thank you guys so much for coming on. Give yourselves uh, an opportunity to promote yourselves real quick before I boot you off because we got a big thing coming up, a big announcement coming up here in a second. Uh, Derek, remind everybody where you can reach on social media and plug everything you've got going on. Yep. I'm on Twitter at Derek Cardi. You can find the Bad X uh, for season long at Fangrass, for DFS at Roto Grinders, for sports betting at EV Analytics. And uh, yeah. All right, John, remind everybody where you reach. Oh, my, I'm kind of split right now, so everything is streamlined on Twitter, at John Legaze. I just released my ranks for this year, detailed write-ups, over 110 players, plus uploadable underdog ranks and stuff. I filtered through all 5,000 players. Just a lot of work I put into it. It's all CSV available. It's only $10 for the entire year, weekly waiver wire as well. Justin, hat tip to you, man. You do so much good work. I just I listen to so many podcasts. You get shouted out randomly for having been this kind of center point 
the enter ent like the entrance way for so many people, including myself, man. We got nothing but love for you, man. You do so much good work, bro. Appreciate it, guys. It's always great to see you guys. Hopefully, I uh, will get to run into you uh, in New York at the Tout Wars time. Uh, if not, I'll be seeing you online and in podcast rooms and things like that. I'm going to boot you guys out unceremoniously because, oh, <laughs> because we have something coming. We have Scott Fish of the Scott Fish Bowl of Fantasy Cares coming on for a few minutes just to chat. Tell us a little bit about Fantasy Cares uh, and what you guys do over there because it's an amazing organization that we're supporting today. What's going on, man? Thanks, thanks a lot, Justin, for having me on. Yeah, uh, Fantasy Cares is this uh, just this little fundraising thing we started many, many years ago that turned into a, a nonprofit, and now it's uh, full on accredited for the last few years, accredited five hundred one c three charity that we basically raise a whole bunch of money. We go buy a ton of toys at Christmas time for kids and in 25 different cities around uh around the country but not only that we we try to support a bunch of different charities local charities small charities uh all over the country as well outside of that we run lots of fun contests and uh and and games and and whatnot obviously the fishbowl is part of it and uh awesome that tgfbi is uh is working with us this year on, with it as well it's just it's just wonderful seeing the community do good with our hobby as you've known for years and done for years as well. Yeah. I mean, one of the things I, you know, envisioned when I started TGFBI, which was one to give people in the industry a platform that may not necessarily get it from just their own content, but also to do good, right? Like yep. we have, we have these platforms, they're bigger than they probably should be. And we should use that <laughs> to do good around, uh, you know, our industry and around the country. And uh, I think Fantasy Cares is a fantastic organization that does just that. Uh, you have something to announce as well that I would love for you guys to share or for you to share because, uh, yeah, it's a pretty cool prize that you guys are donating. <laughs> Yeah, so uh, we we have lots of we generally have lots of prizes on hand to uh, give away in these contests we run to try to raise money, and uh, we noticed we had a we had a few jerseys sitting around signed autographed uh, uh, jerseys that we could uh, give away on this. Uh, they're baseball ones, so that that might hit your crowd a little bit a little bit better than my normal crowd. Um, <coughs> excuse me. Uh, so we have an Eric Gagne jersey, signed jersey. We have a Jose Canseco signed jersey, which I actually, I actually have right here. Um, and we have a Ronald Acuna Jr. jersey, a signed jersey, to give away. Um, I think what we're going to do is we're going to give one of each of those away to a random don't to ra three random donators who donate between now and the end of the Potapalooza. I believe that was the plan. So. Um, we'll have a few jerseys to give away if you, if you plan on jumping in and making a, either a donation or another donation from now until the end. Uh, you could win one of those three jerseys. That is an amazing prize. I am bummed because I'm not eligible to win those prizes. Uh, we also have, uh, it's not signed or anything, but a Sean Bouchard jersey, a guy who won me a bunch of uh, money that I'm going to donate nice. uh, to someone. Uh, keep those donations coming in. Donor box. Bat, uh, dot org backslash tgfbi yep. we've already raised over a thousand dollars today you add That's that cool. into the over six thousand dollars that tgfbi and tgfbi uh, satellite participants have raised uh, all off season uh and we are currently at seventy three hundred and forty eight dollars raised nice. so far wow. this draft season for Incredible. tgfbi and potapalooza keep those donations coming in Scott, where can everybody find you on social media? Where can everybody find uh, Fantasy Cares on social media? And where can people sign up for the Scott Fishbowl? Because, man, I've been a part of the Scott Fishbowl. My wife has been a part of the Scott Fishbowl for the last few years. And it is an absolute blast. It is. It is. You can sign up for that at scottfishbowl.com. We're going to have at least 35 different cities have live events you can go draft at uh, this year. So sign up for that. Try to get in one of those live events and have fun. Uh, uh, you know, drafting live with some people, but if you don't draft live, there's slow drafts, uh, just like TGFBI has. Um, you can find me on Twitter, Scott Fish 24. You can find Fantasy Cares, uh, Fantasy Cares at Fantasy Cares org. 
Um, actually, those are the handles for basically any social media platform you want to find us on. I was going to mention also if 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 your uh, if your audience has more interest in in what Fantasy Cares does or our, our contests, uh, you can always email to see if you want to help with us, volunteer with us, um, or just we have other contests. We have a March Madness contest coming up. We have an NCAA or a uh, a Masters contest. We have. You know, I, I grabbed, a, I pulled a few out because I thought this might be interesting to your audience, but uh, I'm sure they like other sports too. But we got like a signed Hambino Smalls jersey. We got a signed by the entire cast of the Sandlot. We got a Wild Thing Vaughn signed jersey. We got lots of contests coming up that'll have more, uh, more really fun stuff. So uh, if interested, uh, check out Fantasy Cares Org on, on the socials or just Scottfish24 on the socials, uh, especially X, because I'll, I'll generally retweet when we have those various contests. But thank you so much for having me on, Justin. It's very cool hey. of you to do this and to bring me on to talk about it a little. It's just, just a wonderful thing you're doing, man. Man, I really appreciate you and everything you and your organization does in the fantasy uh, industry. I know you guys are mostly fantasy football, but you yep. do so much. Um, and, hey, you know what? If you play fantasy baseball, you probably play fantasy football. You probably play a million different fantasy sports. Um, <laughs> and so it's so great to have the two kind of communities coming together uh, to do a lot of good. So I appreciate you coming on, Scott. Thank you so much for carving out a few minutes out of your day. I know you're not feeling well. I'm under oh, the weather, okay. too. And we're just we're just chugging along to raise money for a great Gotta cause. Do it. <laughs> Thanks a lot, Justin. <laughs> All right, brother. All right, definitely go follow Fantasy Cares on Twitter. Definitely go follow uh, uh, Scott on Twitter as well. Go check out FantasyCares.org, a fantastic organization that we are raising money for, and we're gonna raise some more money here with another amazing panel. One I get to be a part of uh, because we are having some starting pitcher debate um apparently nick pollock is uh, on the cole, phone i know i know cole but you know, just just oh i'm sorry hold on bye I gotta go bye yeah <laughs> uh what's up hey how you, how you guys doing what's everything we were you <laughs> talking to garrett cole there oh I mean, oh i don't i wasn't talking to anybody what are we talking about oh, oh okay all right uh, sorry. that is nick pollock of pitcher list nick remind everybody where you can reach on social media and plug all that you do just come to pitcher list y'all that's it just go if you haven't seen it yet you're doing it wrong Let's go. Yeah, you're right. Uh, we also have Eric Samolski. How are you doing, my friend? I'm good, guys. How are you? This is like, do you ever see the How I Met Your Mother, where they meet their the they have like they meet their doppelgangers? It's like <laughs> we got these two tall, lanky pitching experts, and then they're like thick, husky counterparts. Um, and it's just like it feels, and that's also perfectly aligned here in the mm. boxes. I don't know. Yeah, uh, I'm doing good. Uh, remind everybody who you reach on social media and plug all that you do. Sure. So you can reach me on uh, Twitter at Samsky NYC. Um, you can also reach me on Instagram uh, at Samolski underscore sports. If you want just some Instagram videos, uh, just some 90 second good content there. And then you can catch all my writing over um, on NBC sports. Um, but I tweet everything out. So just follow me on Twitter. You get all those articles and stuff. You, okay. And you can, you I got to I gotta say me. something. Eric, yeah. Eric has too few followers on Twitter. Okay, I don't know how he has like under four thousand. I looked; I was expecting like fifteen thousand. Go follow Eric, everyone. It's amazing. Sorry. Hey, thanks. Well, remember that, like you know, just like a year ago, I was an English teacher and doing this in my <laughs> spare time. So, um, you know, I'm I'm grateful for these opportunities. Obviously, grateful. You know, Nick uh, brought me on to on the Corner podcast where you can listen to Nick and I. Um, I took over for Alex Fast. Um, and then uh, I'm with Scott Pianowski on the Roto World uh, baseball show. So these are all awesome opportunities that have come my way in the last few months. And I'm super grateful and I'm glad to be chatting here with you guys. today. Well-deserved opportunities. We love you, Eric. Definitely go follow Eric on Twitter. These other two guys, they, they've got plenty of Twitter followers. Uh, but Mr. Paul Spore, my co-host on the Sleeper in the Bus, is here as well. How you doing, my friend? Hello. Hi. Good to see y'all. Thank you so much for having me. Very excited to talk some pictures with some great minds. Where can people follow you on social media and then find your work? Uh, at Spore on Twitter. I'm not on there as much, but definitely hit me up. I've been getting on more with the season getting going. Uh, very excited. I can't believe we, we made it through another 
winter, so I'm very excited. Uh, Fangraphs, obviously, fantasy .fan, or fangraphs.com slash rotographs now. You got all, we got all our rankings up. We got some more articles coming out. We got sleepers coming out next week. Very excited for that. We're doing our preview pods. We're on episode three of Pitchers on Monday, Justin, of what will at least be five, probably six episodes, yeah. let's be honest. We like to get really, really detailed with it at each position. And pitcher, of course, is somewhere where we could probably do ten episodes if we really wanted to, but we'll we'll cut we'll cut it at six, uh, max. But uh, yeah, I'm very excited about that. And I mean, the season is is here. I mean, it's here. Once once that first Dodgers Padres game started, that's the season being here for me. Yeah, uh, we're doing pretty good on our starting pitcher preview. We we've made it through like fifty pitchers in two yeah, episodes. Yeah, I, I actually, would say so. Yeah, that's I great mean, for us. I will yeah. say the next two episodes, you know, th that meat there of those mid-tier pitchers, we're going to have a lot of debates on them. I think those are the ones that could be pretty long and, and interesting, especially. See, this is why he's the best in the business, because we're talking starting pitcher debates right now. Uh, because what I did was I took your guys' starting pitcher ranks, and I put them in a Google Sheet for myself, and then I started looking. Which people do you guys disagree on? kind of the most now i stopped at like the top 100 because uh, i think uh, you know at a certain point it just gets ridiculous to just, sure. uh, discuss you didn't the you didn't want to compare all of our like 300 to 400 i'm sure we <laughs> yeah. all all four where of do us you have Eric Fetty? That deep. where yeah, do you guys yeah. have tyler but <laughs> yeah Beattie? exactly <laughs> <laughs> so uh we're gonna start at the top um and then we're just gonna work our way down the first one i've got is framber valdez um now, this, this whole process is great for me because I haven't finished my starting pitcher projections, so I get to just yell at you guys for no apparent reason, um, even though you guys can't yell back at me for misranking people. So, uh, Framber Valdez, uh, Eric, you are the low man on mm -hmm. him at starting pitcher 25. Paul is the high man at starting pitcher 10. Nick, you're closer to Eric. You're a little bit lower. You're at 20. Um, so why don't we start with Paul since he's kind of on an island by himself. Why do you have Framber Valdez ranked as the top 10 starting pitcher for this year? I mean, it starts with the volume, of course, with Framber Valdez. I, I really, really love, uh, you know, kind of clocking in that volume. I look at him and Logan Webb as a lefty-righty version of each other, getting that sort of guaranteed innings. It's, as much as anything can be guaranteed, you'll hear me talk about it a lot on the podcast and hear about how nothing's a guarantee with pitching, uh, which is why, you know, I'll, I'll lean talent over maybe a, a deeper track record. At the same time, it's not like Fromber is just eating up innings. He's not... He's not just Kyle Hendricks out there. Uh, no offense to – well, I guess really offense to Kyle Hendricks because I'm saying that his innings aren't as important to me. But from Valdez puts quality innings out there, and I think I think way too much is being made of the second-half struggles, which is something that we do a lot. You know, we take kind of the most recent thing, positive or negative, and we'll get into somebody that we're going to take a real positive aspect on their second mm -hmm. half, maybe a little bit too far. And I think just too much is being made of it. You know, he finished – he's 16th and ADP right now, which is obviously still low than where I've got him, but it's a top 20 projection for the year. Um, and you're looking at that stable floor in the top 10 too. I want upside with the floor mix. Could I get 200 innings of a low three ZRA, great whip and a ton of wins on Houston? Yes. Uh, am I am I almost certain as long as he stays healthy to get 180 innings of a mid three ZRA, a good whip and, and plenty of wins? Yes. And so I'm just going to stick with Fromber Valdez. And after kind of a lot of those shinier guys uh, at the top end, he and Webb round out my top 10. All right, Eric, your rebuttal. Yeah. Um, so I get what Paul's saying. I need much more ceiling if I'm going to put him in my top 10. Um, for Logan Webb, I view them differently because I I feel more confident in Logan Webb's ratios. I understand that Framber has shown similar ratios in the past. I feel more confident that I will get those ratios from Logan Webb. Also, um, I know that Framber Valdez wasn't a full-time starter for his entire career, so we take these numbers with a grain of salt, but he has two seasons with over 135 innings they happen to be the last two seasons they happen to be the two seasons that he has gotten a full run as a starting pitcher so we're not saying he can't throw that volume but he doesn't have as long of a track record of volume as some of the guys that we're we're bumping up into the top 10 because i feel really Ooh. good about their innings i, I feel solid about Fram that. i feel solid about framber's innings but i don't i we don't have a track record of him throwing consistently years and years deep innings it's just something the, to keep in mind that's the not overall that's not my big one guy 
Okay, well, I'll let, I'll let you go. Let me interrupt, though. The overall number one guy has, like, five minutes in the league in Spencer Strider. Well, yeah, he so, said some. Not well, I, well but I, also, I'm looking yeah. at a bunch of them. You know, George Strider's, also my, Strider's my number two, but yes. Um, but I I hear you, yes. And then um, also the one other also, thing before you get Valdez to your main point. Valdez is 30 point. years old. Strider is okay. much younger with a shorter track record. Valdez sure. is going to be 31 this season with only two years of throwing over 135 innings. The the counter to that is there's not as much mileage on his arm as somebody who is 31 and has years and years. But I'm, I'm just saying I, I don't feel as – I feel more confident saying I'm going to get X number of innings from Logan Webb versus I'm going to get 180 out of Framber. I don't think it's a bad bet at all by any stretch of the imagination. I'm just talking about the comparison between Logan Webb and Framber Valdez for me. Sure. I mean, the three years younger helps. That's why I have Webb one spot higher. The one thing I disagree with the most that you said is about ceiling. Uh, Framber had 201 innings of a 282 well, ERA and a 116 whip in 2022. I mean, what well, more so ceiling is, do you need out of, a, out of a top 10 well, guy? I need him to have not changed his cutter last year and had that cutter get absolutely ab obliterated. Um, he threw his cutter two and a half miles per hour harder last year after it was a dominant pitch for him in 2022 and then if you go to this i don't know if you've heard of this website it's uh, called pitcherlist.com um, and they have these really great metrics um, like an icr rate which is the ideal contact rate which is barrels plus solid contact plus flares and burners over total batted ball events for the the icr on framber's cutter was 41.7 percent last year um, that is 42nd percentile in all of baseball. In 2022, the ICR on it was just 27%. That pitch got crushed last year. So I need to see if he's keeping last year's cutter or if he's going back to the 2022 cutter because those pitches perform drastically differently for me. And then I still also see a guy who throws a sinker 49% of the time, and the sinker also gave up a 40.6% ICR last year. So two of his three pitches that are his like bread and butter pitches got hit really hard. Now, I understand that it he still performed to a solid ERA and his whip was still 113. I mean, that's really good. But I just... I, for me, don't have the confidence to put somebody as an SP1 who gives up that much hard contact because to me that there's there's a fine line that that's going to blow up. I think Framber Valdez with a slightly above average swinging strike rate is a 25% K rate pitcher and a mid three ERAs guy. And I have no problem with that. But to me, that's an SP2. Fantastic floor. Sure. But, but that's an SP2 for me is I, I like that floor. Nick, break the tie here. Hi. Um, well, I, I think there needs to be some clarification here because I do very much recognize in deeper leagues there is a floor that is going to be weighted higher in like a 15-teamer. And I'm, Spore, please correct me if I'm wrong. Are you ranking this as a 15 or a 12? I mean, I generally focus on 15. I would take him that high in a 12-teamer. Okay, too. so you would still put him at 10 and 12. I just want, I don't yeah, want to assume I, anything. I, okay. I, I just I don't really... Sure. Like, I respect all the data that Eric just brought. I think it was just a lot of different ways of saying that he had some bad starts down the stretch because that's that's really what it was. We're making a lot out of, like, five bad starts. Well, well but, okay, I just agree with that sentiment, the whole by season. the way. Uh, I mean, that? yeah, I, I don't agree with that sentiment about I'm just only judging Valdez. Otherwise, I'd put him at 10 if it weren't for those five bad starts at the end of the year. Uh, I, I'm, I'm more on the side of Eric in that I, I'm very much of, hey, what do you have to offer that should showcase – being you know an elite starter consistently and everything like that when it comes to the arsenal of valdez it's this sinker that actually performed way worse against right handers overall not just in those five starts throughout the year than it did in 2022 as well um the cutter he stopped using against right handers and it drove me up the wall and again as eric mentioned i don't know if that's going to be there at the same time like he is going to be helpful on your teams there is a really nice floor here i very much get that the idea of putting him in the top 10 for me, you got to have someone who at least could be close to like a one whip, like at least have that ceiling to do that. I feel like everyone in my top 10 has that ceiling to push the needle in such a big way that and also has a floor that I'm very, very happy with. And I don't feel that Valdez has that kind of ceiling of like a sub three ERA with a one whip and like a 25 to 30 percent K rate that pretty much everyone else does in my top 10. And that's why I'm moving away with it. At the same time, I have him at 20. I originally had him actually close to where 25 uh, is for Eric. But then I was like, you know what? He's on the Astros. He's going to get these good wins, even though last year was kind of weird. 12 wins. What the heck? What are they? 
um, and it should be productive. It's just, you know, it, it really depends on what you want to go for in your drafts. Do you want to go for that larger one? You know, I could see him up to 15 because I have some guys that like 13, 14, 15 are more risky and then less, you know, safe. Um, but I also see that they have the higher ceiling potential than Valdez does. So it's up to you. So um, but yeah, I wouldn't put him up. What to is 10. your split him with 20. him? Look, and when? Let me, I, I favor let, more on the 25 side than I do on the 10 side. Let me just jump in because we're going to move on to the next starting pitcher. You guys all made good points. Nick and Eric are right here. Uh, Paul is just a little bit too high on Valdez. Well, there's Love no right you. or wrong. It's just all. No, there is a right or wrong. I am the judge, <laughs> the jury, and the executioner on this. I got to uh, be honest. Like to... every time Justin says I'm wrong, I feel so good about my position. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. All right, fair. Uh, one that uh, another one that we've got uh, going higher up in the draft is Pablo Lopez. Nick, you have him ranked fifth overall. Yeah. Uh, Eric, you're pretty close with uh, at six overall. Paul down at eleven. Now, obviously, we are you know splitting hairs because we're just you know a few ranks apart this high. But Nick, tell me why you love Pablo Lopez so much. Is it because he had him on his podcast? Does that yeah, bump him right. up five spots? <sighs> I wrestle with that so much because it's like I actually go into it being okay cool Nick you need to inherently just lower him because I am going to be biased it's like how could I not I'm hearing a guy talk about all the things I want to, him to say and then he's encouraged by it how can I believe him that he's going to be great but also they're going to be their biggest fans too so you know you have to gr take everything with a grain of salt with that stuff um, but I had this ranking there before I talked to him and yeah, I, I think your rankings this is a uh, this is something that has to do with um, not necessarily what the end result was of, you know, 366 ERA last year, 115 whip. And you see that and you go, oh, that's actually pretty similar to the 2022 of a 320, sorry, 375 ERA and a 117 whip. And I was actually really surprised to see that uh, the, the, those final marks from him, because I remember in the entire season, I remember actually in the beginning, it was like, this isn't working for some reason. Why isn't this working? But then you realize, wait, right, 29% strikeout rate. Right, he increases velocity on his four-seamer. Wow, the hit for nine went up, but he has a much better arsenal than he's ever had. And I look back and I remember, right, in previous years, he was always like this slow threes-ish hinting guy um, with really a change-up focus and good four-seamer command, not with much else. And all of a sudden last year, we saw the full arsenal. Um, we saw a four-seamer that actually... Uh, I believe it was third highest swing strike rate in the majors of four seamers. And we had tied for fourth of total strikeouts. Um, we had a new sweeper that is legitimate. That is finally a proper put away pitch against right handers. He still has his change up and he was even saying, yeah, the change up is always there, which it is. And I love the fact that he leans into that change up because it's just filthy to both right handers and left handers. Uh, he has a sinker that he uses correctly um, inside a right hander. He's actually made some adjustments to use it more so early in counts to get those quicker outs later in the second half, which of course he performed better at. So he has all the tools. It's all there now with the velocity you want uh, that you didn't have before, the better put away pitch, good situation inside of Minnesota. And I see 11 wins last year, which is going to lower him on the player radar that you saw. That should change. I understand the probably the biggest pushback is, well, he had the shoulder problems in 2021, 102 innings then. He had 180 in 2022, uh, 194 last year. I mean, I, I, you know, we're talking about Spore that like how many guys do we really believe the track record in? It's really hard to break the, predict this stuff. I generally try to avoid a lot of the volume games because the volume games are so ridiculous last year. There are only 15 starters of the top 31 in ADP that made 25 or more starts. That's it. Under half did. Now, obviously, some that were more uh, obvious, like DeGrom, didn't make those, you know, right? But so a lot of the ones that we thought were like Max Free was the safest one. No. Um, and considering you have two straight years of it, it's like, all right, you know what? I'm not really going to ding him in any way in this in this fashion. He's going to go every five days and go six innings. Really complete arsenal. Has strikeouts. Fantastic command. He should be better than a 115. Whip. Easily should be one better than a 360 rate right? easily. It's all there. Um, I don't really... I see like a, the more and the more complete pitchers in the draft. So I'm a huge fan. All right, Paul rebuttal. If you have one, I mean, no, obviously I really like him. I've got, I've got uh, Pablo Lopez up pretty high as well. Um, you know, you mentioned the shoulder and it is probably the one thing that kind of lingers with him because he did have multiple years of it. He's now shown some health for two years. I do like to bet on 
uh, you know, on talent and, and kind of take the health risk, uh, you know, because he had the shoulder in 19 and 21, but then last year, 180, 194. I think my concern is why maybe I don't have him quite inside the top 10 and in that top five area is just that I'm not sure he's going to hold all 7% of the strikeout minus walk surge that he got. Um, and I'm not going to, I don't fully ignore the shoulder history, but again, it's 11. It's just a small difference here. Although he is eighth in ADP, so I guess at 11, I'm not getting him a ton. Um, unless he falls a little bit, obviously ADP is just as average. So when he gets to the lower end of his register for Pablo Lopez, I'm more apt to get him. So I, I'm on board with him. I like what Minnesota has been doing with pitchers. I think they've really become a bastion of, uh, you know, pitching that I don't think they're going to really miss a beat without Sonny Gray this year. I think you plug in Bailey Ober there and let him take over that spot and they're going to be just fine. And Lopez can lead the charge. Barlin, please show up. Barlin. Barlin. I'd like please. to see Barlin as well. Big I hope guy so. Too. Uh, yep. Tony Disco. I, well, I just want to. He's got that spot right now. Unfortunately, Tony Disco does. But, yeah. you know, there, there's there's Disco's health track record, of course, and performance. There's Chris Paddock's health, which I like Paddock. I'm I'm hoping for health with him. But, like, know, you know, let's I be know. honest. Just... Um, and so I think Barlin will get his opportunity. He's still somebody I want to draft. You know, know, if you're still doing draft champions, get on him. Yeah. And look at the way they treated Ober last year. They probably wouldn't sure. turn Varlin loose even if there was a spot open. So we're probably mm -hmm. better off like waiting for them to unleash him on the league in late yeah, May, possible. early June, and then we get him for the stretch run. Yeah. So I'm with you on the Varlin love. I just I just am gonna have to play the waiver wire game, which is annoying. Yeah. I just want to be able to draft him be like aha I agree. But and sorry Eric, you're gonna leagues, you, you can't draft him. You're you're right. Go ahead. Well I was just, back to, I was back just gonna to point Pablo. out um the only thing I'll add on Pablo because you guys covered almost everything you know paul mentioned not weighing second halves too much i think it's important to also note and he didn't mention that for pablo but just as a as a kind of like a general standard when pitchers have new pitches in their arsenal i think we have to expect that there are there's an adjustment period right so like if you were to look at pablo lopez's splits during the year his worst months came at the beginning of the year and then his best months came towards the end and i think there is some sense of like getting comfortable with new pitches feeling you know the you know whether it's the grips or the release points or whatever and getting more acclimated to it and it becoming something that becomes more second nature so this is just a general comment it's not like pablo specific but when you are looking at those splits if you're looking first half second half or whatever try to see if there's a reason why the second half may have been better rather than just he had a good he had a good run sometimes that could be oh he's throwing a new pitch and that pitch got much better as the year went on and that makes sense and then that second half boost might actually make more sense than you just picking 10 games at random of a pitcher and saying, oh, he was great in the second half of the year. So it is a little bit of a case-by-case -case basis when you're looking at splits like that. Somewhat interestingly, um, his whip was a decent bit worse. It was the ERA boost from 389 to 336 for Pablo Lopez, but then the whip went from 109 to 124. So he kind of had a mix and match second half there. You know, it's really funny. Half. We have a new stack called Striker you might have seen on the site, which is pretty much just like he's used called, to a lot called of Called what? I'm sorry? Striker. Uh, strike okay. minus ICR rate, uh, and essentially says, "Hey, do you throw lots of strikes? Cool. Are those strikes that are are those strikes punishing you or like good contact and play?" Pablo Lopez, uh, he had the sixth best uh, striker whip, and actually we found that it is it correlates better to whip than whip itself for the next year. And his relative whip last year would have been 108, according to strike minus ICR rate, which is kind of fun. Can, so can, can I ask something fun. about the website? Um, but, about the website, author? yeah, please. Um, can you get rid of decimals? They're worthless. <laughs> I'm not trying to be rude. Uh, I'll, I will just, try inside of, uh, or, or, inside or even of, offer it as like a PL plus thing. I, I, I think it's an interesting idea. I will try to see if we can do something like that just to have a different rounding. Um, for and you I guys. would also, yeah, that's ask a fun idea. Podcasters get rid of them. They just, yeah, that's actually one of the things that's for I refuse. I refuse. No, to get it, rid of them. Listen, this I'm not be serious for one second, Justin. Like they're, they're worthless. All the time. They, they make listening to a podcast more difficult for, for at least for stupid people like myself. Podcast so more difficult and more gave me this advice i think one of the, after one of the first podcasts we ever did at first i said absolutely not people respect the fact that i am as accurate as i am with it and that's i respect the that i do this and now i completely agree just it say makes, like hey cool he had around a 24 percent or whatever and it's so yeah. much smoother you get the point across yeah as long as you know uh and as long as you feel like it's, you're not it's, proving it's, that you know the things 
like it's if you know other things, just I'm, let people be like, yeah, cool, 24%. All right, cool. Yeah, really I'm cool. not as I smart as you part. guys, and I can't round on the fly. So well, no, my, my point is that, like, I'm an idiot. So when I'm listening, I just think the extra number is a little bit of clutter. And then as far as the website thing, that one's less important, obviously. No, but maybe if it was an option, it. Like it. if it was yeah. something where you could go in and, let's, and say let's how talk many about decimals this you want. With everybody's support. Yeah. And, uh, I just had it on my mind right now. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to derail everything. Move on to the next I want to talk about Tariq Skubal, who Tarek's actually gonna. Oh, okay. I've been saying three. That's my bad. So, Tarek Skubal, Eric is the high man. He wasn't when I first posted this uh, rundown. Yeah, I saw him in there updating about five minutes. uh, Yeah. Well, I put put my updates as in, like, I will change it. I I appreciate that, uh, uh, Nick. But Eric is the uh, high man on him at number 13. Paul's right there at number 14. Nick, hi. have him at 25 but you're going to be moving up no up yeah i've already okay so i want to explain this so, yeah go ahead please explain. um so a couple of the concerns i had about Tarek skubal was we saw really like the biggest thing that happened when he came back from not tommy john it's flexor tendon surgery was whoa you're like 95 96 now and like almost pretty much sitting 96 after being around 94 before and that completely changed them as a pitcher uh, where all of a sudden this four seamer performed as best as like any four seamer in the majors. And that meant that he had like hundredth percentile, like FIP and Sierra and everything like that. It was just ridiculous. Um, strike rate was also a hundredth percentile essentially. And so it was, you know, the success of it. It's insane. And at first I was like, okay, well, this is kind of typical. Actually, a guy comes back from a long while and they have a ton of adrenaline and that is fueling uh their velocity for a moment and then the full season after they generally fall back down well we got an early report that he hit 100 in the bullpen i hate the word hitting when it comes to sit uh to spring training the word that we want is sitting because hitting happens all the time we don't really talk about like max we talk about what are they consistently at however if you hit 100 you likely aren't sitting 94 that, that that's all so okay i'm recognizing that the velocity one of the concerns i had about scoobal is likely going to be there. That's fine. Mm-hmm. That said, when it comes to the arsenal of Scoobal, I I'm not totally sold that his four seamer is this elite. Um, one of the major things that I've been working on this off season is actually taking the time to really study pitch shape and what it means. And it's something that has been a very big flaw in my analysis for a while. I would more look at the results of it and just say, well, well the results are a product of whatever the shape is. But it, there are, it's such a valuable thing to understand ebbs and flows and just kind of like sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. Sometimes it's location focused, sometimes it's stuff focused. And Scoobles four seamer is surprisingly not elite when it comes to shape. It doesn't have good vert. He doesn't have great uh, VAA. He doesn't have amazing extension. It was really the velocity that put him over the hump that made this a much better pitch than we've seen before. Now, the changeup is excellent. The changeup is phenomenal. I'm not going to say anything bad about that. I think that's the pitch that ties it all together. And generally, if you have ways to defeat right-handers more than left-handers, you're going to be more successful than fail in the majors because you're going to face more right-handers. So this is very good. His best pitch really is that change up to go with that four-seamer. The problem is that there isn't anything else. And the slider is more of this cutter pitch, which is fine. But I thought it would be more of a big pitch for him. And considering I have some concerns about the four seam you're performing at the same level, like a 76% strike rate with a 35% ICR last year is like, whoa, that's one of the better striker pitches because you're throwing so many strikes and you're not allowing all this damage to it. Um, I don't think that holds up over a larger sample. And then it becomes a good fastball with an excellent changeup and then other things that aren't quite there. I've heard word about him getting a new slider. I'm excited for that. Because then he can get a proper weapon against lefties and then maybe mm-hmm. things maybe actually as a gyro that can actually go down and in to uh, to right handers. That's cool. I haven't seen it yet. So Tarek Skubal could be someone I push up gradually throughout the spring. It's why it's already 25 to 20. I understand the 13, 14 rank. I guess I'm just a little more tepid on the four seamer and I feel like it's going to come down in results. And thus, I don't quite know how it impacts the rest of the arsenal when that four seamer doesn't perform at the same rate i'm not really going to negatively attribute the schedule he had that much i don't really want to lean too much into that um he does have a negative 10 hitter performance which essentially says that the hitters he faced performed worse than average against his pitches but that aside smaller sample whatever 
Uh, that's the reason why he isn't at 13, 14. I'm not as confident as the full arsenal Can as other guys in the top 15 right about now. About what you brought up there. Yeah, please. If if the velo is up and he's sitting like 97, 97 and a half. Oh man. How much could that um oh yeah, that's uh, push huge. through the shape issues? Yeah, absolutely. Velocity is king at the end of the day. You see like Hunter Green at like 98 yeah. and change. And the reason it does get hit is because it's not a it's terrible, bad extension, bad VEA, not yeah. really good vert. And that's but it gives why. Him a margin but for it's still error. a good pitch, right? Yep. So, yep. uh, like, velocity is king. And that's why it's like 96, 97. It's fine. Hazel Lazardo is a perfect example mm -hmm. of like, that is a not a good shape, but it works enough. It's not okay. overwhelming, though. And yeah. that's like, that's a kind of the best comp I can kind of give here for Tarek Skubles. That's why I'm so shocked at, at its marks at the moment. Uh, but. The thing is, Lizardo has, a, I think, a better slider and a better changeup, but Scoobles four-seamer perform better, so maybe there's more things I'm missing there. I guess one, I want a larger sample. I'm not quite sold that, like, oh, he's a dope stud now and we shouldn't jump in. Yeah, that's the that's only fair. reason why I'm not up to, like, 13, 14, but I can understand it. If I'm being honest, like, I have some trepidation about my own ranking on him. You know, I didn't yeah. rank him there as a Tigers home or anything. Everyone knows I love no, the Tigers. Of but I don't I don't rank guys based on being on my favorite team. But I do have some some nerves about it. And I even in my write up, I wrote about how, like, um, I have Glass now, Miller and uh, Scooble at 12, 13, 14. And I can't yeah. remember the last time I had a 12, 13, 14 that had, like, a combined 250 innings or whatever the heck it was like this is not a high total for a 12 13 14 ranking so i don't want to aggressively defend this if, if eric wants to say anything to the to the school's point otherwise we can move on because i like I, I take a lot of what this year. pardon me i'm sorry no this is eric's article almost like the top 20 starters are like less secure than ever before oh yeah they i couldn't agree more couldn't agree you more. can Go check ahead, that out on nbcsports.com i did there just write a whole breakdown um, of why it seems like the top 20 starters are worse than they have it's ever been. And in some ways, accurate. they are. Um, but then and, the yeah, next me, 20 is actually really yes. amazing well, to kind of make up. Nick, Go ahead. I'm Nick sorry. and I were talking about that. It's like we loved the depth. And then it's like Bradish gone, Senga gone. And then you're like, yeah, oh, that's okay. true. Two, <laughs> um, Bradish, two big hits already. We'll see, we we'll we always love the depth until everybody gets until there's no doubt we, we yeah. said the exact same thing still, last there's still, year there's still and so then we depth. lost yeah. like rasmussen in springs or yeah like, but we got like 90 people of depth yeah. this year. We'll, we'll probably so, lose a few more go ahead yeah. eric so i was just saying the, the movement on scubal for me was i had him at the bottom of a tier of those guys like bobby miller grayson rodriguez freddie peralta like guys who all have like really high upside but question marks of various degrees whether it's track record or freddie peralta's like you know um innings health whatever um, and I do think the the fastball velocity made me at the moment bump him just to the top of that same tier for me because I felt like one of the bigger things was, is he going to maintain that velocity? The only other thing that we should bring up, um, which Nick pointed out to me and I didn't even realize it, was the schedule last year for Scooble is another question mark for me because he made only 15 starts. The last eight of them came against the Guardians, the Cubs, the Yankees, two against the White Sox, one against the Angels, one against the Athletics, and one against the Royals. And he had a 188 ERA and a 37% strikeout rate against those eight garbage offenses. Um, and that's not to say he, he wouldn't have done that against good offenses, but it's to say that more than half of his season last year was the final eight games against below-average teams. So how much did that impact what we saw there's no way to know that for sure. It's all guessing. And that's why I had some hesitation on him before, in addition to all the stuff Nick said. And that's still why, like, if you look at just his numbers, he should be inside the top 10 because last year he was really good. So exactly. these are all the hesitations that put him in the next 10. That's why I'm fine with not giving any credence to the schedule thing, like you guys are saying, because he'd be higher if we didn't care about it. Yeah. Be because I think he finished with 80 innings. I think Tarek Skubal finished, uh, let me see, what was it? Uh, 15th well, going, last year. Yeah, going to seven uh, wins in 15 calculator. games helps. But yeah. yeah, yeah, absolutely crazy. So yeah, I think even our rankings, mine and Eric's, where we're higher, is saying like, don't get too hung up on that schedule stuff. But the fastball stuff is very interesting. I totally agree on the slider, the lack of a, a big pitch against lefties. Eager to see what he does in spring. But let's go ahead and yeah. keep going on yeah. these next guys because I want to make sure because we talk about I'm, most of these. I'm going to skip a few real quick because uh, we've – otherwise, we I don't know why I thought we'd get through. No, no, no. Just keep going. No, no, no. Keep going. 
It's my get, show. I'm in charge. I don't here. want you to skip the good ones. I don't trust I, your judgment. I know what I know what Nick is you, gonna say about the next yeah. one. I mean yeah, but we're gonna talk about Cole Reagans real quick because uh, I'm assuming that is who Nick was on the phone with uh before we got started. I, I don't um, want to skip Musgrove though. I need to know why oh, they got right. a top twenty. Co- oh, I, I, mean, I don't think I don't know. Back to Musgrove, real quick. Well, I'm yeah, sh- I, assuming Paul's that, argument against really Musgrove is health, um, which yeah. is so that's uh, just a health conversation. If you want to believe that he's health, I understand why. I, I honestly think it was the situation where he didn't have really get into rhythm, was pushed a little bit too much. That's why he had the shoulder thing initially. That's why, uh, in, in the elbow thing, but like it's not, it's not like a tear like it is other guys. He's healthy now, of all, under, all indications. And I don't. I really don't think I'm concerned about it. Yeah. If we if we remember, the reason his season started late was because he dropped a weight on his foot, um, which again, not a, a pitching related injury, and then that caused some of those like ramp up injuries and, yeah. and coming back too soon, and you know, extent like pitching too many innings or pitching, you know, ramping up too quickly. Um, so I think last year, like Nick, to me in my ranking. Last year is a little bit of a fluke health-wise. He had thrown at least 170 innings in three straight full seasons. So I feel like getting 170 innings out of Musgrove is a pretty safe bet in my eyes. And no, I don't care at all about how bad he looked in his first spring training start. Like, oh, I, I don't not either. Register no, no one does. Yeah, yeah. just for the people yeah. that are listening. Like, I'm more I don't, concerned I that he's never really been a top 20 guy. So that's kind of my thing. Well, I, I, I like him in that, in that 25 to 30 range a little bit more, which is sure, but, years, so but if you, but, if you're, on him. but again, that's 25 to 30 without DeGrom Scherzer, McClanahan, Woodruff, like all these guys that were used to ranking ahead of him. Sure. So that but other guys moving in that. Yeah. yeah so we're talking I mean, about without like, he's not saying the nebulous 25, 30. He's just saying, it I know, he was probably but, those guys, but yeah, I, I see right. what you're saying. Yeah. Okay, all that's right. fine. That's all. Let's talk about Cole Reagans because <laughs> uh Nick, you love Cole I, Reagans. You yeah, have him as your starting pitcher 14. I'm not like tempted. I'm tempted to put on like eleven or something stupid. Yeah. Uh yeah. Paul, you hate Cole Reagans <laughs> as starting I pitcher. I do. Don't that's Reagans. actually ADP, believe it or not. Yeah, exactly. Yes. I'm right at ADP. Uh, I have and, absolutely and love Eric, Cole Reagans. You are, you are right in the middle. Uh, Nick, Raise your hand uh, if he was a breakout pick for you on your uh, last May. I mean, last uh, March. I, I could not. How about, have how about after game. one start with the Royals? That's all I got. Yeah, I, I have before spring out. started. How about? Yeah, I'm being, it, I'm being a hipster it, during the during the the rotation breakdowns, and then also winning through four innings at 96 in relief in April. Yeah, I was like, oh boy. All right, Nick. Talk. Hi, about we're, we're the Mighty true Reagan's them. hipsters here. Um. So here's the thing. Oh, I'm sorry, guys. Hold on. Just got it. Ugh, it's a little hot. <laughs> For those who are listening later, podcast a little hot. Uh, uh, Nick has a Reagan's uh, yeah. T-shirt on uh, <laughs> currently. Uh, okay. So anyway, um, it's Cole Reagan's. Look, obviously, it seems like Nick, you're just obsessed with this guy. You're pushing him up because of it, and I, I had him lower because of this. I, again, I gotta always. I'm always someone that has like the pendulum swings, and I need to pull it all the way back. And then make sure that I want to push it back again. And I, uh, you know, I see, I understand all the reasons not to like Cole Reagan's. Look, this came out of nowhere, right? All of a sudden he does this in the second half. And like, is that sustainable? He has those walk issues that we saw. The Royals, how many wins are you going to get with them? Are they actually going to help him when he's hurt? Because, or not going well during the season because of development. Uh, they let him in too long at games. All this kind of stuff. The injury history. All of those are valid reasons to say like hey i'm going to turn away from this you know i think actually before we even talking uh we all had a group chat together and sport was bringing up the point like look like we got really in on the guy after 80 innings before and that was back when we started the fireside chat and that was luis castillo mm-hmm. so i think it's important for me to understand that i know all of those arguments i thought about those and i left them down and i want to explain really quickly why i'm kind of thinking that these other arguments are better at least for me so i call him the unicorn um, and when it comes to guys that I really like and want to lead on in my season, uh, there are a couple major qualities. One, I want someone that I know is going to go every five days and allowed to go at least six innings and with a high pitch count. The Royals are doing that. Absolutely. He has full reign, all the leash. Like last year, they even gave him too long of a leash at times, you could say. So that's great. If you want to talk about the injury history, I call it 1.5 Tommy Johns. He even called it that before I did. Yep. Because he said, look, I was going through Tommy John and then it was still bothering me. And instead of trying to go through it, I just said, I just want to get this done once. 
correctly. And that's it. And I think he's getting a bad rap for that because it's like we push aside Tommy John for everybody and we're fine with it. And then all of a sudden now him, he's not, I don't know. Um, there's a worry about the velocity jump, which I can understand uh, that. Oh, no, it's this extra uh, extra element to him. Put whatever you want about that. I love his velocity, though. It's all of a sudden 96. And all by all signs, it's like he's saying that he's working harder at it. And I feel like it's going to be slightly even better this next year. Uh, also, when it comes to guys that have like these wonderful moments and then they fall off the next year, the most common reason is command. And I do not believe that Cole Reagans is a bad command pitcher. I think he's a nibbler. I think there were also moments last year that you see the 9 to 10% walk rate. And you think, oh, he's a, he's just going to be a bad control guy. He's not. He actually got uh, a lot of starts they should have been removed in. There's that ridiculous one in uh, the, uh, the Toronto Blue Jays. There's the one against the Astros, too. Both of those, yeah, I think he had five walks between those two ridiculous moments. Mm -hmm. And you remove that, and then it's like, oh, cool. It's like an 8% walk rate and everything like that and change. Like, you're fine all of a sudden with Cole Reagans. Uh, also... The other element that you see that is not really uh, that, that a lot of guys fall to the next year when we get really in on them from a small sample is they don't have the arsenal depth. They don't have uh, a ton of things. There's just like one pitch that really succeeded. And then if that one falls, then everything fails. You know, Reagan's has five. It's a four seamer that we saw above 100 at times last year. Uh, we saw a cutter that uh, at 92 that he attacks inside of right handers, a gyro slider that works against both lefties and righties we saw a curveball he throws for strikes and a legit change up that he's willing to throw in three two counts and i just looked at this entire draft pool and i thought to myself wait this is like the one of the most dominating pitchers i've seen in years i uh, i am so buying in on this like it, it, it's a guy that actually utilizes these pitches correctly and he's, it's not like a chucker it's not a guy who's just there all right, i'm just gonna throw this i don't really know what i'm doing i've, I've talked to pitchers and a lot of them, uh, after the interview, I'm like, no, I am not interested in that guy because they're just like not really in tune with what they're doing. They're not really planning out well. They're, they don't, they're not really necessarily great tacticians with it. They just kind of listen to whatever is going on. And they just chuck it. Reagan's has a notebook. He's like doing this stuff. He is very much in tune with it. His work with Tread is very good and they're fine tuning and tweaking and doing all this stuff. I, I Look, I just see it as there are a lot of guys that we're excited about. There's Yuri Perez is a good example. He has obvious flaws of like four seamer that needs to be located differently his slider is not a Perez. big moving one um yeah yuri perez you have a curveball that you can't throw for strikes and that's really it the changeup is terrible and like there's not depth to us reagan's has five pitches and he utilizes them correctly and he clearly has the ceiling we we saw it and this is it this is like the thing you want so i i just see this as like yeah he's he's going to be a stud and i know that there's risk of like well i'm only basing on 80 innings but like the second that he started with the elements that he had, that's him. He's there. And I'm I'll very add, much ready to jump in. I'll add very quickly before Paul goes in, because I'm not going to add much more than that, is that I think there's a perception, and not necessarily from Paul, but there's a perception in general that Reagan's came out of nowhere. Um, and it's important to understand that, like, he was a first-round pick. He was a high-prospect, you know, pedigree guy who battled the one-and-a-half Tommy Johns that Nick was talking about. And then kind of like is a little bit late in his development because as somebody has said many times prospect growth is is not linear and so he didn't really come out of nowhere um he was derailed a little bit and i also i have i know people who work inside the texas rangers organization who told me they were extraordinarily high on him and so to me that just adds even more of like a personal vote of self-confidence that like what we saw wasn't random. Even the organization that dealt him away was like, he's going to be really good. They just made a move they thought they needed to make. That's it for me. It is weird that they got a lefty when maybe they could have just used him as that lefty. Yeah. That's okay. Um, well, he didn't have a no, slider was, yet. I know. I know. It, it, it was you, also a pen. They, they wanted someone. Well, I'm saying use him in the bullpen. Sure. But I'm, like they, I'm not like trying to roast the the Rangers for that. You know, they they made a move. They were going for they it. The World Series. They got one of the yeah. They won the World Series. They got one of the best lefty relievers of his era. Even though he's not at that same height right now. Um, and now the Royals come. I, I'm not gonna try to really argue against him. I have him at ADP. I'm, I'll take Reagan's. I've been promoting Reagan's just as long. 
Um, I'm just not, I don't think I'm paying 14 for a Royals starter though, too, because you still do have to factor kind of the win potential. Sure. And, you know, even if you have some confidence in the Royals offense, which Justin has definitely discussed, and I agree with, um, I'm just, I, you know, I'm not entirely sure they're going to fully take care of him. I guess my question for Nick is, are, are you, you know, are you putting this to the test? Are you paying that price point for him? Yep. Cause I I'm understand sometimes, you know, you rank somebody somewhere like where I got Fromber, I don't have to pay 10. Right. I have right. him there. That's me kind of saying I like him, but I don't have to pay top 10 ADP for him. Um, I do do try to make sure I get him. Uh, where are you on that? Yeah, are that's you a really good question. 14, that's one of the hardest things pitcher? we do, right? Because yeah. it's like I like this guy more than others. But then you look at the strategy of like, well, you don't need to get him here theoretically. But it but only I, takes one other person to ruin. That's you. the thing. Mm -hmm. And also there's just no feeling worse than not getting your guy you know exactly so, so where, yeah i am actually doing this i did a mock okay. draft over the weekend or this past week where at the turn i took bobby uh, as 12 in a uh 12 turn. so five and six turn i took bobby miller and cole reagan's i absolutely Boom. love that. and uh that's just like me having the most fun ever because i love both of those guys having both yep. in my top 15. huge so i'm fan. doing that i'm not letting Good. myself you know that ranking is like yeah i'm drafting him before max reed before freddie yeah Peralta, don't before don't play games with stuff. it or else yep. you won't get especially for you specifically people are going to know and they're going to want to take him from you. yeah so i think it's with funny. this ranking, league, they don't care it's fun oh. <laughs> you know, with, with this ranking specifically in industry leagues or nfbc stuff that you yeah. might do people are going to want to kind of get him from you so i, yeah. I respect that you're going to pay that actual oh, price he's a uh, oh. a week from tomorrow Nick and I will be sitting across the table from each other at no, labor. You're gonna be you're gonna be on my left, buddy. Don't worry. Okay, so I will be on Nick's left, and my first throw will be Cole Reagan's just to right? put Nick to the test. Probably. That's actually gonna be great for me. So yeah. if you follow Ariel you'll, Cohen's you'll, uh, market exactly. uh, auction draft strategies, uh, one of the major things I learned is that you get your values in like the first two passes because Sometimes. everyone's trying to everyone actually, doesn't want to overspend on that one. Time. So I. Uh, so unless it's the amazing. yeah nick's right unless it's like the bona fide like acuna can still go like 70 when people are going crazy but a, a player like, like reagan's you might actually be doing him a favor by throwing yeah him very, very hey you're first. my buddy i want to do you a favor there you go all right there you go we, I'll do only myself. Have, we, have, we have like 10 minutes left and rapid we have fire like a crap ton of names to get through <laughs> um uh so i'm gonna i'm gonna put you guys on like a 30 second clock for your for your answer uh let's talk shane bieber uh, Eric, you are the high man at 35. Paul, you're a little bit behind Eric, but just a little bit. We're basically bit at tied. 40. Yeah. Nick, you have him all the way down at 63. I'm going to let Eric talk first because he, I don't well, want to. Before him to Eric get... goes, can you ask Nick if anything changes with the velo discussion? I need to see it. Okay. That but was a pen ahead, where he's probably and, going max effort. I need to see it. Right. Yeah, and yeah, that's, yeah. and I, and I already made the change. So that that's where the, the change went for me. Um, Rob Silver put out a really great tweet going through Bieber's whole career at certain velocities. Um, when his fastball is sub 93, he has a 391 ERA with a 21% uh, K minus walk rate. When it's 93, it's a 281 ERA with a 29% uh, K minus walk rate. And then if it's 94 or above, it's a 147 ERA with a 34% K minus walk rate. So we have a long track record of velocity being crucially important for Bieber. Um, he's in a contract year, went to drive line. Um, the velocity is apparently up. I also was like, how is this dude only 28 years old? I don't yeah. understand. I feel like he's been around forever. Um, and we've also never seen Bieber with velocity and the cutter because the cutter was something he kind of brought in to compensate for the lack of velocity. Mm. So I made this ranking right now assuming that the velocity at least holds at 93 or slightly above. Um, and maybe that's too early to make that move, but that's why I, I jumped him up where I did. I'm a believer, so let Nick speak on him and we move to the next All one. Right. I mean, the very quick thing there is... Also, don't forget, it's not just velocity that dipped. It's also the swing strike rates on his breaking stuff. And yeah. he needs to actually get those back, too. Otherwise, he's going to still live in 20% strikeout land. I actually am a believer that like the the vert on it is good. And he, he actually went too, a little too high on it. He's actually a pitcher that would make really good for down and away four seamers. Just steal those called strikes, which he has in the past. So that could work. I absolutely could. I just want to see him do that stuff. Um, and 63, honestly, is fine with me because it's... There essentially it's past the point of like I don't know if he's going to be good enough for my teams to actually hold through the entire year in a twelve teamer, and then there are so many super fun upside guys I'll know right away. Bieber to be like so much better than those needs to show me that velocity too, first. Though. 
We have to. Well, if he has he's, he's that 93 in, the, in spring, that yes. was a brand new thing. So we'll see. Absolutely. All right. Let's move on to Reed Detmers, who Paula has at 47, and Eric has at 91. And Nick just added in that he's got him at 81. Is that what that is? Yes. All right. Uh, Paul, why do you love Reed Detmers? I mean, I kind of always have loved Reed Detmers. I kind of think, you know, he is a, a great example of the prospect growth isn't linear type of situation where we've seen him kind of bounce around a bit. I still think the core fundamentals here, you know, added a, a mile per hour velo last year uh, was basically the same guy. If you look at like the ERA indicators, Sierra was 412, 414 in 2022 and 2023. So basically the same dude going to be 24 years old. I think he's just kind of building up into uh, you know, a full breakout a breakout season. And I don't know if it comes this year, but I'm willing to pay for it. Uh, he's a guy that I've, I've just consistently liked. I liked the strikeout spike last year. I don't know if he holds all of the, the gains, a three-point jump from 23 to 26. But if he does, I, I think there's a lot more here. I don't believe in him as a four-and-a-half ERA guy. I think he's a high threes type of guy right now with a solid whip and then the potential to be much more at age 24. All right, uh, Eric, you're the low man. Uh, oh, no, you're not. Nick, no, no, no. Nick, <laughs> Nick just moved him down. I forgot. It says the wrong thing on the player page. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm gonna let Eric rebut. Uh, I, and, I don't have. A, I honestly don't have a rebuttal. I've always been a huge Reed Detmers fan. It just hasn't come together for him, and so I am like eagerly watching him in the spring, and I'm, I'm happy to move him up um, if I see, you know, some something that to me entails growth. I mean, he spent a lot of time talking about how he fixed his mechanics in the off season to be more consistent with his mechanics to prevent the ups and downs. And that would be great. Um, yes, he tweaked his slider. He's been doing it forever and ever trying to tweak his slider. So like, I, I need to see if the, those changes actually manifest in, you know, innings, but I, I've always liked Detmers. Um, it hasn't come together. And so I don't want, I'm cautious of over investing, but again, that was the same thing for me last year with like, I was huge on Josh Lowe after reading all the breakouts about him in the alternate site in 2020. And then I had as many shares as possible. And then I thought, Oh, I got burned. I don't want to do it again. Don't and I missed him. out. And maybe I'll, maybe I'll miss on Detmers. So he's a guy I'm, I'm ready to move in the spring. If I see things I like anything to add quickly. Okay. I, uh... I Very used to be good. the biggest Reed Detmers fan. I was like, oh my gosh, high four seamers at like 95. Oh my God, it's higher now. And he has this really good slider that misses bats and he has this curveball for strikes. Everything's cool. <laughs> Learning about fastball shapes, I realized that Demers has like one of the worst. It's like terrible extension. Uh, he lost over a take of vert and now it's like super pedestrian, but uh, below average at 15. His uh, angle that he goes to the plate, like it's bad for going upstairs. So this is a pitch that got crushed last year. 47% ice air despite the higher velocity. I is that going to change? I don't think so. The slider isn't as well commanded as we want it to be. It's very inconsistent through the year. Uh, he got it fixed in 2022 and then they fired the coaches that fixed it. <laughs> and like the angels are not a good development squad. The curveball is not consistent enough. The actually the only intriguing thing about Demers right now to me is that he had the change at the end of the year. Maybe that helps him, but I need to see something dramatically different uh, from what he throws because the four seamer right now, it just, it needs to be a, the higher vert pitch. It needs to be, just more. I mean, it's a really bad extension that's killing this pitch a lot. And to me, it's just way too cherry bomb esque at the moment that I'm just not drafting him, unfortunately. All right. I'm going to put two together because you guys are on opposite sides of the ranks on both of them. I think uh, that there's definitely some wrongness going on around here. Uh, <laughs> Shoto Minaga, uh, Eric, you have him 30. Nick, you have him 32. Paul, you have him 67. And then I am higher now. And Gerardo Rodriguez, um, Nick, you have him 66. Uh, Eric, you have him 75. Paul, you have him 36. We have just like four minutes left. Yeah. So very, very quickly defend your choices uh, because I'm on the opposite I, side. I can be quick. Guys. Yeah, no, Eric, I'd be love quick. to hear the Imanaga thing. I, I don't uh, know. Imanaga is amazing. Um, he led he led the Japanese league in strikeout rate. He had the highest stuff plus of any pitcher in the World Baseball Classic. His arsenal is ridiculous. He led um, he was uh, he had a 68 percent strike rate in the NPB. It would have been fifth best in Major League Baseball. So he throws consistent strikes with electric stuff. Um, he looked amazing in those early bullpens. I think the, the reason we have this knock on him 
is that he's 30 years old, so he didn't get the hype that Yamamoto did, but he was better in many respects than Yamamoto in the NPB last year. I'm not drafting in a dynasty league. I'm drafting in a redraft league. To be clear, I have Yamamoto higher, but I'm saying that that Imanaga is a very talented pitcher who gets knocked because he doesn't have like the flashy velo, but he has a great arsenal of pitches. The Eduardo Rodriguez hate is he vastly overperformed literally all of his um, underlying metrics last year. I do my rankings as if I'm drafting in the 12-teamer. I don't really see any upside for Eduardo Rodriguez in a 12-team league. I think he is a fine but not great uh, ratio pitcher. And to me, like I can get an Eduardo Rodriguez type off waiver wire in a 12-team league. And so I have him below um, basically guys who are much – riskier but i would rather take them as my late round picks um in a 12 team league on the the off uh, the offshoot that they pop um i've been an eduardo rodriguez fan in the past it, to me it's just like it's a meh profile paul re a rebuttal i mean you're, you're not getting 331 15 off the off the waiver wire uh in 12 team you might be getting a, a mid fours which I don't is think, where yeah, i don't think eduardo right. that either, Eric, yeah. he's gonna give you a three nine is my yeah my guess. with like a 120 125 whip yeah that's not really on the wire that often either if we're being in a 12 totally team or honest. yeah 12 team in a 12 not team really. it, well 12 team there's a lot of guys that are, you can draft like that already like waka how like believable waka. is waka I I mean he's an elite changeup with solid I mean, isn't, command. Isn't that what Rodriguez was? Is an elite right? changeup too. Ro Rodriguez I mean, had I showed like health, you know, Waka health too, but he did this last year. Like he is going Waka's to the, the same thing field though. And like I'll I'll I don't want to, yeah, Waka. Have, we have this, the same place. Uh, that's what I'm saying. I'll take, I'll yeah. take Tyler Wells over Eduardo Rodriguez yeah. if I'm just like trying to draft the beginning of the season. Um, like I prefer about, Erod, about but it's similar. They're right in the same this, range. This is just evolving at the end. Uh, <laughs> gentlemen, I have to okay. just uh, I have to kind of cut it, unfortunately, because we've got another amazing panel coming on. But you guys are the best in the business. I love all of you. Uh, Nick might have reached on social media and plug everything you got going over at Bitrelist. Yeah, Jen, by the way, I'm sure you meant the cute guy in the bottom left because Eric's over there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, well, and uh, right. also, yeah. Spore and I might be doing something. I don't know. We might announce it soon. But we get it looks good and stuff. So it looks that's great. Cool. Look out for that. It's happening. <laughs> I don't even know what this is. I don't know. So oh, nobody, neither of you. Yeah, nobody that's does. Design. Yeah. Nobody does. This is crazy. All right. Uh, Stay a, tuned. A non-announcement announcement. announcement uh, that's right. Coming soon. A tease. It's called uh, a tease. Learn the business. Yes, a tease. Yes, Nick has started right. so many things. This. <laughs> yeah. Whatever. Uh, Paul, remind everybody where you can reach and what you do. On Twitter at Spore, I'm not calling it X. I'm not a moron. Uh, fantasy uh, <laughs> fangraphs.com slash rotographs. We can switch the URL every year, it seems. Pods with you, Justin, uh, doing our starting pitcher preview. As I said, we got our rankings up, got sleepers coming out next week. It is baseball season, y'all. All right, what? Eric, finish out. Oh, yeah, uh, they're Eric. already out. Sorry, the bus oh. is already out. That's the only reason I'm previewing. Sorry, yeah, yeah. Sorry, go ahead, Eric. No, that's okay. I'm, I'm ready to read the bus. Um, I'm it's at out. Samsky NYC on, on Twitter. Um, I tweet out all my articles so you can get them there. Um, you can get them at NBC sports.com is where all of that will come. If you just type in Eric Spolsky, NBC sports, it takes you to a page with literally all of my articles. Uh, Nick and I are on the corner together. Um, and then I'm also on the Roto world baseball podcast. So check me out there as well. I'll visit that. Cool. Right. And, and hopefully I'll be on the podcast with you, Justin, to talk about uh, your hatred of Riley green. Yeah, we're gonna we're gonna uh, set that up. I will uh, DM you, and we'll set that Sounds up good. in the future. Uh, Nick, I will see you in Florida in uh, just about a week. Eric, I will see you in New York, hopefully in about three weeks. Paul, and I'll see you on Monday when on we Monday morning. Together. That yeah. sounds great, gentlemen. Great talking with you. Take care, Love guys. You guys. Bye. Dun, dun, dun. All right, we are raising money for uh, for Fantasy Cares through Bottom Palooza. Fantasy Cares is an amazing organization that uh, raises money for Toys for Tots drives all around the country. We had Scott Fish on earlier this hour to not only discuss everything that Fantasy Cares does, but the fact that they're giving away three amazing jerseys on top of all the prizes we have, including, we just had Nick on, a PL Plus membership that he's giving away. Uh, Fantasy Cares is donating an Eric, a signed Eric Gagne jersey, a signed Jose Canseco jersey, and a signed Ronald Acuna jersey. Any money you donate, for every dollar you donate, you get a raffle ticket towards winning some of those amazing prizes. 
All the prizes will be given away after the weekend, so you do not don't be afraid that you missed out on something. We're not giving away prizes every hour like we did last year. We're going to save it all to the end, so that way you're eligible to win as much as you can. Keep donating. So far, we have raised as I update my screen uh, over uh, twelve hundred dollars today, and if you add in the six thousand uh, dollars plus from TGFBI participants and satellite participants. We're over seven thousand uh, dollars for from TGFBI and Potapalooza. Please keep it coming. You can see down below uh, uh, www.donorbox.org backslash TGFBI is where you can donate to get entered in to win those prizes. Coming on strong is a new crew. We're we're changing gears. We're going from starting pitching for this year to everything you need to know for your dynasty leagues and prospects. We have Drew Wheeler. How are you doing, my friend? Hey, everybody. Justin, so good to see you again, my man. How are you? It's I'm, I'm hanging in there. I'm sick. I'm podcasting, but I am having a lot of fun with all these panels. Well, you know, you've got a, you've got a bit to go, so I'll uh, yeah. pray for good health on your behalf. And thank you for having me. We're, we're hyped. And man, what a first of all, what a great panel we have coming up here. So many very smart people and myself. And then also, uh, thanks for letting us follow the the goats of starting pitching. I appreciate the death slot that you've given me. <laughs> hey, you're bad in cleanup, right? You're you're going to knock them in. They they got on base with their panel, and you guys now get to knock in a run right here. Uh, Drew, thank remind you. everybody where you can reach on social media and plug everything you do. Well, thank you. Uh, you can see it right here, guys. Uh, you can find me on the Twitter machine at Drew is OK. Uh, you can also find my work in the written and auditory forms at Prospects Live. Uh, we have a great crew that's actually growing exponentially by the day, Justin. And uh, so many great people are, are coming in to provide what we think is the best suite of fantasy baseball tools across the interwebs. Uh, we just released our top 500 prospects update, uh, I believe, Thursday. It's tremendous. Uh, it's it's very exciting, and I can't wait to talk Dynasty with some of these brilliant minds that you have assembled for me. The Avengers, so to say. Yes, let's bring in some of those Avengers. We have Tim. How you doing, my friend? Excellent. How are you doing? I'm doing well. Remind everybody where you can reach <laughs> and what you do. I'm at the Fantasy Ace Ball podcast in podcast form. I'm also writing on Friends of Fantasy Benefits, your website, and Fantasy Pros. So you can find a lot of my dynasty stuff over on Fantasy Pros, and then uh, we've got the F scores over on Friends with Fantasy Benefits. We love the F scores over at Friends with Fantasy Benefits, and we love all that you do in the industry. Joining us as well is Joe. How you doing, my friend? I'm doing good, Justin. I appreciate you uh, inviting me on, even though I tend to troll some of your live podcasts here and there. Um, I appreciate it. <laughs> <laughs> you, you can find me on twitter at jay hook uh you can find me um at prospects live dropping all my content there focused on uh baseball cards but i also kind of moonlight uh writing some uh prospect uh, reports here and there as well and uh yeah no i'm stoked to be here thanks for having me all right and then we have chad how you doing my friend doing good and happy to be here for a great cause all right. Let everybody know where you can reach on social media and plug all that you do. Uh, I can be reached on social media at SouchadTTV on Twitter. Um, you can find my articles right now at Fantasy Six Pack. Uh, you can find my Dynasty rankings there and also on Fantasy Pros. I'm one of the experts there. And you can find my live content at the Plaza Podcast. Two L's, mm -hmm. two Z's. Uh, with the great Michael Govier. Um, we have a big show coming up with Negro Baseball League Museum President Bob Kendrick on March 13th. That's awesome. I'll definitely be looking forward to listening to that. You're going to hear more from Govier later because he's going to be coming up at the uh, back end of day one. Uh, but before we jump in, we got one more person. We got a packed panel for prospects and dynasty. Uh, we have my brother, Matt Thompson, who I've known longer than anybody in the industry, uh, co owner of Friends of Fantasy Benefits over at Prospects Live. Tell everybody where you can reach and what you do. Prospects Live is the main hub for all the work now, although I would like to talk about getting our FWFB podcast going one day a week at least. Um, that was some of the most fun I've had 
doing any of this stuff by a mile it was with me, you, and Mike, and we our guests we'd always have on or so. I'd like to do something like that. But uh, no, uh, Prospects Live with some of these fine folks here. Uh, Mr. Wheeler, Mr. Lowry, um, two, of the, two of the greatest people that we have at our site that makes our machine keep turning. Um, happy for everything we have. And uh, I'm rambling at this point, but, friend, uh, but Prospects Live is the place to be for all of my Dynasty content. I just had a small, tiny Patreon post up today about some of the prospects and, and young major leaguers that are playing in games and how I see their value changing over the last, I don't know, 72 hours or so. So fun stuff if you want to read about Jackson Merrill, Sean Bouchard, Christopher Morell, and Kyle Manzardo. That's supposed to be. I got my Sean Bouchard jersey right here, baby. You're ahead of the curve, funny. man. You're ahead of the curve on that. And he, he hit a home run off of a, a Twins reliever to win me my uh, NFBC auction. I, I remember that. I was at AFL. Yeah. Weren't you wearing that jersey at the AFL? Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. yeah I, mean, I had to. So uh, you guys have a fun hour. Uh, Drew's going to take over command of this rowdy bunch, uh, but I will be listening and learning because you guys are the people I turn to for prospects. Thank you. Appreciate that. Thanks, Justin. And uh, fellas, let's get to it. Uh, you know, talking about dynasty and prospects, for a lot of people, it brings up a lot of joy. For me and my heart, it brings up a lot of anxiety. So I'd like to spread that kind of disastrous anxiety with you all. And just real quick, let's let's bounce around the room and talk about who your your favorite prospect bust all time is. And I'll I'll kick this off with Mike Olt. Uh, you you may recall him as a third base prospect, a, a corner sort uh, for the Texas Rangers, who tragically kind of stopped, started having some tragic eye issues, and it just really kind of derailed his entire career. Uh, Mike Olt uh, was a dude I thought was going to be an absolute Goliath. Uh, I miss him. I love him. Shouts out to Mike Olt. Uh, F's in the chat for Mike Olt. Uh, Tim, hit me with yours, buddy. Uh, favorite fantasy prospect bust of all time. I went with Alex Reyes, and I almost, <laughs> I almost went a little dark and went Oscar Tavares here, but uh, <laughs> we won't really get into that. But I'm a Cardinals fan, so of course it's going to be a Cardinals prospect. And Alex Reyes, I fell in love with him, and then he got hurt, and then I fell in love with him. This is a guy I just fell in love with like three different times, and he just keeps getting hurt. And it's, I don't know, one of the guys that I just can't give up. It's understandable, man. And, you know, Tavares, uh, hard RIP for him, would have been an absolute – giant in the fantasy world joe my dude tell me about whose baseball card you invested too heavily in uh you ain't lying there um as a giants fan um i bought way too many joey bart fan uh cards way way too many <laughs> and and so uh along with me buying baseball cards i i also tend to uh put those favorites of mine on my dynasty uh, teams and Joey Bart was owned across all of my dynasty teams, 2018, 2019, 2020, 2021. <laughs> <laughs> about yeah, about that. I started to, to get smacked by reality and, and uh, yeah, I don't even know if he's a backup catcher <laughs> anymore. It's rough. It's hard to say, but he'll always be the starter in our hearts. I was definitely with Bart. Chad, my new friend, tell me, buddy, your number one prospect bust all time. Who you got? I just want to quickly second the Alex Reyes thing and really hammer it home with the fact that there was so much hope with this kid that I bought 2022 and 2023 shares of him with the Dodgers. That, that just is, hoping that is... they could fix him. But for I... me, it's it's got to be Henry Owens. This was the next Chris Sale. This was the next great all-time pitcher, and then nothing. There's leagues I trade Garrett Cole for him. There's leagues I trade oh. Mike Trout packages for him. It, yeah, it's oof. him and Chris Shaw together. A fickle mistress is Dynasty. Henry Owens, I remember, was going to be uh, another legitimate arm, and I, I definitely suffer with you there, Chad. Uh, Maddie, your favorite – Prospect bust. It's one that I, 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 it's very you. It's predictable, but go ahead and tell us. Yeah. Well, uh, I didn't want to pile on Alex Reyes, but I went to, I went with Lewis Brinson because I thought he was going to be like the next, you know, huge thing, right? He does everything at the power speed combination. Oh, just if he learns to make more contact, he'll pick it up. And well, 
obviously he never did. Um, I, I'm still a sucker. I'd be like, I'd sign him to a non-roster deal every spring and see if I could figure it out. That's what I would try to be doing if I was, you know, yeah. in this situation. Because I mean, that's it's still the type of skills you can't teach, right? He's got a lot of the innate things that you look for. Um, premium athlete. Don't bet. I mean, always bet on the athlete. Seems to be my slogan. And sometimes you go down with the ship. So. Yeah. Uh, as long as you can bat above 500, you're doing pretty good in that. Yeah, that, that tragic thing. You know, if only he could learn to hit the ball, what what would be? And, you know, this is me in my heart trying right now to ignore the fact that Scott Kingery just hit a, a mammoth home run in spring training for the Phils. Uh, we are so back, baby. Anyway, moving past that, uh, we do want to get to some questions that uh, that we've got kind of proposed in here for you guys to take and adapt into your dynasty and your prospect uh, mindsets as you go into this upcoming year of our favorite hobby. Uh, so first question we've got is, how do you like to construct your dynasty league teams in the initial draft? What is it about that first draft and how exactly do you turn those corners as you're constructing this team, knowing this could potentially be a three-year, a five-year, a 20-year league? Uh, Tim, let's start with you, buddy. How, like how do you go with it? I like go to go with a year two build most of the time. So like I hate losing and I don't like giving up year one. So usually what I'll do is I'll try for year one, but I'll have the most of the emphasis on year two type players and go with like some proximity prospects who are going to be up sooner rather than later, uh, which also makes for good trading ammo. So if you're, I think if you put yourself in that spot for year two, you give yourself a lot of flexibility where it's like you might accidentally win in on year one because you're not aiming so far out, but you also have the flexibility to say, okay, this year one is just not working for me. Someone just went all, because there's always the one guy, right? In your league who goes in for year one. And so then at least that gives you some flexibility uh, to maneuver around because when you're in a dynasty league, flexibility is key. Well said. I can agree with that. Uh, Joe, constructing your dynasty league teams from the jump, from that first draft, what's your strategy? So, um, you know, a, a completely, you know, made up stat is that is completely true is that three out of every four dynasty leagues fail within the first three years. Um, That's the five. <laughs> so my approach is win now. You know, I, I've taken them all. I've taken the win now, the win soon, the win later. And just with dynasty failure rates, I've just gravitated towards win now. Um, and, and to be fair, you know, I feel like redraft is kind of starting to to marry up with that as well, just with the success rates of all of these young players um, and, and them coming up earlier, um, you know, years ago, um, I don't think we would have seen um, debuts of so many of these players, uh, you know, just recently, like, I mean, a, a Mason Wynn, for example, just the, the, the 20 year olds, the 21 year olds, those used to be the exceptions when they were debuting at that age and now they're not. So I think you can, take the win now approach but still have that waiting towards younger players right jordan jordan walker's an adp of 111 115 ish right now in redraft and in dynasty adp he's roughly around 50 which is kind of where mike trout range is for outfielders right and so you know you'd think a win now approach is take mike trout but you can take a win now approach and, and still draft Jordan Walker. There, you're just jumping them up 50 places. So kind of know your ADP and be willing to jump up the young guys, but the young guys that are playing and contributing in the MLB. So that's kind of the approach I've gravitated towards more, most recently. It's a safe approach. It, it almost kind of plays into what Tim was saying about being flexible. It's mm -hmm. almost uh, redirecting your approach in, in different ways. And, you know, people are going to do that from time to time. Uh, Chad, uh, from the initial draft, how do you set it up, man? For me, it's a little more simplistic. I just go out and get my guys. I ignore ADP because I know there's going to be parts of the draft where there's just a glut of guys that I will never have a share of. You know, there's a portion where it's Freddie Freeman, Austin Riley, uh, Vlad Jr., just guys that I don't want to pay the price for because some of them I don't trust, some of them are too old, and some of them I think there's just better value in the draft. So I'll go out. I'm. I have a few startups this year. I'm probably gonna have some round one Adley shares, some you know round four Vinny P shares. Just because at the end of the day, if you end up getting your guys and you think your guys are gonna be top one, two, or three at their position, 
the long run, you're going to win. That's fair. Uh, it's a good analysis. And I mean, if you trust yourself to to have these guys scouted and to understand the future of what their position would look like, it, it makes total sense to me, man. Uh, Matt, what about you, pal? Uh, starting up the Dynasty League, what do you do? Two quick things. Number one is kind of a, just a broad statement. Know who you're drafting with as much as possible. Um, if I, you know, I'm, I'm going to pick on Joe because I know Joe a little bit more. But if I, if I see Joe Lowry and I know, okay, well, there's a Giants prospect whose ADP might be around here. Hey, if I want him, I might have to take him because he's not going to go to – because he's not going to get past Joe, right? If you just have to know – you know your people like that. And the second thing is diversify your portfolio. Don't take too many Lewis Brinson types to where you're hamstrung. And, and you know, for, for every one or, you know, look, look for a safer option sometimes. Don't always shoot for the moon. Shoot for the moon is, is a good strategy when you're in, in a lot of these smaller leagues where there's a shallow wire or even on these – I don't mind it in a 30-teamer either, but 30-teamer you have to, you know – maybe one or two dice rolls like that. You're not, you're not going to build an entire team of, you know, highly volatile um, prospects, right? There's, or younger players or, and you know, a lot of the, a lot of the value in dynasty things can be found in, in a lot of the DJ LeMahieu, the older, the older type veteran guys that nobody wants that are going to fall down too. So, I mean, mix and match, man. Don't, don't, uh, don't kill yourself with too many high variance players, or in the in the flip side of that, don't draft all you know thirty eight year old players either, right? Um, just variety, variety, variety. Can't beat it. This is the spice of life, as they say, Matt. Remember that at home. All right. So uh, another question that I feel like people are asked, and they ask constantly, at least in the prospects live Discord, and you see it on Twitter all the time. Uh, how do you know when to flip the switch? When to abandon ship? When do you compete? When do you build or rebuild? And that's a it, it's it's such a tough question to 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 juggle. But Matt, I'm going to go to you first. We'll switch this order up. Uh, how do you know when it's time to compete? How do you know when it's time to rebuild? Honestly, if you're unsure, your league mates will tell you about the trade offers you're getting. Um, you y'all know what I'm talking about. You'll get a guy so say, "I think you know." You make it known. Everyone knows the standings are public, right? You can tell. Okay, well. Yeah. Matt's Matt's shitty in stolen bases, so let's see if I can maybe send him some of them guys, and you know, see if I can snatch some of these older guys from him, and or whatever. You know what I mean? Your 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 league mates will tell you uh, what your where your where your team's sitting, and you just have to be conscious. You know, you're you're again, it kind of goes back to ideally, you don't have you have a competitive window all the time because you're not you don't have seven Paul Goldschmidt's on your team, right? You ideally you have a variety of that and you don't let yourself build into that kind of complacency but but yeah i think it's a, it's a tough thing but if you're if you're really unsure obviously another thing too is join communities like prospects live or other places uh clegg substack all these other places is a, i'm, I'm not want to start listing because i don't want to forget anybody yeah. but, but uh, they'll you know they'll give you analysis of your teams as well like but if you don't want to pay for anything and you're kind of on the fence yourself, man, you'll get trade offers from your league mates that'll kind of steer you in directions. I promise you, um, you'll get some influence. For sure. Well said. Chad, how do you know when it's time to, uh, when it's time to dive in and compete versus time to rebuild? So for me, uh, I don't even use the word rebuilding. I don't think that word should exist if you're capable at Dynasty. Um, I think retooling is a word that I would use from time to time. Um, basically, if you build your roster correctly and you know your prospects and you do the research and you talk, to, you know, you follow the people that are in this show today and other people in the industry and you do the work, you always have that next group ready where you can just shave off some age. Of the, you know, maybe this year you, you find a trade for Kyle Schwarber and get a maybe you get a Parker Meadows or something. You're not necessarily rebuilding. You can still compete with that. But you should never have to completely blow up your roster. Definitely fair. I think that that kind of goes to what we were talking about a minute ago and, you know, having that diversification with your initial draft or having kind of a, a, a clearer idea of, okay, if I'm going to go heavy for the first year, I need in the back half of the draft to focus on the uh, the escape hatch, so to say. And so, exactly. Chad, that's a good point. Having that roster construction is is pretty critical. 
and uh, knowing that there is value you can get by shaving uh, the dudes off the top or, uh, you know, ditching some of your chaff at the back half of your roster for a churning prospects. Uh, it's a great, great method as well. Joseph, when do you compete? When do you rebuild? Retool. When do you do it? When do you do something different? <laughs> so, I mean, to, to a certain degree, uh, it, it follows kind of what Matt said, where um, either you're aware or your league mates let you know um, where your weaknesses are. So to, to me, you know, I, there, I don't know if there's really that good or if they even exist um, tools out there for projections for Dynasty. But in, in theory, you should just be able to use the standard projection tools for redraft to um, give you a really good idea at, you know, because there's the there's the eye test. You look at your roster, you look at, at your competitors and, and you have a pretty good idea if you're competitive or not. But uh, I, I find that um, getting that data point with projections helps me really focus on, OK, I, I'm light on power. Uh, I'm, I'm light on speed. I'm going to go out and, and look for you know, in, in an OBP league, you know, to, to what kind of where Chad was going, you know, I'll, I'll look for a Schwarber, right. Um, and, and see if I can get it. Cause usually <clears throat> he's, he's not overly expensive, especially if I've got enough prospects to make that deal happen. And, and, you know, so I, when I project, I want to be in that top third of the league. If, if I'm not, then I, I tend to, to, you know, sell off veterans. Right. Um, you know, I, I just made a, a trade a few days ago in the dynasty league um where it wasn't and, and you don't i don't like to sell off for um you know the leo de Vries who's not gonna help me in five years because going back to my stat my league will be you know kaput before de Vries is up and, and so i'd made a trade for shane bieber uh for vinnie p right because i've i've on that team i've got paul goldschmidt and he just you know it's it's no longer a competitive team in the next year or two as Goldschmidt starts to fall off and I've got no first baseman on the roster. So um, I'm either looking to acquire that power bad or that speed component, finding my weakness, or if I'm doing a projection and I'm in the back half of the league, I'm not looking to sell for the youngest prospects that are the hottest names in the hype. I'm looking to sell for the, the, useful vets that are still kind of in that 30-ish year old range and pick up the um, young MLB players in that 25-year old range. So that's kind of my my approach. It's like like Chad said, I'm retooling, I'm not rebuilding. Awesome. Right. Well said. Uh, Tim, bring us home, buddy. When do you know? The thing is you have to go with your gut. And this is America, Drew. You're always going to compete, right? Like that, You have to. Keep the pedals on the keep 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 the pedal to the metal. If you don't, you're gonna lose a competitive edge. So you have to always compete. Like I had a 16 team odd new league, and I started 0 and 6 this year in that or last year in that league. Injuries, right? Injury bug always hits. You get a guy like Jose Altuve in a 16 team league gets hurt at the beginning of the year, it can kill you. You have a Fernando Tatis suspended on top of it, it kills you. And so 0 and 6, I didn't just stop paying attention to the league. No, I started selling off pieces, right? I flipped Garrett Cole for Yuri Perez. I flipped uh, Altuve for, I think, Gorman and something else. But then I ended up finishing this season 11-1 and after that 0-6 start, and I almost made the playoffs, just barely missed the playoffs. So that's the thing about retooling, right? Instead of just rebuilding. I'm not like, ah, I'm just going to get all prospects now. Instead, I retooled to players that could still help me compete that season, like a Yuri Perez, who's younger, so that he's going to help me for future seasons. But... If you retool in that method, you can still compete at the same time that you are quote unquote rebuilding. Yeah, I absolutely. And I love those two trades for you, by the way. That's rad. And, you know, sets you up for the future, too. Certainly a little younger. All right. I'm going to switch up the order again. We're going to go to a new question here, guys. Uh, well, let's do it both at once. We'll try to combine these two questions into one. Uh, are there positions? or types of prospects that you avoid in Dynasty Leagues? And then on the flip side, are there types of prospects you get overly aggressive on in Dynasty Leagues? Who are the who are the prospects that you think, or rather the position types or prospects you're pushing, and who are you pulling in? Uh, Joe, let's start with you, buddy. Yeah, sure thing. So, uh, you know, I think it's going to be pretty obvious I, um, that 
catchers. I'm not over waiting on, on prospect catchers at all. Um, yeah, I, I, there are ones that I like and, and they, you know, I'm not going to ignore them, you know, um, but, uh, you know, the Diego Cartayas, the, the Kevin Paradas, the Joey Barts of the world are just not places where I want to be investing. Um, you know, in, in season last year in my dynasty leagues, I picked up Samuel Basalo right now, who knows if he's actually a, a long time catcher or not, but that's kind of um, where you want to play in the catcher space in my opinion you don't want to have long-term investments there just because of the rigors of the position the fact that they may get moved off and they may not be as competitive um hitters when they are moved likely to first base or potentially the outfield um and and then uh final thought there is there's there's some orgs that i just avoid and and you know i'll probably be burned at some point because of it but i'm not doing rockies prospects i can't i can't do it uh you know obviously pitchers just that's where they go to die and and even on their hitter side it it can be pretty rough i mean i'm still a believer in audio amador but beyond that i kind of don't want to be involved in in their prospects you know uh nationals pitching to a certain degree has pretty been pretty rough for a while and 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 the obvious one marlins hitters oh my goodness i i couldn't tell you a marlins hitter that they drafted and developed or picked up in the international free agency that they've um, developed. You know, the, the some people want to think, you know, maybe Jazz Chisholm, but he was a, a Diamondback, you know, when he started out, right? It's, they, I can't name one that, that's come through that system. So staying away. For for the guys that I, you know, like, I, I tend to overweight myself on prep shortstops and international shortstops um, because, you know, some of those guys aren't going to be shortstops long term, so I, it helps me fill out my roster in other positions as they get closer to the MLB. Right? They'll go to third base, they'll go to second base, they'll go to the outfield. Right? We just saw um, Jackson Merrill right playing in the outfield, um, and then you know last year Brady House going from shortstop to third base. Right? Um, if you look at you know as you mentioned off the top, Drew, our top 500 fantasy prospects just got released, and if and if you um, filter it by shortstops and you look at the top 100 um there are 21 shortstops two of them were college bats uh tommy troy and brooks lee every single one 19 of the 21 were either prep shortstops or international shortstops right jackson holiday jordan lawler noelvi Marte, adio armador jackson merrill jet williams colt emerson colson montgomery yada 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 the list goes on and that's where I'm attacking prospects for my dynasty. Let me jump in real quick on that. The, Do it, Matt. I have a philosophy as well where I kind of punt, not punt, but go back in recent history and look at how many college shortstops are shortstops at the big league level. I got one for you. That's it. Dansby Swanson. That is it. Alex Bregman was a college shortstop. He's playing third base. So that's another one. But the reason is a little bit different than you might think, and maybe it's an obvious reason, but I'm going to explain it anyways. Most of the premium athletes aren't making it to campus. They're getting drafted as prep players with huge bonuses attached, or obviously they're international players and not eligible for the draft. So college shortstops, like some of the recent college shortstops are like Zach Desenzo. He's not going to play shortstop in the pros, but he's moved over to third base. Like You know what I mean? Or he might play the outfield. He might play first base. Um, Matt Shaw is a perfect example. Matt Shaw, he's made. not going to play pro shortstop. He's not going to be a shortstop in the big leagues. He might play second, might play third, but he's not going to play short. Um, so, I mean, that's a demographic that um, you can probably stay away from if you're looking for a shortstop. But, I mean, you're not really drafting for needs, I don't think, in a first-year player draft or anything like that. You shouldn't be anyways if you are, unless it's like an odd thing like a Yoshinobu. But, I mean, those are – Anyone can draft those players because they're already developed and they are what they are. But that, and then obviously catchers were kind of mentioned. Um, I I also tend to stay away from prep first baseman because the level for an offensive player to clear to be an everyday first baseman is massive. And yes, I might get burned, and maybe I miss out on an Xavier Isaac or like. But, like, that's not going to kill me, right? Right. Um, most of those guys – and Isaac still might not work out. But most of those guys, especially right-handed hitting ones, 
you know, the right-handed hitting first baseman is not a demographic I'm interested in that much either because number one, if, if they, if they don't become a full-time everyday guy, you're not carrying them on the big league roster because you're not carrying a, a platoon DH on the way teams are built anymore. That position's gone. Um, so that's, that's something to look at. I mean, if you stay up the middle shortstop, I'm kind of don't like second baseman that much I, either, to be honest, because where are they going to go? Left field. That's, if they can't play in the infield, they're going to left field, right, most of the time. But stick up the middle. If you draft shortstops, oh, no, my dynasty team might have 20 minor league shortstops. Okay, well, you might have three when you're all said and done. Like, that's right. fine. Like, stick up the middle where the athletes are. Um, and if you're doing pitching, like, obviously people say stay away from pitching. Well, you can't because that's, that's roster spots and half the categories are pitching. So I've seen people draft no pitchers in dynasty, and guess what? If nobody trades with them, they're not going to win anything because they don't meet limits and it won't, won't be competitive. So if you will look for pitching, mm-hmm. look for command. Look for that. Pay attention to the frame. Um, I'm, I'm, this sounds all sounds obvious, but like, if a guy can spin a breaking ball, and look at the organization. If the Cleveland Guardians draft you, it, it means you can command a slider, and it means you have fa- command of a fastball, and it means you have a projectable frame. Like, okay, those are all good things. Um, if the Houston Astros draft you, it means you're a a uh, college pitcher with, with it's, uh, that's underrated with uh, four pitches and good fastball shape and, and can can command a slider. Let the teams do the work for you. And if you if you you know if you're if you're really unsure of how you if you keep getting burned in pitching, if you just stick to the Dodgers, the the Astros, the Rays, like you're, you're not going to come out that bad. I promise. So like, yeah, it's harder. The Dodgers might be the, a bad example because like you have to be a legit number two nowadays to pitch for the Dodgers, but like. You know those put those organizations will do a lot of the work for you. Um, you may think, and I mean, this is something that again, probably sounds obvious. You're not smarter than the than the big league teams are. So, like, they have models, they have different things to you know identify who they're picking. If you follow their lead, you'll you'll work out. It'll work out for you most of the time. I promise. Well said, uh, and great stuff, Matt. Uh, and uh, you know, a lot of the things I just want to kind of forewarn everybody. What Matt says is, you know, this seems obvious. So often when you get to Dynasty Leagues, and you guys, I'm sure you've seen the meme on the Twitter machine. Uh, you start here, the bell curves up, and then it curves back down. At the top peak of that bell curve is, I know more than every other player in Dynasty. I know more than any MLB org. Here you say, on the on the left-hand side of the, the meme, you say, you know, oh, well, the, the teams are using them, so maybe I, I maybe they know something. And then at the back half of the curve, it's, it's exactly what you're – you're saying, Matt, it's it's silly to go against these teams that have all of this exponentially better data than what's publicly available to us to, to trust them and to trust an organization that's shown themselves to be able to develop talent consistently. What a great bit of advice. And again, don't overcomplicate it is the point of what I'm saying. Yeah, tra- it's a complicated thing when you look at everybody's rosters comparing it to yourself. Yeah. Stay in your lane. Yes. The simple path is more than often the correct one in, in this game that we play. Well said. Uh, Tim, tell me, pal, uh, positions, types of prospects you avoid, and then who do you get aggressive on? Yeah, positionally, it's kind of the same thing everyone else is saying. Stay up the middle. Uh, As far as injuries, especially with pitchers, I'm not the type to draft guys that are already injured. So I know some people think, oh, I'll get a bargain. This guy's getting his TJ over with early or whatever. But I don't really like to draft players that are coming off of injuries. It's just kind of a personal preference because drafting prospects is already kind of a hard enough game. And then when you're going to get someone who's also hurt on top of it, you're just going to, you're going to hurt your chances of that player being successful down the road. And then another thing with starting pitchers, and this may be more of a personal preference because I know we just had the starting pitcher guys talking and Nick's really big into, you know, getting the guy with the killer fastball or whatever, but like, I like pitchers that have multiple plus pitches instead of just like one amazing pitch. Like I'd rather go with a guy with a wider arsenal. Uh, They can work with pitch mix and, you know, get a little crafty. So I like guys with multiple plus pitches uh, more than just the one big fastball or whatever. And then as far as like pitchers and hitters, it's very important because I've done a lot of correlation work on this, especially this off season, but hitters have a lot higher chance of success if they have good plate skills. 
So I know, especially people who only play in Roto and they don't play points or OBP or whatever, they're just going to be like, oh, uh, you know, uh, it doesn't matter if they're walking or striking out or whatever, as long as they're hitting dingers and, you know, getting counting stats or whatever. But there's a huge correlation between not striking out and walking and having a good eye and then their success when they hit the next level than when they don't. Like you can look, use Gunnar Henderson as a good example of that, right? Gunnar Henderson has fantastic plate skills. And then he had a little bit of a, just, I mean, any rookie will, anyone will when they come up, but he had 60 plate appearances or whatever, where he had a little bit of struggles and then he took off. So that's going to happen. If you have good plate skills, you're going to adjust a little bit better. Um, and then it's the same thing kind of like with pitching, it's control. It's all about control. Like what Matt was saying, like you see the pitchers that come up and that have immediate su success. It's guys that have great control. George Kirby came up. Oh, he can, he knows where he's throwing the ball. Great. That's going to be awesome. Uh, you really, you really fight against that reliever risk with guys when they have good control. Like we have, you know, DL Hall and we've got Kyle Harrison who have awesome stuff that have come up. Right. But who knows? Everyone's like, Oh, potential bullpen risk because the control isn't there. So it's, it's true. They, put, they might have the best stuff in the minors, but if they can't, throw the ball in the right spot, then they're not going to make it as a big league starter. I, I love that, Tim. And, and again, it's such a, you know, it's, it's, we have all these complicated formulas and things, but at the end of the day, being able to hit the ball or being able to avoid having the ball hit. How do you, how do you miss these very, these, it's such simple truth almost. And it's, it's good for your soul to kind of almost reevaluate your own perspective in dynasty to say, you know, yeah, if you're looking for the diamonds in the rough, start with the, the most basic facets of the game. You want somebody that can hit the ball. And then for a pitcher, you want somebody that doesn't have the ball hit. It's well said, Tim. Really love that. Chad, bring us home, my man. Tell us how, uh, what you, what you're, what you attack and what you're pushing away. What, what, what are you leaving away? You're pushing away. We're going to go a little obvious, but also not so obvious. Cause there's a couple layers to this. We're going to talk relief pitchers as prospects. It seems pretty obvious, but there are cases where guys pop up that you'd want to own. And I've been on both sides of the coin with that. Uh, a couple years ago, Ben Leeper had a monster season for Iowa for the Cubs. They had no one at the major league level. I paid a pretty penny to get him. You know, I traded up to get a high waiver claim to get him. Never saw the light of day. Still hasn't. Then this past year, uh, Orion Kirkering, everyone loves him. I got him for free after he got called up. Then there's starting pitchers that are high upside, but with huge risk factors that just turn into relievers. You know, nine times out of ten, the best relievers in baseball were former starting pitching prospects. You know, I invested highly in Abner Uribe when he was still a star. Now he's probably the next Milwaukee great closer. So just don't invest in relievers. And on the uh, dive in side, um, I go heavy on DSL hype. I have a, uh, a core of people that are in the know that I lean on. And even if those players don't pan out, they tend to get a lot of helium within the next year and I can flip them. Very safe. Uh, you know, I love that too. It's almost um, having that kind of background of who you trust and in certain areas. I love that you could attack that DSL uh, demographic and then turn that into kind of value in your league. Because again, I forget who it was that said it earlier, but knowing who you're playing with, knowing who you're drafting with, and knowing what your strengths are. If your league mates, Chad, see you repetitively having a DSL guy that turns into your uh, – your buzzy, heavy, you know, prospect value guys, they're going to say, okay, Chad's in on something. I need, I need a little bit of that. Let me lean into that. I'll take this jump on this guy. And then you're selling a guy that you may not be as high on because if he's, you know, struggling with contact now that he's, you know, in America, you, yeah, you've, made out, you've made, you've made, well, yeah. Unfortunately in that league, everyone started following Eric Cross and he started talking about them more and more. And my edge shrunk significantly, but. Still had an edge because I was getting there earlier. You can't have lost an edge unless you had it in the first place. So celebrate that for sure, my man. Let's we'll celebrate that for sure. Okay, good answers, everybody. Love that. Uh, I've been taking very thorough notes, and I plan on winning all my leagues going forward. So thank you guys for that for sure. 
Uh, let's move on to a new question. Uh, which prospects, in your opinion, make the biggest impact in 2023? Chad, let's start with you, man. Who, What prospects are going to be the guys that sh show up and show out in 2024? So, I, I'm going to go strictly like true prospects. I'm going to ignore the obvious guys, you know, the sure. Evan Carters, you know, the guys that are already been up. And I'm going to give you two on both leagues. Okay. I'm going to give you Carson Wisenhunt of the Giants. I know Joe's going to really like that one. Um, he's all the good aspects of Logan Webb and Kyle Harrison together. Now he's going to have a, a slow start to the year, come back from injury, but I really think, especially if they're in contention, he's going to be up in the back half of the season, and he's going to be dominant down the stretch. And then on the offensive side, I'm going to go Zach Veen, the Colorado Rockies, just because – I still believe um, there's people in the chat, and I think Joe knows this as well, that I once had Zach Veen as the number one overall prospect on my rankings. And I once said he could be a 50-70 guy. I, I love so this belief. I, I love this enthusiasm. In I'm invested in him panning out. And then on the AL, um, I think the most obvious one who's not already up and I'm counting Jackson Holiday is up. Okay. Is Chase DeLauder of the Guardians. Um, this is a guy who easily could be the best outfielder in baseball within two years. Um, and then on the pitching side, I had a name and it's escaping me. So just give me one second. Sure. There. Too many names on the brain. That's all right. I'll tell you what, uh, I'll loop back to you after we talk to Matt. Loop back about to his. Me, yeah. I'll loop I don't back know to why you. I lost it. That's all good, man. Uh, like you said, there's there's so many names and so much information and data flying around just amongst five people. And really, you four, I'm not even talking, that it's hard to keep uh, keep your brain on straight. Matty, who's going to make the biggest impact in 2024, dude? So I'm staying away from the bigger names. I think I'll go a little bit further down the list. You yeah. got a, uh, two Padres arms. For you. I think uh, Drew Thorpe, I think, is one of their most you know well-rounded. He's still a top 50 guy, but mm -hmm. one of the more well-rounded starting pitching prospects in the minors. Really good changeup. Excellent feel for that pitch. Learned how to spin a breaking ball. It's mid mid-90s fastball. Big part of the Juan Soto trade. Um, Padres are in a weird spot this year. It's kind of all hands on deck because I think that GM's seat's are very, very warm. So I don't think they're going to leave a stone unturned to try to win this year because I think that's their mandate they have going forward. So I think mm -hmm. you're going to see some wild things out of there, like a Jackson Merrill and left field kind of thing. Um, and then another Padres arm I like is Jairo Iriarte a lot. Mm -hmm. um, he's borderline top 100 guy. Um, like in, in a real life list, because I, I think he's the stuff is legit. A real long, lanky dude. Um, probably a pen arm, but – Again, this situation for the Padres is unique because their depth chart is very – they're playing the Stars and Stripes – or Stars and Scrubs uh, uh, model yeah. with their major league team in a sense. They don't have a lot of depth, no, nothing at the top. You know, and the minor league system is kind of thin in the AAA levels unless you're counting these guys and Merrill, which I think Merrill probably breaks camp as an everyday guy to be honest. But um, Iriarte for me is a guy like – I mean, it's triple digits out of the bullpen and short stints. I mean, he could be – I'm not saying he, he's going to be this guy because, you know, this guy's command has done a complete 180, but, like, it's Edwin Diaz-type pitch mix. Like, I don't like putting out big names like that, but, like, it's it's filthy like that. The delivery, mm -hmm. the body type is similar. Like, he's long. Uh, like, it's, it's, it's an incredible overall uh, arsenal, and I, I really, really think he's a guy – that I'd be targeting late in, in a DC or anything this year. Cause I, I think the, the way the Padres are, I, uh, they're going to need a lot of help this year at the back end of the roster. They're going to be one of those teams kind of scrambling to piece everything together. Um, I also like Kate Horton. Cause I think there's a reason why the Cubs didn't give him an NRI to, I saw this on Twitter, man. People don't use their brains I and mean, maybe I'm just frustrated, but like <laughs> maybe if, if you haven't looked, the Cubs do this every year. They don't. Jordan Wicks didn't get an NRI to spring training last year. Do you know why? Because they want him available in September and October because he's going to have an innings cap. So they start these guys a little bit later, and they're going to. Kate Horton is probably going to get a handful of starts at the big level at the end of the year. I'm not saying draft him because it's not going to be like impactful. 
and then like that. But like Cade Horton's going to be up with the Cubs this year. Uh, he's probably he's in the conversation as the best pitching prospect in the minor leagues. I have him third, uh, second healthy one. I still think Andrew Painter is the man, so I have him highest, but he's hurt. Um, but like he's with Job and Skeens, like in that tier, of guys yeah. for me, and I, I think he's that good. Um, from an offensive side, I want to try to give you a name, but I'm struggling to find the one I had picked out. I think not to be pro Cub, but I think Matt Shaw will be up relatively quick. Um, Colson Montgomery needs to get more attention than he's getting for some reason. I don't understand that. Um, and the last name from an offensive standpoint I will throw at you is I think Drew Gilbert for the Mets could have a chance to break in. He's kind of the fourth or fifth outfielder right now on their depth chart if they're trying to win, stay competitive. So I think he's a guy that could get some run there. A little bit of everything, no standout tool there, but I think he's a guy that I, I, I expect to contribute late. Yeah, well said. Uh, you lots of lots of things to, to touch on there. You know, we talked in our uh, dynasty team chat at Prospects Live this week about Drew Thorpe, and I had to shout you out there for uh, having my back on Drew Thorpe, especially after I, I learned miserably this week that you hate forty percent of my favorite prospects. <laughs> hate so, uh, hate's a strong word, my man. That's a strong word. You're right. Uh, you intensely dislike. Uh, second question I was going to ask: Why exactly do you not want to be pro Cubs, Matt? That feels so odd for you. Um, I don't know if you could. Uh, <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'm trying I'm to kidding. look down at my notes. Now, you know what, what, I mean. what in the world but, could that possibly be? All you yeah. Cardinals fans in this chat, this is bizarre. hey man. I'm telling you, I'm gonna go on a little rant it's for a second. Like, if, tell you. if they have another year like they had last year, I, I might not survive because the Phillies would survive. have you in a heartbeat, Matt. Uh, I'm not interested. I don't like, oh, okay, I don't like how they build their team like a softball team, but it works for them. But I like um, it, it's fun. Yeah, I do wish that. Cardinals would spend some money on free agents like the Phillies do, but that's a different issue for another day. Different issue, another day. <laughs> Chad, did you come up with your uh, your other hitter? Yes, um, I want to touch on the Drew Gilbert comment just because I'm the resident Mets fan, which makes me hate Phillies fans. By the way, it's all no good. Pressure. All good. Um, I don't see it happening this year. Um, not just because they're not going to compete, because they're not going to, especially losing. Oh, I think they're. I think they'll be in the wild card uh, race all year. To be honest, I like that roster. I the the indeterminate amount of time losing Senga really impacted that. Yeah. Um, but I think they're going to go to Acuna before they go to Gilbert. Yeah, Acuna's on the infield, though. He hasn't really started playing the outfield in the minors yet, so I wouldn't expect them to throw him out there to learn it in the majors. If he starts playing no, in the I minors... I that's where he'll be once... If he starts playing season. in the minors, if he starts playing the outfield, then you should put your antennas up for a call-up. But I don't think they'll just throw him up there to play center Oh, field. yeah, no, they won't throw him out there anymore. Um, but yeah, so the reason I didn't have a name is hilariously embarrassing. I found my notes and realized I never got to the fourth player. <laughs> That's all right. So we're just going to go with the obvious one, go Jackson Job, who's not only going to be up, but he's a legitimate Cy Young contender. Awesome. Yeah, Job is another dude kind of in that mix with Horton, Skeens, uh, those lot who are arguably the best pitching prospects right now. Uh Incredible. And so kind of you Job after what happened with him with this. Right. I I had almost ran him completely off with that injury. It is nice to see him kind of bounce back, isn't it? It's 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 a it's a refreshing, and you love to see the kid win because that's a kid. You know, we talked earlier about dudes that could just spin the breaking ball. That's Jackson Job. He is a, a spin Goliath, a spin monster, spinzilla, if you will. Uh, Timothy, let's go to you, buddy. Uh, what prospects are going to make the biggest impact in twenty twenty three? Yeah, I'm going to kind of circle back around on some of the guys that Matt talked about, especially with the Padres. Sure. Because a part of the, the a part of having success for a prospect is that that prospect needs opportunity. Like Junior Caminero can be as awesome as he is, but if the Rays aren't going to play him, then it doesn't really matter for this year anyway. Mm -hmm. So uh, the Padres have so much opportunity, it's ridiculous. I really like Jacob Marcy from an outfield offensive standpoint. I've been getting him pretty much in every draft I've been doing really deep especially like a DC, there's a good chance that he could break camp as the opening day center fielder. And I've been calling him like my Matt McClain of this year because I was like really big on Matt McClain last year around this time. Uh, so he's kind of like my Matt McClain of this year. Drew Thorpe, another guy that you guys have already talked about, really big on Drew Thorpe. He's going to have excellent opportunity this year. That back end of the Padres rotation is just an absolute mess. And Michael King, if you're specking out for him to pitch 150, 160 innings, you're insane. Uh, <laughs> Red starting pitcher, Chase Petty. 
I've had Chase Petty in my top 50 starting pitchers since before he threw 99 this off season. <laughs> so, and now everyone's all on board. But, you're, uh, you're, among, you're amongst friends in the Chase I like, Petty Club. Matt I like I. Petty a lot, but, man, they had such tight restrictions on him. I don't see him getting opened up enough chance to compete this year. Yeah, I, I yeah, mean, he, they, they did. It, it's almost like Tink Hentz. I actually, in my when I did my prospect rankings on Fantasy Pros, I said I, that's what I comped him to, like the amount of playing time he was getting. It's like a Tink Hentz type deal going on. But he has great control. He has a lot of great pitches, even without the fastball throwing 99. Now he's back up to 99, so he's going to be awesome. Um, and – one guy I don't like is Connor Phillips. So I think Petty's going to pass Phillips on this depth chart because Phillips has terrible control. So uh, Phillips, great bullpen candidate in my mind. Uh, on the AL, Colson Montgomery already mentioned. I've seen Paul DeYoung play enough that I know that he's not going <laughs> to be the starting shortstop all season for the Chicago White Sox. Uh, twins, David Festa. For some reason, the Twins don't like Louis Varland, who I kind of actually do like, and they're putting him in the pen. So that's going to op open up an opportunity for David Festa to get a good amount of playing time this year. I don't think Chris Paddock is going to pitch 160 innings or 180 innings or whatever. So they're going to have spots open for a guy like De David Festa. And then I wanted to get into a negative real quick. I'm actually down on a guy that everyone is drafting insanely high right now, Jackson Chorio. He's got the contract. He's going to have the playing time. Yeah, yeah. But the dude is going to be 20 years old this year. And that transition, like – I, I don't know why people are drafting him so high when I think best case scenario or maybe most likely scenario is that he kind of does what Anthony Volpe did last year. And Volpe was disappointing to many last year on what was expected. Like you're going to get a bad batting average, I think, or not as good as you would hope because he's 20 years old and the play skills aren't going to be there and he's going to develop. Like I like him a, a lot long-term, but for next year, I'll wait on a 20 year old. It's fair. It's it's kind of safe to I love that you did your air quotes on Volpe being disappointing whenever he's so young and still provided a 2020 season. That's actually a pretty realistic um you know 50th percent outcome, I'd say, for Churio this year. It's not a bad comp at all, Tim. I like that a lot. Joseph, bring us home, buddy. Uh, who's gonna be the biggest impact prospect this year and why is his name Kyle Harrison? <laughs> um well, I've been on Kyle Harrison since 2020, so he is obvious. No, I'm, I'm, I'm no, I, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> um, but that that going circling way back around to Matt's point, um, if you were in a draft dynasty draft with me uh, from 2020 to 21 to 22, you knew that you had to draft Kyle Harrison if you were interested because I was taking him. Um, but uh, focusing on this question, I mean, I think we know the the obvious names, right? That people are. Talking about uh, Jackson Holiday, uh, Jackson Churio, Junior Caminero, and, and to me, those are all kind of a lot longer shots that I'm not taking those risks. For me, the obvious one is Wyatt Langford. Um, just, I, he's a beast. And, and I don't think I need to kind of dive into those details, but I think he's going to have the biggest impact of a player who is yet to debut. Um, and then, and then, you know, I had my whole Colson Montgomery spiel as well. Uh, but, you know, it's hard to uh, have any new thoughts when you got all these great prospect minds. You know, I'll, I'll stick on brand here with, with the Matt Thompson. If you're, you're watching on, on the uh, live stream, I've got a Drew Gilbert first Bowman Sapphire card here sitting in front of me. There you go. Uh, I love me some Drew Gilbert. I think, you know, like Matt said, he, he provides kind of, just uh, steady contributions across the board. And, and that's just really nice to have. Um, and and uh, I didn't really, you know, to, to Tim's point, there's there's always a couple pitchers, right? L last year in 50 round draft and holds, I was drafting Bryce Miller and Andrew Abbott, right? And, and um, not expecting them to, to debut in April or break camp with the team. But I think there's a couple of those guys and Tim brought one up, which is David Festa, right? Uh, I really think he's um, going to we're going to see him come up in May um, as the back end of that rotation just doesn't perform. And similarly with the Orioles. Right. I just don't think Cole Irvin in, is, you know, long for that rotation. We don't know what's going on with Bradish. So I'm going to take multiple shots there um, and, you know, maybe get lucky with one or both um, with Cade Povich and Chase McDermott. Right. Uh, I just think that um, those are the next men up. In, in the oral system. And I think they can both be, you know, SP3, SP4 types, uh, provide different things. But uh, I think those are kind of that Andrew Abbott, Bryce Miller type of impact that you should be looking for um, 
when you're looking at re even redraft like 50 round draft and holds or, or dynasty leagues. Absolutely. There's so much crossover that I think people ignore between like your your 50s or your draft and holds with dynasty because if you have a concept of that player pool going deep and knowing uh, the team the team's strengths and weaknesses at the major league level, you can definitely pluck some value there. Uh, okay, so guys, we are actually running a little bit short on time, so I'm going to have us do a uh, a quick quick exercise, quick. So I'm taking I'm talking. Give me a name. Give me one sentence. Wrap it up. What is the most overrated prospect in fantasy? Who is the most underrated prospect in fantasy? Timothy, most overrated and why in one sentence, most underrated and why in one sentence? Kobe Mayo. I just don't like his hit. The, the, I don't like what my, when I put it in my model, it just doesn't spit back at me as a good hit tool. Uh, underrated, probably Mason Wynn because he came up and was bad. And then now everyone is just writing him off. I agree. I can get with that. Joseph, go. Yeah, you know, I I, I think um, standing room only, uh, Nolan Shanwell. Uh, he's got a great hit tool, but o over time, he's just going to be, um, you know, part of the the mid mid tier first baseman kind of rankings. And, and, and I just I want more power out of my first base guy. And, did and you I call him standing room only? I did. Um, <laughs> And and uh, un underrated, um, I, I I wanted to go outside of the top hundred on most lists, so so I'm going with um, kind of a lesser known name. He's he's further down, but uh, I, I love uh, Nacho Alvarez, Ignacio Alvarez of the Braves. I'm in love with this hit tool, uh, and he's got great plate skills, and uh, he's got a frame that we should expect uh, more power in the future. So. Definitely. Uh, Chad, hit me with your most underrated, most overrated prospect in one sentence for each. We're going to stay in the family with this one. Jackson Churio is my most overrated. I don't think the contact rate ever gets to where it needs to be for him to be any more than a Schwarber type. And underrated is his, bro his brother, Jason Churio, who I think is really going to be the next Acuna light player. Uh, just outperform Jackson at every stage of their comparative careers. And we'll see if that continues this year as he faces advanced pitching. Awesome. Uh, Maddie, bring us home, buddy. Most overrated in one sentence, most underrated in one sentence. Uh, Ethan Salas is the most overrated for fantasy by a million miles. Uh, catcher, uh, 17 in double A, cool, but he didn't hit, so I don't care. Um, and then most underrated is Blake Dunn because the numbers are fantastic for the Reds. Uh, he's older. Can explain why he's been older. He's served in the military. He's been battled injuries. So timeline's a little bit different than most guys. Sure. Uh, the numbers are eye-popping, and I think he could take a spot in that Reds outfield if injuries hit. Awesome. I wish I had heard you say that Ethan Salas is an overrated prospect. I traded for him yesterday in a dynasty league. <laughs> I oh. like here's my thing. Like I overrated might be harsh, but he's getting way too much buzz. I'm not interested in a catcher number one that's 17 because he's not going to be in the big leagues for a while. Yeah. And if he is, like if he is, it's outstanding and it's incredible. But like let's not act like what he's doing is historic. It's historic because the Padres are pushing him. He's not. Does that make sense? Like, it's yeah. not yeah, the call-ups he got later were not because he destroyed I, I the level. They were because the Padres like... are are yeah. moving him along the line, which is, again, part of the desperation. I think he's and the – And the Padres have historically ruined catching. I think they're the trying years. to trade him. with old the guys for far too long. I, I think they're trying to – I think they're dangling him as their big trade chip uh, this deadline to somebody that, oh, look, this is a 17-year-old kid in double I hope so because I don't want to repeat it. Of Francisco yeah. Mejia in San Diego because they, they don't have that. yeah they don't have a lot of money to spend from what it sounds like so the best next best thing is prospect capital and Jackson Merrill is going to be on their big league team Salas is going to be their big chip to go get that one piece to yeah, but don't worry they're going to be trading Salas for Dylan Seas to add all right pitches. guys let's uh, unfortunately I got to wrap this one up because we got another crew coming in I want to thank all of you guys for coming on make sure you guys are following all these guys on the social media. Make sure you're following all their work. I'm going to unceremoniously boot you guys all out because i got to get on to the next panel. But I appreciate everything you guys did today. Uh, Matt sticks around for just a second as I scroll down. We are raising money for Fantasy Cares. Every dollar you donate 
uh, to uh, www.donorbox.org backslash TGFBI. We'll get donated Fantasy Cares. It also gets you entered in to win amazing prizes, including signed jerseys, bobbleheads, uh, TGFBI entries for next season, uh, and much, much more subscriptions, great things, Fantasy Black Book. Yeah, like definitely make sure you are donating uh, and continue to donate all throughout the weekend. We're going all day today. We've got, I think, five more hours or something like that today, and then 10 hours tomorrow. Appreciate everybody who has been a part of it, whether you are watching, whether you are donating, whether you are being on the panels. And we're going to bring in another fantastic panel uh, to take over and talk about some busts, starting with Eric. How you doing, my friend? How's it going, Justin? Glad I could uh, make it. I was a little bit worried that I would be five minutes late and you'd have to host this one yourself, but uh, we're here. Is it just me and you? What's going on? No, no. I just wanted to bring you in first. You're our host. Let everybody know where you can reach on social media and plug all that you do. Yeah, you can find me at Eric Halterman, or that's Eric underscore Halterman on Twitter. Eric with a K. Uh, you can follow someone else, I guess, if you go to Eric with a C underscore Halterman. Never met him. Uh, you can also go to rotowire.com and find all my work. And you can also listen to me on Sirius XM. I'm one of Rotowire's hosts on Rotowire Fantasy Sports Today and on MLB Network Radio. And you just got off the air, right? You were just doing something. Yes. Yes, yeah. I was just over hosting the Rotowire show on the Fantasy Sports Channel. All right. Uh, also joining us is Jordan Eisen. How you doing, my friend? Hello, I'm doing good. Nice to see you, Justin. Jordan is uh, still holds the record. Uh, he's no longer the youngest uh, participant in TGFBI, but he holds the record for being the youngest ever when I think you were what, 16 years old. Yeah, maybe about that. It was a few years ago. So, uh, Let everybody know where you can reach on social media and plug all that you do. Yeah, so I'm at FOV underscore sports on Instagram and Twitter. I'll be very straightforward, though. Not too active with Field of Vision these days, but if you want to tune in to Northwestern Sports Radio, I'm on WNUR a bunch. Uh, you can just look up WNUR Sports in your browser. It'll come up, and you'll either be listening to me or my friends on the Sports Block on Sunday nights. There you go. And joining us as well is Bob Osgood. How you doing, my friend? Doing well, Justin. Thanks for having me on. This is always, you know, I feel like the start of the real fantasy baseball season when TGFBI kicks off. So I always love this weekend and this week and uh, looking forward to talking with everybody. All right. Uh, you guys may have another person joining or not, but I will turn it over to Eric and uh, uh, let him lead the show. All right. Thank you very much, Justin, not only for that introduction, but for this whole event. Really love to see that we have people in the fantasy community who can turn this silly little hobby into something actually useful for the world. I think that's pretty cool. We are blessed to have uh, Justin as part of the group. Uh, Jordan and Bob, you two already introduced yourself, so there goes my first question. But I do want to ask a quick question before we get into our specific sets of players. Since this is a panel on busts, I want to know what your guys' general approach is to the notion of a bust, because there's some people who would say probably the first few rounds of the draft, it's all bust avoidance. As long as I can make sure I get out of the first round, maybe first three, first five with no busts, that's all I'm trying to do. Later on, I, I can take some risky guys with some busts. We find taking potential busts early. They just want to know that the bust risk is factored in. Uh, so which of those would you say describes you more? We'll start with you, Bob. Are you uh, really got to avoid those busts for quite a while or just, you know, factor it into the reasoning? Yeah, I mean, I really think looking at the whole first 10 rounds, I'm trying to, you know, build somewhat of a safe base. And then in the second half of the draft, I'm a lot more willing to take chances. Um, you know, I've gone back and looked at some of these 30 round 15 team leagues and seeing what percentage of players that I've dropped in fab leagues, you know, most of the players from round 20 on you're going to end up dropping a good amount, even from that 15 to 20 round range. So I really want to avoid um, major risk, especially in those first eight to 10 rounds. Um, and then in the second half of the draft, I'm a lot more willing to take shots. I, think of uh we did the the nerf draft last week part of the earth leagues and 
you know, Walker Bueller fell to me in the 15th round and I felt okay with that risk there. And then Kyle uh, Bradish was there in around 19. And those are the types of players where, you know, I'm not looking to target them, but in the second half of the draft, when there's a decent chance that I might drop a player from those rounds on, that's m- more where I'm trying to take risks. So I think that makes a lot of sense. We're talking definitely first several rounds, pretty heavily avoiding busts, and that's probably where we're going to focus our potential busts today. Uh, Jordan, would you agree with that? Are you also pretty heavily avoiding busts early, or are you open to a bust anywhere? I mean, you want to avoid busts no matter where you're drafting them. A bust is bad, inherently. Good point. Um, Good point. And so I don't think it truly matters where a bust is taken. I think you just want to avoid, at least for my list, I want to avoid everyone I'm going to mention today. Um, but I do think that getting hitting a bust earlier is worse for your team than hitting a bust later because the replacement value earlier is obviously higher than it is later. So if we're just thinking about value-based drafting, I know Ariel Cohen talks about a bunch. Um, obviously, earlier, I want to be less risky um try to hit on guys that i feel more confident in think freddie freeman um people like that over more um polarizing or um like wishy-washy guys um and later on as you said walker bueller if he was going ground two even if he like had more attraction just with his situation or someone like that i'd be trying to avoid them no matter what um, earlier on. But in round 15, he has a risky situation. I'm still willing to take Walker Bueller at that point. All right. Well, let's zoom in to the very early on. Let, let's look at just the first round. And I think it's a, a bust heavy first round, maybe this year. Maybe it's like this every year. But there's quite a number of players where if you told me I don't know about that guy. There's some injury risk there or something similar. There's a lot of them this year where I think it's pretty reasonable to be out on. Uh, I'll start with my player to get us going. Uh, Mine is Shohei Otani, and I love Shohei Otani. He's everyone's favorite player, not on their favorite team. Uh, And I will love drafting Shohei Otani next year. But we've seen him try to do basically exactly what he's trying to do this year, namely hit wall recovering from serious elbow surgery and that was the year that he wasn't as good those his two years where he was seriously in pitching arm rehab he didn't hit as well and I'm I'm pretty darn worried that that's going to happen again this year also looking at like our experience with Bryce Harper last year where hey he was a hero he came back so early and it was amazing but guess what in those first six weeks two months when he was back so early he wasn't really Bryce Harper, and he didn't become himself till later. I'm pretty worried we're going to get something like that with Otani. And for a first-round pick, even in the late first round, uh, that scares me. Uh, but who's scaring you, Bob? What kind of first-rounder are you avoiding? Yeah, and uh, so I'll start. You know, it's really kind of – it's not that easy to fade first-rounders. You know, I'd have this player as an early second-round pick um, – but Trey Turner is mine. And, you know, since the 1st of January, I've kind of been looking at January 1st on ADP for everything I'm going off of today. He's going around pick 12 to 13. Um, He's at a max of pick 20 in NFBC drafts. And I'm fine with that closer to the max pick, but, you know, we have to nitpick here from a group of 15 players. Um, And I think first of all, you know, he's a speed guy that is on the other side of 30 Now, granted, he was 30 for 30 um, stealing bases, which is incredible that he didn't get caught once all of last year. Um, But, you know, I think we'll start to see a little bit of a speed decline um, in the next year or two. I think, secondly, we've seen the worst version of Trey Turner, and it's not pretty. It was uh, the first half of last year. Um, And, you know, he was pressing and he was in a new city, but it happened. It wasn't just a slump. It was pretty much a half-season-long disaster, and... So I think you have to be a little bit wary of that. Um, I think the biggest thing for me is that his contact percentage has gone in the wrong direction each year. If you use the fan graphs contact percentage, you know, he's gone from 81 to 79 to 74 and then 72% last year. And as a result of that, he struck out almost 22% of the time, which was easily a career high for him. 
So when Trey Turner was at his peak, when he was going a lot of years as the first overall pick, he contributed everywhere. He was winning batting titles. He had a 335 average in 2020. He hit 328 in 2021. I don't think we're getting back to that. Even when he was really hot last year in the second half, he hit 286. So, you know, I just, I don't know that he has that ceiling anymore. It's a safe speed pick and it'll contribute in all categories. And I think if all of the speed players were gone and you were worried about stolen bases, it's not unreasonable to take him at the 15, 16 turn. Um, but for me, I think, you know, when you're, we're nitpicking and he kind of has just the most minor flaws that I'm staying away from in the back half of the first round. Yeah, it's not what I want to hear as a Phillies fan, but I understand the logic. <laughs> Certainly some some of that upside may not be there with Turner. And when you are a speed first guy heading into your 30s, some downside certainly starts to creep in as well. Uh, sure. Do you want to make people sad, Jordan? Do you have any any first round hitters that you're going to make us all cry with how much you hate them? Uh, not exactly. I'm actually going for a pitcher. Um, I think that he's the only one on Fantasy Pros he's going on a average of 11th overall Spencer Strider. I don't know. I think that if you do take a pitcher in round one, you have to be certain that he'll rack up a bunch of strikeouts. Obviously Strider will do that, but you also have to be certain he'll contribute in whip and ERA. Strider will contribute in whip for sure. Could contribute in ERA, but it's so plain and simple. Last year he was a three, eight, six at ERA. If he does that again, I'd pick 11. It's not worth it. Obviously he's so abundantly talented will rack up a bunch of wins an absurd amount of k's especially in this era but i don't know the era bugs me i think we can predict lower than a 386 era but it was also the first year he's pitched that many innings so maybe just as time goes on it's um the classic efficiency versus volume argument i think that with volume maybe he becomes less efficient in terms of allowing runs and i don't want a pitcher like that in the first round when there are so many great hitters to pick from yeah i can see the logic especially because you're locking yourself into zero in every single hitting category from mm -hmm. your first round pick where everyone else in your league is going to have quite a lot of hitting stats from the first round so you better be quite sure that strider is going to be well above the rest of the pitcher pool if you're going to do that and like you said, there are reasons to be maybe not quite as sure. Let's go to a top pitcher uh, that you think will bust. I think theoretically on the outline, that last question was first round hitters, but I, I like going with the first round pitcher as well. So feel free to throw in another pitcher if you have one, Jordan. But we'll go to you first, Bob. Uh, who is one of the earliest pitchers that you are not taking because you're afraid of their bust risk? Yeah, I'm uh, pretty easily going to go with Blake Snell here uh, because I've been faked out by these great seasons before with Blake Snell, and I've been burned by this guy a couple of times in the past, and he's going to pick 67 to, uh, towards the early half of round five um, in drafts since January 1st. I'll take Blake Snell a year from now when he's back at pick you know, 125 or something like that, um, and I'm sure it seems like Snell is going at almost a discount or a fair price being all the way down in round five after winning his the Cy Young, his second Cy Young. But, you know, he was unquestionably awesome for the final four months of the season. But there's a lot of things that don't work in Snell's favor. I mean, first of all, it was a contract year. So a lot of times you have to factor that in. Uh, this was a, a free agent season where he's going to be signing really late. He's still unsigned five weeks away from opening day. Um, so he's not in camp. He's going to be most likely in a new environment. The pressure will be on the face hitters and be ready for, you know, late March when opening day is this year. And we already know that he doesn't fare well in April and May. He's had a lot of slow starts in the past. Um, last year, he reached 180 innings for the second time in his career, but it was also just the second time in his career that he reached 130 innings, which is crazy to me. Um, just because of how someone that has won two Cy Youngs and pitched as long as he as he has, he's just got, reached 130 innings twice in eight major league seasons. So, you know, in terms of statistics themselves, I have some concerns there as well. He walked five batters per nine last year, and it's incredible that he could be that elite at pitching around the walks. His 
uh, left on base percentage was 87%, which is almost unheard of. So he really pitched his way in and out of jams. and was an escape artist for the whole season. Um, but I just think he's walking a bit of a tightrope there. You know, anyone that in the whole league out of 130 innings or more, that's 87 pitchers. He had the highest walk rate out of everybody. He just happened to have a 32% strikeout rate last year. Um, you know, only Spencer Strider had a better strikeout rate than he did. So it's just, I, I know what the downside is of Snell and I've kind of seen some bad starts and some bad seasons where he's fooled me in the past. And there's just so much uncertainty with his situation that, um, you know, stick, uh, stay away from him. I guess if you're in a trade league, maybe around Memorial day, that's when Snell really starts to heat up. He's got a career ERA after the all, uh, all-star break of 2.52. So, you know, if you're in a trade league, it's good to, to target him after Memorial Day, but I'm staying away in, in redrafts. That's an interesting point, especially, too, as he remains unsigned, right, deeper into camp. I think the odds of him having a difficult April go up, but maybe the odds of him having a difficult July don't change. So if you are in a trade league, maybe the later Blake Snell is, the more you want to keep him in mind as somebody to trade for but not to go get yeah. right now. I think I think that's an interesting thought. Or, you know, maybe to just avoid completely, because as you said, quite a lot of bus risk there. Uh, Jordan, do you have a, another top-tier pitcher that you're avoiding? Yes, sir. Really quickly on Snell, though, even if he does end this year with a stat line that reflects his ADP and, like, it looks worth it, I can almost guarantee you, especially starting this late into camp, it's not going to be worth it with the ride you take. Like it's going to be such a pain. I guarantee you're going to want to sit him at some point. We, it might be the start. It probably will be the start, but we don't even know that it could be later. He just like goes in waves and I don't want that for my SP two or three. Definitely not my SP one. If he skyrockets, once he does sign somewhere, Um, (laughs) I want to talk about George Kirby real quick. I don't feel super passionately about this. Honestly, if you wanted to take George Kirby, I can't blame you. He seems so skilled. Um, It's more just that he doesn't really help you in any category besides whip. That said, whip is huge for Kirby. Um, But he'll like be very decent in strikeouts, good in ERA, rack up a bunch of innings, which also helps with the denominator of the whip equation. But it, I don't know, at ADP 40, that seems very rich. You can take Zach Gallen just after. I'm not even that high on Zach Gallen, but he's just so much more proven. We know what we're going to get from Gallen, and it's more well-rounded. You can also hit Tyler Glass now if you feel good about your pitching staff at that point. Tarek Skubal, I'm going to get everywhere. I would take him 100 times out of 100 over Kirby. I think they're very comparable, but I think Skubal has big, big potential, almost Cy Young potential, potentially. Um, There just are a lot of pitchers in this range that I don't even know if I love, but it's more that there are more exciting guys than Kirby, and um, he just seems overvalued. I, When you asked about what we define a bust as earlier, I wanted to mention that I think it's just like an overvalued player. Like I'm not saying George Kirby is going to have a four or five ERA, a one, three whip, like in just bottom out. Maybe he'll flirt with the minors. Like I'm not saying that he'll be good. He's not going to like full out bust, but I think next year he'll go around pick 60, which 40 to 60, that's a big difference. And I think that he could just like not return his full investment that you're making yeah we could uh derail the episode at this point and get into a big long semantic discussion i think i might enjoy that uh because i had thought about putting george kirby as my potential bus because i am low on him i think for me i'm low on him in a way that didn't fit my definition of bust which to me is someone who may still return value like maybe even their average projected value is fine but the worst 25% of their possible outcomes is mm-hmm. real bad. And Kirby is sort of the opposite of that, where I'm not sure that the average of the expected outcomes quite adds up to his draft price, but I think it's not going to go so bad. But I, I really like that you mentioned him and threw him on there as a, an option because 
as somebody who is command first, like Kirby, it's hard to see him squeezing much more out of it, maybe if that makes sense. So it's hard to see him exceeding his draft price, which is one way to sort of count as a bust. Although again, it's a semantic thing there. I don't know, Bob. Yeah. Do you want to do you want to play referee here and and decide who wins our semantic argument? Uh, I I just drafted George Kirby in round three yesterday, so I guess we that's my win. answer. Um, <laughs> I'm okay. It depends on who you're pairing him with, and and I had taken Pablo Lopez um, at the start. We were on the two three turn, and I took Lopez and Kirby together, and I think that they pair well. Kirby has fewer strikeouts, but Lopez kind of balances that out. And I just really, I'm trying to protect my batting average and my whip more than anything early in drafts. And Kirby does that. Um, so I, I, I understand, you know, it, it's tough. It depends on who you're pairing him with because he does have a slightly lower strikeout rate, but I really like that whip protection. My starting pitcher that I did throw on here as a bust and I'm not sure if it's it's my own description of bust, is Garrett Cole. I think that he's still being drafted as if he's Garrett Cole of one or two years ago. And with that strikeout rate dipping by about five percentage points last year, and with that age increasing by uh, one year last year, actually the same rate that it typically increases, but he's now up to age 33. His velocity down a tick. These are just some characteristics that have me wondering if, this isn't necessarily late first round Cole, and maybe he's more late second or third round Cole. Although maybe this is more of a Jordan style bust where it's a uh, misvalued uh, rather than a serious downside risk. Although when a guy has his velocity and strikeouts and age all trend in the wrong direction, sometimes it goes downhill fast. Let's move from pitching to a look at each offensive position Let, let's go around the diamond sharing the player that we're avoiding because we're pretty afraid of him busting uh who is the bustiest catcher in your eyes jordan um i'm going jonah heim this fits your definition of a bust too i think he might just be garbage honestly like he i think he's all right if you're playing in a two catcher league, you'll probably have him through the whole season. But if you're playing in a one catcher league, I think he could end up in wait on waiver wires pretty quick. He just doesn't stand out as a talent. He overperformed so much last year. And I guess if we were truly believing that, he should be the catcher five off the board. Instead, he's the catcher 12. So there is a discount in terms of that. But I don't know. He led catchers by so far and away in RBI, which is definitely a possibility in that Rangers lineup. But if you take Will Smith, for example, who gets a lot of playing time, similar at bats to um, Heim, the RB I'm still out RBI'd Will Smith by 20. That's just ridiculous. And you can't bet on that. Nobody's betting on that, picking Heim at catcher 12. But without that many RBIs, let's call it, let's say he gets 70, which might even be generous RBI this season. You're, even if he overperforms as much as he did last season in his other statistics, that's 130 runs plus RBI. He had 18 homers. I expect, expect about that. And then the average, the batting average is just, I don't know. He hit 258. I think of him more as a 240 guy. That's not a helpful player. I guess he still plays catcher, but there's some exciting catchers this season. I'd rather have Logan Ohapi. I'd rather have Bo Naylor, Mitch Garver. That's, I don't know. He's he's definitely a bottom tier catcher in terms of ADP, which makes, like, going into this draft season, I thought he was going to be huge bust. The market's smart. 186 overall is not bad, but I don't know. I think for a very middling catcher, I'd rather just take someone with more upside. All right, so Jordan is fading Jonah Heim coming off his career year and his healthiest year. Uh, what direction are you taking this one in, Bob? Who's your catcher fade? Yeah, I, I think just to follow up on what Jordan said, it's so important to know the format that you're in, whether it's a one catcher True. or a two catcher. Is it 12 teams? Is it 15? Um, in a 15-team league, I'm kind of looking in that same range as Jonah Heim, and there's, there's a cliff after you get past, like, pick 200 where you've got – a lot of catchers that might end up on waiver wire. So you really want to identify, you know, do you want to have two catchers by this point? Cause there's really only 
18 of them probably that you can feel good about. Um, Himes in that group. And, and my pick was Gabriel Moreno, who's also kind of in that group as you get kind of the top of your catcher two list. Um, I think Moreno is going to be a very good, maybe great catcher long-term he's 24 and I'm just not sure if we're there yet. And I think that some of his draft position has to do with just how electric he was in the postseason. He had clutch hits. He was hitting for power and he's really not a power hitting catcher. You know, he had four home runs in the playoffs and he hasn't reached 10 home runs at any level since he was in uh, low A in 2019. Um, you know, so I'm just not sure that he'll provide that much more, maybe eight to 10 home runs. And he's definitely going to hit for average and he's going to play a lot, but I just can't make a, you know, uh, pick 150 end of round 10 selection on Moreno. There's some of the other names that Jordan mentioned, you know, Naylor and Ohapi, Francisco Alvarez, who I do like, he's got lower average, but I think he's going to hit a ton of home runs. Um, so, I mean, for me, if I miss out on this range, I'd be okay with taking Alejandro Kirk, who I think is a very similar player to Moreno. He's going at pick 270 on average over the last month, where Moreno is at 150. There's a slight difference in counting stats because Kirk's not going to get as many at-bats as Moreno probably will. Um, but he's going to have the average, and I think you can make up those counting stats elsewhere, with especially with that 120-pick difference. So. Um, that's who I'm going to fade. Yeah, I like the Alejandro Kirk shout out. My bust <laughs> behind the plate is Yiner Diaz. Uh, he's going fairly early. He's going as the fifth catcher off the board in NFBC draft, just outside pick 100 in February. And I think this is a bust for me in, in the narrow definition of the word in that I think it's there's every chance he, he does live up to that draft day value, but the downside risk is pretty extreme with Diaz. Uh, there are things to like about his profile. He had a barrel rate over 12% last year, strikeout rate just under 20%. That's a very promising bat. Problem is it came with a walk rate less than 3%. This is a outlier in how weird and aggressive this approach is. Also, Diaz, not a defense first catcher. His defense actually maybe graded out okay last year, but the scouting reports were not very positive. So I see a lot of ways for him hitting his way out of a regular role. If he just has a bad first month or two where the strikeout rate ticks up a bit and the walk rate stays that low, we could be talking about a guy who's on base 250 come mid-May and, and the Astros may not want to be giving him many more at-bats. So I think there's a real risk among the top catchers. I think there's a lot of good ones who I trust who have been good for several years I think there's every chance Sander Diaz finishes as the fifth best catcher, but I think if he is off, he may not even be a top 30 catcher, and I don't think that's true of a lot of other guys in this range. Uh, let's move from behind the plate out to first base. Uh, we've been making people sad by hating on their favorite players. Jordan, do you want to make an entire country sad? Is that what you're doing? No, I actually changed, or I guess so, yeah. Um I, I changed I last changed second. to a blue jay in here. So yeah, yeah. I I had Yandy Diaz earlier, but in the conversation of what a bust is, Yandy Diaz doesn't fit that at all, even less than George Kirby, I think. Yandy Diaz will be bare minimum replacement level and could even replicate last season, I guess. Um, so I switched to Vlad. Um <laughs> I don't know. I, Vlad just has never done it for me. We always talk about the launch angle. We always talk about his potential. But at this point, he's had, what, five almost full seasons? And it's happened once for him? Like, I, I guess 2022 was also solid. Um, but even still, first base, not too much return in steals, probably. Um, and then... His, bat his batting average is good, but maybe not even helpful. Like when Vlad was a prospect and we were like, this is everyone do everything you can to get him in dynasty leagues, um, stuff like that. We thought he was going to be a 300 plus bat, 40 ish homers, huge in runs and RBI. And that's just not the case. He will be fine in average. He won't tank you there. But I think no matter it, it, I would not predict him to help you in batting average. Even in homers, I think he'll be good, 
I don't know if he's going to be great. And you want your first baseman, especially if you're taking them in the third, second or third round, you want them to be great at homers and batting average. And I think he might be great in neither. Um, he'll definitely contribute a lot of runs, even more RBI, which is helpful um, in the top of this Blue Jays lineup. But taking a first baseman with no speed this early, I want him to excel in the other four categories. And I don't know if Vlad does. He obviously has upside, but I think if he lands, even if with his 2022 season, like 90 runs, 30 homers, almost 100 RBI, and a 275 average. I don't know if I'd be happy with that, and I think that's what we should be expecting. And I think it could be even worse, too. Yeah, it's hard to be too down on a guy with his prospect pedigree who's still 24, but but I hear you. I think some it's priced in that people are expecting him to keep taking steps forward, and if he doesn't, you know, he's, he's actually sort of taken some steps back and I don't think those steps back are priced in. So I, I hear you on that one. Uh, Bob, where are you going with this? Who's your bust prediction at first base? Yeah, I'm I'm going to go uh, – well, I'm pretty much going to copy and paste a lot of my points from Blake Snell, and I'm going to say them about Cody Bellinger at first base. Um, I just can't use a fourth-round pick on Cody Bellinger. And I just, we talked about that layer of safety, especially with early bats Um, and everything I said about Snell, he's unsigned entering March here in a few days. He, uh, you know, last year he didn't have a career year, but he had a return to stardom in his contract year. And I'm just not usually going to buy off of that type of season when there were so many down years before that. The three seasons before that, he hit 239, 165, and 210. And I know that he was playing through an injury in that 165, so maybe you can throw that out, but it kind of sticks with you when you see a season like that. Um, You know, last year he was making contact at a good rate again. He was running. You know, his steals increased with the new rules. And he had the perfect park as a fly ball hitter, you know, with the wind blowing out at, at Wrigley. You know, if he ends up back in Chicago, I can see why you would make a pick there. I think it's a great spot for him. Um, but, you know, his he hit 307 and his expected batting average on StatCast was 268. So I feel like he that's more of your expectation that he should be in the 260s as a hitter. Uh, you know, he doesn't hit the ball hard on StatCast. He's in the bottom quarter of the league in barrels, bottom 10% in hard hit rate. I think he gets away with it um, when he's going right. You know, there's some players that that can, but there's just volatility here for me. I root for Cody Bellinger. I think it was a great story as the you know comeback player of the year last year, but I'm okay with him being on another team if he does repeat that season, um, just with a lot of the uncertainty. Yeah, Bellinger was probably the top contender for me, even though I, I have ended up with him in a couple places. And I think maybe to go back to our first question of the day, maybe I don't have a good enough approach to busts and need to learn to be more scared of them than I am. But I think as Bellinger stays unsigned, he should continue to drift down draft boards, I think, because if the Cubs liked what he did last year and thought that what he did was repeatable, even though some of the stat cast data was not so positive, if the Cubs said, you know what, I think this actually does work because we just saw it work for the past 162 games. Here's $150 million. If they did that, then I would be a little bit more willing to believe that Cody Bellinger is just fine, but they didn't. And I think we should pay attention to that. Uh, so that is my top bust as well. I should know at first base, there's not a lot of guys who fit the traditional definition of bust that I was talking about. The guys who, man, it could go really wrong. I think first basemen tend to be solid. They tend towards boringness, if anything, yeah. if they're to have a flaw. So Bellinger really does stand out. It was a moving tough group on. to find one from. I agree yes, with you. Yeah, yeah, yep. And that's that's why I'm moving on quickly and just copying <laughs> yours and not throwing another name out there that I don't really believe in. Uh, but let's move to second base, where it may be easier to find some more traditional busts. Uh, do you have a busty second baseman lined up for us, Jordan? Yeah. Why are we taking Nico Horner in round? What's it like five? sometimes even higher and you can take when you can take any second baseman 
in round what 10 in the like roughly replicated i i would obviously rather have nico horner but given the price i would take bryson stott i would take Catel Marte. i would take andres jimenez i uh i would go uh, even at the price tyra estrada i'm not a huge fan but there are just so many guys that will swipe bags hit for decent average obviously horner gives you good average but he also doesn't give you ribbies he is no power i i expect even i i don't know like no power and no rbi from your fifth or fourth round pick is unbearable and it's not like it's not like one of those guys that like helps you in average i was just talking about this with vlad too if he if horner hits 280 again which he's done for two seasons now that's not a big help like it's good but it's not huge like you want him to contribute in three categories which is runs stolen bases in average and i don't know if he'll help you in average he'll be good in runs he'll be good in steals but a lot of people that applies to a lot of people that you can get a huge discount on um i especially andres jimenez i, I don't get it like 30 points of batting average is not worth that much and i think jimenez will match or even exceed Horner in a lot of the other categories. Yeah, the three of us all had a barrel rate that trailed Nico Horner's by less than two <laughs> points. He finished the year at 1.7. <laughs> so there's just no possibility for him to add meaningful amount of power. Yeah. And so he needs to do everything he did last year with speed, and he needs to have at least that good of a batting average, maybe even better, because there, there's nothing else coming anywhere else. I, I hear you on that. Uh, which direction are you going with on this one, Bob? Yeah, and, and just to add to the Horner point, he had 688 plate appearances. I mean, th that was the the max number that he could possibly be out there, and he still didn't reach 10 homers or 70 RBIs. I think in a certain build that Horner might be okay if you really feel good about your power and you have an ace and you have a closer and and you know you just really need that speed guy in round five and you don't want to be stuck with – a story Ruiz or something a few rounds later. Like I get it, but I agree. I think it's a, it's a tough uh, price for him. I, I went with Matt McLean and he actually goes pretty much in the same spot that Horner does. And I think just to echo a lot of Jordan's points, I mean, the, the, the Jimenez and Stott range kettle Marte, that's a great place to get a second baseman this year. And with McLean, I've just got this weird vibe about his oblique injury that's been coming out. I mean, he missed the last month of the season last year with an oblique injury that was on the same side. It's been five months since that happened, and he has another oblique injury that they're downplaying. They're saying it's in a different spot, um, that he should be back in a week or so. But until I see McLean out there in spring training, if it's like the second half of March and he's been playing for a week or two and looks healthy, then I wouldn't rule him out. But this is a pure just injury risk thing for me. There's a lot of infielders in Cincinnati. You know, they brought Candelario in. They uh, have Jonathan Indy who was a rookie of the year just a couple of years ago. They've got Ellie, of course. There's Noel V. Marte. I mean, they have a lot of options. Um, so that's not to say that McLean would sit if he was fully healthy, but it's just th th there are a lot of bats in Cincinnati. There are a lot of options, and the guy that is, has the same injury that he finished last season with, if I'm at that round four, round five range, it just it doesn't feel right. And I like that range a few rounds later that Jordan was mentioning. Yeah, not not hard to be out on any red, even though they're all exciting and play in a great park. There's just so many why, of them. Pretty, pretty why they have to sign J Kendallari? I don't yeah. get it. Uh, like, yeah. why they? He's a great fit. for all. I'll draft those. him, but like, why? <laughs> I don't get yeah, it. yeah, I, yeah. I hear you on that one. We are about two thirds the way through our time and one half of the way through the outline. So I'll speed us up by combining my second baseman and shortstop into one player, uh, which is easy to do because that's Hassan Kim. Uh, he is eligible at both those spots and at third base. I uh, really like the player. I've been enjoying following him since I got into covering the KBO back in 2020. Love the guy. Really excited to see his success over here. But his price is just wrong. I think just from the 
value being wrong perspective, I, I think he should be going near Bryson Stott and Andres Jimenez. Uh, Kim's going pick 82 in NFBC drafts in February. Those two are going 106 and 113. Both of those guys are maybe more 10 steals than, tw- or more 10 homers than 20 and could get you 30 steals. None of them have any real power. And I think Kim, as we were talking with Nico Horner, I mean, he's got more barrels than Horner, but not a lot. He's been at 4.5%, 4.2%, and 4.2% his three major league seasons. I don't think there's any more power coming there. And he's never been a high batting average hitter. He's, he's topped out at 260. So really, he needs to steal a ton. Well, and his steals jumped all the way from 12 to 38 last year. If he's not stealing 38 again, I think we could be seeing a season where he's got 12 homers, 20 steals, and a 245 batting average. And that really is just not a top 100 pick. So I think guys that need to do exactly what they did last year just to live up to their value, and it's hard to see them getting past it, I think I think that is one way to be a bust. I think that could be Kim. Uh, let's hear your guys' shortstops. Uh, let's switch up the order. We'll go to Bob here. Bob, you got a shortstop that you're not taking? Yeah, uh, I'll start with Tommy Edmond. He's been going uh, pick 166 since uh, the new year. Uh, I feel like Tommy Edmond was a lot more interesting as a good kind of team build piece before the rule changes and that there are a lot of other players that do what Tommy Edmond does now. You know, there's 20 other guys I feel like that have his skill set. Um, it is the multi-position eligibility uh, that he's second and short and outfield. And I definitely see the appeal with that, especially if you're like in a draft and hold format and you can't pick up free agents. Like it's good to have those, those three eligibilities. Um, but you know, his, 284 batting average last year, maybe a little bit misleading, but 47 RBI, his career high in RBI is 57. Uh, He's hitting, projected to hit eight, which just really brings down his value, bring down his runs. So if you've got 47 RBI, you've got less of a chance of runs hitting down, you know, eighth in the lineup. Um, You know, he's giving you steals, he's giving you versatility, but I don't know that he has a whole lot else. Um, You know, the tier before that, that ends with, Danzy Swanson and and Thyro Estrada, Anthony Volpe. I'd rather take those guys, and if I miss out, I can get my speed elsewhere. Um, and then there's players later, like Willie Adamas and Jeremy Pena. Uh, Luis Renjifo is somebody that has a bunch of different positions for eligibility. You know, Even Carlos Correa is going crazy late this year, and Zach Neto. There are a lot of later shortstops that – you know, I'm more willing if I miss out on this range, I'm just going to kind of punt it out a little bit uh, and take one of those those later players because I'm just not sure with those runs and RBIs. And I don't like where Edmonds hitting in the lineup to use a top 10 to 11 round pick on him. All right. So we got a lot of speed first middle infielders that we're worried about here. I think most of the ones we've talked about fit that category. Are you going that route, Jordan, or you got somebody else you're fading that shortstop? I mean, I think I'm not going that route, but I think the market would. I'm going to have all of Canada after me because I don't think Bo Bichette's going to do too much this year. Like, he had five steals last year, and it should have gone up. If he had 40 steals last year, which I honestly think he could have with his skill set, he should be fine. I think he's as talented as he's always been. But something happened in the past two seasons that has led to him having less stolen bases than he used to, whereas it should be the opposite. Obviously, steals have exploded league-wide, and it's done the opposite for Bo Bichette. I am so disinterested in him. No, power's also gone down recently. I could see that bouncing back pretty easily. Um, he just had a down season. Fair enough. But even in a down season, why why are you only stealing five bases? He could bounce back if he just decides, I want to start stealing again. Maybe Vlad bounces back. Maybe Springer, whoever else in the lineup around him's better so he's more apt to stealing that's possible but even two years ago he only had 13 steals i don't know i i think that there's very slim chance that bobichette hits 2020 granted he'll give you average that's for sure he's a lock but in this range around michael harris gunner henderson luis castillo Jose Altuve, he does not belong whatsoever. There's so many potential 2020 guys you can get later in drafts. I know we were kind of hating on him earlier, but Matt McLean is one, Jazz Chisholm, 
Christian Yelich, O'Neill Cruz. I don't know. He's a little iffy. But there's so many guys that can go 2020. I think you're hoping. I think the odds of Matt McClain and Bo Bichette going 2020 are about equal. Bo Bichette will help you a lot more in average. But in the other categories, Matt McClain could have the advantage. And there's a huge discount. I, yeah. I think that Bo Bichette's my biggest bust of the season. Yeah, I've been out on Bo Bichette. His uh, sprint speed was 75th percentile just two years ago, or in 2021. Just last year, it was 43rd percentile. So I don't think those steals are coming back. And so if he's just a four-category player, I, I'm with you in thinking he... And not not even play. power, too. That's the thing. Yeah, like if he, was, if he was hitting 35 homers a year, then sure. But last year, he had 20. 20 is nothing. Right call him th- a three and a half category player and I, th- I think he's going too high for that certainly in my opinion let's move to the hot corner uh bob which third baseman are you afraid is about to bust uh, i'm gonna go with ryan mcmahon and he goes a little bit later he's a little bit after pick 200 but third base is a position that i'm trying to make sure i plan around and have an early um batter at that position his home runs, road splits are just really aggressive for me. Uh, I hate going into a week with Ryan McMahon and seven games on the road in what is a pretty terrible lineup uh, and team for Colorado. You know, he you can really just trust him half the time. And, uh, you know, the, the baseball forecaster put it best in my mind. You know, his OPS is 661 on the road, um, and he also hit – an OPS of 683 against lefties. So he's got the kind of the platoon splits in home road. He's also got platoon splits at lefty righty. I think that he's going to get at bats because they don't have anyone better to play there, but you know, he's a 243 career hitter and he plays half of his games at Coors field and that he doesn't do enough in the other categories uh, for me to really trust him. I think if you want a 240 career hitter that has some pop, I'd rather take Matt Chapman. I don't love Matt Chapman, but he goes 50 picks later. Um, I would just rather take him. But like I said, I'm third base is a position that I'm targeting earlier in drafts this year. Speaking of earlier in drafts, Jordan, it looks like you might have an earlier in drafts bust that you're a little bit worried about. Yeah, I hate this pick. <laughs> I'll be honest. Like you were talking about it earlier with first base. There just aren't too many first basemen that have bust potential. I think it's even more true about third base. I picked Gunnar Henderson. I I think his value is fine. It's just he is objectively risky. Um at this cost, if he returns what he did last year, might not be worth it. And that's a big possibility. But I don't know. He could return insane value. He could be the AL MVP. So it's totally fine to take him there. I really don't care. Um, I just couldn't find a better one. I'll be honest. Yeah, yeah. I hear you at third base. I, I was struggling. I think there's a. It's not surprising that Bob picked somebody super late. But I think the fact that we're all struggling to find a bus at third base says something about us because there's the most obvious bust in fantasy baseball plays third base. He also plays shortstop, and neither of us put him on there. Ellie De La Cruz. None of us are Ellie De La Cruz bust people. I mean, he he is the the quintessential bust. If I were to make a, a cover photo for this podcast, I would have guessed that he would be on there. Uh, I didn't want. I am not wrath. putting him on there. So yeah, what what do you? Why were you not an Ellie bust person? Bob? I just wasn't in the mood to have the wrath of all of Twitter coming after me for the next Fair two enough. days. Um, you know, I just wasn't feeling that. I don't have any Ellie De La Cruz. I totally get the appeal and that his ceiling is insanely high. Um, I don't have it in front of me, but I think the last two months of last season, he hit like 180 or something like that. And yeah. that's enough for me to not use a late second, early round pick, early third round pick on a player. And, you know, I'm not going to shame anybody for taking Ellie. I don't hate him, but. I don't know. Down the stretch, that batting average cratered, strikeout rate was high, and maybe he steals sixty bases and hits thirty-five home runs, and I'm wrong. But uh, yeah, I, yeah, I, don't I just have wanted him, yeah. to make sure we had a mention of him. It would have felt irresponsible no. to go through a bus True. episode and not touch on him at all. I have picked him some places, and the re- reason I didn't put him down as my bust is because I'm pretty sure he's going to run a ton. I don't know if the bat is going to get there, but I don't know if it needs to. 
Uh, this is a guy who called himself the fastest man in the world like less than a week after his debut, and he backed it up. At least he's 100 percentile sprint speed and stat cast. And the Reds played him every day, basically down the stretch, even as his bat was terrible. So I think he's slightly overpriced, but I actually didn't put him as a bust for that reason, because I think even if we get no steps forward from the bat, I think he still might be perfectly fine because he might give you 60 steals with a pretty bad bat. I, I think wins a category fun. for you. Yeah, exactly. I, so, I also think calling him a bust doesn't really do listeners any good. Like if you're taking Gally De La Cruz, you know, there's downside. True. I think True. that if you're taking Bo Bichette, you might not recognize it. True. But I think Ellie De La Cruz, if you make that decision, you know he could end up in the minors. You know he could bet 200. Like True. calling him a bust doesn't really benefit anybody. I, I and he's so I think, fun. I didn't want to do that to him. Yes. True. All right. Well, well, you guys aren't mean enough. We need to make everybody sad <laughs> on this panel. I'll, I'll really quickly mention my actual third base when I picked was Nolan Arenado. I don't hate the pick, but given his age, I think if you want to be a year at, uh, a year early on giving up on Nolan Arenado rather than a year late. I think he's entered that territory. That's more or less the entire argument there, though. Let, let's move to the outfield. I think we got time for the outfield and the starting pitcher as long as we move quickly. Um, so which outfielder are you avoiding in your drafts, Jordan? Yeah, literally just copy and paste my argument about Bo Bichette, but apply it to Randy Arozarena. He's a 2020 guy. He could do better. I, I feel less passionately about this, um, but he just has a very replicable skill set that you can find later in drafts, plain and simple. I I don't know. I, I think that they're obviously outfields pretty scarce this year, so that actually is big, um, but I don't know. What's the difference between Christian Yelich and Randy Rosarena? I, I hear you. So some definite risk in Oroz Arena's profile. I think I did notice that he was going five or six picks later in the earth drafts than he was in NFBC drafts at large. So I think maybe there is some other backing behind the notion that there's some risk there. Uh, Bob, who is your outfield bust? Yeah, I, I went with uh, Jazz Chisholm, who's uh, going on average at pick 67. And just for me, he hasn't stayed on the field. You know, I, I, I know how exciting of a player he is when he's out there and how much he does for the Marlins. But, you know, first off, he's lost his second base eligibility. And that was a, a big attraction for his value in the past. But he missed, you know, in 2021, he missed 38 games, mostly with a hamstring injury. In 2022, he missed 102 games with the back injury. And then last year, he missed 71 games with the turf toe and an oblique injury. That's a ton of games, and it's happened every year. And, you know, Mike Trout gets – dinged a lot more than Chisholm does compared to their skill sets. You know, they, they missed the same amount of time. Jazz has missed more the last two years than Trout has. Um, not that, you know, I would say Trout is any higher than Jazz, but it just, you don't hear it discussed as much. And just for him, I mean, he's, he can't hit lefties. Like it's not that he lags. He flat out can't hit lefties. He hit 172 last year compared to 275 against righties. He had two homers and four RBIs the whole year. In 94 plate appearances against lefties, you know, his career is 207. So that might've been a little drastic, but this is when he should be making improvements to his profile and uh, the K percentage regressing a year ago, the platoons being worse. Um, I just can't use a fifth round pick on a player that, that has those types of splits as well as injury concerns. Yeah, pretty remarkable yeah. how many different directions the risk comes from, yet he's still right. being drafted that high. So I hear you yeah. on that one. I, I think that if Jazz Chisholm had brown or black hair and his name was John Smith and he played for the call or the let's say Giants or something, like nobody would really care about him. He's just so exciting that like he has so much intrigue and that drives up his market price way too much. It is true. Uh, giant slander. Giants. I'm here. I can hear you. <laughs> I, I was going to say Rockies, giant. but then I remembered then we have the whole cool. Yeah, cool. Yeah, I, I really thought you were going to go with a, a Midwest team. I was surprised to hear that one. I know. Uh, yeah, I, I, the I, Royals, I like I would have been like, okay. Royals sorry. was the right yeah. pick. Yeah. No, you, I'll, I'll so move to a Midwest power. team for my outfield bust. Unless this is Justin cutting us off here. I think we got time no, for you got to time, time for outfield and starting pitchers, yeah. and then we'll get back. Do starting pitcher real quick. 
All right. Yeah, my, my outfielder would be uh, Jackson Churio. I think uh, if you're taking a rookie, you know that there's serious bust potential. But the thing is, if you're taking a rookie, you could take Wyatt Langford a round or two later or even Jackson Holiday a few rounds later. Those two were going ahead of Jackson Churio before Churio signed his extension back in November. Uh, Churio shot to the front of that rookie trio as soon as he got that confirmed playing time. But I think the others have a very real chance of earning that playing time and will be more interesting if they're all on the field by opening day. So if you're taking that combination of risk and upside, just get it a little bit later with some of those other guys. Uh, real quick, let's go to the starting pitcher you think is going to bust. Bob, you got one minute to make your case. Who is it going to be? All right. Uh, I'm going with Nick Pavetta. And I understand all of the advancements that Pavetta made in the second half. 29% K minus walk at a whip under one. He was one of the best pitchers in baseball, honestly, in the second half. But I think what gets left out of all of this is that most of that was in the bullpen. You know, whether he was a multi-inning reliever or had uh, an opener in front of him, I just feel I can't get away from that. I've watched Pavetta. Uh, I'm a Red Sox fan. I live in Bo near Boston, and I've watched him for four years now, and I know just as quickly as things go well that he can turn into one of the worst pitchers in baseball. And – there was a just under one year stretch uh, that went until May of last year when he got pulled out of the rotation uh, that he had an ERA over six in a five month span over two seasons, uh, 6.12 ERA from uh, July of 2022 through mid May of 2023. So he was arguably the worst pitcher in baseball for almost a full season. And I know that he was polar opposite in the second half of last year, but He's going in the 12th round for some people taking them as like their third starter, maybe fourth. And I've just seen it go the other direction too many times as a Red Sox fan to buy into that. Yeah, some people didn't watch 3,000 Nick Pavetta Philly starts either. It seems like if they're drafting him this high. Uh, speaking of Phillies, you have another ex-Philly on your bust list here as your bust starting pitcher, Jordan. Yeah, I do. It's Zach Eflin. He could fit your build. Um but I think more often than not, the risk doesn't outweigh the reward at this price for Eflin. Obviously, the Rays might have just worked devil magic and fixed something with Eflin. He was really good last season, but I don't know if we can forecast that going forward necessarily. Um, and he, he, he just walks a weird line. Like, is he safe? Maybe not, because he's only done it one year before. But does he have upside? Like, also not really, because what we're hoping for is last season, just over a full season. So I don't know what you really want from Eflin. He would be a really specific build. I think you would know it when you see it, but I can't really picture it. And I don't even know if he's going to be good again. He could straight up just return to Philly's Eflin and just be garbage again. Or not garbage, yeah. but like And those mid chronic yeah. knee troubles aren't too far in the rearview mirror for Eflin either. I will real quick mention my bust starting pitcher and then hand back to Justin. My potential bust I'm scared of is Yuri Perez. There's just too many directions for things to go wrong for him this year. I would love Yuri Perez last year. I would love taking him next year. But there's other rookie starting pitchers who are just as exciting who reached a much higher innings total last year. So if you're accepting the risk that comes with a rookie starter, maybe go with a different one, and also maybe go with one who didn't have a ground ball rate of 25% last year. That is shockingly low. I don't totally know what to do with that. Too many ways for that to go wrong to pick him quite as high as he's going. But I think that's going to wrap up our panel. Thank you very much to both Bob and Jordan. Uh, do you want to real quick tell us, everybody, where they can find you, pump your uh, either latest or next piece of work, and then we'll hand it back over to Justin. Yeah, I'll go first. Uh, you can find me on uh, Twitter at Bob Osgood15. I uh, write it over the monster, which is a Red Sox uh, blog, and we also podcast. Uh, you can find us on the Monsters of Sox podcast feed. It's called The Red Seat. I host along with Jake Devereaux and Keaton DeRocher. We record every week talking Red Sox uh, throughout the season. So you can find my writing and my podcasting there. And I still do a little work at the Dynasty Guru as a contributor. All right. Thanks, Bob. Great to meet you. And how about you, Jordan? Yeah. It's definitely a different speed than your typical fantasy baseball plug. But if you want to hear some Northwestern sports news, basketball team is going crazy recently. 
Uh, tune in to WNUR Sports tomorrow night at 8 p.m. I'll be on with a couple of my friends. And that's my local Big Ten team. Maybe I'll have to check it out. So yeah, I know Jeff uh, Eric. Thanks to chat with you as well. Too. True, true. We got <laughs> we got a lot of Northwestern connections here. Maybe maybe you'll get a ton of fans out of this. I'm sure. <laughs> uh, you can find my work at rotowire.com. You can find me on Twitter at Eric underscore Halterman. That's Eric with a K. And you can find Justin Mason right back here. Thanks for having us on, Justin. Thank you, guys. I'm going to unceremoniously put you all out. I appreciate you all coming on and dropping some bust knowledge. All right. We're going to bring in a new crew here in one second, but just want to remind everybody what we're doing today is we are talking fantasy baseball, but we're also raising money for charity. Uh, we're raising money for Fantasy Cares, which is a fantastic organization. We've already raised over $1,500 today. Plus, if you add in the money from uh, all the TGFBI participants and satellite participants that have donated, uh, we've raised over $7,700 this offseason for Fantasy Cares. Really, really appreciate everybody donating. Continue to donate. Donate all weekend long because you're going to get entered in to win amazing prizes like baseball jerseys uh, that are signed, uh, like uh, baseball cards, some of which are signed. Uh, bobbleheads, uh, and subscriptions to amazing sites like FTN, where Mr. Todd Whitestone works. <laughs> uh, and you guys are donating a prize from FTN, correct? Yes, we are. We had a high stakes package and a fantasy baseball plus package. So hopefully uh, somebody can take advantage of that. And there's a lot of good information there for them. Uh, well, thank you so much for joining us, Todd, and you're going to be mm -hmm. leading this panel. Remind everybody where to reach on social media and talk about what you do. So I'm at, at Telestar7 on Twitter or X, whatever you call it these days. Um, and uh, I write a weekly article, Justin. Uh, it's on the main event, and it it follows the main event because that's where everybody is totally engaged, and it goes over the fab pickups and what uh, the, the biggest – uh, draw is and then latest free agents and then uh, the, the people that are leading the main event uh, usually are, are in there as well so uh, it's an article comes out every Monday usually and I'm looking forward to writing it again this year I'm looking forward to reading again this year read it every week uh, <laughs> love checking out FTN especially for all their high stakes content we're gonna be talking a lot of high stakes content uh, and one of the people on this podcast is Mr. Jake Hallisker. How you doing, my friend? My mic still works. It I'm does still work. I'm I'm surprised. It's been. <laughs> I mean, no, actually, you've been you've been you've been recording yeah. a little bit, which is yeah, a little is bit for you. A little bit. I took it out of the bubble wrap a few weeks ago. Um, I was so, so shocked. I almost had a heart attack when I saw it pop up <laughs> in my I'm player. How do you for keeping it in your feet all that time? Hey, I, I I still have a, a podcast in my feed on a podcast defunct that we're going to talk about here in a second with a different uh, person. Actually, you're the one leading the pod or this uh, segment today. Uh, why don't you uh, remind everybody where you can be reached on social media, plug all that you do, and talk about the price you're giving away. Yeah, yeah, you can find me at the Dust Mite. Uh, random fantasy musings most of the time. Cleveland sports, uh, you know, sadness. <laughs> from the factory itself, direct from the factory. Uh, we are giving away a Rotosaurus t-shirt of your choice. Uh, high quality shirts, cool logo. You can kind of see it a little bit. And uh, yeah, just happy to be part of Pot of Blues again and doing TGFBI on Monday. Looking forward to running this panel. It's a great group of dudes and over four decades of high stakes experience in here. Yeah, it's uh, it's going to be a really, really fun panel. I'm definitely going to be listening along. Uh but uh, yeah, Rotosaurus t-shirts, love those things. I've got two of them. I prefer the Christmas dinosaur yeah. to the regular dinosaur, but that's just me. Uh, joining us as well is Kevin Hastings, my friend. How are you? Doing wonderful, Justin. Thank you so much for having me. And once again, as always, thank you for doing this. Absolutely. Remind everybody where you can be reached on social media. Uh, talk about what you do and the prize you're giving away. I mean, so many prizes giving away the, you know, from this hour. <laughs> Yeah, it's awesome. Uh, I can be found at Hastings Kevin 
on Twitter and as the co-host of On The Wire with Adam Howe, uh, released every Sunday morning, in season anyway, talking about that weekend's uh, fab pickups and what we're looking at for the next week or two coming up. And in the off season, once in a while, it gets posted a little earlier. Uh, Adam will get it out on uh, Friday or Saturday at times, but the closer we get to the season and then in season, um, Check us out while you're having your Sunday morning coffee. There you go. Something I listen to every Sunday. Uh, so you should be too. Uh, great to see you, Kevin. Oh, and you're giving away something, right? Oh, that's right. Uh, uh, sticking with my annual tradition, giving away some picture list merch. I think I put a cap on there for, mm -hmm. for this season. Uh, of course, that could be negotiable with whoever wins it. We can get them what they'd like from the picture list store. Perfect. Thank you so much. Appreciate that. And joining us out of retirement, rising like the undertaker <laughs> out of the coffin, we have Toby G, Mr. Batflip Crazy. Holy cow. Out of retirement. My goodness. Um, Didn't retire I heard this... for very long. Retiring like Tom Brady did. <laughs> for sure. For sure. I heard this was an Ohio uh, podcast, so I, I brought the best baseball team in Ohio <laughs> hat with me. Uh, uh, oh, oh, Justin! Wearing my Friedel jersey, oh, baby. Beautiful, beautiful. <laughs> Remind everybody where you reach on social media. I know you don't do the pod anymore, but um, it's it's a pleasure to have you. Yeah, for sure. Uh, you can reach me on uh, Twitter at BatFlipCrazy, where you can get um, announcements about all of the contestants that are joining the the Champions League on that FBC. That's pretty much okay, all I tweet yeah. out these days. Yeah, but give that a little pub. Oh, yeah. Well, the Champions League is a, um, an idea um, that we kind of created. This is the first year that it's in existence. But the idea is people join a main event, an uh, online championship and a draft champions and their Champions League qualifiers. There's an overall that includes all three of those leagues. And then the top 15 um, then qualify for a 15 team auction the next year for um, yeah, it's a 250 additional dollars to join in addition to the package that you buy and that all goes to the pot in the next year so i'm um, kind of trying to create a, a larger pot where people can compete based on performance alone and not be able to kind of um you know volume their way into into a, a heavy prize so i'm um, really excited about it and appreciate you know uh, the opportunity to share a little bit about it absolutely <laughs> well, i'm looking forward to watching how that goes this year uh, and um, rooting uh, you on to become the champion of the Champions League, right? So, uh, all right, I'm going to let you guys, you guys are way smarter than me and better at NFBC than me, so I'm going to let you guys talk here for a little bit uh, while I take notes in the background and also do pitching projections. So I will see you guys in a, about an hour. He's too modest. <laughs> he, he won a, he won a 7,000 auction last year. What's he talking about? Yeah, he went. He went a. He won a, a few of them and finished really well. So he's come Justin's a long way from humble. drafting seven injured guys in the main in 2018. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Justin could be on this panel, no problem. Uh, all right, boys. We got like I said before, a couple of you came on. There's probably four decades of high stakes experience in here, and a lot of that has been spent in the NFPC. So let's drop some knowledge bombs if we can. Um, before you even make your, your draft choices at the table, you have to set your Kentucky Derby style uh, selections or preferences. Uh, just for those that don't know all NFBC leagues pretty much, except for a couple that do it with fab dollars, they uh, randomly draw people based on uh, you know, a random generator, but then they get to order their preferences of draft choice. So if they are selected first, they get the first choice that they have on the list. If it's they want to draft 12th for some reason this year first, they can if they don't want Ronald Acuna. Um, <laughs> and you can luck out and get your third draft preference, even if you're the 11th or 12th chosen, like I've had this year happen. Uh, I'll start with you, Todd. When you are setting up your KDS for this season in particular, or if you want to take it any other way, that's fine. Uh, you know, what, what, what are you tending to follow? Are you a, a guy that likes to mix it up every league just to try different things or straight butter kind of guy? Or do you, uh, <laughs> do you have a preference for this year? Yeah, I usually adjust it. I try to uh, adjust it to the uh, market for this year. Uh, and the, for the, the one thing, I guess, for people that don't play NFBC is that you're, what you're looking for in the first round particularly 
are players that you feel are roughly the same, or maybe you like a guy a little better that is going one or two spots later. So for example, let's say Bobby Witt and Julio Rodriguez are, um, are, are going two and three in ADP, but you would take uh, Julio even if you had the number two pick. So what I would do in that case is I would take, I would put number one first, I think as everybody will, to try to get Acuna, but then I would put three second because then I would have a chance to get um, Julio at three and then uh, be able to get a slightly better second round pick. So you're looking for that sort of situation. The same could be said for, let's say, Kyle Tucker at six. Let's say you think he's as good as the number three or four player. Then you would probably put that earlier in your KDS and then hopefully get a better second round selection uh, because you took a number six pick instead of a number four. So that's how I would look at it. But you have to, each person has to kind of decide what they feel is the better starting spot. Very good. Uh, Kevin, I'm going to mix your question up just, just a hair. Um, do you, do you mix up your choices based on, you know, how many leagues you're doing and also do you plan into your draft further than say the first couple rounds when you're setting your KDS? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I'll go to the, the second question first there. I, I think uh, a lot of times we get really caught up in what we want to do with the first couple of rounds. And what I'm noticing specific to this season is the fourth round. I I tend to want an earlier pick. So the obviously I think all of us are, are are setting well not necessarily but I think most are setting one one as, as their first choice. Ronald Acuna is just the projected so much better than the field this season. Uh, but then I'm jumping towards the back, kind of similar to what Todd was saying, but I'm not looking necessarily for a specific player. I'm looking for the, a grouping of players that I'm comfortable with later. And I'm finding when we get to that fourth round, um, and unless I have gotten Ronald Acuna Jr., I, I, I want to go earlier in the fourth round. Very interesting. Uh, yeah. And if you've done a few drafts, you, you are kind of getting an idea of what tends to go in that spot. And uh, yeah, it's easier to make your, your preferences once you've done a few. Uh, Toby, I'm going to, I'm going to keep dovetailing in the champions league for you guys, for you, whenever you can't, whenever I can to plug it. Um, since the champions league is a 12 team online championship, it's a 15 team draft and hold or DC draft champions and a main event 15 team, whether live or online, are you um, trying to, mix up your KDS for those different leagues based on, uh, you know, diversifying your portfolio or anything like that? Yeah, not, not really. I mean, I think for me, there's like, there's a, there's a clear, and again, I think a lot of this goes to like your, your valuations, right? Like looking at that, that first few rounds of ADP and who it is that you want to be selecting and making your judgment based on that. I think, um, is super important. So for me, obviously I want Acuna. Like I have Acuna as being like everybody else, like $20, $15 uh, of more value than any other pick. Um, and so I always want to have that as my first option. I would take him three times in the champions league uh, for sure. Um, but yeah, I, I, I'm not really bearing it up. I think there's a lot of flexibility after the first pick in terms of how you approach it. Todd mentioned like, J Rod versus Wit. You also have Strider in there, who's clearly you know the the number one pitcher, at least from my perspective. So I think there's a lot of different ways that you can go. I tend to um, uh, agree with what Kevin said, just in terms of not just thinking about like the first first one or two rounds, but also thinking about like how does this set you up to build your team for the next for the first six rounds, the first seven, the first eight. You know, obviously there's going to be fluctuations from draft to draft, but it can give you a, uh, an idea probabilistically of like how likely it is to be able to get certain players. So for me, if I'm drafting on the turn, like the question becomes, you know, I did that. I got in my first DC, I'm doing my CLQ right now, my Champions League qualifier from the 11 spot. And so like one of the questions that you're going to be asked right off the bat is, 
what are you doing in the second round? Are you going to go with the second hitter there? And then are you comfortable with the, with the starting pitchers that are available? I feel like there's a drop off there um, as well. And so I really think you need to think about these things ahead of time. If you're in a slow draft, you have a little bit more time to contemplate them. But if you're in a fast draft, you really need to go in there with a plan about how you're going to attack different places and, mm-hmm. and make different choices. And, and then thinking about those first eight picks and what you're likely to have at that point in time. So I, I like to think about it a little bit further out. Um, but I think everybody's spot on that, you know, it really does dictate a lot in snake drafts where you're what, who you're going to be able to get and, right. and who you need to jump for. Yeah. Um, guys, feel free to interject anytime you want to throughout this. I don't, I don't run a iron handed ship like in my classroom. Uh, <laughs> uncle Ted in the chat says no starters worth drafting earlier than round 12. I think, Sounds like a Nick Pollock extreme philosophy there. Um, or maybe it's the splinted splinter back from the grave. I don't know. Um, <laughs> for me, I do so many 15 team leagues and I try to mix it up in the early, the early stuff. All my DCs, I kind of, kind of play around um, to see what I want to do in the main event. Cause really that's, that's kind of what it ends up coming down to for me. It's really the only high dollar snake draft that I do. I like doing auctions for everything else, but I got to get one main event entry in there. Uh, so I do like to plan out, you know, eight to 10 rounds and see if mm-hmm. I can make that happen. Uh, I don't let the like 10th round dictate my KDS, but I definitely look at the first five or six for it. Cause you got to have an idea of when the closers start going and you got to have an idea of when you need to have your second, you know, starter nailed down or else you're going to see it fall off the cliff. So you got, you got to try things out. If you're, if you're only doing one of them, then you need to study ADP pretty heavily and, and kind of try to plan it out yourself, in my opinion. Um, anything else on KDS? All right. Nope. Um, this is kind of a, a broad question, so I'm going to let you take in any direction you choose. Uh, the only question I have, or the only words written here are, how do you approach roster construction? That could go, how, uh, you know, how do you uh, evaluate risk? How do you uh, like to, it, are there certain positions you like to have at certain times? It could be this year, it could be general doesn't matter to me. Kevin, why don't you start off with your answer? Well, this is the age old question, right? If any of us had the 100% correct (laughs) answer to this, uh, we'd be winning every league we're in. Uh, But it, it, it fascinates me. Roster construction, I think is what I I enjoy most about trying to figure out fantasy baseball. And we have so many different theories and some we've seen work at times, not work at others. And but I, I think in general, um, it really comes down to what you are comfortable with. Right. When when we're talking about we, we, we hear all the time, what, what, we talk too much about the first round, but the first round does lay the foundation and that affects every pick you're going to make after that in a, in a snake draft. So how, how do you want to construct your team? You have to have an idea when you go into the draft, you also need to be able to shift gears in my opinion uh, and and completely switch. If if something goes wrong or somebody that you, you value uh, much higher than, than where you are able to grab them and you didn't think they'd be available and they fall and that completely changes your plan. So I, I think there are many ways to go about it. Uh, for me, I, I'm i really trying to concentrate much more on the ratio categories, both hitting and pitching in my roster construction. Uh, it's been a work in progress over, over the past couple of seasons. I'm getting better at it. I'm still not there. I, and I think, you know, we've seen some people, Steve Weimer uh, put out an article, I think last season about mm-hmm. when everybody's always talking about getting your speed in the early rounds, but he found no, but you really need to be banking in the early rounds is your batting average. When we're talking hitters, I'm trying to, trying to do that more, pay attention to that more. Uh, I'm trying not to say this batting average won't hurt me as often and trying to say this batting average will help me more often. Uh, I think we, I, I've gotten sucked into that, you know, 
league average is like 245 now and we only need 260 for our fantasy league so these all these 250 ish hitters are fine if that's all you have you're not fine so uh, <laughs> it also leads to to problems when guys don't perform up to their expectation you, you don't have much of a cushion so i think in general as far as roster construction goes over the past couple of seasons and i'm going to try even more so this year is really concentrating on ratios uh especially in the first 10 to 15 rounds toby you're a you're a big projection drafter and and you love your regression models uh <laughs> how much how much does that influence your roster construction i would assume more than just a little bit yeah, for sure. I mean, I think I think I totally agree with what Kevin said. I mean, I think part of part of roster construction is just understanding scarcity of categories, scarcity of positions, and figuring out, you know, how you address that. You know, as you like build out your team. Um, I also think that um, for me, roster construction is in a lot of ways about risk mitigation. So it's like, how do we? reduce the impact that luck can have, right? We know that luck plays a factor, right? Sometimes guys hit their 95th percentile in a season, right? We know that 5% of players are, are gonna do that, right? But the question is like, over the course of your whole team, how do you build in, um, how do you build in uh, things that address like the different risks and, and the different player underperformance and other things that can happen? And so, like you mentioned, Jake, for me, that's what projections do, right? Like we focus a lot on the individual projections of players and whether they're right or wrong. But when you combine those and you have a larger sample of those medium projections, the more likely it is that your team is going to fall within a smaller kind of, um, there's going to be less uh, variance. You know, you're mitigating the impact that variance can have. And so for me, that's really what I'm trying to do in using projections and I know there's a question later on about building towards the 80th, but really having a balance across number one, if you're in overall competitions, that's an important thing, but also like if, if you don't put all of your eggs in one basket with steals or batting average or home runs, you know, the more you can spread those out, the more you're spreading out risk and the more your team has the ability to adapt to bad luck or even good luck that happens to you throughout the course of the season. So really with projections, with kind of the approach and building in a balanced way, you're really trying to mitigate risk. And then, um, you know, from there, if you do get a little bit of lucky and you're in a position to do well, you know, then, um, you know, you hope luck swings your way. Now, Todd, uh, same question, obviously, but I'm going to also add in a little bit. You mm -hmm. partner a lot with James Anderson uh, <laughs> on your live yep. drafts. Yep. Auctions and Snake, I believe you do mains and auctions together. Uh, not auctions. We just do snakes together. Okay. All right. Well, that makes it easier then. Um, so do you guys ever qu uh, quarrel about what your roster construction should be <laughs> in general? Or, I mean, obviously you'll, you'll have disagreements on players, but uh, how do you guys come to an agreement on how you're going to construct your roster? Um, okay. Well, that's interesting because uh, James is such an easygoing guy that I've learned over the years that he's never going to say, well, that's an idiotic pick, Todd. <laughs> Which sometimes, sometimes I need someone to say that, you know, I, I could, I could look across, across the room at Toby and say, Toby, is this stupid? But anyway, so he, he's, I, I just want to say, Todd, I've heard on multiple occasions, James mentioned the wonderful picks that you've had on fab recently. On okay. this podcast. So well, don't that, sell yourself short. That goes to show how nice he is, but um but anyway, uh, so so what I've learned over the years is uh, James, he'll he'll sometimes he'll be well in favor of what I'm saying, and he'll be like, yeah, that's that's good, I like that. Or and then other times he'll just be quiet, and that means <laughs> that means that it's not a good idea as far as he's concerned. And so I've learned how to read James. Um, but yes, we do go over it beforehand. It's not like you know we're doing this at all at the draft table. Um, but we we have lots of discussions about it, and we know the players that we like, and uh, you know that's that's the key. I would say, sort of as an overview, uh, Jake, that um, I divide it into three parts. The first part is the early picks, where you're just trying to get the most value you can. I agree with Kevin that uh, you know the ratios are are paramount, especially batting average. I think you got to go for that. 
Um, and the second thing I look at is is the late picks. Which late picks do you like? Because let's say you like a Matt Walner. Well, that's great for power, but he doesn't have a very good batting average. And you can go through the guys and say, what do I think I can get late? And that sort of advises what where you should go in the middle. It's not just positions. It's it's the categories those late guys provide. So I, I would divide it into three parts and say, you got to get the balance that Toby's talking about, but you got to also um, look which guys are you trying to lean to at the end because if they don't fit how you do the middle, it's not going to work out. You guys said all different elements that I incorporate into my strategy. Um, the big word for me is balance. Uh, like Toby said, especially I, I don't know if there's really ever a time that I am not going for a balanced team. I, I play a lot of overall contests, but even in my non-overall contests, you'll never see me punting a category or anything like that. It's just not yeah. in my DNA. Um, Todd mentioned uh, looking at the last rounds of the draft and, and knowing who you can target in those areas and then knowing what you need to do early on in order to, uh, you know, complement all of those late picks that you're going to have. Honestly, the late picks are complementing the, the earlier part of the draft, but uh, not screwing up the beginning, you know, eight to 12 rounds of the draft, even probably eight to 10. Uh, I don't, mm -hmm. I don't take a lot of risks before round eight. I like to take a few risks inside the teens because honestly, I think the teens are where you, you make your hay. Uh, a lot of people can draft the first 10 rounds, uh, but there's a lot of hits and a lot of more busts in the mid rounds. And those are, players that you're going to want to stay on your team, the majority of them uh, for a lot of the season. And the last 10 rounds are just a bunch of shots in the dark that, I mean, okay, I keep kind of backtracking. They're not shots in the dark, but they're shots in the, in, in the early morning light per se, where your eyes are getting adjusted. You have some ideas, but you know, eight of them are probably not going to work out or they won't be on your team past April. So just stay balanced and be able to take those shots later on. Don't take your shots in the first eight rounds so that you have to try to play catch up by drafting guys like Luis Arias all the time mm, right. uh, in the back half of the draft. Right. Um, anything else to add on roster construction? I mean, this, this topic can go for a whole hour on its own, really. And this is a lot of what we do on High Stakes Heat whenever we get around to recording it. Um, I kind of touched on it already. I don't like to take health risks early, especially. Um, are there any types of players that you like to avoid early or especially target or take late, Toby? Um, I don't know if there's a t particular type of player. I mean, I think, um, yeah, honestly, like I, I'm trying to look at value, you know, um, at that point in time. Like I think oftentimes towards the top end of the draft, it's really difficult, right? Like the higher you are in the first round, it's really hard for your first round pick to actually generate value. So what you're really looking for is more of those balanced profiles, like you mentioned. So it's not necessarily that I'm avoiding anyone in particular. Like if I, if I look at the first round, like I'm pretty much comfortable drafting any of those players in the first round that are there, probably in the second round too, you know, with some differences. Um, but I think to the point that Kevin has made and Todd has made as well, I think you really want to be addressing scarcity as much as possible early on. So with batting average, for instance, being something that's critically important, um, you know, for me, that's something that I'm probably going to focus on a little bit more to Todd's point as well. Like knowing that you actually, it's not even that you need to be at your goal, you know, with batting average, with the picks that you choose, but you need to build in a cushion because those right. guys later on are going to take it down. Right. And so um, so I think it's really important. So for me, it's really focusing on scarcity. And Kevin, I think, mentioned like the Steve Weimer article that he wrote as well. And like the thing that is the most scarce is pitchers that throw at a high volume with good ratios. Right. Like even even less so the strikeouts are, are even that important. Right. And so it's like if a guy can consistently get the good ratios, even if he doesn't bring along like the super elite K's you know, then that's something that's, that's really interesting as well. So it's less like avoiding a particular profile as it is targeting probably a, a particular profile. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Whip, whip especially was my killer last year. Uh, <laughs> I played catch up in a lot of leagues last year. Yeah. Until the very end, And I just, 
it cost me, you know, I was getting thirds and fourths in leagues that I could have won if I would have had better whips. And it was a, it was a big problem. And I try to be mindful of it, but for whatever reason, last year, it really didn't work. I had a lot of Gaussman and as for as good as he was in a lot of things, he's when he's your ace and he's getting almost a one, two whip and you're already kind of recovering from that. It kind of stinks. Um, I'll go to you, Kevin, next. Uh, are there certain types of players that you're going to avoid, especially late or early? Um, I'm, I'm kind of on the same page as Toby here. I, I don't think there's anybody I actually avoid. Um, however, there there are guys that a whole lot of things have to happen uh, before I consider them. And it, it, it's going back to it's going back to the ratios, uh, not to dwell on it too much. Uh, and then uh, you're the one of the best to talk to about this, Jake. The injury risk. You, you and Dave are very vocal about this uh, on high stakes heat. And uh, I'm learning. I'm getting better. Uh, I'm still not good. I mean, I I I drafted. Byron Buxton and Jacob DeGrom in the same gladiator draft last season. That that was just <laughs> ridiculous. No, no reason to do something like that. I, I think what we have to remember is we spend a lot of time thinking about what if this goes right, we need to spend more time thinking about what if this doesn't work out, how, how, how is that going to affect my team? Uh, can I, can I recover? if I lose this player. Uh, and I, I think you have to get a few rounds into the draft before the answer to that question is yes. So earlier in the draft, taking less risk, I, I know I'm preaching to the choir here, Jake, but uh, that that's something I, that I'm working on getting better at as well. Brownie points for you. Thank you, Kevin. Uh, <laughs> I, I don't know. I do feel like we kind of tried to pioneer that years ago. Um, first Dave on Twitter before we started the show and then on our show. And it, it was just always part of our philosophy going back to, you know, 2013, 2012 is uh, just avoiding those guys that you really had a good feeling about them being a landmine early on. And, you know, um, I know Phil won his, Phil Dussault won his overall in 21 with DeGrom missing a lot of the season, but uh, those stories are not as common as you would like them to be. Uh, so, <laughs> Yeah, if you're losing your fourth round pick in a main in the first month of the year, then it gets a lot harder, exponentially harder, I think. Um, I forget. To, uh, Todd, I haven't asked you this question yet. Sorry. Uh, any players you like to avoid early or late? Yeah, I can be short. I mean, I, I think Kevin and Toby got it right. I, I The only tweak I would put on it personally is that I would say I'm a little bit more of a target drafter. So even as I get into the third, fourth, fifth round, there's guys I'm – feeling like there is a little bit more value, even though all of them are probably pretty good choices. So um, I am I am looking for those players, and I'm trying to build the cushion of batting average that I mentioned. But um, I think everybody's got it right. I think you just – you can't take the big risks in the third round. I just – personally, I don't subscribe to that. I think you can do that later and – have just as much upside on your team. You mentioned what? target players, Todd. Um, yeah. Did somebody want to say, I'm sorry, I missed that. Oh, I was Go just going to say one thing, like I think that's helpful in thinking about like injury risk as well is if you use a projection system that generates a value and you can adjust, you know, for instance, with DeGrom, it's like, okay, the question isn't necessarily, is DeGrom going to be healthy for 200 innings? The question is like, how many innings does Jacob deGrom need to throw in order to be worth whatever I'm investing in him, right? Mm -hmm. You know, last year, I can't remember what it was. It was like 120 innings of deGrom is better than any other pitcher, right? Mm -hmm. So if mm -hmm. you think that he can get to that in a given, given season, then it might be worth it. So I think that's a helpful adjustment to make as you think about these things. It's like Altuve asked last year, right? He's injured. You have to think about the implications for having him on your bench without an IL mm -hmm. in an NFPC league. But then it's also like, okay, well, how many plate appearances do I expect him to get? And how much is that worth? And then factoring that into what you're willing to spend in terms of draft capital on him. Right. And and mentioning DeGrom again, it, you know, that for Phil, that's pretty much what happened. He threw enough innings to pretty much pay off his right. second round cost that year, I believe. 
And it yep. was about, it was like 120, wasn't it? It was like 110, 120. And then he knew when to drop them instantly, cut bait and moved on and used that roster spot for maximum flexibility. So he did it exactly right that year. Um, okay. Uh, Todd mentioned player targets. I want to talk about draft targets. Toby already alluded to the 80%. And, and he's honestly one of the people that championed it in the early going. So I want to put it out there for him first. Do you, do you, obviously, you use the 80% draft targets when drafting in the NFBC. What, what is that for everybody, just, just so they know? Yeah, totally. So um, it's a great question. If you think about, um, so you think about a 15 team league, we're generally, well, 15 or 12. Generally speaking, if you average 12 out of 15 in each category, then you will win your league, right? If you get 120 points, and my math's not good enough to figure out in a 12 team league, but you know, mm -hmm. whatever it is, 100 there, I'm not even going to try to. <laughs> yeah. um i i've just focused so much on 15 yeah somebody do the math for me well, you got to so, this year toby say, say you got it this year. yeah um i do well i did last year too I'll, I'll figure it out for like a brief two-day period when i do my draft <laughs> but um yeah so essentially what you're trying to do is create category targets so you're like okay well if i finish at 80 percent in across the board in the categories then i'm likely to win my league and so that also helps you build towards balance so if you take the 80th percentile from the previous year, you know, some people integrate like more than one year just, just for whatever's sake. But if you use the previous year, so, um, you know, let's see, for different contests are going to have different ones. And so I'm drafting a draft champions right now. You know, 80th percentile in runs is uh, 1,081 runs, 305 home runs, 1,047 RBI, 186 steals. And so it essentially just gives you targets to draft towards. And then if you have projections that you're working from, then you just add those projections together of the players you've drafted. And it gives you a sense of how close you are. Now, it's actually really difficult with reasonable projections to get to that 80th percentile. So part of what you need to think about, and I think this is something that I've failed to do in the past, is there's going to be, you know, you're going to be short like 500 plate appearances or 600 plate appearances or 400 plate appearances. And that's going to be guys that you need to fab or overperformance in the projected plate appearances that you have. But the challenge with that is those are likely to be not very good plate appearances because they're not your top round draft picks. They're the guys that have some playing time volatility. And so, um, again, you know, you kind of build towards those and then you hope that you get lucky enough to be able to reach them eventually. Um, and so it's a really nice way of staying balanced. It's a nice, really nice way of making sure that you're not underweight in a particular category. I think where I'm trying to be a little bit more flexible because I've been really rigid in the past is understanding that if I'm at 85th percentile in one category, that gives me a little bit of grace in other categories to not be as good. Like Brian Slack winning the main event last year without being super good in stolen bases, I think he was like 75th percentile, was kind of a reflection of that where if you're really good in a bunch of categories, it's okay to be a little bit weak in one category. So mm -hmm. I'm trying to build in a little bit of flexibility there. I'm actually working off a 90th percentile in batting mm -hmm. average this year because batting average has really okay. been a struggle for me. And so I really want to make sure that I've got that cushion built in there for my batting average. So that's just a way for me just mentally to be like, okay, I know that it's 90th percentile, but I'm still going to try to get there um, and build in that a little bit of that. Because um, mm -hmm. we know that the batting average we right. fab is like 200, yeah. 210. Below so. replacement, yeah. Yeah, yeah, sure. yeah, yeah. That's very interesting. Good. So you do you do modify that in your own head as well. You don't just stick with the 80. Um, Todd, do you use projections when you draft, and are you going with the 80th percentile pretty much like Toby? Uh, I do look at it. I'm not wedded to it. Uh, I do agree with most of what Toby was saying. Um, but I would also mention that, um, stolen bases, which uh, Toby mentioned about Brian's team, um, you know, that's the one category on the offensive side that it, it doesn't really affect as much of the other offensive categories. So if you're going to be weak in one, that would be the one to pick. I think uh, you don't want to be light on the power categories because that can affect so much. And, um, and then the only other thing to mention on the offensive 80% is uh, the batting average it just can vary so much depending on BABIP and other things that you might have a very good team in terms of batting average, but it still can vary 20 points or so. So you, if you go in light on that, you're really running the risk of being way down in the standings uh, in batting average because it just, 
you know, especially over a couple of months, you just you just can be buried. So anyway, I try to build in that cushion and and really pay attention to it. Uh, Kevin, what about you? Are you looking at the 80th percentiles when you're drafting? Um, I don't necessarily look at them while I'm drafting, but I look at them before I draft and I do use projections. So I kind of have an idea of what's going on, I, but, but it's not something I'm really paying strict attention to. I think we kind of, um, we all draft a lot of leagues. So we kind of have a feel for where we are on, on, on our category targets uh, without having to specifically track them to the exact number. However, post-draft, that's when I sit down and look at the projections of the team I drafted and where I'm at according to the 80th and 90th percentile targets. And so I know right away going into the season before a game has been played, what I have to pay extra attention to and some of the, uh, the leans I'm going to have to make when we start fabbing as we get into the season. I tend to be a little more like you, Kevin. Um, you know, I started doing high stakes back in, uh, 2012, 2013. And uh, it was before, uh, projections were were heralded as the thing that they are today and i kind of got used to drafting off of skills and putting players into different tiers based on skills and i i feel like i have a pretty good mental idea of what's going on with my team uh as it's being constructed and, and when i do a live league i always have somebody at my right uh kind of in my ear the whole time watching the projections but i am not one even if i'm doing a draft at home that's looking at them um, just because I, I, I don't want to say I don't want them clouding my judgment, but I don't want them clouding my judgment. I kind of, I, I look at them pre-draft uh, as I'm doing my player analysis throughout. And then I kind of incorporate that. I feel like I have a pretty good memory for it. And maybe that's tooting my own horn too much and giving myself too much confidence, but I've, I've always enjoyed building my rosters uh, by, by feel, by, mm -hmm. um, uh, you know, tiers of, of skills. And I think we do a pretty good job with roster construction. Um, and then the projections are kind of ancillary to that. Um, so I don't really look at the 80th percentiles uh, during the draft. And I kind of, I've, I've been, again, doing these main events for a decade now, over a decade. And I kind of have a good idea for the most part, what I need to have. So I don't like looking at them in the draft. Not to say that you shouldn't, because there's definitely value in it. It just it it makes it less fun for me, as as weird as that is. Uh, looking at too many numbers in the draft is less fun for me, which riles up many of the the new age crowd that love the numbers in the in the sheets. And I am a lot more of a Neanderthal when it comes to that. <laughs> Yes, Uncle Ted. I draft by feel. <laughs> well, I, I would just say, honestly, I just do it for the fantasy pros grade at the end of the draft. Yeah, <laughs> I'm like a, I'm a real sucker for that. So I did my first draft. I got an A and I was like on top of the world. I was like, I, I won. Like, I don't even need to see what happens during the season. Like, I won. Just hide the team now. Just hide the team. Yeah, there you go. There you go. For sure. It doesn't even exist anymore. Like, no. Everybody's uh, favorite Sunday sure. night tradition. Fab. And every NFBC league gets a $1,000 per year fab budget. Uh, and it is hours upon hours of time. And we love it every Saturday or Sunday night. It's the ritual. Um, and Todd, you also wrote a very, very comprehensive article and you've done so for the last few seasons, uh, mm -hmm. detailing uh, fab performance from the previous year and also a couple of years before that. So I'm going to start off with you. Um, First of all, dive into your article a little bit, which you will sure. link on your on your Twitter account or your X account. And yeah. uh, you know, how do you how do you approach fab spending in FBC, especially with your research you do? Okay, so I, I want to just mention I the article is available. It's a free article. I, I tweeted it out. Um, but I what it has in it is the last three years of main event spending. And main event, as I mentioned, is you know very competitive and people are engaged pretty much the whole season. So it's pretty accurate in terms of what's going to happen. And what I've noticed over the years is the pattern is almost always the same. Yes, the numbers are a little different. Like last year, there was a little bit more spending early because of all the rookies. But even then, the pattern was very similar. 
So what that meant is you can sort of gain an edge by knowing what your league as a whole is going to do. You can sort of plan to be a little bit behind the spending early that the other players are going to do and then hopefully get bargains in the middle or later part of the season. Um, I won't go through the numbers because they're there in the article, but um, it does hold up. I also provided sort of an estimated budget is the way I try to do it, but people can sort of create their own budgets that is better for them. Um, but th it's just a way to try to make sure that you have a little bit more money at each stage of the season. You don't want to not spend early, that of course, but um, if you can hold back a little, uh, I find you have a big edge over the competition and in those critical months of, you know, May, June, July, and August. And uh, I, I think, I think it just shows that these players are roughly the same and the, the attractiveness of getting those early guys when people say, Hey, I have a thousand dollars of fab, you know, it's sort of a bottomless pit of money. Um, I can sort of bid, bid 300 if I want to. And uh, that will sort of hold true this year. I'm sure. One thing that I'm noticing looking at uh, the first chart uh, that you have on the article uh, detailing the last three years and what was spent each week overall on average. Mm -hmm. um, it's funny, like after 20, obviously, everybody kind of had had their brains a little poisoned by the fact that we could spend money every week in 2020. So right. you can see in 21, we were spending money like gangbusters, right. like unprecedented levels, you know, the, you know, eight, it's 60 to 80 bucks a month or a week for almost a whole two months. Yeah. And then we really pulled back the reins in 22. And then we kind of went somewhere in the middle last year. Um, yeah, it's, it's interesting to me to see, to see what's going to happen. I, I think it's going to be kind of like last year. We kind of had to reset a little bit after the, the tumult of the, of the previous few years. So I feel like it's going to be a lot more in that range. And you also notice there there's, it seemed like last year there was somebody big ticket coming up from the minors, like every week. Three yeah. Straight. Yeah, it's exactly. One, it was big. one, one big guy a week. And I think that's what caused it. it if that doesn't happen this year, I think the spending won't quite be as high, but there was Bybee and Gavin Williams and every week there was a Bobby new Miller, guy. And, Bryce Miller, Mason. Yeah. Miller, so many yeah. Guys. So I they think a different week. <laughs> and the, and the person that was like just barely missed on Gavin Williams was going to go after the next guy because they were, you wanted him. So uh, I think, I think that won't quite happen the same way, but still you look at this pattern and it's roughly the same. And I think it will hold true in 2024 for sure. Kevin, do you have a, a budgeting plan as you approach fab? Absolutely. I'm pretty strict with a budget. Um, I, I take a, a chunk out of my thousand dollars that I'm reserving for my one or two big bids that I'll make throughout the season. Um, I, I, I like to budget between two and three hundred dollars. That's so I'm operating my week to week budget for my uh, uh, turning turnover of players on my roster. Uh, I'm going to base that off of uh, about seven hundred dollars in my budget. Obviously, we don't need a lot of money the last couple of weeks, but I want some. I want to be able to go two dollars on three or four players if I need them. So I'm I week by week it's and I start at both ends. I start at week one and I start at week 27. Right, week one I shouldn't need much money. I might have an injury. I might need to replace one player, so I'm not going to spend much week one. It's going to gradually go up throughout the heart of the season. You know, from mid May to to mid August, I want ab about forty dollars a week to to use to to turn my roster mm -hmm. uh, with that in reserve for a, a, a couple of bigger players throughout the year. One thing I agree with Todd, I don't think we're going to see the numbers and it, especially as spread out as they were the big bid players each and every week throughout the season that we saw last season. Uh, I think a, a lot of people are, can, are attributing that to the new rules 
and they obviously did affect it. But I think this still has more to do with 2020, right? There was no minor leagues in 2020. We only did a five round draft back then as well. I think this was a result of that. And we're probably going to go back to normal. And if everybody mm-hmm. thinks there's going to be players out there week in, week out, all season long, like last year, then maybe I want to use my reserve for my big bids early. Mm-hmm. Maybe those bids will be tempered a little bit. People are going to say, well, last year I could have waited a week and got Tanner Bybee instead of Gavin Williams, something something along those lines. Uh, but uh, I think so that might temper the big bids early this season. And I might consider, you know, using my reserve for, for my, my uh, big fab target throughout the season a little earlier this year than I typically do. Okay, Kevin, you don't need a, a a big amount early if you get a great draft grade like Toby gets. Uh, right. <laughs> I was gonna say like Fab. I don't. I don't even. Do, I don't even do Fab. I'm just like you want to know something. I just got an A on fin- yeah, fantasy right. pros, and I'm number one. So, so can, I don't need to use this waiver wire you guys are talking about. I don't even know what this is. You're really you guys, what is this Fab? You guys are talking about. Holy cow! Oh, I just do man. really good drafting. That's my strategy. So obviously, then you don't look at projections after the year or after the year starts. Tony, Absolutely right? not. No, nope. I just chalk up. I, I take the victories. I wait for my checks to arrive. Um, no. Um, yeah. Well, actually, I do. I do use projections uh, throughout the course of the uh, year. I use Rasball. Uh, Rudy puts together weekly projections on the NFBC timeline, so Monday through Thursday, Friday through Sunday. Um, you know, and so generally that that will influence like a little bit of the bids. But I think to Todd's point, like if somebody's on the waiver wire, they fall into a couple of categories. Number one, they're mediocre, right? Like they're mediocre or bad. And there's like not a lot of difference in the level of skill that they mm-hmm. actually possess. And so right. in a, those situations, it's the matchups that they have, whether it's the pitchers or the parks or wherever it is, that's really going to influence their value over the shorter term. And I think you can't really assume that those guys are going to be on your team for a long time. And so spending a large amount of fab on them doesn't really make sense. And then the other category is either like an injury or a minor leaguer who comes into play or a change in batting order where somebody who you maybe have a sense of what their skill is or there are projections or, you know, by feel or by by following them closely, like you determine that they have a higher skill level. And those are the guys that you want to bid higher I think um, I really like, um, you know, what with what both Kevin and, and Todd has, have said, um, you know, Todd's point about being a little bit ahead of where everybody else is or a little bit behind in your spending, I think is a really good point. Because I think last year I, I did spend big on Ellie De La Cruz and it worked out for some of my teams and for some of the teams it it wasn't what they needed at the time. Mm-hmm. But it was like I got so excited, I kind of went away from it. And I really felt like it hampered me down the stretch where mm-hmm. I lost like one or two leagues where I ended up finishing second or something. And like the reason why was because I didn't have that fab hammer or I didn't have the comfort level that I needed to be able to bid, you know, those small double digit bids versus those, lo- yeah. you know, high single digit bids, you know, those where every single dollar is really going to have an influence. And so, I think that's where I went wrong last year. And that's how I'll probably modify my approach a little bit is there's far too much risk and there's so little that's often known about the guys you're bidding a lot on fab on it's a crap shoot. And so if it's a crap shoot, I want to take seven $40 bid shots in that crap shoot versus right. one $400 bid right, in right. that crap shoot, you know? Um, Again, there are always going to be different players and, and, and exceptions to the rule, but generally that's what I'm going to try to minimize, like how the emotional impact of the hype train works, you know, and my enjoyment of the game, because it was fun as hell following Ellie last year. <laughs> uh, well, for some parts of the season, at least. Um, and so like, yeah, so I really think like being really judicious in how you think about it and saving, especially like, I think, it was um, uh, Anthony Jaldi, um, Kansas City Moose, in the chat who asked, like, how much do you save for September? In the past, I was very strict. Like, I'm going to have 75 bucks or $100 for that last month, which was generally a lot more than everybody else in the league would have. This year, I didn't follow that. And I really saw the impact that that had. Yeah. 
yeah. you know, in terms of the risks you take with two, two star pitchers or not being able to get, you know, the guys who come back from injury late on or, you know, those types of things. I, I'm glad you brought that in because I, I do feel like that's um, something that really merits mentioning. Uh, September, I feel like you got to have at least 40 to $60. Um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Maybe that's wishful thinking, but most of the leagues that I do well in, you, you need to, you're not, you're not running those leagues running away a lot of the time. And you need to have that little extra oomph. Like, you know, in 19, when I got my auction overall, it was my $4 Garrett Hampson that gave me two weeks of gold at the end of the year. And if I had three dollars left for the last two weeks i was f you know i, I wasn't going to have it and i might have might have lost that overall so it sometimes does come down to having those few extra dollars to not feel like you know you're at the not feel like you're at the auction table with with two dollars and you have to get two players and everybody's got a bunch of money um, todd do you, how much money do you like to have in september or is that something you focus on a lot yeah i mean i look at it and, and the budget i put together is does have sixty dollars left for the last four periods so i think mm -hmm. i'm pretty much in, in sync with what you're saying yeah. jake kevin is that something you worry about heavily yeah absolutely like like i said uh i want to be able to go two or three dollars on players the the last couple of weeks uh a, a little more than that as you get into september and what i noticed last season you know by by following that that plan Everybody else was out of money. Uh, in some of my leagues, by mid-August, I was getting mm -hmm. anybody I wanted. Right. Uh, well, Justin has one more question on the rundown. Do you want us to hit it, Justin, or you got to move on? Uh, if you guys can do it really, really quick. All right, let's let's blow through it. I'll start with uh, Todd. Are you when you're drafting? Are you playing to win the league, or are you planning <laughs> to go for the overall? Well, the overall is the dream, of course. So I think you play at the the best way you can up until, you know, June, July, August, maybe. And then if it's really not happening and you can figure out a way to just compete for the league, I, you would do it at that point. But I think you got to start out thinking that you have a shot if everything works well. So I would, I would say that uh, play for it until it gets taken away from you. I, I like that answer. Uh, Kevin, are you thinking more about the league or the overall? I agree with Todd. The only way I'm thinking about the overall early uh, is in drafting a balanced team, right? Yeah. Uh, to compete in an overall, we have we have to take that route, or it, it seems uh, historically that that needs to happen. Uh, and then throughout the season, I, I can adjust my plan. Uh, this is where you talked earlier, real quick, uh, about. Um, not punting a category. I never go into a draft or expecting to punt. But if you get to a point mid-season where you have no chance in the overall, but you have a better chance of winning the league by punting mm -hmm. a category, make embrace it. Go all <laughs> in on that punt. Don't still try to get a few and say maybe I can. Uh, if you're gonna punt, go all in. Yep, go hard at it, Toby. You you've had your share of uh, high finishes and overalls. Uh, when I'm gonna ask a slightly different question. When do you start pushing for that overall? What's, what's your general point of the season? Yeah. I mean, I think it, it depends on the season. Um, or I mean, it depends on the team, you know, like I had an OC that was like, I saw very clearly, like the ratios were super good and it was good from the get go. And I was like, Oh, okay, well, you know, uh, I'm going to go for the overall on this one. Cause I'm up like 20 points in the league. So you always have to just like, modify it it's a continuum of like how much am i up in the league versus the overall but i think exactly what kevin and todd said like i think you start off like i think you can need to get lucky to be in the competition for the overall so you build a you draft a balanced squad you go for the league and then if things work out right then you're in the overall chase um to the to the fab question earlier i think if i get an a plus on fantasy pros <laughs> then i don't leave any money at all on for september but if I there get an go. A, then I leave a couple of bucks. <laughs> yeah, don't then, even, you don't even log on thing. on Sunday night. No, <laughs> just forget about it. Boys, this has been amazing. Uh, thank you all for doing this. And thank you, Justin, for allowing us all to help contribute to your Potapalooza for Fantasy Cares. Um, let's just remind everybody where we can be found on, on Elon Musk's plaything and what we're doing. Toby, start with you. Uh, yeah, uh, at Batfoot Crazy is the place to reach me. Thanks, Jake, for um, hosting everything. Great to see you, Kevin and Todd. 
Um, and then Justin, thanks for all of your incredible work in pulling this off and so many other things you do for the community. Kevin. Appreciate it. Yes. Thank you again, Justin. Awesome hanging out with you guys. This is amazing. I'm at Hastings Kevin on Twitter, uh, co-host of On The Wire podcast Sunday mornings uh, with Adam Howe on the Pitcher List Podcast Network. And Todd. Yeah, I'm at FTN Fantasy. Uh, my article is a weekly article during the season. I'm at Telstar 7, and you can find the article. I tweeted it out uh, earlier today, so if you're looking for that and Thanks, Jake, for hosting. You did a great job. And Justin, you do do so much. Really appreciate it. Appreciate you guys. All right. Check me out on the High Stakes Heat with Dave whenever I don't fall asleep with my kids early and I actually record. Uh, you can find me at the Dust Mine on X, and I'll see everybody in Vegas. Uh, Kevin, are we going to see you there? I know we'll see the other two. Uh, yes. I oh, yeah. There. All right. The big flight. All right. Love it. All right, guys. Great job. I learned a lot, as always, listening to smarter people than me. But I'm going to unceremoniously boot you guys all out little by little. There we go. So that way we can bring in a new crew here in a minute. But before we do, remind everybody, we are raising money for Fantasy Curious today. Uh, so far, we have raised over $1,600. Uh, and I really appreciate everybody who's donating. Keep those donations coming in. Every dollar you donate gets you entered in to win a prize out of this massive prize. But we got a lot of really, really cool things. Jerseys, bobbleheads, subscriptions to uh, fantasy sites um, uh, around the industry, and even TGFBI entries into next year's TGFBI. Uh, one of the cool prizes we got is a subscription to Masters Ball by Todd Zola. Todd, how you doing, my friend? Am I on? Am I on? You are. I'm doing, I'm, I'm doing well. So I, I need to donate so I can get into the TGFBI. Is that it? I think you're already grandfathered in as a, a former champion and industry member. Uh, but why don't you remind everybody where you can be reached on uh, social media and then uh, talk about all you do and then talk about the prize you're giving away. So I'm on uh, I'm on the X at Todd Zola. Don't put a one there because then you'll be unhappy. At Todd Zola, uh, we're doing some work for ESPN, Rotowire, Masters Ball, Fantasy Index. Started today, back on Sirius XM, talking baseball again. Woo! So one to three, uh, e Eastern tomorrow. I'll be on with uh, Mr. Erickson. Going to break in a new co-host. Oh boy! Um, you know, I hope I hope he can figure it out. Yeah, I don't uh, know if he can keep up. Yeah, Jeff was the first one. He was on the NLB Network before it was a fantasy channel. He had the fantasy show. Uh, so I'm pretty sure he'll figure it out. Anyway, um, it's not about me. It's about the other guys. Are they around? They are. We're going to bring them in. We also have Via. How are you doing, my friend? Hey, what's up, Justin? What's up, Todd? Nice to uh, talk to you guys for our annual Potapalooza. But we're about to bring it to the Totapalooza. Yeah, we got, we got a couple Todds on the show today. Uh, Via, why don't you remind everybody where you can reach on social media, talk about what you do, uh, and then you're also giving away a prize. Yeah, so uh, most of the time you can find me in the, the leadership office at the high school that I work at, but in my free time, I am uh, trying to put out some content here and there for YGM Fantasy. Um, the idea of it was to kind of get um, youth involved more in fantasy sports. So I, I have a few physical products and um, I'm generally that that person around the hallways that's trying to uh, encourage more people to play fantasy baseball, other teachers, other staff members. So I'm, um, I'm kind of a walking encyclopedia and just uh, trying to get more people to, to watch more baseball and, and talk about the game. Hey, that's what we need, right? Bring more generations into our game. Keep it growing strong. So that way, when we're all gone, the game is still going strong. I love that. Sure. Uh, Joining us as well is another Todd. How you doing, Todd? I'm doing great. Thanks so much for having me. Absolutely. Remind everybody where you can reach the social media, talk about what you do, and you're giving away a prize as well. Absolutely. Uh, perfect segue from the last NFBC. I'll be giving a $50 best ball entry. So okay. hopefully that turns into much more than $50. Um, yes. And I recently have, in the last few months, joined with Fantrax. So thanks to Doug Anderson there for bringing me on and helping contribute some content as we wrap wrap up the draft kit and obviously into TGFBI. 
Awesome. Glad to have all you guys. Uh, you guys are going to be talking about on-base percentage league. So I'm going to be taking notes because I've got Tout Wars draft or Towers auction coming up in just a few weeks. And that is an on-base percentage league. So teach me something, guys. I'll be back in an hour. Dope. I'll be I'll be in that league with Justin this year. So looking forward to that. To that moving over from an L. So we're talking OBP, I guess, huh? Did you guys volunteer for this or did Justin just stick into it? Oh, uh, this was my top choice. Yeah, man, I, uh, I I threw this idea out there in the in the comment section as well. So I'm I'm looking forward to the the convo. All right, well, good to know. So it, it helps in, to to sort of frame some of the questions. All right, then why? Uh, we'll start with you, Villa. Why why did you volunteer for OBP? What's what's uh what was the what's the allure? Um, I I started playing fantasy baseball back in the the pen and paper days in in high school in the '90s, and then. Um, took a break but but the first league i joined for real for real was uh in the mid 2000s and it just happened to be an on-base percentage league uh 12 team head-to-head -head category league um daily move so there's a lot of action and um there's definitely uh, a learning curve when you're when you're newbie like that because the only stat that most people talked about back in the day was average but um it it quickly dawned on me that just focusing on on those things was um it, it wasn't capturing all of the skills that hitters are putting into, you know, their repertoire in terms of performance on the field and also what, what teams want out of their players. So for me, like um, using on-base percentage, it just represents a closer uh, aspect of, of the game of, of, of baseball. And also it just makes a lot more sense with plate appearances at, as the denominator and, in terms of trying to explain it to someone else who's watching the game, you know, when a bat gets really complicated pretty fast, when you take out this for an error or, or you know, hits batsman, no walks, all that kind of stuff. So I think just in terms of uh, trying to explain the game to someone else, on base percentage, pretty clean way of, of approaching the game. What about you, Todd? Yeah, absolutely. Many of the reasons that that John mentioned as well, uh, kind of a story behind this, a long time league that I've been in. You know, we had kind of a divided discussion for years, especially coming off the Barry Bonds, like 100 plus, you know, intentional walks. We stayed with the traditional average, and this was a head-to-head -head categories lead, league. The championship match came down to the last game on Sunday Night Baseball where Jim Tomey drew three walks, and all mm -hmm. that that player needed was either a hit, an RBI, or a run. And it was just so deflating after six months. So we switched, and we've never looked back, and – Pretty much the majority of the leagues I'm in that aren't NFBC are OVP. I, I also love it because it kind of diminishes those steals only guys. For for years, Billy Hamilton was just kind of that necessary evil. OVP leagues, it's not even worth rostering unless you're desperate for steals. So I love it. Evens the playing field and it elevates, as Billy mentioned, the actual true hitting skills. So when you're in your other leagues. Is OBP the only different category, or are you, have, are you switching up other categories to try to make it more real, if you will, realistic to real baseball? Yeah. You know, uh, in some of our kind of our pre conversation, it was mentioned OPS. We've been flirting with that and haven't yet, but we did replace home runs with total bases. That's a whole nother conversation. Uh, and well, as well as quality starts with wins, which I think is much more popular these days. But OBP in place of average. Billy, do you have any other categories? Other, we're going to talk mostly about OBP, but I'm just curious because yeah. if the reason being it makes it more realistic, maybe we change some other categories too. True. Yeah, I think I think obviously the in terms of other categories, a lot of people have saves plus holds is kind of the other thing that they try to flip in just to um, make the the fact that relief pitchers are more involved in in baseball games and that closers are um, in a sense just this seldom used uh player out every once in a while but no I, I haven't experienced other leagues you know the the thought of of if OVP is good maybe there's some other evolution in terms of fantasy sports um in, in terms of categories but i think uh you know in our uh, like mini pre-game back and forth email conversation you brought up the good point of like if you start involving ops then you have two different denominators that you're involving so that kind of makes things a little um, confusing in terms of uh, plate appearances and a bats gets a little weird. So I think um, 
I think five by five feels good. Six by six, I've never participated in a league like that. Um, but yeah, I think um, I think OBP is kind of the baseline, you know, and it would be nice to see maybe more more leagues like that on NFBC and other platforms to um, bring that element into the game. Well, the thing with OPS is it's not so much confusing with the analysis. It's 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 not a very well accepted stat, so it's hard. If you're gonna make people change, you're gonna you need to change it from a stat, a stat that they it's accepted more than mm -hmm. anything else. But uh, Todd, you mentioned quality starts. I'm a big uh, innings pitched replacing wins guy. That's that's what I believe mm. should be one of the next iterations. And in Tell Orders, on Tell Orders board, we have a league. You mentioned uh, Vela with saves plus hold. OBP, all of Tell Orders is OBP. But on the pitching side, we're going with wins over innings pitched. Or I'm sorry, innings pitched in lieu of wins and saves plus holds instead of saves. We're having that draft on Tuesday uh, for those that are interested. So – I'm not the kind. I'm not the guy that needs my fantasy to emulate baseball. Uh, mm -hmm. To me, it's a game within a game, and I want mm -hmm. the categories to represent. I mean, I believe OBP should be done, but I still want the categories to be a challenge. You know, I, I'm not going to get rid of steals. I know steals aren't 20 percent of a player's worth, but I think they need to be involved in the strategy sort of thing. So there's a mm -hmm. fine line between the the balance of relatable and fun and making it close. You know, once every team starts with $260 million and builds their team, then I'll, then we can talk. But right yeah. now that's not the way, that's not the way it is, but yeah, we're, we're not going to start adding in defense too. So like, you know, <laughs> like we're not, gonna, that's, that's like another realm if we're going to like, well, in, uh, the, yeah. in the early days, steals of the, at least this is the, the, the narrative that's been passed down. The reason steals is a category was as a proxy for defense. Hmm. So that's, I mean, that's the stories we've heard and, uh, you know, who, who am I to say otherwise? Uh, curious what you guys do to prepare for an OBP league. I mean, everything out there is five by five or points. What do you do to prepare for an OBP league that uh, uh, our listeners and watchers may find interesting? We'll start, well, this time we'll start with Todd. Yeah, sure. And, you know, what's interesting is over the years, I've actually – use my OBP research even for traditional leagues. I, I just find mm -hmm. that it's a great indicator of long uh, season long success, being able to just get on base more, score more runs, obviously. Um, with OBP format leagues, I actually look through and, and I've just published my top 500 rankings. So I look through uh, all of the hitters and what I like to compare and I kind of created this moniker, of the 100 club, those that have significantly higher OBPs than batting averages. And there's a large handful of players in every round of the draft that have 100 points or higher OVP than batting average. Players even like Andrew McCutcheon still last year. So those are the diamonds in the rough that I look for. And what I found, which is really interesting before this, I looked through some of the league history and there hasn't been a team that has had a below 340 on base percentage that's ever won. So I prioritize it in the drafts, even though last year the league average was 320 on base percentage, you have to go above and beyond. Mm -hmm. So for me, it's a huge emphasis. And I reflect that in my rankings that I do personal and, and published. Yeah, I'm in, in my leagues for it's an ESPN daily moves league. That's the one that um, I've done fairly well uh, performance wise um, for the last four or five years. I, I'm pretty much a grinder in the seasons, meaning like I'm just uh listening to many podcasts as possible listening to as many games as possible so just kind of soaking in a lot of content um I, I really love listening to games live the mlb at bat app is like it's so nice to just hop around between at bats and just get a sense as to um what each city is saying each city's announcers are saying about their team and, their, and like how things are going so it, um, i find that to be extremely helpful for in-season content preseason um i really uh, rely heavily on Tanner Bell's SGP, um, SGP, GP um, calculator to kind of help me organize things and, and um, give better context to players that have maybe not the best OBP, but contribute in other ways so that they're like, um, you know, matching out. So I, I, I heavily rely on that to, to guide me. And then um, I really like what to, uh, Todd is saying about this 100 club. So I think that's something I'm going to start investigating as well. 
Interesting. One now, caveat to that, oh, sorry, is there yeah. are some players that have below league average OVPs. Their batting averages are so low. Mm. <laughs> so those are the ones, obviously, to uh, to avoid. For sure. But, yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, whoever wins the Masters Ball subscription is going to get a site that provides OBP rankings. Mm. So, hey, there's a, a, little, a little perk. Uh, I guess it's more for Todd because it sounds like Villa, you've played in slightly different leagues. And you kind of alluded to this is what kind of made me think of this question. When you approach a draft or an auction, do you have a different strategy in OBP versus batting average because of the difference in the in the and I, the, the the kind of the, the way the, the the way the category plays. Do you have a different way of approaching a draft with OBP versus batting average? Yeah, absolutely. Especially in the auction leagues I'm in with OBP, like you have to get an at least one anchor, usually multiple. And I call anchors like the 400 plus OBPs, the Freddie Freeman, Shohei Otani, Sotos. Without them, it's just such a hard category. And I think that's what I like about OBP in general is the variance. Uh, it's supposed to a 240 to 280 batting range. You're looking at some teams that are yeah. 310 to up to 360 or even higher uh, team OVP. So those anchor players for me in the early rounds are an absolute pillar of roster construction. And then going to the late rounds, finding those kind of less exciting players that maybe can contribute one county category, but will solidify your OBP in like a corner infield, a middle infield position. I actually thought of a question for you, Bill, along these lines yeah. before we get to that, because uh, of the, the daily the daily approach. Now I forget what I was going to say. Um, well, I'll ask the question. It'll come back to me. I'll jump back to, to yeah. Todd in a second. You play in these day. You play in daily leagues mm -hmm. with OBP as a category. Yeah. So if you're if you're looking to make up OBP or whatever it is you're doing on your daily moves, what are some of the factors you look at when you set your lineup on a mm. daily basis for the fringe players that you're jumping in and out what do you look for when you're looking for an, to move an obp guy in um this this is a is a good question because i think um, when I first started playing the the way to stream or you in in some in this particular league you're capped at transactions per week so that helps okay. e even the field a little bit um and, and it's not in um it's not a free agent uh budget there's just seven moves per week um and used to stream pitchers more and so um, I think the strategy is starting to evolve in terms of uh, taking those, you know, the those random Mondays and Thursdays and considering um, how to get more at more plate appearances into the into the lineup. So I think um, I'm fortunate in this particular team, my keeper, I have Bryce Harper. Um, so that that helps, like, as uh, Todd is saying, have it. That's my anchor right there. So um fortunate there. And so that kind of allows me to just look for whatever category is needed. Usually not just a steel specialist, but um, just someone who's playing, playing that day is important, obviously, or maybe playing when other um, positions aren't, won't be filled during that week. And that, I think um, that's the aspect that, that carries over to my, the NFBC leagues. Cause I'm like, okay, I got um, Brandon Drury, and he's doing X, Y, Z in, in the CSPN league. Let me see. Can he apply to TGFBI or, or some other place? So um, that that's the the beauty of the daily league is because yeah. of the constant searching for players to fill gaps, whether it's it's a day off or um, plug in for certain categories. It always applies to to the season long or the weekly fab leagues. Um, I didn't realize it until you mentioned how prevalent in my daily OVP league streaming hitters are for getting that lift towards the mm. end of a, a week to week matchup. So like Lamont Wade Jr. last year, mm. um, he was my go to on Saturdays and Sundays just to get that extra edge. Wasn't going to provide a lot of counting stats, but helped me make sure I won that OVP category. Yeah, Dave, Davis Snyder last year, yep. like he was a, he was a joke in the last couple of weeks of, this, of the season, but like him, um, he didn't do anything except walk for long exactly. the longest time. He didn't have a single hit in September, I think. <laughs> So I remember I remember the point that was wanted to bring up Todd. Yeah. You you mentioned the, the 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 range of OBPs in your league. To me, that's a little bit odd because, or maybe it's not. The reason being OBP is more projectable, more stable than batting average, because walk rate is more projectable than the whims of Babbitt. So I find it a little odd that the range of batting average was higher in your league uh, of OBP 
I wonder if that's because people aren't in tune and don't know how to draft for OBP. I was, I was going to say that you know, I think you see it every year. Um, and even some of the, the tell what's going on right now, like that temptation to take a, a player that has a below league average OBP in the first or second round. Um, personally, I don't have Bobby Witt Jr. in the first round of an OBP league just because that risk. Uh, he could easily surpass, surpass that, but a below league average, it's hard to pass over a Bryce Harper or a 400 OBP. So the steals, uh, obviously chasing steals and sometimes chasing upside can lead people down that trap. And then there are just the, the people who have subpar performances. Look at Luis Robert Jr. the last few years, great counting stats, but his OBP continues to trend downwards. So they're not bad players by any means, but that missing out on those anchors definitely can put people into uh, players into a really tough position all year. When you guys are doing your draft because I the, the OBP leagues I play, I do this I think probably more in points leagues, but points leagues they're comparable to OBP because the same things that are good in points leagues, walks, etc., uh, are, are are strong points in OBP. Do you try to get a sense? if the rest of the room, how they're valuing OBP, so you then can know when to go after it, I can wait. I mean, do you, do you, or do you just, these are my numbers, these are the guys I'm drafting. Uh, uh, I, I'd say for me, I'd say for me, just, uh, I'm just, I'm just going to go for a OPP no matter what else is happening in the, in the particular draft room. I will say there was a dynasty OBP league and it's like, just grab whatever person's living, breathing and hitting like for that, for that particular league is uh, 30 teams, 50 players. Like, so uh, at that, in that particular sense, I'm just grabbing any player, but for the 12 team one, um, yeah, I'm just, I'm hitting the number. I think um, Todd said is 340, you know, the, the process um, did a an average of uh, 2023 Tout Wars, um, and I think a different in a main event league or something that had OPB, and that their average was um, 328. But the first place finisher had 343. So I'm I'm trying to hit 343, like for with yeah. every player, every starting player, I should say, with every starting player. Obviously, the bench could be different. But um, yeah, I want that. I want that number because it's going to fluctuate, especially in this week to week or uh, weekly category, head to head categories league where like, you know, some players are up, some players are down. Like I just I just want to hit that number for everybody. And it might take it in a little different direction, but with the dynasty leagues for OBP in particular, the prospect rankings are, are fascinating to me. And I actually mm -hmm. carry that into dynasty leagues that I'm in that don't use OBP. Players like Evan Carter last year went for me. Uh, they were like the 14th player off our, our draft last year. And I, I just look at that as an indicator, as we mentioned early on. Ability to hit and get on base, good things are going to happen. You're more likely to keep your job <laughs> or not be absolutely. sent down. I think yeah, so. Absolutely. I, I kind of I like that point is even a, a dynasty, a, a rankings tended to a dynasty league might be more applicable. Then are than not they're not because I think you, you know you're worried more about the not so much worried about the future but I think that has something to do with it there you're not going to get the guy sent down I yeah. I uh it, it, I guess maybe more so in an auction I do want to have a feel if I feel the rest of the room in a points league I care more about are they ranking them players properly relative to pitching versus hitting so I, I kind of want to get a feel for what how, how that is but in an OBP league I do want to have a feel for how the room is taking it now early on in tout wars it wasn't as much that maybe they weren't used to it at this point i think everybody knows that the is a is an obp draft and they made the adjustments so i don't know my first year in this auction league i don't think i'm going to find any inefficiencies to take care of i the, the room pretty much knows it but i think it does help and in keeping that in mind a viable strategy in batting averages i don't want to say punt it but don't focus on it because it is so variable. Mm -hmm. And if you take it into a ratio category and convert it to a counting stats category, it's the most tightly bunched category. So you can get lucky or unlucky within a very tight range. It's almost, I'm not, I'm going to pay for my counting stats, but I think you're right, Todd. In OBP, you, I don't think you can take that same chance. There's not as much variance. You can't shoot for the middle and hope you end up at the top just because of a couple lucky BABIP guys. It's not going to get you as far uh, in, in an OBP league. So I think you do need to 
draft for OBP more than you need to draft for batting average. I know there's people out there saying you need to draft for batting average in this day and age because then they can go and get your low stolen, your high stolen base low uh, average or high home run low average guys later. There's several different ways to to approach it, but I think OBP, I don't think you can punt it. No, it's so hard to find on the waiver wire. I feel like once a month, like a JP Crawford emerges who had that 380 OBP last year, but that's an anomaly, right? Usually you're chasing low end middle infielders that aren't going to crater your OBP and just get you some runs. Uh, to your question about kind of how to feel out an, an auction draft, the best suggestion I have is see what the value of Kyle Schwarber is in an yep. OBP no, draft because. You know what? The, he he may should be, be a top 40 hitter mm -hmm. in OVP league, and he's probably a 100 overall hitter in a, in a standard roto. I think he might be too obvious at this point, though. Sure. Maybe throw like a Logan or Hoppy out there, someone mm, who, yeah. you know, it, it, it has some pretty decent OVP, but it isn't so well known for it. Mm -hmm. I think that might be, a, a, you know, I think everybody knows Schwarbs goes up at this point. Yeah. Uh, and plus, he's coming off such a low batting average season. You may not get the right, the the, the same uh, the same read. Yeah. But um, I think that that I think that's interesting. Is there something you guys look for? I mean, in season, when a player's power goes up or runs go up, uh, there's there's much. Do you got, you know? Oh, wow, this guy's OBP is a lot a lot higher than I expect. What do you look at to see if it's real and I want him in my lineup, or if it's just you know, a, a week or two of drawing a couple walks against some pitchers that didn't have good control. Is there anything you look at in season? I mean, I think, I think a lot of, um, I don't know what platforms you guys use, but I think it's uh, platform dependent. Sometimes um, the information, the way it's presented um, I've, cause I use fan tracks, ESPN and uh, NFBC. Um, I'm getting a variety of ways that the the information is displayed on the player card or like on your roster lineups. And I think um, sometimes that can have a great effect in terms of um, looking at the last 15 or like just whatever presets they have. And I, I do use a lot of presets, but I'm, um, well, I guess what I'm building up to is that on ESPN, they have a player card that kind of pops up. And I love that it just has walks. Like you just kind of go through there and you can see how many zeros and ones and twos are, are filling up the box sheet um, for that particular player. And I, I tend to use that in terms of um, for walks or for how to select someone specifically for OBP. Yeah, you nailed it. I, I spent a lot of time looking at last seven, last 15 and last 30. And if the all, all three don't show that consistency, then it might be kind of a fluky thing. You know, they faced the Oakland Athletics pitching for a four-game series and then went to the Angels. Um, it, it's something I factor in particularly with the waiver wire on Sunday nights is just really looking at what's real and, and what's just the trend. I actually make, but I, if I were to ask the, answer the question, it's almost, I don't look to see whose OBP is popping, but if someone's sure. OBP is dropped. Oh, sure. A lot of times it's just because they're in a groove and they're hitting the ball mm -hmm. and they're not walking because they're putting the ball in play, hopefully in a good way. So I, I don't get if the guy's OBP drops, I'm not, I got to get him out of my lineup. Mm -hmm. I think I, I'm a little bit more patient. I want to know why it's, I mean, maybe he's chasing, maybe it's dropping because he's striking out more and he's not walking. But if it's because he's putting the ball in play, well, then I'm, you know, things are going to slow down and he's going to walk again. I think so. I think that's an interesting, uh, on a on a day you know in a in season basis but you guys did a lot of work yeah on players to take a look for in obp leagues mm -hmm. so we want to i think we have a little, little more than half the time left when justin pops on and and says we're out of here so let's uh let's let's, let's put the work that you hard to work you guys did to advantage and talk about some players that you guys look for or have are drafting and if we have them it's going to we have the, we don't know if we'll have the time, but there are two drafts going on now. Well, there's the Tout Wars draft and hold, and Labor just did their draft. So at least for the early players, we mm -hmm. get kind of an interesting interesting comparison of where some of these guys may have went. You know, where did Bobby Witt go in one draft versus the other, uh, for instance? So we'll let you guys talk. Uh, we'll keep it a little bit loose, and we as far you just want to make sure you guys name get to talk about all the players you want to talk about. So um, we'll start with we'll start with Villa this time and. Um, what are some players that you're finding that you are, I, I don't like to use the word target, 
mm, but you you are gravitating towards in some of your OBP endeavors. Um, right now, uh, if we're just talking loosely, like all levels, all the ADP ranges, um, the in terms of this fifteen team um, tout wars mixed mixed league, um, some people that are kind of like like catching my eye that I want to investigate more. I'm not saying like hundred percent recommend are right. our players in particular lineup spots that have shown um, getting on base skills in the past. So Shanuel right now, they, he's been named the, the number two hitter in front of trout. Um, so uh, if that sticks, his, um, his on base skills have been phenomenal so far. He's a unicorn. Say what? You, anybody who's looked at his, he's a unicorn. I mean, there's not many yeah. unicorns for batting average in contact. Yeah. It's just, it's just nuts. It looks yeah. like his numbers were made up. Yeah. Even, even good. He's a lefty and even he, he's even done well in limited uh, plate appearances against left-handed pitching. And then another one that isn't really so talked about, and he's just kind of averaging on, on base is LeMahieu. Right now he's, he's bleeding off in front of Soto and judge. If that sticks, that's, that's what the manager has said he's wanted to do. Um, and so that could be an amazing amount of runs and, uh, maybe he'll find some, uh, some, you know, other skills to, to return, not necessarily looking for power, but if you're just looking for on base and possibly runs, um, those are two people and they're going so late that like the, the draft cost is, is nice. Any early, any players, Todd, that you're, that you have, that you going through your research to, for this or whatever that are kind of sticking out to you? Yeah, absolutely. I, I think in the mid rounds, my go-to every year is Ian Happ. It's really not an exciting name on draft boards, but the consistency of on base plus decent power and being in a lineup that produces runs, small handful of steals. As I, I mentioned earlier, uh, savvy veterans that are often forgotten, like McCutcheon, they have a tremendous amount of value in OEP leagues. And then there are a really interesting dynamic compared to Roto, where usually filling those third definitely fourth and fifth outfielder spots in roto drafts is is pretty challenging there's a, a good abundance of outfielders for ovp leagues five outfielder leagues like uh Swinsky and uh, newt bar for instance is like a third outfielder that offer great uh, ovp as well as strong counting stats so outfield is deeper for sure in ovp leagues and that's exciting and that's where a lot of kind of these rare finds it, exist uh that can help create that 340 plus on base for a team yeah i'll say that um in terms of uh you todd heberg you uh you wrote an article and you put some like about this kind of mid-round risers for on base percentage and um i definitely note focused in on those outfielders because a lot of people when i listen to their podcast talking about how there's outfit dries up so in terms of on base percentage uh newt bar outman and Suwinski yeah. um, stood out kind of in those mid rounds, right? And um, the player that popped a little bit more than I would have thought is uh, is James Outman. Mm -hmm. um, so for him, um, he hasn't had uh, lower than a twelve uh, percent walk rate in his last four stops from Double A to to the major leagues. Um, four out of the last six months, um, or four out of the six months in twenty twenty three, he had above a three seventy six on base percentage. Um, he's not as bad against left-handed pitchers, um, as one would think in, in at least last year, he only sat, you know, like five to 10% of the time against them. So it wasn't a straight pl platoon or anything. And, um, right now he's listed to hit sixth, um, in the Dodgers lineup. So I, I, um, I personally don't like to draft a lot of Dodgers being a Giants fan, but, um, I might take a chance on, on Outman more than, um, I would have before. Yeah, absolutely love Outman. One other just addition, and that, that's such a great call out because his stock is rising in all leagues with the guarantee of, of at least a majority platoon role, but definitely in, in OBP in OBP leagues. But one other going really deep, like players that I target when I do want to have stashed uh, steel sources, and they can lead to great things sometimes. So one of my go tos over the years has been Tony Kemp. He uh, gives a really strong OBP and he can get you steals in bunches. He's not a consistent lineup play, but in those kind of points of either catching up or at the end of a week to head to head week. But last year, for example, Hassan King, Kim, he uh, 
wasn't hitting great at the beginning of the year, but he was delivering a good OBP and just enough counting stats in a strong lineup where he's worth stashing. And then he went off, uh, as we know, for steals, mm-hmm. for, for power. So there are steel source players. There's not as many uh, that do help uh, maintain your OBP or even improve it. You make an outman. If you were talking any other team, after you gave that whole OBP spiel, you were saying, yeah. and that can move them up in the order. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. But he moved up. He moved up from eight to six. That's as, yeah. high, that's, as high, yeah. that's as high as he's going, at least in that order. You mentioned Kemp. Kemp just signed with the India, uh, the Reds. Oh, no. And no. if there's any team you really don't want an infielder to sign <laughs> with, yeah, it's the Reds, right? But I think it's an NRA, uh, non, non-roster non invitee uh, for Cincinnati. But on the other hand, there's Jonathan India with the planner. Uh, Bassiitis is, is is acting up. So maybe they have Kemp be the role that Indy was going to fill a little bit of everything because Kemp also dabbles in the outfield. But he's the, you know, you know uh, Villa were talking, when you play the ESPN leagues, you know, no one's going to draft Tony Kemp because they didn't play. But if you get the lineups are out and you find he's playing on a Monday or playing on a Thursday, he's a perfect pickup. Mm-hmm. Well, not perfect, but I think those are the kind, you know, you can't get category, ignore those sort of guys. When he's in there for OB, you know, OVP, grab a steal. Those are the kind of guys that you need to look for. Um, mentioned, you talk a lot of outfielders. One of my, I don't know, pet peeves, not pet peeves, pet tricks. One of my things I like to do. I think you can get an edge at catcher in OVP leagues because I don't think people realize mm-hmm. that there's some catchers. Do you guys have any catchers that you like to look at? Is sort of your, because uh, you can you, any edge you can gain at the catcher position is huge because it's the catcher position. So, do you guys have catchers that you like to look at for OBP? Uh, uh, I mean, <laughs> I'll just say right. I mean, right now, if if I had to, um, I don't know how many two catcher OBP leagues are. I don't play in one like that, so I don't really know right. what that looks like but if i could i'd draft ivan herrera like that dude is balling out right now he had a, he had a really perform really well in the caribbean series and go check out his minor league stats he's like um even on walks and strikeouts um in triple a and so i um he's not going to play as much as you would want from a backup catcher with wilson Contreras there but haha <laughs> todd you you zola you'd shared um the stuff about hit by pitches and, and wilson Contreras is one of the leaders in hit by pitches which contributes to on-base percentage and who knows if there's some correlation between hit by hit pitch and um you know injury uh time or time on the injury list but like if ivan herrera got a bigger chunk of time and and he and he performs just like he did in this last uh caribbean series like that's someone i'd want definitely as a second catcher um, because he's got the power and the on base. I'm kind of bummed I left NL Tout Wars because he'd be perfect for the <laughs> 12, 12 team NL only two catchers. That's the guy yeah. I want. <laughs> uh, I want I want a kind of guy I want him. Uh Todd, do you have any any catchers on your secret list that look like pop and OBP that people may not realize? Yeah, uh, Rasmani Grindal is sort of the yep, was the the you know the centerpiece for this, but everybody knew. Is yeah. there someone that we maybe don't know pops an OBP? Yeah, that's a really interesting. The catcher landscape's changed so much. It's really kind of changed over the last two years for the majority of teams. So with this influx of prospects, that's where there have been a, kind of a resurgence of players like Bo Naylor that have a lot of appeal in mm-hmm. Dynasty or Keeper Leagues for OBP format. Um, the standout last year was William Contreras, the Brewers. And, you know, I've always kind of followed the, the Brewers catchy, catchers. They've had a consistent stream of catchers that's produced strong OBP. And uh, they Colorado Rockies as well. Mm. Um, Montero and, and Diaz, you know, they will get you a few home runs. Those are kind of nice. But when you've got most catchers being part-time players and you're not going to invest a top, you know, five or seven round pick in a catcher, at least you can solidify OBP and get any kind of bonus counting stats. Yeah, Contreras is one of those I was thinking of. Uh, Ohapi, yeah. who I mentioned. Yeah. Rushman, I mean, I don't like drafting early oh, catchers, absolutely. but in a, in, a, in a league like you play, Villa, with the daily moves, et cetera, yeah. I think you can grind your way to an edge at the other positions. I know in a 10-team, ten, ten one-catcher league, the rule of thumb is just draft the 10th catcher. Yeah. But I, I don't – especially if you get an edge – 
give me the edge of catcher. And then I'll grind my edge at the other positions. I don't know that you can grind an edge at catcher. Yeah, I don't. I don't think any of my, my league mates are going to be listening to this. I'm, I might share it out with them later. But um, the person I'm looking at is Wilson Contreras in terms of being um, like a solid on base percentage, but not a high draft cost like Rushman going in like the third or fourth round or something. Um, I did. I had William Contreras last year, and the number one reason why is because it it looked like he was going to be. Um, strong with on base percentage, and he was. It was great, great to have him on the team. Um, and so um, I haven't fully delved into exactly who I'd be targeting um, for this upcoming year, but um, Contreras, Wil Wilson Contreras is who I'm looking at. Um, and then I know Alejandro Kirk also gets props for being just kind of another like average, mm -hmm. but his playing time um, to me right now is up in the air. Um, like it, whoever him and Jansen, but it doesn't matter. Like for, for a team, for a league, like a 12 teams, um, one catcher, like sometimes it's okay. Hey, Kirk, just sit down, you know, man, it's okay. Take a day off. Like, let's keep the, the on-base percentage up for the rest of the, let's let, let's let Harper take care of it this today. So, um, like, I don't, I don't mind when my catcher sometimes take a break in, in that league. Yeah, so you guys <laughs> oh, sorry. Go ahead. Well, you're you're, you're uh, the panel. You talk. I'll, I'm just going to add on. Talking, I'll ask a question. <laughs> no problem. What you both said. So, looking at the the current Tout Warriors draft that's going on, Adley Rutschman was one of the biggest risers from compared to Labor. He was taken at pick forty, which was fifteen spots higher than where he was taken in, in Labor. So, definitely a, a player to target in the early rounds to solidify your catcher position for OVP. And then just kind of re reiterate, like for me, my target this year is Bo Naylor. Um, I think mm -hmm. he is possibly going to have that kind of Tristan Casas like breakout, maybe not with the same power, but definitely with OVP and contribution and, and counting stats. Well, Rutschman didn't quite make your 100 club. He went from 277 in a 374. So if you have a 97 close. club, yeah, that would be, but I mean, a 374 OVP is wonderful for anybody. Absolutely. You're getting at it a catcher. And what did that OBP did? It moved him to number one or two in the order. And now it's just over that many more, more at bats. Uh, so speaking about the, the hundred club, you guys had a few names in here. If you guys want to expound or if you bid, I think uh, Max Muncie is someone who isn't so attractive in a batting average league, but he's uh he's nice. He's nice uh, power source and OBP, right? Absolutely. And I would say, Justin Turner, uh, he's not bad in a batting average league, but he takes on a, a higher level of value for sure in on base. And those are two very similar players, in my opinion. So I'm looking at at, at Naylor, Bo Naylor, mm -hmm. to make sure I got Bo and not Josh. Yeah, I got Bo. Uh, he's a he's in the hundred point club. Yeah. All right. It was only well, I'll say well, it's 230 plate appearances, but to to your point, 237 average, 339 OBP. It's going to hurt in batting average. Who's this? We're, I think we're all hoping Naylor gets better too, that he has better numbers this year. But the, the, the 339 OBP, that's for a catcher. You absolutely get an edge, don't you? Absolutely. I should add uh, Will Smith. Yeah, he was yes. close to 100 as well, 359 OBP. So he's obviously but a rock in that position. Aren't you, are you concerned that he's going to not have anybody to drive in though? <laughs> yeah, just, just if there was any talent in that lineup at all. <laughs> yeah, it's just, it's just get lost in that. Oh man, it's just, it's just yeah. It, it must be good to be Will Smith, I think, at this point. Uh, and I think he's you know not off topic, but I think he's going to pick. I, I'm not. I don't think he's going to lose that many DH at bats because Otani has to rehab that elbow. Mm -hmm. He's not pitching, but he still needs to rehab to pitch next year. We're not going to see 158 games at DH for Shohei Otani. I don't think anyway. And I'm going to add a, another player just kind of talking about going deep, yeah. not a catcher, but I'm just looking at my kind of difference, uh, especially yeah. between o average and OVP. And number three in between Aaron Judge and Juan Soto is Ryan Noda. And yeah. he had a 135 point difference between OVP and his average. So again, there are finds deep in drafts that can, even if they're just fill ins for short periods of, of the season, if you have a slumping player like I did last year with Trey Turner who had a sub 300 OBP for much of the year, I was leaning on the Ryan Notice, the Levante Wades to help win the, that category each week. Yeah, I'll, I'll add um, kind of a, a mid-round bat that um, I, I hadn't really considered an on-base percentage um, pro. That's uh, Nate Lau. 
So for Texas uh, last year, he had 724 plate appearances. I, I guess, um, you know, like I, they have a very good uh, physical trainer down there with Simeon, him getting over 700 plate appearances. That's, that's, that's really impressive. So strong, strong 12% uh, percent walk rate, um, you know, an acceptable 22 to 25% K rate. Um, and his ADP, at least in average, like batting average leagues is around 200. Um, so I think, uh, I haven't seen where his name pops up in that Tout Wars draft, but like um, that's someone I hadn't considered before. Um, who may, his power may return? Who knows? We may, yeah, I don't think we've gotten quite that. I think they're around ten or eleven, maybe in the in the draft and hold. Um, a, a name that you guys have in the hundred club that I think because I'm I'm kind of I should be on him because he's on the Rays and I should know that Rays are good, but I get scared because of the platoon is Isaac Paredes mm. and. 250 to a 352, that's 102. He's he's well into that club. The power, maybe it comes down a bit, but now I'm thinking maybe in a in an OBP league, I'm not gonna downgrade him as much as I would for losing some power than in an OBP league because he still get that OBP as kind of a buffer. Any words? Definitely, definitely. Nothing, nothing on Paredes, yeah. huh? Well, I mean, 350 <laughs> is 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 yeah. phenomenal. You know, I, I'm not sure I'm the biggest believer in his, his just raw skills for power and and uh, RBI contributions, but he is in that class. Like, I look, you mentioned Josh Naylor before, too. Um, it's hard to find 100-plus RBIs with somebody who helps your OVP. So I think there is that, you know, round 10-ish range of players where you can also find some really strong counting stat contributors that lift your OVP. I hadn't considered Paredes either. Yeah, um... I think that the idea being there's, there's, there's somewhat of a, of a parachute in case the power doesn't come back, it's not a total bust. So sort of flipping and flipping the mindset around a little bit, we're talking about who to target for ODP, how to build up your ODP. You know, you got you got 14 hitters. At what? You're not considering OBP for every single pick or every single purchase in an auction. Are there certain players who? Maybe because they are going to get downgraded in an OBP league, you say, you know what? I got OBP. I can get this guy at a bit of a discount because the rest of the rooms. So, like, I'm thinking Bobby Witt is an example. Are there other examples of that ilk that you guys like to have in your back pocket? Because I got enough OBP, then I can afford this guy. Todd, why don't you take it away? <laughs> yeah. I, I... A perfect example, I had uh, Soto, Freeman, and Betts last year that I acquired in, in an auction. And it allowed me to go make a move to get C.J. Abrams by low. And yes, he barely clipped 300 OBP, but I, I desperately needed those steals and, and just the run con contributions. So that was an example of having those anchors. I had three anchors. My OBP was over 350 at the time, and I could have the flexibility to not go backwards in that that critical category, but gain in other categories. And you knew Abrams was going to steal like 50 bases, right? I didn't, but I, I'm glad <laughs> he did. But what's interesting about him and why I've ranked him outside of top 50 hitters in an OVP league going into this season is the last month when I was in a dead heat, I benched him. I, I just like I couldn't lose ground in OVP because okay. he was like a 270 OVP the last month of the season. So that's the risk that we run with the uh, – and I'm going to say the name, L.A. De La Cruz and, and C.J. Abrams out there in an OBP league is that uh, batting average plus the inability to walk uh, negative um, impact that they've displayed is really detrimental. Yeah, I'll say um, I haven't drafted yet, so I, I, I'm actually glad we have some um, this uh, this OBP draft to kind of like look at. And I'm not this isn't really criticism of anybody's particular um, draft tactics, but um the people in tout wars like if they were considering obp some of them are some of the teams aren't showing it that that it's much of a concern and they are going after certain uh players all on the same team so uh one of the teams has bobby witt and that's their on base percentage anchor for their team because follow they follow that up with uh adelise garcia royce lewis and c cj cj abrams who are all projected for under 320 on base. So um, they're seeking an, an edge in, in steals. 
um, which as we all know from last year, like that you had to be close to 180 to 200 to finish top three. Um, so like they're, they're trying to jump way out in front in that and for this particular league, but like they're kind of throwing on base percentage out the window in a sense. Yeah. In a standalone league, in a standalone <laughs> league, that can be done. You know, you can win a standalone league by punting a category. Mm -hmm. And maybe this, I know I maybe this is a good person to get on Sirius XM when I do it, ask him if this was a, a plan. Uh, but I can see that as a strategy. Take because all these guys are gonna be a little bit cheaper. And you can build a team and try to punt OBP and see what see what ends up happening in a especially in a draft and hold scenario. That that's uh, something ah, good. Good point. I I didn't notice that. I'm going to take a look. I haven't really looked at the um, and actually now that I see who did that, <laughs> um, and I know very statistically driven. The, the board's publicly available. It's not. It's, okay. it's Anthony Perry from Fantastics. And you know that very number driven, very program driven. I suspect that's by design because mm -hmm. uh, that they've got a program that'll pump up the OBP guys. Mm. So I, I gotta get Anthony, I gotta get Anthony on. If Anthony, if um, you're listening, <laughs> yeah, I'll just say that um, I did just some very minor research. This isn't anything um, you know like heavily based in too much, but. Rounds one through seven. So I, I use I use the bad X for pretty much all my hitter projections. Um, so that's kind of what I'm basing these numbers on. And, and remember, the number we're trying to hit is around 340, 343 is right. like to get us to first place, right? So rounds one through seven, all the hitters averaged about 343, with the max being Acuna at 413. Rounds eight through 18, um, the average was about 319, with the max the max out there being 370, Yandy Diaz. But so past that, 18 through 30, if you didn't get your on-base percentage, you know, targets um, by then, then you're there's a handful here and there. But like the the main crop averages three three oh six, and with the max being um, Brandon Donovan at 346. So um, like he's, you're you're taking a chance if you don't get those anchors early on that um, to to kind of buoy whatever is gonna you know, be the rest of your, form the rest of your team. Yeah, I'm looking at the Tout Wars draft. I'm looking at Freddie Freeman and one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eighth. And I'm thinking, Freddie Freeman in an OBP league eighth? Right. Sign me up. Yeah. Then I'm thinking, okay, well, if you, who, who should he have gone in front of in the first pick? Well, Acuna, Soto, Judge, Mookie Betts. Eh, the OBP isn't as good as it was, but it's mm -hmm. not bad. Uh, Julio Rodriguez, I think you can make an argument that mm -hmm. maybe in an OBP league you drop him a little bit. Corbin Carroll, I think you can make a general I mean, So I can see moving Freeman up a little bit, but you know, you're right. You, the the better players, and this is almost an, kind of a not so much excuse, but reason for OBP leagues why we should switch to him is the better players and the first round players are just naturally good at OBP because they're good at baseball. Mm -hmm. And it's just a better reflection of, uh, of of what what they can do and make your league reflect it a little bit. Kyle Tucker down at eleven. He's my batting average guy, <laughs> but I, he drop drops a little bit in an OBP league. Um, I can can sort of see that, but I like the idea that you're talking about. Kyle Schwarber went in the second. You know, so people know, and then and then Adley Adley Rushman went in the third. And you guys have talked about Nolan Jones in the in our notes is about an OB, a sneaky OBP guy. So uh, Jorge Montanez, who drafted a pitcher first, and St Spencer Strider, went with three OBP guys: Schwarber, Rutschman, and Jones. To me, that's he sat down and thought about that, right? That what that that that's by design. I would. Yeah, I think yeah. Um, uh, I'll just say that um, in terms of like trying to capture to gain back, to scratch back at some of that, that yeah. loss that may come from um, taking um, the, the riskier on base percentage people, you, you know, you do have shots. And I think, I think you can, um, you can get it back. Like uh, uh, there's a big question mark with Jung Hu Lee in terms of like what his on-field performance is, but um, uh, having spent a lot of time at um, AT&T, like there is, there's a lot of room for him to to slap that ball around, and also supposedly he has a really good eye. So I'm I'm looking forward to seeing what he uh, brings, and that that's coming in like round 17, 18. So um, 
there is chances out there if, if you do take LED Dela Cruz or you know um, who like some of the people you just mentioned in terms of the, the detractors, but like, but yeah, you really I think you do really have to map it out. No, for sure. Um, you mentioned Lee. I seven percent strikeout rate, eight percent walk rate for his career, and he's been walking more lately. I know he's a little bit dinged up right now. Those. You don't that hasn't that's that doesn't have to translate linearly. I mean, he's got some wiggle room, Lee does. Uh if he hits a home run, it's an inside the parker to triples alley, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, I don't know how many home runs he'll be hitting, no. but that's uh that's that's interesting. He's um Lusuk goes uh brother in law. So that's oh, wow. kind of new, new denizens of the <laughs> new denizens of the uh I'm kind of quoting from a piece I just wrote for ESPN, but whatever. Do the research, got to uh put it out there somewhere. I'm sure Justin's going to pop in uh, to let us wrap it up. Anything that you did your research on that you want to get out there so it doesn't go to waste? Names you want to bring up real quick? Yeah, well, maybe two quick things. So we talked about Bobby Witt. We talked about some younger players that are going in early rounds and how they are kind of at that fringe level of, you know, league average LVP. At the same point, it's, it's really tricky with young players that are developing. And I, I went through this long time ago, having Bryce Harper come up through the minor leagues and not a great OBP as a prospect. And now he's a machine. He's an anchor. So looking at Bobby Witt today, it is a risky pick in the first rounds when you're in an OBP league. Doesn't mean he can't take that leap. So that's the, the tricky part of it, right? And, and you mentioned the focus that the Royals have in their development on OBP. So that's the extra research that goes into it. And, you know, I, I just think it, it's fun for me. That's, that's what it's about is, is making it fun and, and making it where the last week of the season in the championship, you're excited if a player gets a walk because that's going to help you win the championship. It doesn't take away from the ability. Yeah. I'll add um, a couple of random. These are super random out there, but um, they're, uh, park factor. So some other things that can contribute to on-base percentage is just having more opportunities to put the ball in the play. So Toronto losing, it's losing foul territory. So there'll be less chance for a foul ball to get caught in certain parts of the park because they're, they're um, re renovating the lower bowl seating. Um, that's one thing to note. And then Houston, uh, apparently players complained a lot about the batter's eye. Um, so they've extended it. So for whatever it's worth, those two things could be factors of uh, park renovations. Um, and I'm also, I'm, I'm curious, I'm not so good about speaking on it yet, but like managerial changes, GM changes, president of baseball operation changes. There are eight teams that got new managers um, or seven or eight teams that got new managers. So th those things may factor into uh, team strategy, whether they, I don't know, give the sign to bunt or hit whatever. I don't even know if teams do that anymore. Yeah, we can't go a whole OBP podcast and not mention Moneyball, right? So that's yeah. a perfect example of a new approach in the front office. All right, guys. Uh, thank you so much for uh, coming on and uh, delivering some great knowledge on on-base percentage leagues. Really, really appreciate it. Before I uh, boot you guys out unceremoniously, I want to give yourself or give yourselves an opportunity to uh, promote yourselves and uh, remind people where you can reach on social media. So uh todd zola why don't we start with you first all right todd zola social media i'm still on x i don't know why but i am uh rotowire espn uh series six and fantasy i'm doing some work with fantasy index this year um if you're at first pitch next weekend i'll see you you're in new york city and tout wars in a couple weeks i'll see you there um and if these guys did the heavy lifting let's let them go for it yeah via why don't you uh tell us where you reached and uh talk about what you do Hey, um, I'm via. Um, if someone shows me a better platform right now to talk about fantasy baseball and baseball than X, like it's the easiest, best way to get the information out there. Um, so, like, I don't know what other way we would be able to communicate. Um, but yes, yeah, so I'll be there. YGM Fantasy. Um, the prize that I'll be giving away is this uh, fantasy journal. It's based off of things I heard in podcast. Um, Rob DiPietro and a few other people. I think Jenny Butler. They talked about how they did a a, a journal for their free agency and they just jotted down some notes. So I'll be sending this to somebody. Um, you can buy one on Amazon. Um, I, like I said, my big thing is just getting younger people into uh, to the sport. And I, I see like you all are very good at talking about players um, and websites are really good at hosting leagues, but there's no really, there's not really anybody talking about how to get people to um, speed up their process for 
um, all the different things that they can use to to be solid fantasy baseball players. So that's kind of where I fit in. I have a, a book here that kind of talks about how to do that. And then also a, a, I'm very dig or analog. So I like to write a lot of things down. So I have a planner that I call the fantasy baseball planner also on, on Amazon as well. So go, go check that out. YG, uh, YGM fantasy on X Twitter. And uh, I, I got your planner last year and used it for a couple of my leagues. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, highly, highly recommend it. It's very affordable and uh, it's useful, man. It, it definitely helped keep me. Please organized. provide feedback. Uh, any feedback right. you want to give me, send me an, an email. I love it. Thank there you. we go. Uh, and Todd finishes out. Yeah, real quick, a few things. Uh, first of all, it's an honor to, to chat baseball, OBP leagues with all of you, uh, brilliant minds. You can find my writing at fantraxhq.com. I have my top 500 OBP ranks there, as well as recently published just this week. Players to target, we talked about several today. You can also find links to those on my Twitter X account. Uh, but before we go, uh, Justin, I have to tell you, you've given me one of my favorite laugh out loud in public. Everyone looks at me awkwardly moments in a podcast that you and Paul did where you did play by play of him chasing a bird around his house. <laughs> it was iconic. So it, it may be a, the a highlight subway. of my podcasting career. Yes. Yeah, it was, it was a lot of fun. <laughs> so just so you know, people were listening like myself laughing for probably a half hour straight. So thanks for the uh, opportunity today. Highly appreciate that. Thank you guys so much. Yeah, that, that is probably the highlight of my podcasting career. I'm putting you guys out unceremoniously. I appreciate those guys coming in, uh, dropping some knowledge. We've got another panel coming up here in a few seconds, but want to remind everybody that we are raising money today for Fantasy Care. It's a fantastic organization that uh, donates uh, toys and toys for touch drives all around the country, among other charitable things that they do. Every dollar you donate will go to them, and it'll get you a raffle ticket in to win amazing prizes, including jerseys, bobbleheads, uh, baseball cards, and subscriptions to amazing sites, among other things. So keep on donating and we're going to turn it over to a new panel right now uh that are going to be talking sleepers uh we all love some good sleepers we're going to be talking starting pitching sleepers we have joe rico how you doing my friend hey i'm doing well man how you been i'm doing all right hanging in there i've been i'm doing this all sick and uh I'm going to be passing out uh, shortly after this. Well, not shortly after this. After this, I'm taking my kid to a father-daughter dance, and then I will be passing out. That's so, nice. <laughs> yeah. That sounds nice, though. Uh, why don't you remind everybody where you reach on social media, talk about all you do, and I believe you're giving away a prize as well, correct? Yeah, I'm giving away one of our fantasy passes at Sports Ethos, which is where I reside. You can find my podcast wherever you get your podcasts, uh, Fantasy MLB Today. We get a lot of guests on. Justin has been on many, many times. And our next big kind of thing I should be plugging is I'm going to be doing my Tout Wars draft live on Tuesday with John Legaza. He's also drafting in that league. Um, we're picking a couple spots apart, so that'll be a lot of fun. Head over to our YouTube channel, Sports Ethos on YouTube, and make sure you're checking out everything we have at the website. Our draft guide is coming out on Monday. It's going to be a, a launch. Not everything, but uh, we're going to slowly get everything out over the next couple of weeks to get everybody ready for the season. So make sure you're checking us out over there. And on social media, as you see on the screen there, uh, Joe Rico 99 There you go. Uh, also joining us is Pierre. How you doing, my friend? Good. Thanks again for having me. Uh, Potapalooza and of course TG FBI. Um, I will say this because always excited this time of year to be in the league and do the podcast, but I have to ask uh, legitimately, there's some sort of beef here because I was really excited to get into the TG FBI again until I saw that I'm in the group of death. Uh, oh. I think it's pretty safe to say. Uh, I mean, look, all these leagues are competitive, right? They're all yeah. filled, but you know, I see okay, Nick Pollock. Pitcher list. He was on earlier today, right? All right, tough. And Ryan Bloomfield, Ray Murphy. I'm like, okay, these are the guys whose books I buy and websites I go to to do my research. And now I'm I'm going up against them. So uh, I guess thank you. I'll I'll take it as a compliment. I guess I'm getting a lot of complaints about that league in particular. Um, uh, unfortunately for you guys, uh, I used to be able NFBC used to allow me to kind of put the people in leagues and stuff. Uh, and now it's just a random draw. So, uh, you know, what? You, you know, if you believe in God or the universe or karma, talk to that person or B 
being or thing uh, because I had nothing to do with it this year. Gotcha. <laughs> All right. Joining uh, us uh, is oh go oh sorry Pierre. Want to remind everybody where you reach on social media and plug everything you got going on. Yeah, let's see. All that doesn't the random draw thing doesn't fit my conspiracy theory, so I'm going to ignore mm -hmm. that. I'm just going to assume it was a yeah a compliment. I um, also know where Jimmy Hoffman is buried. For the for my only gig right now for fantasy is fantasy endgame. It's a YouTube channel. Uh, so video, no more, no more writing, no more editing. So fantasy endgame MLB just celebrated our one year anniversary. It just started before last year. Been doing fantasy football on YouTube for a couple years, but now fantasy endgame has MLB. So get to focus more on baseball this preseason. Very excited to do that and dive into it. All right, and joining us again is Jason Collette, uh, who is joining us again because we had a couple people who were supposed to be on this panel, and unfortunately, uh, they uh, got sick today and so and weren't able to uh, make it. So Jason's kind of pinch hitting uh, for his second panel of the day, and he'll be on his third panel uh, tomorrow. Jason, how are you doing again? Yeah, I'm a spot starter today. Uh, you know, somebody came down sick. It's funny that Pierre was complaining about leagues because when I got my league assignment, I was like, Good God, Justin, you stuck me in a league with Pierre. I mean, how am I supposed to win? <laughs> and, yeah. So, yeah I, I did I did send my own complaint, Pierre. I was like, because uh, I thought Justin still had control. So today I learned that it's all random assignment, and he just put me against pretty much people I play against on everything else. But at least I got the first pick. So I can, I've already got Acuna auto drafted. So I don't get the whole Novelli Marte thing going. Uh, but I've already got Acuna auto drafted. So the draft can start uh, Monday without me uh yep. and i'll just come back to pick some other time during the day when it gets back to me there you go see yeah. at least you got a bunch of active people in your leagues though because you know you won't have to wait as long as maybe some other leagues will that's true in order to my make league was one of the quickest last year you had one of the slowest yeah yeah i, I had a pretty slow league all right well i'm going to turn this over to joe to lead uh this sleeper panel and uh, I'm going to maybe go catch some sleep myself, or I'll probably just listen while I do pitching projections. Uh, so I'll see <laughs> you guys in Starbucks an hour. Run? No more bougie Starbucks runs? Come on. No, I, I got my energy drink, and I'm ready to go. <laughs> All right. Thank you, Justin. Reminder to everybody to be donating. Make sure you guys are doing what you can. Um, subscribe, or sharing the video out, doing anything you can. If you're not able to actually donate, then um, just get the word out there that we are holding this. Justin is also doing this tomorrow the entire day. Uh, so make sure you guys are helping out if you can. We're going to be talking starting pitcher sleepers. It's one of my favorite subjects. I love pitching. Why don't we start with Jason? Why don't you give us your first starting pitcher sleeper here? We're probably going to go through about four a piece. All right. Um, so... I've looked at this a couple of times over the course of the off season. Um, and the one guy I keep trying, I keep coming back to in my, uh, in the work that I had done was in Miami, all the attention been with been over at Yuri Perez and rightly so. And I understand it. Uh, but when I looked at Miami, I can't help but look at Edward Cabrera. I mean, for me, it's a one skill away guy. I know it. I know the skill is a big one. He has to throw strikes and I completely understand that, but there's so much other goodness there and if just one more thing can come along and i'm not asking him to be like this efficient strike thrower but come from the four uh, percent walk rate fourth percentile and just get it close to league average and i think there could be a lot of magic in there uh you know his market price uh, is is where it is because of those walks but if he shows some improvement then it could come way up uh, and like i said i know yuri price has got the better stuff i'm not saying edward cabrera is there but at the price, I'm very intrigued uh, on where uh, what Edward Cabrera can do if he can throw more strikes this year. Yeah, his price is very low, 287 right now. I'm just looking at uh, draft champions in the month of February. He's not even being drafted uh, in the Roto Wire. Oh, no, he is being drafted. Sorry, 277 uh, in 12 team leagues as well. So the price is very low. Um, I thought he was kind of like a Dylan Cease type last year. He was one of my most rostered players. I thought he could be like a 30 and 10 type of guy in terms of strikeout mm -hmm. and walk rate. And B, you know, this was my thought going into last year that he could potentially be a Cy Young kind of finalist. That obviously didn't happen. But to your point, if he's able to get that walk rate even down to 9%, I think 9, even 10%, I think we could get by if he's able to get that strikeout rate or maintain it around that 27, 28% range. Uh, I love Edric Cabrera. Those supporting metrics are still really good, despite the fact that on the surface it has been kind of rough. Pierre, do you have any thoughts on Cabrera? 
Oh, well, as a long-suffering Marlins fan, I'm very aware of Cabrera's upside and the fact that he'll probably break out just as soon as they trade him uh, because that's what happens with Marlins pitchers. He actually has been rumored, uh, as most Marlins pitchers at some point are, to be traded. He's a guy I feel like they might kind of package. Uh, you know, Luzardo is a guy that, of course, for the right price, they might move. I would be glad to get Bobby Witt Jr. for Jesus Luzardo. I guess that's not happening, but um anyways yeah cabrera i think is gonna really have to show that he does take that that step forward um but i will say that there's another guy if uh if i go over my sleeper i'm, I'm still in miami that you know there's always pitchers that turn out you know to be good values there and they, they kind of take a step forward look at the guy who already broke out a couple of years ago and everybody is kind of out on this trevor rogers and, uh, you know, he was an all-star back in 21. And then, of course, when everybody was all in on the next year, wound up tanking a lot of teams because the ERA more than doubled. And, uh, you know, I really was interested. I dug into it because last year we can just forget about him because obviously he was hurt. Um, but what's interesting is he only made four starts last year, but it, he's not coming off Tommy John. It wasn't anything you would think would be like a season ender, but it's like every time he was on rehab, he, he just was another setback and he just couldn't make it back. You know, I even stashed him, I think in TGFBI at one point, cause I thought he would make it back, uh, you know, August or something. It just, it didn't happen. So he should be right this year. He should have a rotation spot. Um, so the main thing here is, I was interested to find out when I really dug into what happened right in 22, he didn't see a velocity drop. Uh, and he does have one of those kind of uh, calling card uh, trademarks. Things you look for is he's got a good fastball uh, not a lead velocity, but it's good enough. He just couldn't locate it. Right. And so I think this is somebody who is very capable of getting back to where he was. It's crazy. His four seamer went from plus 16 run value in 2021 according to Statcast, to minus 11 the next year i don't know any pitches that make that big a drop from year to year and it wasn't because of an injury that year it wasn't because of a velocity drop so it's like what's going on here i was i think that with the time off if he's healthy he could get right so he's a guy who's going like cabrera basically free i mean mine is definitely always a good place to look for cheap pitching yeah, I love I love Miami. And just to quickly touch back on Cabrera, there was a rumor last week or a couple weeks ago that he might be traded to the Pirates, which I would not like him in that scenario. There was some talk. I don't know how legitimate it is. Who knows anymore with what you see on Twitter, what's real and what's not. Um, but that was something that was going around. I wouldn't love that because Miami is still, I think, a pitching factory. I, there were some people who kind of pushed back on that. I did, I did say something about how I wouldn't love it if he was traded to Pittsburgh. And people were saying, well, Miami's not the, the pitching factory it was. But I, I still think when you look at their recent body of work, there's a lot to really, really like there. Um, my sleeper is the first one is kind of depending on the word sleeper, how you want to use it, because it it gets misused. I don't really even know how the hell we're defining it anymore. But I went with Zach Eflin as my first one because I think that he is somebody who can very easily return a top 10 starting pitcher season. We just saw it from him last year. And now, according to Fantasy Pros, the early consensus rankings, he's the 21st starting pitcher. And if you're looking at drafts, he's about the 25th or so on NFBC leagues. It's Everybody's just worried about the health. Everybody's worried about if he can stay healthy or not. He just threw almost 180 innings last year, and there's no real indication that he can't do that again. Um, I, I don't really have the concerns that a lot of people do. And the way that I'm using sleeper here is that I just think that he's maybe 30 or 40, maybe even 50 picks undervalued. Um, even though he's going about pick 90, 95, we just saw him return a top 25 fantasy season last year. And I don't think the concern is warranted to the degree that people are are worrying about him. Now, he's getting a little bit more expensive as starting pitchers will. But I still think the price is really, really good. You can get them as your SP2 or even your SP3, and, and you might be getting into an SP1. Am I, am I crazy? Am I crazy on the Zach Eflin front here, Jason? Uh, no, I, I, I understand the, the issue with trying to talk about what is a sleeper. It used to be like, oh, nobody's talking about this guy. But everybody's talking about everybody. But like you said, if there is a who, you know, if you feel this pitcher is worth X and the market is saying it's worth Y, 
they are like, okay, great. I love this guy and the market doesn't. So I can wait just a little bit, or maybe like, uh, Eflin was somebody that I bought in labor last year, in nail labor last year. And I only had to pay $9 to get him on my roster. That was tremendous because I got a, I doubled that return on investment uh, with what he was able to do. And I really liked him team aside. Yeah. He pitched for my favorite team. Didn't matter. I liked it. Uh, and with the track record of Kyle Snyder, that's what I wanted to go for. So I'd like looking for those opportunities where, I think there's either a little more to this picture or there's something under the surface that has not surfaced in the, uh, in the conversation. And so early on you see that and the deeper we get in the spring, the tougher it is to pull those things off. Uh, I want to say, yeah, I, I drafted Eflin at $9 in labor. And then two weeks later in tout same pitching categories, I want to say it cost five more dollars. Uh, so it, to kind of move the needle up a little bit, but early on here as, as you know, TGFBI starts Monday, you're still going to be able to pick up some of these bargains. Whereas we get to mid March, no more bargains. In terms of the Eflin analysis, do you think that he can return uh, the same kind of value as last season? Or was that just, you know, a crazy peak that he's never going to hit again? Uh, I'm concerned about the degradation of infield defense uh, with Franco vacating shortstop. He was excellent at shortstop. Uh, we don't know who's going to be the opening day shortstop. Uh, Taylor Walls will be back in the fold at some point, but there's going to be a loss of infield defense, and that could come back to bite Eflin a little bit. You should bake that into your uh, into your expectations for him because the defense won't be as good. I mean, Wander, if, if he had stayed around all year, there's a good chance he could have won the gold glove at shortstop. He was playing that well until his head got in the way of being a decent person. Yeah. Oh, what a moron. Uh, anyhow, go ahead. <laughs> Pierre, you have any thoughts on uh, on Zach Eflin? Am I, uh, am I crazy to think he could be another uh, top 10 starting pitcher season from him? No, definitely. You know, he's a guy I remember back in Philadelphia. I feel like he had uneven results. Like he would have nice stretches and then he would get hit hard sometimes. But like the underlying stats always looked really promising. It felt like he was always ready kind of to unlock that next level. And then injuries, of course, too. So, I mean, yeah, going to Tampa is, is never a bad thing for a pitcher. So I feel like, uh, yeah, he's a guy that probably, you know, in TGFBI, more industry leagues or more savvy leagues, you're probably not getting a discount on him. But I feel like he's definitely somebody who, you know, in your more casual league or, you know, somebody might not be on him. He's not a big name, but you take him as like your number two starting pitcher and be like, really? Okay. And he could absolutely deliver, you know, way over uh, wherever he's being drafted. Yeah, you're not seeing discounts anymore. I think he went in the fourth round uh, of a DC recently where I saw a draft board. He's not cheap anymore uh, where he might have been if you were drafting early in the season. Um, Jason, let's go back to you for another starting pitcher sleeper. We were staying in Florida for all of our first ones. We leave in Florida. Or are we sticking around in Florida here? <laughs> uh, let's leave Florida. Let's go up the coast to go to Philadelphia. I am uh, really high on Christopher Sanchez this year. Uh so is my dog apparently, or one of my dogs here. So it's with, with Sanchez, you know, it, Ryan Bloomfield's often put, puts this question out there for everybody. Like, Hey, who is a, who is a player that can make the jump out of the 12th round? So 13th round beyond who can make the jump from there to the first round? Because every single year, one guy does it. No, there's never two guys, but there's always at least one guy. There's always at least there is one guy. Uh, the first year, it, and this has been since 2014 or 15, Dallas Keuchel was that guy. Uh, there's only been two pitchers to do it. Dallas Keuchel and uh, Blake Snell in 2018 when he won the Cy Young uh, the first time. That's it. There's been the only two pitchers. Everybody else has been hitters. And so this year I'd looked at a hitter or a pitcher. The hitter I thought was Tyler O'Neill. We've seen the tools, but the pitcher I'm trying to look through, okay, who's down there. And Sanchez just really stood out to me as a guy that's currently in, in the 222 30 range, at least when I made this call a couple of weeks ago. And it, he probably moved up a little bit uh, in the marketplace, but he was this time last year, you know, people were like, man, I cannot believe the the Phillies gave away Curtis Mead for Christopher Sanchez. This guy's not doing anything. Mead's going to be a top prospect. And now that script is flipped. And Sanchez looks like the better guy. And Mead is like, okay, what are you going to do? You going to hit? Where are you going to play? Uh, and so that's what's really been impressive for me. But when I watched Sanchez pitch last year, I was just super impressed with his ability uh, to limit hard contact and just the strides he made from when he first pitched in the season, as the season wore on, he go, he looked better and better and better. And so I'm pretty excited. He'll probably be inside the top 200 by the time we get to the uh, the heat of draft season. But right now, uh, where his market price is, everybody should be buying in on this guy. Yeah, so it's funny you mentioned Ryan Bloomfield. We did a live stream auction the other night for uh, his listener league, for the Bubba, Bubba and the Bloom listener league. 
and his average bar, uh, value is four dollars and he went for ten dollars in that <laughs> auction yeah he went for 10 bucks in that auction of course he did a 20 percent strikeout minus walk rate you love to see that only walked four percent of batters last year he had a 309 x fip uh his sierra which i love as well was 333 like there's a lot to really like um and i think he's gonna have a regular role in that rotation I love him as well. I don't know if he's going to be a, a sleeper anymore come main event season. He'll be a top 150 pick probably uh, with a lot of sharks in in that particular tournament. Pierre, you liking uh, Sanchez as much as we are? Oh, yeah. I mean, he's not necessarily going to have, I guess, the ceiling because the strikeout rate isn't elite. But it's nice to know you get a guy that late that you feel like by this season's end – he could be like top 20, 25 in terms of innings pitched. I feel like he's going to be out there. You know, they'll leave him in at least five, six innings every time because he just doesn't get hit that hard. So, you know, it's it's nice sometimes. Yeah, we chase. And, of course, some of my sleepers look at her are kind of the goes, I, I tend to chase ceiling, right? Maybe a little too much. But, like, when you get to the later round, sometimes it's nice to know you have a guy who has that solid floor. He doesn't get himself into trouble, and he can be out there and rack up innings. Yeah. Let's get your next sleeper. All right, so uh, very opposite of Chris Sanchez. Let's go with one of those guys who I'm going to be probably a little too excited about. Again, I was really in on Mackenzie Gore last year. I feel like, you know, we forget he was at one point one of the top pitching prospects in all of baseball. Um, but, you know, now he's in Washington. So, okay, maybe not the best track record of developing young pitchers here. But I think I'm still in on Gore. You know, he's a guy that... Uh, another guy who, uh, Jason, you and I get to compete against in our league, uh, Nick Pollock. One of the things he looks for in pitchers is somebody who has not just great velocity on the fastball, but gets that movement, that rising action, right? The vertical of approach angle and uh, can kind of pepper the, the high end of the zone with the fastball and has the good secondary stuff. So Gore has that. He's actually one of the better, uh, one of the better fastballs in terms of that the approach angle. And he's got a good slider and a curve. Uh, so the problem is he just needs to stop walking guys, right? But the thing is, his walk rate wasn't really that bad. You feel like it was, but really under 10%. I mean, just barely, but it was under 10%. He can get that in order if he just, you know, shows a little bit more control. You know, will he take that next step forward? I don't know. He's still super young and experienced. But uh, I, I feel like he's got all the tools there. Um, you know, he's in a position where he can do it. You know he can get strikeouts. Both those secondary pitches, he has really high swing strike rate on. We know he can get strikeouts. So, again, kind of like with Cabrera, just get a little more control, right? walk less batters, get yourself out of trouble, uh, don't give up quite so many home runs. Uh, you know, I think he could take it to the next level. We've seen flashes for sure. I remember early in uh, in his rookie season, we were talking about him as at one point a shoe in for the National League Rookie of the Year. He started off so well in San Diego, and then it did kind of go downhill. He was traded. This season is, even though it wasn't an amazing year on the surface, he increased his strikeout rate. He lowered his walk rate. Um, you know, those supporting metrics were not terrible. Um, they weren't great, but they, they weren't they weren't terrible either. They were just kind of okay. 411 X FIP. Um, the FIP was 489 to that 442 ERA. I think that there is a chance that he can kind of break through. Though we're still talking about a very high level prospect who's still only 24 years old. He actually just turned 25. Actually, today is his birthday. Uh, today is his 25th birthday. So uh, happy birthday to you, Mackenzie Gore, if you're listening to this one. Uh, we are thinking that you might be a sleeper this year, so be on the lookout for him. I'm going to go with Hunter Brown for my next pick. I know that a lot of people have talked about him. Uh, I think that he's going to be a lot lower in your average Yahoo fan tracks, ESPN league than he will be in nfbc style tournaments because that era was 509 and that'll scare away a lot of people when you look a little deeper you know the 352 x fit was really good he struck out nearly 27 percent of batters he's in a very good organization and you're getting him close to pick 200 in most cases and i think that'll actually probably be even later if you are talking about once a lot of people get through their real uh money drafts on those yahoo and espn sites i think he'll probably be like close to 250 maybe like a last couple around pick uh, so I've had a lot of early shares of Hunter Brown. I think that he is a really, really nice uh, target to be going for around probably around 14 or 15 or so. He's not costing you much. So it's really not going to set you back, even if it doesn't work out. You guys interested in Hunter Brown this year, Jason? I can't hear you. 
There we go. I was double muted. <laughs> like I'm a day job, right? My dogs were barking earlier. Uh, no, I was what naughty when you had brought him up because last year there was so many of the, oh, his delivery looks like Justin Verlander. So he's going to, he's automatically going to be so good. And I thought that's where it was driving some of the market price on him last year. It's, and it just, he disappointed. And I love getting back in when somebody disappoints, like you said, the 509 ERA, it's going to chase some people away get back in. I would say the same thing applies to Taj Bradley. You know, Taj Bradley had some pretty ugly numbers. Hope I'm not stealing anybody's sleeper there, but I thought those two guys had a lot of market hype this time here, even hands uh, last year and both came in under, uh, under expectations. And I don't, I would not be running away from either one of these guys. Yeah. Pierre, what about you? What do you think about Brown? Definitely a non Brown. Uh, yeah, I, I guess I'm sort of a masochist besides this league that we're going to be in. I just did an online auction uh, championship on NFBC uh, to auction against Ariel Cohen and Ruben Guy. Uh, oh yeah, so we'll see how that turns out. It's definitely a very stars and scrubs kind of team. But um, one of the starting pitchers, I didn't, I didn't pay. I paid up for hitting. I didn't pay up for pitching. And so, like, my number one pitcher is Grayson Rodriguez, which I'm totally fine with. But then on my number two guy is Hunter Brown. Like that's it. I saw him there, identified him. He's kind of a nice mid rotation to me, mid rotation target. I got him. Uh, a guy like Gavin Williams, you know, the, I think the upside is there for these guys to take a step forward. And I think there's less question marks with some of the players we're talking about. Where right? we're getting a little deeper here with these sleepers, but um, but yeah, I'm I'm definitely in on Brown for all the reasons that you said. And Jason, yeah. by the way, I, I totally get it. I've been on mute off and on the whole time. Glad I'm not the only one whose dogs wait until right when you go online to start going crazy. So yeah, yeah. I have, I have three, only two of them really bark, but they bark at everything that goes by. And one yeah. of them is just, he's got that <laughs> and he's right here. So if you see a tail going, it, it's him. Um, nobody else is home right now. That's the problem. If somebody else was home, it'd be easy, but uh, they're, they're being very clingy. So <laughs> I will try not to double mute myself again. The joys of podcasting. We've all been there, of course. Uh, Jason, let's get another starting pitcher sleeper from you. Uh, and so this is really in, what, on the news. So I drafted, uh, and the guy that I want to talk about is Christian Scott with the Mets. I drafted Christian Scott with the last pick of Worf this past uh, this past Saturday. So a week ago, uh, he was my 30th round selection, my last pick uh, of the draft. And I took him, and that was before we found out about Kodai Senga not going to be able to start the season, maybe not pitch in the spring at all, and have to wait until the summer. Uh, hopefully it's not anything like Brandon Woodruff played out last year, but – Christian Scott was somebody that I took a, a last round dart on that I feel really good about now uh, because I doubt he would wait in the last until the 30th round. Scott's got ter terrific numbers uh, throughout the minors, was a great pitcher uh, in different roles at University of Florida. And he's adding a sweeping slider this spring, too, as if he needs something else for that. Uh, just really doesn't get himself in trouble with walks. And I'm excited to see what he can do if he gets the opportunity to join the rotation uh, early in the season. But that's a guy whose draft stock just went up with recent news. And he's going to be competing with somebody like Jose Butto, but you know, he's got his own control problems. So we'll see where things go there. Uh, but Christian Scott, somebody that excites me. Yeah, he's never pitched above double A, but I will say We've seen a lot more examples of teams jumping AAA for a lot of starting pitchers these last couple of years, so that's not as much of a concern as it might have been a few years ago. Just incredible numbers we've seen. Almost a 30% strikeout minus walk rate at AA, uh, 0.84 whip. He, just, he was incredible uh, over his 12 starts there. Uh, Pierre, I'm not sure. Are you a prospect guy? I'm not I'm not 100% sure how, how deep you get into prospects. Are you familiar with Scott? Are you interested in him at all? I'm not too familiar with Scott. Um, I'm getting more into prospects. I'm, I'm digging. But uh, yeah, Scott's a guy. Uh, the Singa news is it's painful. This guy was all over, especially early in drafts. So yeah, that, that's the best place to start looking. Guys already feeling, you know, tweaks and issues uh, already early in spring training. You know, what's plan B? You got to look there. So I think that's a smart move. Uh, Scott definitely looks like a guy, uh, you know, again, this is going to cost you what? A last round pick, if anything. Absolutely, the dart throw that's worth taking. Yeah, and he's already 24. It's not like he's like 20 years old, and right. you know, he's ready. He's ready to to make that jump this year. I mean, the the 107 strikeouts to 12 walks last year over three levels that should get your attention. Yeah, I mean, that's that's like whoa. Yeah, that's incredible. Um, Pierre, we are back to you for another starting pitcher sleeper. Well, uh, let's go back to Tampa. Why not be in Florida again? Uh, I guess, again, this is a player that, 
you know, like in our circles, we we know very well about Ryan Pepio. Um, but his ADP right now is outside of the 200s. Uh, it was, I'm seeing on NPC 203. And, you know, in a lot of leagues, he'll be drafted pretty late. So besides the fact he's in Tampa, and that's a good thing. I mean, look, in his debut last year, there, there are really no red flags whatsoever. There's nothing you can question about. At a 2.14 ERA, 0.76 whip, uh, only walked five batters. That's what you want to see, first of all. And this guy who knows how to throw strikes, that's also what I want to see, right? Somebody who now, in this case, control, not an issue. So the only issue here, of course, is being Tampa's innings, right? How, how long a leash is he going to get? You know, is he going to really go beyond five, six innings? Uh, we'll see. But at some point, you got to say, okay, I'll I'll take the quality over the quantity. You know, if he's going to help my ratios that much, we know he can get strikeouts. So, uh, you know, at this point, I would say really no questions about him uh, other than that. My only thing that I will point out from last year is that he stranded 99.2% of base runners which is an insane number. I, I couldn't even believe it. I thought, I thought Fangraphs was glitching or something, but nope, 99.2 left on base percentage and a 189 Babbitt. So I don't think we can expect a sub three ERA from him. I think that he's probably like a mid threes ERA guy, but even like at that point, mid threes ERA guy going past pick 200, going from one good organization to another. Uh, Jason, you like this addition by your raise this offseason? So when they when the news came out that they were trading, when it rumor was like, hey, Glasson might be going to the Dodgers, my initial text reaction to Paul, Justin, and Eno is like, I hope Pepio's in the deal. So I was mm-hmm. happy that he was in the deal and then getting Johnny DeLuca was a ne- nice extra piece. The concern I have here, uh, and Pierre mentioned it, is just the workload. I don't, I'm not as concerned about the innings per start as I am the innings total. Uh, you know, Scott Gilroy made a comment. Someone has to fill innings. He was talking about his Mets, but the same thing would apply to Tampa Bay too with the news that Shane Boz may not be pitching until the summertime. Uh, I could easily see him opening the season on the 60 day IL uh, and then working up his time. So somebody's got to do innings Uh, and the minor league, they don't have it. I'm looking over right now, like Jacob Lopez, a guy that was up and down a couple of times last year when they needed an extra guy. He was there. He's not it. Mason Montgomery, not ready. Like they don't have, they don't have the depth to play the, the play the game uh, to say, okay, where are these innings going to come from? They're going to have to go find somebody. Cause I'm looking over here. I'm like, mm, no, unless they start doing Johnny bullpen more. But then again, with, when you have, limited Johnny bullpen was something you could do back in the day when you had unlimited up downs. But now that you can only do so many times in a season, you have to be really creative on how you do that. Yeah. Wouldn't surprise me to see them go out and try to acquire another arm. Not that anybody ever trades pitching this time of year. Uh, and they're not going to sign one of the, one of the Boris guys. We know that. So I don't know how they're going to try to pull this off, but I'm, I'm concerned that I don't know where they're going to get 900 innings out of their starting pitching. You need 1450 innings to get through a season. They don't have 900 innings in that rotation right now. Yeah, and we're, we're pretty good on time, so we can kind of go off on some tangents here. What the hell happened with Shane Baz? He didn't pitch at all last year. I thought we were fully good to go, and then may pitch. he may pitch this summer. I saw that. I What? I, I was stunned. I was yeah, stunned. I mean, my thing was he had a surgery at the end of August of 22. Uh, and you know, for those who've read, listen to me, for me, I've always been out on all of these guys until they're two full years back in. Uh, and so this winter I've seen a lot of like Boz was coming up, Boz was coming up and I, I kept preaching, take the under on a hundred innings, just because look at what he's done. It feels like Boz has been in the, the fantasy periphery for quite some time. Last I checked, he has like 44 career at major league innings. He just hasn't thrown a lot, but he's been around for, it seems like he's been around multiple years, but he just has not thrown that much uh, at the major league level. And so to me, it was like, I always had him coming in under a hundred. And now with this news, he's absolutely coming in under that. Now I don't even know if he gets to 80 innings, uh, but I honestly have very little interest in having him. I have AL tout, AL labor and an AL home league. Uh, auction in the next five weeks. He's available in all three of them. I doubt I will come out with him. I don't. I just don't want to deal with the headache. Yeah, I wouldn't want to deal with him in an AL only in a mixed league and, and really in anything at this point. If you're just looking at NFBC drafts, they let you see minimum, maximum picks. You can sort by so many different things. His minimum pick throughout draft season was 73. Somebody took him at pick Ooh. 73 overall. Now, he's generally going about pick 200 or so, and I think that's going to start to trend downwards as more people start to 
to do their research and see what he said there. But I, I mean, the talent is there. The talent is or was there. Who knows at this point after a couple of years off? Um, you never know what's going to happen. We saw it with a guy like completely different pitcher, different situation. But Mike Soroka, he was amazing. Yeah. Missed several years, and now he doesn't look like the same pitcher anymore. I'm not saying at all that that's going to happen with Baz, but we just don't know. And to draft a complete unknown with a top 200 pick, or even if it ends up being 220, 230, I just can't do it. Uh, Pierre, do you have strong feelings on Baz? Yeah, I'm I'm out right now on these guys like this. And, you know, actually just before getting on here, I was streaming a, a best ball draft. And I'll say like an only league, you know, like Jason just mentioned, or best ball, some place where innings really do matter. You know, you can't just make those those transactions midseason uh, so easily. Like it, it's just so important. You can't take these chances on a guy. And that's why I just mentioned a guy like Walker Bueller. I'm, I'm just not drafting him. I'm hoping that he's ready, what, May, June? And then how many innings are they really going to, you know, give him at a time? How many wins is he really going to be able to pick up? And uh, then we're like, oh, yeah, we're just assuming that we're getting the guy that we saw a couple of years ago. Same thing with Baz. Do we even know what that guy looks like? Have we seen a full season of him? We haven't. So it, I don't know. It, it's just a little too risky for me uh, at this point. I know sometimes the name value and the upside is kind of tantalizing. I would much rather take a shot on a guy who maybe hasn't put it together. Some of these guys we've talked about, the younger pitchers who could actually put it together, but I know they're going to be out there every five days to prove it. Right. If they flop, they flop, you know, Oh, well, but just hoping and waiting and stashing an IL that's, I don't know. I've been burned. I think a little too many times by that. And, and so I'm so like, yeah, so DeGrom, Scherzer, Bueller, Baz, all these guys, I probably will have, I'd say zero of. I don't, <sighs> I, I just don't know how you can take somebody with such an unknown. And I guess it's just kind of my, my general philosophy as, as I play more fantasy baseball every year, it just, I drift more towards the safe players or who we perceive to be safe. Cause really we don't, we don't know who's safe or who's not safe, but right. the, the guys who are going to be the innings eater types, your Logan Webb types, your, your, your Aaron Nola's, your Zach Wheeler types, the guys who are always out there, obviously those aren't sleepers, but lean more into the innings pitch guys as opposed to the potential high upside like i know it doesn't always work like that like jordan lyles are going to throw a lot of innings okay you don't need to be interested in jordan lyles but a lot of these guys who were hoping for like like a shane baz and even at this point like like a walker bueller you're hoping to throw a lot of innings versus somebody where you're pretty sure they are going to throw a lot of innings uh, i'm just not really willing to take those risks the more and more i play the more leagues i join i just try and play it as safe as possible um, I'll, th I'll throw out another sleeper here. I think, I think it's back to me in the rotation. I'm going to go with Tyler Wells. And I think this comes, I was already pretty interested in him, but the news of Kyle Bradish's UCL hanging by a thread potentially, um, is going to open up a lot of innings for Baltimore. And I think Wells is somebody where he wasn't really given a, a shot last season after the all-star break. He had a couple of bad starts and they sent him down. I thought really prematurely, they pulled the plug on him pretty early. Like you're talking about a guy who finished the season with a whip below one. How many guys are there in Major League Baseball that are even capable of doing that for, for even half a season? You want to say it was lucky or whatever. Okay, but he does suppress hits. He's for his career allows a batting average against of two zero six. He has a one zero three whip. Those are really, really valuable. He is going to be probably getting more expensive. But at this point, you're really not paying up for him. I'm just going to take a look at where he's going in February. We're seeing him. 306. I mean, at that point, I'm, I'm going to take him on my last few remaining teams, most likely, because uh, I think the upside is really, really there. Jason, you, you liking Tyler Wells this season? Yeah, I agree uh, with the with the new pitch rather well than he like hit a wall uh, and they basically yanked. I want to say one of them was right there against Tampa Bay. And then the, right about that time, that's when they brought Grayson Rodriguez back up. Okay, I'm back. I'm sorry. I lost signal there for a second, it looked like. Uh, but no, uh, right about the transition, Wells faded out as Rodriguez came back from the minor leagues and then pitched wonderfully. Uh, and so, yeah, I, I'd be back in on Wells. I don't know what how much we can get uh, workload-wise, but I don't know. I'm also not convinced that Baltimore is not going to try to take advantage of this window with all of these young players and not go get one of these free agents that are sitting out there. If, they, if they're going to play the waiting game with Bradish, I know we threw today, uh, but to me, Montgomery 
or Snell would be a great fit there. Yeah, there are some one year solutions they can go get, but they have they have Burns for this year. And unless they can re-sign him, he's gone. They should be thinking long term window with all these twenty somethings they have. Uh, last I looked. Ryan O'Hearn was the oldest guy in this roster at 30 and a half years old. Uh, so go take advantage of this window of time uh, and go get either Snell or Montgomery. I think both would be a wonderful fit in that ballpark. Their values would come up immediately uh, going there and we'll see what happens. I've been thinking going back to the last trade deadline that they were going to package up a button, maybe not a bunch, but a few assets and go and get Dylan Cease or maybe Eduardo Rodriguez at the time mm-hmm. or something. Um, and they've now they've got Corbin Burns, so that's not as much of a need. But losing Bradish, Bradish was just incredible last year. I don't even know if we've really you know appreciated how good he was enough. Um, maybe we did, maybe we didn't. But at this point, he's potentially going to be a, I don't want to say a non-factor, but he could very well be headed for Tommy John surgery. Um, I don't I don't think like I've taken him out of my top 100 and I might have been a little premature with that, but he's out of it at this point. Well, he's uh, going the last couple of drafts I've been. And he's been taken after pick 300. So he's been down. And even then they were like, oh, God, I guess we'll see. At that point, you're in a you know, you're basically reserve round. You just got to cut him anyhow. So no harm, no foul. But yeah, it's just hoping for the best. Anybody still drafting uh, DCs should stay away from Kyle Bradish. Uh, yeah. I just I just can't trust him at all tyler wells pierre do you uh do you share my sentiments that we're probably going to see um a lot of innings out of him at least i, I think that the performance is maybe a little bit in question but i think we are gonna like the guys he's competing with dean kramer cole irvin i think he is better than these guys i think he is the be- the third best starting pitcher i guess it just comes down to whether they are going to go and add another snell or montgomery type at this point but what are your thoughts pierre yeah that's what i'm thinking and uh i mean you look at baltimore where they are now uh and not just as far as expectations, but, uh, you know, they would already went out and got Burns, the issue with Bradish. I feel like it's almost inevitable with a surplus of these young, talented offensive players. At some point, like something's got to get right. Like Kowser or Kierstad or one of these guys yeah. going to get flipped or some combination, right, for another starter. So, Wells, I, I hate to say, I kind of feel like he fits in more like the Orioles of two years ago when there were zero expectations. They just need somebody to fill a rotation spot. He might be in there early in the season. I just don't know if I have enough confidence that he'll be in the rotation all season. He might turn into kind of like a, you know, guy to stretch out like a a long reliever, you know, a spot starter. So uh, yeah, I mean, for where he's going, absolutely worth a shot because if he can get you something early in the season, that's fine. But I feel like it's, it's almost uh, just a matter of when, not if, they do make a move, you know, to do something in that rotation, something else. The Orioles are going to get to a point where their entire lineup is made up of players who are 25 years old and younger. And we know that not all these guys are going to pan out. They're just, they're just not. It's not the way that it works. A Kowser, a Westberg, a Mayo, whoever it is, Kierstad. There's going to be a couple of misses. Maybe it's Westberg. I don't know who it's going to be. And it's it's who's and anybody's guess as to who these guys are going to end up being, whether it's us or the organization. But you've got to flip a couple of them for established players. That's kind of what you got to do when you have this kind of surplus, because there's not even enough places to play all these guys. And they're going to eventually realize that and make uh, some kind of trade, I think, for another starting pitcher. But it's good that they got the ball rolling with Corbin Burns. Didn't even have to give up any of those really true top tier prospects. I think the bloom was off the rose with with DL Hall and he was kind of the main piece and he's still very good. But. None of those marquee prospects were traded, so they still have a lot to deal with here. Um, Jason, let's get it back to you for another sleeper. So let's go. Let's reach back into the uh, and, and bring somebody back that was a sleeper a few years ago and looks like he's 100% healthy and on a con- uh, on a competitive team in Chris Paddock with the Minnesota Twins. Paddock is uh, looking to contend for the rotation. Uh, he pitched, had a nice debut yesterday in spring. Is Looks like he's adding a gyro slider uh, to, and that's always been a thing with Paddock is he had a fastball ride and had that great changeup but nothing in between. He's always been looking for that third pitch. And if something could come up, then we could potentially see a step forward because he was even able, he was able to find success despite that two pitch approach, Uh, just because the changeup was that good. And he's finally healthy again in a good place with Minnesota, working with Derek Johnson, very respected pitching coach. I'm pretty excited to see what Chris Paddock could be capable of if his body can hold up. Um, because again, that that elusive third pitch, if he could find something that's usable, he could be very serviceable this year. Yeah, he's not going until about pick 
almost 300 in most drafts, 278 over the last month or so. That rotation, I think, is is going to be pretty set. I just don't know why that they're going with Anthony DiSclefani over Louis Varlin. That's the only one that's really puzzling to me at this point. Varlin looked good today, so I don't know how long that'll stick. But I think that this entire rotation is just so solid. They've become one of those teams that you can kind of look at as maybe not a pitching factory, but like, I mean, just look at their record over the last couple of years of developing guys. Um, I don't know how much you want to credit what they did with Pablo Lopez, but he's there and he looks like a top five pitcher in baseball now. So uh, I think there's a lot to be said about the organization. What do you think, Pierre? Yeah, uh, it would be nice if Varland ever actually did get a chance. Doesn't look like that's happening right now. We'll see. Uh, yeah, I, you know, pack another guy. Remember, we were all excited when he first debuted and everyone thought he that's it. He's he's on the way to uh, to great things. And it didn't last too long, right? Things took a turn in the second half of that season. Uh, we'll see. Look, he's definitely still got good stuff. And like you said, situation does matter. We know that some teams... And it's not just the ballpark, right? It's just some teams just know how to get the most out of their pitchers and then some teams not so much. So, yeah, he's definitely somebody worth keeping an eye on. Yeah. Um, we haven't seen a lot of them recently, but I think that we can see um, probably 120, 130 innings maybe. Jason, what do you think? What do you think is the expectation for Paddock probably? 130 innings maybe? Uh, yeah, 120 to 130 feels feels doable. Uh, you know, Var Varland's also in that... It, I kind of look at them as a symbiotic, if you will. One of the, some, only one of them is going to get a job, you would think. And I, but either could be effective in either role. We saw Varlin pitch in relief last year and look really good with a little bit of more velocity uh, in there. The home runs. I mean, go back and look at his game log. A lot of those home runs came early. I want to say he had a four spot uh, against the Yankees right out of the gate in Yankee Stadium. I mean, who hasn't done that? Who hasn't given up four home runs on that joke of a ballpark? Sorry, Yankee fans. Uh, so it happens uh, with that. So I think there's value either way. And I I, I also like talking to somebody uh, to other mono league players because so often this conversation is about mixed league folks, but mono league folks. I mean, these are, I mentioned Jose Butto earlier. I mean, these are names you have to think about in NL and AL only types uh, because it's, you know, the 12 team mixed leagues are so, are so nice and shallow. Uh, but those of us who play in, uh, mono leagues or an 18 team mixed league. These are names that have to come up. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, I just love the twins. I'm, I'm, I mean, they knocked out my blue Jays in the playoffs last year. So maybe I'll pump the brakes on that a little bit, but I love what they do uh, developmentally. They're, they're looking like a lot of fun over the next couple of years for sure. Um, Pierre, I believe it's back to you for another sleeper here. All right. Well, I feel like uh, before we go, I have to mention this guy because he was the uh, poster boy in the thumbnail of my last video just came out yesterday and it was about pitching sleepers. So here we go. Cutter Crawford. Uh, you know, I'm also a sucker for guys who throw a lot of pitches and that they're all good. He has six pitches that he threw at least 5% last year. And according to Stuff Plus, right, Eno's uh, formula, five of them were above average. So that's pretty good. That's a good way to keep hitters off balance. Um, you know, he's got a cutter, um, mainly leads with the fastball. But, you know, it, it's funny. We actually just got, I guess, breaking news today. He is in the lead for a rotation spot in Boston. Um, whatever that means. Like, I, I think he our 23 games last year. I don't know that they've got a lot of players ready to supplant him. Uh, I'm not going to hold that hope. You know, guys like Garrett Whitlock, you know, and Tanner Hoke, like we keep waiting for them to actually start a bunch of games and be good consistently. I'm not going to hold that hope for them anymore. I'm just going to say, let's go with Cutter Crawford. I think he can do it. Um, and so he's somebody who is, again, going to rack up innings. He's going to probably need to be a little bit more of a an accumulator, you know, in terms of the strikeout. He's not going to blow hitters away, but I think he can do all of the things you want to do you know, back end of your fantasy rotation very late. And kind of surprised he is almost like an afterthought in drafts right now. I do like Cutter Crawford as uh, as kind of a late target. The thing that scared me, you mentioned, you know, I did a show with him a few weeks ago and he kind of scared me with Boston pitchers because he was talking about how he had done some survey of pitchers and they all hate Boston. It's a psychological thing and it's also kind of just – Maybe it's a real thing as well in terms of the backstop and like the ballpark itself being very hitter friendly. 
Um, he went in a lot more depth than I did there. So you can go check out my, my show with, you know, from a couple weeks ago, if you want to hear him talk about it, cause he's definitely going to be uh, more eloquent than I will be, but he was kind of scaring me about Fenway in general. Uh, Jason, are you worried about Boston pitchers at all this year? Is that something that worries you at all? And, and what are your thoughts on Cutter Crawford? Yeah, I think it was Nick Pavetta. That was something like, Oh, and six with a six something ERA at home. Uh, and then it was at, and so, yeah, there could be some issue there. Uh, I mean, Boston itself, it's an inter- interesting team. I want to say, I, I said the same thing about the White Sox earlier today. I believe their parts are better than their sum. I don't look at Boston like a playoff team, but there are pieces of this team that I really like. I mentioned earlier about Tyler O'Neill as somebody who has the skills to make a big jump, but we've he's had the skills forever and has failed to launch. Uh, and so with the pitching staff, it all comes around. Like I took uh, Kenley Jansen today in the thir- with the third pick of the 11th round. Last week, he was going either eight four, anywhere from 8-14 to 9-1. And then just this week with a little lat, two-round discount, I took it. I hate Boston. <laughs> I've hated Boston forever. But I'm like, at that kind, I'll take anybody in my roster at that type of discount. The thing with Crawford that really intrigues me, uh, and I want to see the lasting power. Because remember, he he changed he changed his arm circle and started looking like Lucas Giolito with his delivery, where he used to be a longer drop drop down type of guy. And then last year he got really short with the arm circle and then things came alive for him. And I know that you know, talk about the six pitches. I, every time I hear about a guy throwing that many, I go back to the, uh, the Jeff Zimmerman rule, the you Darvish rule. Do you have more than four pitches? Yes or no. Are you, you Darvish? Yes or no. Stop throwing the other pitches, dumbass. It's like, that's the, that's the, the thing. So it's, but the fact that he's, the fact that Crawford's got five of them that was able to do that says something, but I'm, I'm wondering how much of the new delivery, how much of that was le- driving some of that. So it's maybe he's more efficient in that regard. And like Nick Pavetta, I would say the same thing. Pavetta, I've always believed in the stuff. One of the comments that always stuck out in my head was when he signed with Boston, there was the comment where uh, Tampa Bay had made a comment of something along the lines where they were trying to get Nick Pavetta too. They, they said that they loved the fastball ride and that he reminded them of glass. Now was the comment. I was like, wow. Uh, and there are times when we've seen Nick Pavetta pitch, we're like, man, this guy's fantastic. And then there are other times we see him pitch. You're like, Oh my God, pull him off the mound. He's terrible. You just got to look for some consistency. And uh, one of those guys will click and one of them is going to bust and be stuck at the bullpen. We'll see what happens. It's tricky to figure out how you want to order the rotation. Because I've heard people say that Lucas Giolito is their favorite starter in the rotation. I've heard people say that Lucas Giolito is their least favorite starter in the rotation. Um, and that's I think a lot of people are kind of confused as how that rotation is going to look now. Mm-hmm. Um, I think Whitlock's pretty good as well. I don't know if he's going to get a chance to be a starter, but there's just a lot of moving pieces. But um, there are some definitely, like I, I agree with what you said, that the, the parts are very, very interesting. I think they're probably still the worst team in the American League East. They almost definitely are. But there's some really, really intriguing uh, Red Sox this year. And Kenley Jansen, if he starts to start, you know, 11th, 12th round, I'll take him all day. I know that he's somebody who people have talked about as a trade chip, but he's been a closer every stop of his career everywhere. Going back for like, I think, 12 or 13 years now, he hasn't ever been in any role other than the closer. So I think that wherever he is, whether it's Boston or he gets traded, he is still the closer. And I think that might maybe some of that, and it might not even be a massive thing, but the fact that they signed Liam Hendricks might have scared a couple people. Even though he's not coming back until the summer, that might be a subconscious thing where people are, mm, maybe they're planning on not having Jansen there down the stretch. And I don't know how much that factors into it, but I think it might be something. Well, I I don't know if Liam Hendricks even pitches this year. If he does, it's going to be August, okay. September to me. But the, the key thing is both Jansen and Chris Martin are on expiring deals. Both of them are free agents after this year. And so it's easy to see, okay, Hendricks, you're slotting right in 2025. You're that guy. And so I could see if, if Boston does decide to trade Jansen, they trade both Jansen and Martin. And they're just like, okay, somebody else, take the ninth inning, whatever. We'll find somebody. Uh so it just uh, it was a it was a long term play for them uh, there, but I agree. Even if Jansen gets traded, I have a hard time imagining he's going to be traded to somebody to be somebody else's setup guy. Yeah, unless he goes, you know, behind Classe in Cleveland or something. Like there's all, there's a very very few names where he would slot behind. If he goes to Milwaukee, I don't think he's usurping Devin Williams, but I, you know, I, there's very few scenarios where I think he wouldn't be the closer. So I think he's pretty safe by the dip. Um, the last guy I'll throw out there, I'm kind of cheating a little bit because he's going to be a starter slash reliever probably. And I'm not even sure how many games he's going to start, but Matt Strom is really interesting to me in Philadelphia. 
He started 10 games last year. It was more early in the season. I think that he's somebody where you know, he'll get the odd start here and there, but regardless, he'll have starting pitcher and relief pitcher eligibility in a lot of those leagues. I know NFBC groups it together, but Yahoo, ESPN, fan tracks, whatever. He's got that double eligibility. He's coming off a year where he had a 31% strikeout rate, uh, only a 6% walk rate. Really good supporting metrics as well. Like the 329 ERA was supported by the ERA estimators. Again, I'm kind of cheating here a little bit, but I think the fact that he is starting pitcher eligible and relief pitcher eligible can really be a benefit for you at the end of even like a 12-team draft. I think that he could be somebody where if he does what he did exactly last year, even if it's slightly fewer innings, even if it's like 70 or maybe 80 innings, I think that there's a lot of value in him there. You guys interested in Matt Strom at all? Indeed. Uh, yeah. oh, go ahead, Pierre. Sorry. No, no. I was just going to say, sometimes you don't have to have a guy who's locked in the rotation in spring training, right? Because things happen, injuries happen. So, yeah, you look for the guy who's got the talent underlying metrics. Everything looks good with Strom. What do you think, Jason? Yeah. Agreed. And he could pitch in any, he could start. I mean, I would like to see him have somebody else come in and open and have him come to a bulk thing uh, and, and go that route, but he could pitch. He's got the stuff to pitch anywhere. Uh, and he's got great hair. I mean, <laughs> I wish I could grow hair that long, but I just goes curly. He just got great hair. I wish I had that. Cause that definitely looks when he's throwing from that crazy arm angle and stuff's coming out of his hair. I'm sure that's part of the deal and why he has long hair. You see pictures of him sometimes, and he'll get mistaken for Nicolas Cage half the time on the internet. I think part of it is a joke that people uh, will kind of lean into, but yeah, he does kind of look like Nicolas Cage. Um, injuries pop up, right? Even though the rotation looks like it's fairly set, no team. I mean, I saw it with the Blue Jays last year. As lucky as the Jays were health-wise, they still needed to fill some starts once Alec Manoa did what he did. And I mean, you still need to fill 20 five starts throughout the year on most teams even if your team is fairly healthy rotation wise and i mean even that's assuming that Taiwan walker is able to stick in the rotation all year and not bottom out and ranger suarez is able i mean I, i'm more confident in suarez but the point is essentially you need innings and i think a guy like strom whether they come as a reliever as a starter he's shown especially last year and even the year before to some extent uh that he can give you a lot of quality innings um, we're going to have Justin pop in here, I'm assuming, in the next couple of minutes. There he is. How you doing, man? Hey, how's it going? I'm here. I think uh, it was pretty good. We covered, um, I think, 12 sleepers or so, uh, 12 starting pitcher sleepers. So I think it was a fairly successful hour. Nice. Um, I'll, I'll just rattle off the ones that I was going to do had Jason not filled in. Um, and you guys can yell at me real quick if you want. I'd love to. Sure. Uh, John Means, Braxton Garrett, he's good. Uh, Stephen Matz, Jared Jones, and Tyler Anderson. Boom. Means worries me a little bit with this uh, with the news. I don't know how concerned we should they, be. They just said that there's no injury. He's just behind. Oh, okay. So okay. he will probably not start on the roster. Um, he'll go to expend, uh, extended spring training, but he is. They are saying he is not injured. So. Okay. Okay. I like it. Uh, someone mentioned in the chat earlier that Braxton Garrett was still uh, dealing with something, but I couldn't remember what it was. Through, I do love through a bullpen. Through a bullpen yesterday, they said it was his best bullpen and that he's going to be fine. That's beautiful. The supporting metrics. I mean, there was times last year where if you look at strikeout minus walk leaders, he was like top five, top love seven him. in baseball. He was he was fantastic. And if the news the on either of last the, week, yeah, <laughs> the news on either of those guys continues to drop their prices, I'm all over it. Well, I didn't I hadn't heard it and I've looked at this stuff like constantly. So I'm sure a lot of people haven't. Yeah. So um all right that's gonna wrap you guys up. Why don't you give yourself some self promotion and tell people where you can reach on social media. Joe, why don't you lead it off? Well, I want to say, first off, thank you so much for having me. I love participating in this. I think this is the third year I've done it, and it, it's always a blast. Uh, Jason, Pierre, thank you guys for coming along for the ride. Uh, you can find me on Twitter at JoeOrico99, and you can find my podcast wherever you get your shows, uh, Fantasy MLB Today. And make sure you're checking out sportsethos.com. We have our draft guide coming out this coming week, and we have a lot of fun stuff planned on our YouTube channel as well. Like I mentioned off the top, I'm going to be uh, live streaming my Tout Wars draft on Tuesday at noon. With Big Johnny Stud, John Legaza. So that one uh, will surely be filled with a lot of talking and a lot of fun banter going back and forth. So make sure you're checking us out over there. Awesome. Pierre, remind everybody uh, where you can be reached and uh, plug all your work. All right. Well, it's on YouTube, Fantasy Endgame. Like I said, we uh, got two channels, Fantasy Endgame for fantasy football and now for baseball uh, entering year two. So excited about that. Putting out 
multiple videos every week. So that's it. I'm technically still on Twitter, but again, uh, only because there's not anywhere better to go. I see Jason on Blue Sky. I'm trying to make Blue Sky a thing. I hope it becomes a thing, but I guess make it a now, thing. It needs to be a thing. Make it a thing. <laughs> I'm on there too. I don't really use it though, uh, unfortunately. <laughs> uh, Jason, right? Everybody re reached and uh, what you do. Yeah, I can be reached on Blue Sky because I don't need real time news. I just need I just need access to it. So uh, I'm fine with the with the less than real time. Although they just went over five million subscribers, which is fantastic. Uh, so, and it's honestly it's a growing it's a growing baseball community. And like Mike Gianella and I are over there interacting every day, and it's great. Uh, so you can find me there. Uh, you can also find me on the collect calls column uh, that comes out every week at RotoWire. Uh, this week it was play, you know, looking at different. Uh, pro profiles so if your if your guy gets taken you have another option uh so look at that and i'm not quite sure what i'm going to write about this week uh, but then i will be at first pitch florida with justin uh for the uh to defend my al labor title uh, this this uh friday night and uh tout wars in a couple of weeks in new york where i am uh trying to win one of those leagues damn it uh, <laughs> <laughs> i will see you in florida i'll also see you tomorrow because you're gonna yes. be on another episode or another uh panel of uh pot of palooza like thank Paulson, you guys I'm so much proctor just gonna drag my mouth and be like Ugh. yeah but yeah I'm, yeah I'm trying i'm trying to get you in podcasting shape for the season right that's right <laughs> so, all right guys i'm gonna remove you out unceremoniously as i always do uh, so that way I can bring in the next crew here in a few seconds. Uh, but before we do that, I remind everybody, this is the last hour of Potapalooza for today. There's going to be a whole nother 10 hours tomorrow. So don't you worry if you've been enjoying this. We're going to run it back again. And we're raising money for Fantasy Cares. Uh, go to uh, go to donorbox.org backslash uh, backslash TGFBI. I haven't even been talking the whole time and I'm, I'm losing steam. Uh, but <laughs> uh, every dollar you donate gets you a raffle ticket towards amazing prizes, including signed jerseys, a Ronald Acuna jersey, a Jose Canseco jersey, an Eric Gagne jersey, uh, bobbleheads, baseball cards, uh, subscriptions to all sorts of different sites around the industry. Plus, Every thousand dollars we raise, TGFBI entries. So far today, and let me actually update the total as I talk. We have raised coming up on two thousand dollars. Getting pretty close, just under two thousand dollars. But if you add in all the uh, uh, donations from TGFBI uh, uh, players and TGFBI satellite players, we're up to over eight thousand dollars for this off season or draft season. Uh, going to Fantasy Cares, so at least eight people getting into TGFBI next year based on that. We have another amazing panel coming up. It's a different panel, something I haven't done here on uh, Potapalooza before, but it's my man's birthday, and I thought I would let him kind of take control of the last hour. Oh, this is man. Santa Claus, or Sam, uh, and he is going to be uh, hosting the Palazzo podcast, uh, minus Michael Govier, who has not yet shown up. But I'm throwing in Benjamin Chase. I'm throwing in Robbie Hockey, or is it Robbie Baseball? Uh, and uh, I'm just gonna I'm just gonna let you take over from here because this is kind of your pod. Oh, but before I do, also bring in Michael Govier, who is Man. Mr. Palazzo himself. Uh, Unfortunately, guys, I have some bad news. My wife has <laughs> the podcast, uh, but she unfortunately is stuck in traffic. She had to go to a funeral today uh, in San Francisco and uh, did not realize that the uh, Chinese New Year parade was going on in San Francisco. <laughs> So oh. she is running quite a bit behind. I doubt she's going to be able to jump on at all, maybe at the end, uh, to say hello. But uh, she sends her love, and she hopes you guys have a fantastic hour. I'll see you guys Yeah, next. we love her. Hope she's safe on her drive home. How are you guys doing? Welcome to the Power of the Palazzo podcast here. Kind of the mashup that we have on the Potapalooza 
day one ended it up for 2024. Uh, had some really good uh, spots before this, but now I'm here to my right on the screen, uh, or feels like on my left, is Robbie Hockey. Below me is the always awesome Mr. Michael Govier, and to my bottom down that way is Benjamin Chase. How are you gentlemen today? Hey, I'm doing well. Uh, as long as you don't have me talking politics, I'm good right now. Because <laughs> that all the. Uh oh. <laughs> that bad. Yeah, no politics. Yeah, Robbie looks Robbie looks fantastic. I mean, that's cool, Robbie. Yeah. You really with the extra mile today. You got a. I don't think I've ever seen this done in the industry that you have a winter hat as a microphone sock. It's a big. Moment. I wanted to. I wanted to try it. Um, I just this was broken and i I've, I've been using you know hacky tape to hold it together for a while hacky. and I, I wanted to get your feedback on the feedback so let me know if this will work um but i i'm a little confused i thought we were talking puck tonight fellas um so i got my gear i was ready for some shinny but i guess it's baseball seattle crack <laughs> or something like that is that I, what we're gonna I thought get this was jock talk I've brought oh, props. Oh, oh yeah. Thank you. Hey, you look, know. Uncle Ted's here. Moe's here. Chad's here. Hey, there's Kansas City Moose. Anthony Gialdi. Look, we got a nice crew up in here. Thanks for being here, everybody. And give money to Potapalooza. This is such a wonderful event, Sam. I'm so glad you were able to make this happen. Sam made this happen. Sam and Justin have been uh, pals and working together and brought this to fruition. So I'm just grateful to be here, Sam. Well, I, I, I just got brought along to help out, so I'm honored to do that. And getting to get teamed with Fantasy Cares this year, uh, they do a lot of things for a lot of different organizations. Uh, they're just a really wonderful nonprofit, and they help uh, us in the fantasy community connect with other communities. And so I think that's great. So please, they've raised a lot of money today. They're at $2,000, and if you're a fan of our podcast and you're a fan of theirs, like – Put twenty, fifty, a million dollars, whatever, whatever feels good to give today. Uh, they won't say no to it. So, yeah, I'm with you. So, no, we are not gonna. Yeah, two L's, two Z's, and two O's. Utah, give me two. So, if we're not talking politics, uh, you guys, before we get into some stuff that we're talking about, tell me something good about today. Like, just what what did you get to do today? Was it nice weather? Did you get to see somebody that you love? Did you get to close your eyes and ignore somebody? Where are you at on this Saturday? Oh, I, I wasn't sure if I'd get to talk trucks or not. So, okay, good. I changed the tires. I saw something loose. I tightened it up. My truck is ready to go for its safety next week. 1979 and nobody cares but that's okay i'm excited it's for me and my family um and my son beat me in in hockey tonight in overtime um so he's the house champ for the night so that's a good thing too because if he loses uh bedtime can be a little difficult <laughs> yeah no that's great man if trucks are your bag like don't let anybody shame you for that you're always you're always ready. so what about you ben i uh, i got to enjoy Spencer Strider making his spring debut um, and struck out four over two innings, touched 99 in his first start of the spring and uh, unleashed a couple of his new curveballs, which are going. So, you know, because having maybe one of the best fastballs and one of the best sliders in the game as your two pitch combo isn't enough for Strider. He decided he needed to add something else and he's made a hybrid curveball that he's added to his mix and it is a wicked freaking pitch. So let's hope he keeps it going. Yeah, that's uh, a, <laughs> that would be problems for a lot of batters. <laughs> national league. If that comes true, man, that's putting it mildly. Yeah, yeah. seriously. His two pitches are already, I mean, we, we're talking about 300 strikeouts. There are some people that genuinely think that Spencer Strider could have gone as a top four pick this year and redraft because his value is so immense as a pitcher. And so, if, if he's able to take another step, it's all over. What about Look you, Mike? That. Brian K. Rodgman in the house, old timer. Hey, I, I wish there's a button, Brian, I would love to hit for you, but apparently this is a family-friendly show, so I can't hit a button. But you know the one I'm talking <laughs> about, Brian. I know you do. Good to see you in here. Of course, Jake's here. 
Jake Hallisker from Rotosaurus, high stakes heat in the comments. I got to tell you, Jake, uh, Jake's a good man. And I appreciate you, Jake. But for me, and of course, just, oh, he wants me to hit it? <laughs> no, I, it's, it's got bad words in it. I don't think I could, right? I mean, isn't this how we fired? don't get invited to things or don't get yeah, invited that's back? that's usually what. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'd love to hit it, but I've. If Justin says I can hit it, I don't know. I kind of usually I'm I'm about breaking rules. I mean, you know, this week I broke free of FTN. They they said goodbye to me, so now I, I'm not beholden to anybody. Really, I could just do whatever I want all the time, right? Well, <laughs> it does going off with Govia start. I'm excited for that one. Going. <laughs> you keep saying that, but I mean, I'm not. I like I'm still good. <laughs> I I still gonna be the same guy I've always been. It's still me, and I'm. I could go off a little bit further, but if I go off too far, I mean, wouldn't it get too intense? Wouldn't people's heads explode? I mean, if you want 24-7, 100% Govier, that could be a problem for a lot of people. I don't think you want that, Robbie. Isn't so, that nope. what the Patreon's for? <laughs> <laughs> oh, Robbie's a funny guy. You know, this is actually my first show on the new computer I just got, so it's pretty exciting for me. Um, I got to say. Having a new computer, being able to stream live, feeling more confident, that's probably a highlight for me today, Sam, is that this is the first show I've done on my new computer. So, woohoo! Yay! Yippee! I feel really, really good about that. We're going to be doing more shows as the season gets off, and I'm excited! I'm excited! I also have this that I was given today by my very own father. Ready? Hey! What do you think of this thing? <laughs> I don't even know what to say. Yeah, I, I, I feel like I should be in the doctor's office. I don't know. <laughs> right? Yeah. Or uh, I instantly think of the NBC thing, but it also reminds yeah, me of like yeah. school, right? Like uh, there was school tones, and this apparently was actually part of a school that a buddy of my dad's gave to him that was in his school, and somehow he got his hands on it and gave it to my dad, and now he gave it to me. So there you go. Uh, Pretty neat. I disagree with the comment. You always go full go VA. It's all or nothing, man. I, I love getting full go VA. That's, that's what Okay, I'm... well, if Justin said I could hit the button, here it is. Ready? Three, <laughs> two, one. And you want me to change? Fuck you. <laughs> there you go. That was for you, Brian. That's for no. Brian's one of the oldest Palazzo people. He was there in the beginning. He's still here tonight. That's awesome. So that was for you, Brian. I know you're going to love that. I'm done. Sorry. That's it. Bad W. That wasn't me flipping off the count camera. Sorry about that for anybody that thought I was giving you guys, you know. <laughs> We're swearing. We got gang signs going. This is off the rails. <laughs> okay, I'll stop now. Here we go. Sam, take it away. Oh, my. I just wanted to check in to see how you guys were because it is true. You know, there's a lot of us that are coming out of and I'm referring to it, this hibernation of the winter, and we're getting to go out and see things. And you talked about Strider today, that there's actionable data, this magical phrase that means we actually get to see baseball being played. And so, you know, as we're at this starting point of all of our teams have gotten to play a game and we've gotten to get some information, good or bad, about what they're doing, what are you guys looking forward to in this season in real life? Not about the game, but in real life. And Ben, tell me what you're looking forward to the most. So I am, I'm always a big fan of watching how prospects and young players develop. And uh, two big ones just from today, Spencer Jones hit a ball about three miles. Um, today in spring training ball i think they said it was 475 um was the final distance but <laughs> it, it looked it looked like he sent that ball into orbit it was freaking ridiculous yeah. and then, wow dude it you was. know something something i've gotten used to over the last couple of years is the Braves had a leadoff homer but it wasn't from Ronald Acuña Jr today it was from Michael Harris and he is a guy who I I just I he really did a lot in the second half of last season that I think a lot of people just missed. And yeah, he was a 2020 guy or so. Um, but I think there's a there's a lot more ceiling to his offensive game. And that could be to me, watching guys like that take that next step. Hey, 
another Braves one, just because I was looking at the stats on that. Nacho Alvarez went two for two today with a double. You know, one of my favorite prospects oh. in the Braves system. So he had a, a big day in the first day of the season. So, I mean, those, those type of things. I love watching that. But that's my favorite part of real life baseball is to watch these young guys get their chance, get a chance to show out and, you know, give us give us another month. Well, maybe not a full month because we're going to have Major League Baseball by then, but give us another couple of weeks and we'll be able to say, okay, so these guys are actually competing for jobs now. And that's kind of fun to watch, too. Absolutely. Absolutely. Robbie hockey, or is it baseball? Uh, what are you looking forward to this season? Um, I got a couple things. One of the most interesting for everybody out there is going to be Alec Manoa's April stat line. And if he's going to get it with the Buffalo Bisons or the Toronto Blue Jays, because <laughs> uh, I am curious as to exactly what's going on with that. And if there might be some internal punishment um you know we've seen major league teams do it before he's got options they can send him down because last year he reacted poorly he somewhat alluded to it but uh here in the great white north Sportsnet, the broadcaster across the country did a great job of like washing that away like it wasn't a thing you know like it was something illegal that happened with hockey canada players from five years ago <clears throat> check the news everybody um one of the other things that i'm interested in is if the mariners can take off and get a hot start this year and take advantage of the Rangers and Astros injuries early in the year, pitching specifically for the Rangers. Uh, Astros, you know, they've got they got some woes too. Beat up on the Angels while, the, while they get it sorted out. Yeah, there uh, you go. And then, yeah, there it is. Yeah, um, I'm, I'm curious with that. Uh, and then what prospects that Ben and I have been talking about this offseason are now MLB rookies. That's something that I'm quite interested in. Uh, Follow-up to that is, who is the starting shortstop with Cleveland? Is it Brian Rocchio or is Gabriel Arias stealing at bats? Yeah. Or does it Ooh. not get settled all season? Do they just keep going? Yeah. Back? Which would be the worst That's of all. Just of it. It. Yeah. 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 I mean, absolutely. I could see Juan Brito getting time. I could see Arias playing some first. Uh, I yeah. Mean, Arias will get at bats, but like, is he taking them specifically from yeah. the rookie? That's, that's going to be an interesting thing to watch that, just how they fill things out is going to be interesting with that Cleveland infield, but yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Mike, what are you looking forward to in real life? What, what about then? Give me two. Hmm. Boy, I tell you what, there's so much to look forward to. When somebody says that, usually that means they're vamping and they don't know what to say. Um, that would be me. Like they didn't but fill no, it in I... the show notes or something. <laughs> <laughs> I gotta say, it's been oh. uh, it's been a day. It's been it's been a day today. I am I am if really I think I'm off my game right now, and I'm not gonna deny that. It's been a long day. It's been a challenging day, but that's what this show's about, right? We're honest about who we are and what's going on. We'd never try to fool the viewers. This is about raising money. So if people are getting help because of us being here, that's all I care about more than anything. But I do love baseball and I am curious to see what happens with Alec Manoa as well. I, I, you don't have any insight on that, Robbie, right now beyond that? Because I'd love to I'd love to get no. a, a little bit of heads you, up. From you got to be in the clubhouse. The only person that I know that has a job with, like within Rogers Center, um, works for MLB, not for the Blue Jays directly. So he doesn't know what's going on until they're all back in the building. Um, but, you know, he talked about how he was assuming that, like from what they talked about, he was going to camp competing for his job, not a job. It's just a matter of whether the Blue Jays are going to let him start the year with the big league club. And I don't think they will, but everyone's going to act like they will. And it's going to play out over the next, whatever, three and a half weeks. So. <laughs> Fair enough. Okay. So for me, I have this thing I've been calling it the last couple of years. I like to call it the Danny Santana award winner, which is a oh, tribute. Boy. Yeah. Oh, Ben knows exactly what I'm talking about here. Yes. <laughs> You, ben, do you recall Danny Santana's incredible year he had a couple years back? Where yeah, just just one year with the Twins, where everyone went, "Oh, hey, this guy's something," and then somehow he parlayed that into like four more years of getting invited to Major League st Spring Training. Yeah, I, I remember. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's uh, no disrespect to Danny Santana. I mean, I I had him on several fantasy teams, and I enjoyed what he was able to do for me in limited doses. But I also knew that his one season in particular that he had 
where he really blew up and he became a big deal. I think it was 20, off the top of my head, I want to say it's 2019, maybe. Uh, it was a fluke. It wasn't meant to be. I knew he would not repeat it. So since then, I've been keeping track of who has had a great season that won't have another one to follow that one up. You know what I mean? And uh, some past winners of this award include, I believe, uh, Tyler Anderson, right? Tyler Anderson, pitcher. Oh, who, who, yeah, I think yeah. He had that yeah. incredible year for the Dodgers, right? That was his mm -hmm. uh, big moment, which he did not repeat with the Angels. Uh, surprising for some, less so for others. But yeah, I can't wait to see who will be this year's Danny Santana Award winner. So someone who really rocked it in 2023, but we just, you know, what we know about baseball is that they probably won't do it again in 2024. Right. No, I, I'm I'm hopeful for Manoa. I think that uh, Toronto is a lot more fun as a team with Manoa being, you know, who he was back in 21, 22. Not what we've seen the last uh, year and a half from him. So I'm rooting for him, but I'm with you. Like, this is a real crossroads because he could easily never pitch well again in the majors. And pretty soon it's Manoa of the long release story or Manoa of the low yeah. leverage situation or something of that in nature. So... Yeah, he doesn't have the the velo to be um, what yeah, Reynaldo he... Lopez was supposed to be, and now he's with like Lopez. Look at him; he's washed up with a terrible organization. Right, <laughs> pretty much direct shot, direct shot to Ben. Uh, no, but he's, we'll see he's what the Lopez last does bullpen piece, you know. <laughs> <laughs> but no, like I, that's that's exactly what it is. He he doesn't have the ability to become a closer, so it is legit starter or. Uh, we're going to be real frustrated watching him go up and down yeah. and ruin fantasy seasons. No, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. I'm, I'm really looking forward to the battle in the national league this upcoming year between the Braves and the Dodgers. And I realize that there's a ton of other teams, but you know what they do in Atlanta year over year, making the team better each year, you know, moving the right pieces, signing the right players, making the right things happen. Like, uh, you know, them versus that West Coast juggernaut that got put together that, you know, both Shohei and Yamamoto are now playing for. I mean, I, Oscar. Yeah. Well, <laughs> the bounce back of Tay Oscar. Right. No, uh, Tay Oscar is yeah. going to do uh, quite well down there. So, you know, other than the Dodgers and the Braves, I mean, do you see anybody from the Central being uh, as a pre as from a preseason standpoint? Right. Right. Obviously, 162 games have to be played and anything can happen. That has the same kind of gun uh, power that Atlanta or the Dodgers have. I mean, I'm excited about Cincinnati as a dark horse. They've got so much young talent, and if they catch lightning in a bottle and that kind of their lineup gels, uh, they find a place for the pieces that are doing well, and some of their pitching comes along. They could be a fun dark horse. Arizona still, you know, obviously they were in the World Series last year, but. I, I just don't see another team in the National League that really, at this point, I feel like has any real real chance at taking the whole thing or at least winning the NL pennant. Do either of you guys disagree with that? Uh, no. I, do it, Ben. I, no, you don't want to do it? I, well, no, I'm saying I, I don't. Right now on paper, I think it's it's those two teams and there's a huge gap after that um but in the central i if cincinnati can get two of those guys to step up pitching wise that could be i mean the problem is they got to have two they can't have one because they didn't go out and they didn't sign a surefire guy they signed a whole lot of lottery tickets and oh, so you, you didn't see they signed Frankie Monta. So what do you what are you talking yeah, about? Uh, oh, yeah, yeah, this is right. Yeah, I forgot. <laughs> well, I mean, you know, let's let's put it real here. A Yankee, <laughs> a former Yankee starter leaving New York because he sucked there and going to Cincinnati is usually a good prescription, you know, Sonny Gray. Uh, but yeah. I'm just saying, like, but I they're they're gonna need multiple pitchers to come through because I don't see I'd love to see Nick Lodolo get better. He's one of my favorite guys when he's right. Um Hunter Green's stuff is just freaking electric and you want to see him do well. But you're gonna need multiple guys step up. I don't think what we saw from Andrew Abbott or Connor Phillips is real. Uh, I think they're both gonna be significantly less than what they were last year. So they're gonna need multiple starters to step up. But 
their lineup is so fun. They just they have so much depth. They can run out as much to me as much quality depth as anyone in the central, and that's not even close. Hmm, that's interesting. With the I central, say- I agree. I sorry, Mike. Oh, you sorry. go ahead. No, say your point. I insist on waiting because no one's going to like what I have to say when it's my turn. <laughs> All right. I got two things. First off, I just uh, got this brand new computer, and apparently I froze already. So it wasn't the old computer. It's Google Chrome. Is there anybody know? Let me know. Google Chrome conspiracies related to StreamYard? I need to know. I've been using StreamYard for four years, and I'm having problems, but nobody else is. So whose fault is it really? Mike Govier's StreamYard's Chrome's? You be the judge. Secondly, Paul Spohr here jumping in. The legend himself, Paul Spohr is jumping in our chat and says, Sam's feed is a bit choppy. Now, I take offense to this because Sam is an incredible human being. I love Sam. He's an outstanding fantasy analyst as well. But uh, I would have to agree with Paul Spohr. Sam knows this. Me and Sam have... Sam is living in a place where he gets the most out of his internet every day. The most he can get. He squeezes every last drop out of it so don't you know don't blame sam it's just the northwest territory in general in the united states so yeah that's what i wanted to say robbie now go ahead okay so a surprise nl team what if i told you guys that a team that could surprise everybody i know who you're gonna talk about i don't think you do (laughs) okay fuck yes the rockies okay (laughs) And now you've blown my lead up to saying they've got a five-time all-star leading off. They've got four Coors. former top 20 consensus type uh, fantasy prospects. Yes, it's the Rockies. Um, and I'm not even trying to be a Mike VA truther here with ground ball Nolan Jones. I'm talking about the full lineup top to bottom. Sean Bouchard shocking a lot of people. Um, and oh. it's already the, the Rockies have already tipped their hat that they think he's going to be a two-thirds type right fielder for them which is excellent um what you might not like is the fact that their rotation looks like a bunch of cuts from others but really it's somewhat homegrown here they've drafted uh what ryan feltner who got smoked in the head last year but was potentially going to be a uh, coors beater kyle freeland is a hometown that they drafted he's been okay all the time um we don't know what's going to go on with you know what they're going to do in season but um, when Justin Lawrence and Tyler Kinley were together last year, that was okay. And I think Kinley took over the end of like half of September as the closer. So they could share duties for the team that's good for fantasy. You either roster both or you play in a save hold league or you leave them alone altogether. I could see them surprising. Cal Quantrill, maybe he's a fit with the Rockies. Um, and then we'll see what happens, right? Austin Gomber has been a, a pro. It like debuted, Ooh. I believe. Did he? Who has been Gombered? If you haven't yes, been exactly. Gombered, you haven't lived yet, right? And, and that's the whole thing is it's kind of like Wade Miley for me. A gomber is for several other people where you just <laughs> don't is. care. You can't you pass need... the show without talking about Wade Miley. Wade Miley? Need... No, oh, Wade. Wade, Wade, Wade Miley. <laughs> Wade Miley. But the, the dark horse here is the last guy is Dakota Hudson. <laughs> Dakota Hudson oh. could be okay. And maybe he can beat Coors and be like, you know, one of those like top kind of road guys like um, like Gray was for the Rockies, where he was better away than he was in in Coors um, for a couple yeah. years. And then he had the one year where he was really good in Coors and sucked everywhere else. So anyway, that's just like a little fun thing, because if if the Diamondbacks can do it, if they can cut Mad Bomb and, you know, release Zach Davies, who are supposed to be two anchors in their rotation on their way to the playoffs, eventually the World Series. Why can't Colorado? Can't do it. I think we just spent two minutes, and I'm literally dumber now than I was before. (laughs) (laughs) Come on. Ride Bailey was worth it. That whole thing. There is no way in hell the Colorado Rockies are doing anything. What what I will say to back up Robbie, uh, just one thing to back up Robbie, this is maybe the best Colorado ballpark starting rotation that they've had in a long that I can ever remember. Like the guys that they have in their rotation right now are very, very well fit to succeed in Coors. But that doesn't mean they're going to. It's just on your face and point out your faults. There we go. They're they're two and one guys. They're two and one. (laughs) Yeah. Point well made. God. Point well made. I appreciate that. I Colorado Rockies, here we go. 2024 yep. and <laughs>
Bye, Felicia. Season's already over in Coors. Woohoo! <laughs> <laughs> I think Dakota Hudson will it, will he top four K per nine this year? Dakota Hudson over or under four K per nine? This year? Okay, so that's a real good question. <laughs> and I'm not I'm not looking at him. I'm not looking at him in anything but points leagues. And the one points league that I thought I was in our league, Gobe, that I thought I was going to get him in last night. Stupid Roto Ronnie bid on him with eight minutes left. Um, so right now I've got a timer on my phone. Um, two hours, 17 minutes left. And then I'm going to bid within the last minute on him <laughs> 24 hours to increase a bid. I'm going to make sure I'm within 10 seconds of, uh, increasing it by genius, the minimum. Genius, genius. I love, love it. Yeah. I love that. That is absolutely wonderful. And, and I don't even want them. I just want them now just because this happened. <laughs> spite bid. Classic spite bid. Spite yeah. Bid. Yep. Absolutely. <laughs> it's the only way to go about it. So as I'm sure that you guys have been involved in a number of different drafts and, uh, you know, draft and holds, mock drafts, all kinds of things. Uh, as we get into this season of 2024, uh, I want to hear what you guys are trying to manifest into the fantasy world. What are you looking forward to? What are you trying to see happen? Uh, Robbie, let's start with you. What are What do you want to have happen? I take it you want to get me out of the way to get to the real content. No problem. I get it. Um, I'm curious. <laughs> is Jake Alou getting playing time in Washington? Uh, second base or left field? I'm curious. Same question. Stone Garrett and Jesse Winker. Same organization. I want to know what the hell they're going to do with playing time. Because I thought Alex Call could have been a quiet fantasy darling last year. He didn't get it going, but he got opportunities early. Then he was eventually sent down. He came back up. It was not a good year. I'm assuming Call is on the outs with uh, Garrett Winker, you know, Robles and company. Um, but I'm curious on that one. Uh, Short stops that we aren't banking on. Guys like Hamilton with Boston, uh, Paris and or live in Soto, but not really Soto so much uh, with the Angels. Is this Josiah Gray's year to step into an SP2 type steady Eddie role? Or are we looking at SP3, 4, maybe even SP5 for life with him? And then David Schneider with the Blue Jays. I don't even think he's going to be on the opening day roster. I think he's continuously going down. Um, uh, Schneider, their manager, said today he was talking about the second base competition. And it was between the Iron Falafel and Biggio. And he was talking about moving moving guys around. He didn't even bring up Schneider. So somebody did a follow-up question. And he's like, oh, he's playing some second base and left field for us. That's what we're looking at for him. Which to me spells Bison's until an injury or some sort of reality uh, hits. But these are important to me in, in deep dynasty leagues. And in if you're playing with middle infielder, you know, corner infielder, all that. Like if you've got lots of position eligibility, uh, these are all guys that could make or break your year depending on you know, where you have them in your own uh, team's depth chart. So I've, I've got a lot of questions with these guys, uh, and I would love to see playing time for all of them. Hamilton could lead the league in stolen bases if he's allowed, and Paris played last year at 22, but he's blocked, and, you know, Soto left the organization, and I thought that was great. And then he came back, so I don't know if he's now below him again. I don't, you know, this, I got questions. Uh, this, these are the things I want to know. Yeah, I don't like hearing Move that. Move this man! David Schneider's the man! Who anybody trying yeah. to bring him down? Yeah, I don't get that. David Schneider seemed like he was... What am I missing about him? Does he not play defense well? Did he strike out too much? Like, it seemed like he was doing no. really well playing the field and in the batter's box. So, like, does he just run the bases poorly? Like, is there anything I'm missing with him? I, I honestly don't get it. Like John Schneider is the guy who got to put him in last year and kept give, like once he gave him bits and bobs of playing time and he was hitting, you know, 400 for the longest time. Uh, I went to one of the games when he, I think was like two for four or something like that. And then they pulled him. I thought he was going to get moved to third base because I know he had played there with the Bisons and um, he, he got pulled out and I was pissed off. Oh, he's not bad at baseball. Mr. Mason. He's not bad at baseball. He had a tough stretch at the end of the regular season. And the Blue Jays, for some reason, want to be veteran laden, um, which also gets you really early exits in the postseason. But this year, we're not quite sure what the rotation looks like, well, whether they'll be there or not. So lots of questions, I guess. Important questions. Um, Schneider and Manoa. Yeah, and they've got a ton of middle infield depth and uh, people to come up. Addison Barker, the name that I kept thinking was going to come up. There, there you go, Justin Mason. Hi, Babib. Low expected batting average. Who knows? Maybe he's somewhere in the middle. 
Can't do it. Dreams for him. Yeah, I mean, I there's a difference between hitting 400, your first 100 major league at bats, and uh, you know, hitting 150, right? Like you're gonna hate the 150 guy. You're gonna tell the 400 guy he's overhyped. He's he had a great 2023. It's just a matter of what is he actually, and maybe he's a Buffalo right. Bison for 200 at bats to start right. in 2024. Well, I mean, people don't necessarily like their own uh, home team's front offices, but Toronto has put out a winner. Uh, the last few years, and that's, you know, a very tough division that the Yankees are a perennial team. Baltimore has come out of nowhere. Red Sox and Tampa Bay both play for real. Red Sox have won World Series recently, so, you know, maybe they know something that we don't. We're just casual fans, right? Maybe. I don't think any of us believe that. (laughs) (laughs) That's putting it mildly. I will say, uh, Chad in the chat here, our old pal Chad, uh, Palazzo Discord diehard, also does shows on the Twitch. In fact, he'll be interviewing Negro League Museum legend Bob Kendrick next month on our Twitch, so make sure you check that out. That'll be a real good show with Chad. But he's saying the Rockies will finish higher than the Diamondbacks. Lock it in, Govier. There you go, Chad. Chad's calling his shot. He's never shy about that. Got yeah, you. that's a bold statement. So, so here, here's my bold one. The Minnesota Twins will have the best fantasy infield in all of baseball. And now, I am not counting Carlos Santana as the first baseman in that fantasy infield, mind you. Ah, it's funny. That's um, who I was just going to see. Who is your first baseman yeah. in this scenario? <laughs> yeah, no, it's what I believe is going to happen by the end of the year is you are going to see Edouard Julien playing some first base. You are going to see Brooks Lee playing some second base, and you are going to be. <laughs> you are going to be. I, I believe Royce Lewis is going to assert himself as a monster at third base, and Carlos Correa can only go up. Let's just put it that way. But he's don't be that guy. guy. He's been a legit, you know, high average, high, high power type of shortstop for years, and is still one of the best defenders in the game. I'm sorry, but. One of the downfalls of the freaking twins getting knocked out what well was that they had maybe one of the best defensive plays in the playoffs in recent memory uh from Carlos Correa on the play where he nabbed uh Vladi. And that was just I mean, it was a hell of a play, but nobody remembers it because it was Toronto and Minnesota and you know, because it wasn't the Dodgers or the Mets or the Yankees or someone that they want to publish on Sports Center five thousand times a day. Uh, well, at least but, they ended their curse, though. The Twins finally. Yes, you know. yes. But I mean, with Correa, Correa to me is a huge freaking value right now during drafts because <sighs> I watched him go twice as the seventeenth shortstop off the board. I'm sorry, but. That's no, he's not that low. He's not that bad. The guy still punched out 18 home runs last year. And before that, every year, year in, year out, he was a solid average guy with 20 home runs. I mean, yeah, he's not going to get you sto- steals. Don't expect that. But Jesus, like, how many guys are you going to get that can get you at least something decent at short? But that's. I love what Julian can get you, especially in an OBP league. And then I really think Brooks Lee is going to get some playing time by the end of the year. And his skill set is just fun to watch. So wow. they do have some young names. They they are on the up and coming. I mean, there's probably a half dozen teams that I could think off the top of my head. I I can't see the twins being better than this year or potentially even next year, but <laughs> You know, I could be wrong. And Royce Lewis is a huge wild card. I mean, Royce Lewis could really change that lineup at third base if he comes together. Yeah. But and, and a healthy Alex Kirilov could be a huge thing for them too. And he's, he's finally that. recovered from his surgeries, which he's tried to play through, which has been dumb. But and and Buxton is not going to be plugging up DH this year. That's the other thing. Last year he plugged up DH all year. So <laughs> Well, he's going to be on the injured list because they uh, they're well, going to be playing I mean, in the outfield. Yeah, you know, right. mid-May. I don't. I will tell you, watching 
Byron Buxton chase down baseballs in an outfield when he is fully healthy is one of the more fun defensive profiles you can watch in all of baseball. I mean, there's, there's not very many better. No, I agree. I agree. And I, there, the old statement stands, you know, it's better to watch exciting players play than having them be injured. So, you know, baseball is better with having a healthy Byron Buxton. And he's a lot of fun to yeah. watch. And he's a good dude. You know, I've seen interviews with him. I've seen the way oh. that he is. You know, he's somebody that it's easy to understand why Twins fans like him and have stayed, stood beside him during some of uh, this back and forth with being injured and whatnot. So I'm with you on that. You know, I'm I, I'm I got to I got to say something about this for the season. And that's our starting five has an opportunity to end the season with five pitchers as SP 25 or better. You know, Bryce Miller and Brian Wu take a step forward. Logan Gilbert pitches as expected, and Kirby and Castillo pitch as expected. And you have five pitchers in a starting rotation that could absolutely be drafted in the first two or three rounds uh, next year in redraft. Um, I, I, I don't know how the Mariners do it with their pitching. I mean, I realize the park plays a lot into it, but what they've done with their pitching lab and being able to find uh, these elite relievers out of nowhere and just being able to speak pitching to their starting pitchers. Uh, I'm super excited. I happen to be a fan of it, but I, I, I can't remember the last time I saw this much talent in a starting five. I mean, the Dodgers probably have that kind of a rotation this year. Also, some people could make an argument for, but I just can't remember the last time I saw a team, and against preseason hype, this is when the Mariners do their best. I've been a fan for a long time. Once we actually get into the season, I realize things could be different. But I, I want to see it. I want to see. I want to see those five pitchers become untouchable on draft boards. I want to see them put that together. So that's that's what it, I'm excited it, about. The nice part for you, Sam, is I think they actually have a legit couple of guys that can step in and help out if any of those guys need to miss some time. Now, I'm not talking about Jackson Coar and Austin Volth, which, by the way, any website yeah. that still have Austin Volth as, as a guy who's actually going to be in the starting rotation for the Mariners need to cash in their chips and just walk away from any sort of baseball analysis going forward. That is nonsense. That's nonsense. Oh, season's gone off the rails if that happens. That, yeah. there, there are bad things happening in Seattle. Yeah. But Emerson well, Casey Hancock, Lawrence is the sign of trouble. Sorry. Yeah. Casey yeah, Lawrence, he's been started, Oops, he's, he's the sign. It's all going yeah. south. But, I mean, Emerson Hancock to me is a guy that you want to have. I mean, a lot of teams would have prepping to be their number five. And I think he's he's shown enough to me to say, if I'm if I had a major league team, I would be prepping him as a potential number five to open the season that's a pretty nice thing to have sitting in back pocket just in case. And yeah, you don't want them to have to pitch, but you know, Voth and Coar could at least give you some stinking innings. You know, you just don't want them to have to. Right. <laughs> like, they just got a lot of, yeah. No, and so, yeah, you, you can't expect to go through a season without having injuries or something yeah. like that. Like I'm not trying to speak some kind of impossible thing to happen for the Mariners, but you know, I've, I've heard a lot of people, you know, when we're talking about these hype trains that develop in the offseason, that there have been several people excited about Wu and several people excited about Bryce Miller and several people excited about Logan Gilbert. And, you know, George Kirby has already uh, joined Luis Castillo as a top 10 starting pitcher in yeah. the game consensus for this preseason. And so it's just it's it's fun to think of uh, a team having that collection of young guns. I mean, Castillo's the old guy at 31, 30. I mean, he still hopefully, you know, knock on wood, has several, you know, years left of being able to do what he's doing. So it's sitting up here. I'm, you know, I can't, I can't wait to see what happens this season with that. So let's go. Uh, speaking of which, uh, we have some baseball that's actually going to happen for real. Uh, in March in Korea, we're getting San Diego and the Dodgers. Is that right? They're opening up mm -hmm. over in Korea, South Korea this year. Um, uh, that's a rumor. Yeah. That is a rumor. Uh, but when this is all said and done, uh, I'm curious, what do you guys think is going to be standing at the end of the season? Uh, you know, 
who do you think is going to win in the AL West, East, and Central, NL East, East, West, and Central, and who are your wild card teams? Like, where are you guys at with that? Well, right now it's all about practice, right? We're just watching spring training unfold, and we're going to see practice. how it all plays out and see which teams can make a difference. And we talking about practice? Yeah, Ben already li- he caught me. Nice job, Ben. I said no. It I, I was down. I was going yeah. for the Jim Mora, the Jim oh, Mora okay. one. I yeah. You know. <laughs> Practice. Not about practice. Oh, but you know, I'll give you my I'll give you my picks here. I will give you my picks here. Wow, this is this actually reminds me of the size. Remember when Arnold Schwarzenegger in Total Recall pulls that bug out of his nose? It's like that big. There's no way this thing can fit in my nostril. There's no way. Remember that movie? Oh, it's nasty. But uh, Carlos Correa, by the way, back when Ben was talking about, hey, you should draft him. He had a terrible year last year. He's a career WRC plus. Much, much higher than what he offered last year. His career WRC Plus is 125. He had one of his worst seasons in a long time. The previous two years, he had a 133 to 140 WRC Plus. So, yeah, bounce back sounds good to me. And I'm not even that. I thought Carlos Correa would one day maybe be A Rod, and that just hasn't been the case. Yeah, but that doesn't no. mean Carlos Correa hasn't been an excellent, rock solid major leaguer for a long time who's still not even 30, which is crazy to believe me because i'm still shocked that he's not even hit that mark but here he is so good luck carlos for me i think the al east i'm gonna go with the jays i think the jays are all in they're locked in and they're gonna take that step forward this year and whichever one of these players if it's david schneider who does get a chance because he plays better than dan vogel bench is that what you called him robbie vogel bench yes it is yes yeah. that's a beautiful <laughs> nickname <laughs> That is just so, so good. And I owe you for that one big time. Genius, genius, genius. I'll take the Jays in the East, in the Central. I'm going to take, I'm taking my Tigers. Go Tigers. I am. I know the Twins should win it. They really should win the division. But the Tigers are, they they signed Gio Ursula for a million five. One year deal. Means nothing, right? Yes, he's not a game breaker. But Ursula is a guy that's more depth. And Scott Harris is signing a lot of guys building depth in this organization. And with Chris Fetter, the pitching coach of my Tigers, this is not biased. If I, I ripped the tires, I loathe owner Chris Illich. I think he's a scumbag. He's one of the owners that prevented one of those deals that still stalled out the CBA negotiations in 2022 because he was so uptight about money. So I'm not a fan of him. But I think the Tigers could that. take the Central this year. I really I do. That. And then, yeah. Yeah. And, you know, Kerry Carpenter, Justin Henry Malloy, hopefully our guy, Ben, will get a shot this year. Although the Ursula signing does bum me out a little bit about his yeah. prospects. But uh, there's a lot of guys in that team that can hit. And Spencer Torkelson showed us that he's got 30 home run power now, which is great. And then the AL West, this is, I mean, it's obviously Oakland, right? <laughs> no, uh, I'll go with, uh, I'm going to go with the Mariners to get it done. I love you, Sam. You're my guy. And I'm just going to, I'm going to join you. I think the Mariners can finally get it done. The Rangers finally won a World Series. They'll fall back this year. Uh, the Astros are annoying, but I think the Mariners get it done. Yep. Seattle Mariners, baby. <laughs> love that. I love that. That makes me feel so happy and warm hearted inside. Uh, Robbie, who's your AL teams? I can hop back to the West immediately and, and counter on the Mariners. I did try for comedy sake to find a way to talk positively about Oakland, but we're supposed to <laughs> fill an hour. I couldn't do it. Um, so <laughs> next with the central, I, you know, it, it's about arms, right? Seattle's loaded with arms. Um, Cleveland produces arms. Cleveland can take it over Minnesota. Uh, that's just, that's what I believe. We already know they've got a lot of depth. They also have the ability if they ever decide to use it, to trade some of their prospect depth for MLB players. Usually they trade MLB players away. And then when the angels cut them, they're like, we'll take them, Um, (laughs) but we'll see what happens. Uh, And then it's, it's a toss up to me between Toronto or Baltimore who, what management team doesn't want to win. um, And that one will be the wildcard team. And the other one that actually makes (laughs) in season moves will probably take the East because they're, they're good teams all around. Toronto had a lot of veterans that underperformed, but they were relatively young. Um, the like four-man thing we talked about with 2B, 3B uh, is really confusing, but they're, they'll play the most productive player instead of having only one guy. You know, when Chapman was hot last year, it was great. When he slumped, he still started every day. And that won't happen with Toronto this year. They're all going to need to play somewhat well, league average at, at worst, and that should be a good thing. Um, and then when we hit, do we, do we hit to the NL? No, we don't head to the NL yet. Do we? 
No, no, not, no, Hollywood. Yeah, yeah. And then wild card teams. It's going to be Texas and Mini for me, because it'll be the Toronto Baltimore that loses it, and then it'll be Texas and Minnesota. Okay. Okay. So screw the Astros. <laughs> <laughs> you heard it here, folks. People. What about you, Ben? Who's well, going? I'm going to be that guy. Uh, I'm going to pick the Houston Astros to win the West, and just more than anything, just because. Trey Cabbage. Well, I mean yeah. that too. I mean, <laughs> but you've got that's putting it mildly. They know that they're heading into free agency with a good number of the guys they have right now, and they want to get that win in. You know, they they did sign Altuve. He's going to be around now long term and f- probably finish his career as an Astro. But Bregman's a free agent, I believe, after this year. I th- want to say at least one or two of the rotation is so they know that they're and i mean as as good as he may be and as much as we may enjoy watching his wife come to the ballpark justin verlander is not going to pitch forever so um they've got you know they've got to understand that they're in a window that's going to be just a certain amount of time they're they're the team i like in the west just because i think they're willing to go all in as much as they need to be to get those guys. Uh, then I have the twins in the central and, you know, call me an upper Midwest Homer, but you know, I just, I think there's just a ton of depth there that they do. Well. They should win. it. Um, yeah. And then Baltimore, there's a, if Baltimore is willing to make the trades, they should come out of the AL. I don't know if they are. That's where I'm at with Baltimore. I have them still predicted as the top team in the East, but that's a team that needs to make moves. Yeah, that AL East is really tough to get a real clear look on, for sure. Who's your wild card teams then? If you have uh, Houston, I've, Minnesota, and Baltimore, I I am, you know, I'm surprised nobody has mentioned them yet. But you have arguably, you could you could easily have the MVP and Cy Young on a team that nobody's mentioned yet. And that's the Yankees. And I really could see them making, I don't know if they have the depth to win the division in that division, but that team getting into a wild card. And if you have a healthy uh, Garrett Cole, plus if you know, you can get anything out of the rest of that rotation, get a somebody lined up, you know, Stroman does something you get, you know, just anything like that. Carlos Rodon becomes something again. That's a team that could be dangerous in the playoffs because they have old guys that could do well for a little while. Um, But then my other two are both from the West and Texas and Seattle. And I will say, as we get towards the end of the season, I think you want to hope that Texas gets themselves in such a rut early that they can't make it back. Because when they're all healthy, come if they're all healthy come October, that's going to be a, a heck of a team. Oh, know. their their lineup top to bottom is just super impressive, and you know I just love Adolis Garcia. He just seems to absolutely destroy every baseball that he sees. Uh, I've loved him for a couple of years watching him. I, I don't care that I'm a Mariners fan, Mike. Favorite hitter in the game is Jordan Alvarez, and my number two favorite hitter is Adelise Garcia. I just love watching what they do in the batter's box, and you know I'm going to get to see it up close and personal in the AOS for a long time. I I don't think the Yankees make the playoffs at all next year. I think in spite of having Judge and Soto and what's going to just be a monster lineup, I don't think that they have the pitching to happen with it, and. I see it being another situation like we had last year with Trout and Otani on a a team where both players are phenomenal and they're just so great and they do these superlative things and every day you hear about it because it starts out with, you know, Juan Soto is 22 for his last 35 during the Yankees five-game losing streak. Like that's that's how I see that going for him next year. I agree with you, Houston, Minnesota. I think it's actually going to be Tampa Bay. I think they are just like the the cyborgs, the the Borg from Star Trek or whatever nerdy thing you want to put onto it, man. Like they just make baseball happen. Uh, I, I don't think they have 
a, a playoff team for a deep run, but I think that they're going to win the East. And I think that the Mariners and Texas and uh, Baltimore are going to be the wild cards. I think that those are the teams that come through. And, you know, Minnesota, you were saying that they should win the AL Central. They have a really good pitching staff. They've got a really good bullpen. And that if they have yeah. any yeah. – no, the, the, everybody who's, th- who's throwing the rock for them this year is is sick. And so if they get any kind of continuity in that lineup, if they're able to churn through a couple uh, – winning streaks and just play some consistent baseball after that, they could be a real dark horse in the playoffs. I mean, they, Mm -hmm. they're the kind of team that scare me and make me think of like an Arizona diamondbacks where they just, you know, they're just playing good enough all year until they have to play better than you. And they have some of those players that can take off and do it. And they've got some young players uh, that are on the, on the cusp of playing for them in the outfield. They've got a trio of prospects that all could really do some real damage in the major. So I like them. In addition to Bruce Lewis and everybody else that you were talking about in the infield. Uh, talk to me, you guys, about your NL picks real quick. Uh, well, it's easy for me. Uh, in the NL East, I'm taking the good old Atlanta Braves. Yeah, that's what they do. They'll be around. They're a really, really good team. From top to bottom, they could do it all. Is the rotation going to be good enough? That's a fair question, but I'm down with the Braves there. And El Central, I'm taking the Reds. I'm taking the Reds to win that division this year. I think they'll take another step forward. And then the NL West, uh, every year I try to... Last year, I tried to go against the Dodgers. I thought it would be like one off year. So now that Otani's there, I mean, <laughs> you know, John Madden. Yeah, so <laughs> definitely the Dodgers. Do- Boom! Uh, <laughs> Don is back. Uh, remember, speed kills. Uh, so the Dodgers will win the NOS. But wild card, here's a fun one. And I brought this up with my pal Lucas in the Glarf draft a couple weekends ago when we were in Cleveland. Shout out to Lucas. Beery. Excellent writer Absolutely. at FTN Fantasy. Great Knows person. Doing. Great person, great writer, great fantasy player. Uh, we both like the Pirates. I'm going to take the Pirates to get a wild card this year coming out of the NL Central. That'll be fun. I think they could do it. They were only 10 games under last year. They got some talent on that squad. And if things break their way, I think they could sneak in in a wild card round. I really do. I like that. I like that okay. a lot. What about you, well, Ben? I, I will go kind of the consensus. I don't know about consensus, but I think you're seeing a lot of the uh, – smart people i guess just go dodgers reds braves for your division and uh i I mean on paper it makes sense it's but uh guys the teams i have for the wild card i have the cubs the phillies and then i honestly i think the padres are a better team than they showed last year and i mean they're kind of their depth is not great but if the guys who are there can stay healthy and perform, I think they have a team that can. Put a, lot of a lot of talent in that lineup still. Absolutely. So there's, I, I like them as a dark horse. That's nice. Um, I am unlike the smart people. I have different teams that I think are going to win when I look at the paper. Um, my wild cards are the Braves, uh, the Pittsburgh uh, team and the Colorado team, and then I've got the Dodgers. Naturally, I've got Cincinnati because you gotta love them. And I just assume if anything happens with the Reds, they'll just trade to acquire it because they've got the depth to do it. So if they need a pitcher, if they need a left fielder, whatever, they'll just trade to do it if they can't make it up in house. And then I like the Phillies because I uh, think that their pitching staff is going to be able to outlast a brave staff and like the Mets are going to get in one of those two teams way. Someone's going to be snake bitten by them. So let's just say it's Atlanta this year. Hey, fair. No, well, I would quick. like to say the Marlins real quick too. I would love to take the Marlins. <laughs> but I, the fact that they uh, kind of bone Kim Ang was that bothers me. So on just that alone principle, I'm not going to say the Marlins can get in, even though I think Skip Schumacher is a great manager and there is talent on that team. Yeah, Yuri Perez is dreamy when he pitches, so I'm with you on that. Hey, one word answers, guys. One word answers. Who's winning the World Series this year? Robbie? Uh, Dodgers. Ben? Braves. (laughs) Michael? Uh, Boy, that's really hard. Uh, I'll say 
Yeah. Dodgers. Uh, I think it's going to be the Astros. So, boom me all you want. I realize oh. that but that's where I'm at. <laughs> hey, you good, buddy. Say, say that with that jersey on. Like, you say that with that jersey on. Hey, this is a hoodie jersey, by the way. It's super cool. It's a hoodie that's designed to look like a jersey. Like, it's Ooh. the fattest birthday present ever. It's <laughs> the most super comfy, soft on the inside. It's got embroidered patches on the side. Like, this shit is just dripping with frizz, man. I look so good. <laughs> Utah. That's great. Give me two. Well, there it is. We did it. There's our uh, our supervisors back with a tie on now. So. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to uh, father daughter dance after this. So. Oh, no, that's right. Yeah, yeah. Oh, uh, see, I thought he put that on to administer the drug test. So uh, yeah, yeah. That, that is going to happen too. Like, like, rocky talk and all of that. Just Jesus. Uh, you got to dream in the off season. That it it hurts less when it all crumbles in April May that way. That's right. All right, guys. Unfortunately, you're out of time. We're out of time. Potapalooza is over for the day, though. We'll have just a couple of housekeeping things. But before I kick you all out, remind everybody where you reach on social media and plug everything you got, you got going on. Start with you, Sam. Uh, you can catch me at the Palazzo Podcast with these gentlemen. Uh, I do some podcasting at the Dynasty Guru. You can find me on Twitter at SamFBB1. And mental health is super important to me. So if you ever need to reach out, my DMs are always open. Peace and love. All right. Robbie Hockey, go ahead. Yeah, at Robbie Baseball One on the X. And of course, I'm now representing Palazzo Podcast. Uh, ben and I talking prospects minimum once a week. Big three, Utah. next three. Give me two. Get us up. And Benjamin. I'm on, I, I do some writing for Rotorballer. I'm on our prospect show here. I edit for the IBWAA every week. So you can find me a lot of different places. Big Gentle Ben on pretty much every social media. Instagram, X, Blue Sky, all that stuff. Only go. fans. And Govier. Yeah, shout out our boys who are not here today. Mike Virginia, Britt and Allen. They couldn't be here, but they are part of the Palazzo crew, so we appreciate them. Shout. There it is, a shout out for you guys. Thanks for being a part of the squad. Make sure you follow those two guys, Mike Virginia, Britt and Allen. I'm Mike Govier. Uh, I'm part of the Palazzo podcast. We got the rest of our next big three series going on at Palazzo. So if you're into Dynasty and Prospects, we still got a couple more shows to do there. And of course, we'll be doing... Draft Prep 2024. We got several more sessions of that to kick on opening day. YouTube, Plotso Podcast, 2Ls, 2Zs. You know where to find us. We're all over the place there. Discord's free. Utah. Got a Patreon if you want. Give me two. I'm at MJ Govier on Twitter. Thank you, Justin, for having us here. Of course, mental health. That's what I do for a living. So it's, uh, I've obviously said I did dedicate some of my life to that. So thank you for doing what you did here today, Justin. Absolutely. Uh, it was an absolute <laughs> pleasure to have you guys on. I'm going to boot you out unceremoniously. Uh, as I get rid of that Palazzo podcast. I love the Palazzo podcast. They're so entertaining. Hey, do you like the Palazzo podcast? Did you enjoy the last hour? One of the prizes you get to be a guest on the Palazzo podcast, uh, uh, courtesy of Michael Gauthier and the Palazzo podcast. So keep those donations coming in. Keep them coming in tomorrow. Keep them coming in overnight. Every dollar you donate gets donated to Fantasy Cares. And every dollar you donate gets you uh, entered into win raffle prizes. Amazing raffle prizes we're going to give away after Potapalooza is done. So far, through day one, we have raised almost $2,000. I think we're just about $100 short of that. Uh, and over the course of the entire offseason or draft season uh, through TGFBI, to, to, through TGFBI satellites, and through Potapalooza, we've raised over $8,000. So I appreciate everybody who's been donating. I appreciate everybody who's been watching. Uh, everybody's been sharing this on social media. Really, really appreciate it. We've got another big day tomorrow, 10 more hours to go. Uh, I am uh, looking forward to it. I'm looking forward to hanging out and talking baseball, listening to ba baseball being talked, uh, and just spending time with all of you. Really appreciate everyone just uh, supporting this. It's a, a fantastic uh, cause that we're uh, raising money for uh, and a fantastic way to spend the weekend. So with that, this is the final minutes of day one. Come back tomorrow for day two.